Talmud, Mas Baba Kama Achapter Mishnah The principal categories of damage are for the ox, the pit, the spoliator, Mabba, and the fire. The aspects of the ox are in some respects not of such low order of gravity as those of the spoliator, nor are in other respects those of the spoliator of such low order of gravity as those of the ox, nor are the aspects of either of them in which there is life of such low order of gravity as those of the fire which is not endowed with life, nor are the aspects of any of these the habit of which is to be mobile and do damage of such low orders of gravity as those of the pit of which it is not the habit to move about and do damage. The feature common to them all is that they are in the habit of doing damage and that they have to be under your control so that whenever any one of them does damage, the offender is liable to indemnify with the best of his estate. Gamara, seeing that principal categories are specified, it must be assumed that. There are derivatives are the latter equal in law to the former or not regarding Sabbath we learned the principal classes of prohibited acts are 40 less 1 principal classes implies that there must be subordinate classes here the latter do in law equal the former for there is no difference between the principal and a subordinate prohibited act with respect either to the law of sin offering or to that of capital punishment by stoning in what respect then do the two classes differ the difference is that if one simultaneously committed either two principal prohibited acts or two subordinate acts one is liable to bring a sin offering for each act whereas if one committed a principal act together with its respective subordinate one is liable for one offering only but according to our Eliezer who imposes the liability of an offering for a subordinate act committed along with its principal to begin with why is the one term principal and the other subordinate such acts as were essential in the construction of the tabernacle are termed principal, whereas such as were not essential in the construction of the tabernacle are termed subordinate. Regarding defilements, we have learned the primary defilements, the dead reptile, the semen viral Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B, and the person who has been in contact with a human corpse in this connection, their resultants are not equal to them in law for a primary defilement contaminates both human beings and utensils while resultants defile only foods and drinks, leaving human beings and utensils undefiled here in connection with damages. What is the relationship in law between the principal and the secondary kind set? Our Papa, some of the derivatives are out of PA are with their principles, whereas others are not. Our rabbis taught three principal categories of damage have been identified in scripture with ox, the horn, the tooth, and the foot. Where is the authority for horn for our rabbis taught if it will gore? There is no goring but with a horn as it is said and Zedekiah the son of Chinadah made him horns of iron and said thus saith the Lord with these shalt thou gore the Arameans and it is further said his glory is like the first ling of his bullock and his horns are like the horns of a unicorn with them he shall gore the people together etc. Why that further citation because you might perhaps say that Pentateuchal teachings cannot be deduced from post Pentateuchal texts come therefore and hear his glory is like the first ling of his bullock and his horns are like the horns of a unicorn etc. But is that a matter of deduction is it not rather merely an elucidation of the term goring as being affected by a horn were it not for the further citation you might say that the distinction made by scripture between the goring of Atem and that of Amuad is confined to goring affected by a separate horn whereas in the case of a horn still naturally attached all goring is habitual and Consequently treated as of a new come therefore and here his glory is like the first ling of his bullock and his horns are like the horns of a unicorn etc. What are the derivatives of horn collision biting malicious falling and kicking why this differentiation if goring is termed principle because it is expressly written if it will gore why should this not apply to collision as it is also written if it will collide that collision denotes goring as it was taught the text opens with collision and concludes with goring for the purpose of indicating that collision here denotes goring why the differentiation between injury to man regarding which it is written if it will gore and injury to animal regarding which it is written if it will collide man who possesses foresight is as a rule injured only by means of willful goring but an animal lacking foresight is injured by mere collision a new point is incidentally made known to us that an animal new to injure man is Considered muad in regard to animal, whereas muad to injure animal is not considered muad in regard to man. Biting is not this a derivative of tooth. No tooth affords the animal gratification from the damage, while biting affords it no gratification from the damage. Falling and kicking are not these derivatives of foot. No, the damage of foot occurs frequently, while the damage of these does not occur frequently. But what then are the derivatives which our Papa says are not on a par with their principles? He can hardly be said to refer to these, since what differentiation is possible for just as horn does its damage with intent and being your property is under your control. So also these derivatives do damage with intent and being your property are under your control. The derivatives of horn are therefore equal to horn, and our Papa's statement refers to tooth and foot, tooth and foot. Where in scripture are they set down? It is taught, and he shall send forth the notes foot as it is. Elsewhere expressed that send forth the feet of the ox and the ass and it shall consume the notes tooth as elsewhere expressed as the tooth consume at Talmud, Mas Baba Kama to entirety the master has just enunciated and he shall send forth the notes foot as it is elsewhere expressed that send forth the feet of the ox and the ass his reason and is that the divine law also says that send forth the feet of the ox and the ass but even were it not so how else could you interpret the phrase? It could surely not refer to horn which is already elsewhere set down nor could it refer to tooth since this is likewise already set down it was essential as otherwise it might have entered your mind to regard both phrases as denoting tooth the one when there is destruction of the corpus and the other when the corpus remains unaffected it is therefore made known to us that this is not the case now that we have identified it with foot whence could be inferred the liability of tooth in. Cases of non-destruction of the corpus from the analogy of foot just as in the case of foot no difference in law is made between destruction and non-destruction of corpus so in the case of tooth no distinction is made between destruction and non-destruction of corpus the master has just enunciated and it shall consume the notes tooth as elsewhere expressed as the tooth can submit to entirety his reason and is that the divine law also says as the tooth can submit to entirety but even were it not so how else could you interpret the phrase it could surely not refer to horn which is already elsewhere set down nor could it refer to foot since this is likewise elsewhere set down it is essential as otherwise it might have entered your mind to regard both phrases as denoting foot the one when the cattle went of its own accord and the other when it was sent by its owner to do damage it is therefore made known to us that this is not so now that we have identified it with tooth whence could be inferred the liability of foot in cases when the cattle went of its own accord from the analogy of tooth just as in the case of tooth there is no difference in law whether the cattle went of its own accord or was sent by its owner so in the case of foot there is no difference in law whether the cattle went of its own accord or was sent by its owner but supposing divine law had only written and he shall send forth omitting and it shall consume would it not imply both foot and tooth would it not imply foot as it is written that send forth the feet of the ox and the ass again would it not also imply tooth as it is written and the teeth of beasts will I send upon them if there were no further expression I would have said either one or the other might be meant either foot as the damage done by it is a frequent occurrence or tooth as the damage done by it affords gratification let us see now they are equally balanced let them then both be included for which may you exclude it is essential to have the further expression for otherwise it might have entered your mind to assume that these laws of liability apply only to intentional trespass exempting thus cases where the cattle went of its own accord it is therefore made known to us that this is not the case the derivative of tooth what is it when the cattle rubbed itself against the wall for its own pleasure and broke it down or when it spoiled fruits by rolling on them for its own pleasure why are these cases different just as tooth affords gratification from the damage it does and being your possession is under your control why should not this also be the case with its derivatives which similarly afford gratification from the damage they do and being your possession are under your control the derivative of tooth is therefore equal to tooth and our papa's statement to the contrary refers to the derivative of foot what is the derivative of foot when it did damage while in motion either with its body or with its hair or with the load which was upon it or with the bit in its mouth or with the bell on its neck now why should these cases be different just as foot does frequent damage and being your possession is under your control why should not this also be the case with its derivatives which similarly do frequent damage and being your possession are under your control the derivative of foot is thus equal to foot and our papa's statement to the contrary refers to the derivative of the pit what is the derivative of pit it could hardly be said that the principle is a pit of
Public nuisances come within the scope of the law applicable to pit they would be included in pit whereas according to Rab who maintains that in such circumstances they rather partake of the nature of ox they are equivalent in law to ox and even according to Samuel why should the derivatives of pit be different just as pit is from its very inception a source of injury and being your possession is under your control so is the case with these derivatives which from their very inception as nuisances also are sources of injury and being your possession are under your control the derivative of pit is therefore equal to pit and our papa statement to the contrary refers to the derivative of spoliator but what is it if we are to follow Samuel who takes spoliator to denote tooth behold we have already established that the derivative of tooth equals tooth if on the other hand Rab's view is accepted identifying spoliator with man what principles and what derivatives could there be? In him you could hardly suggest that man doing damage while awake is principal but becomes derivative when causing damage while asleep for have we not learned man is in all circumstances mu and whether awake or asleep hence our papa statement will refer to phlegm expectorated from mouth or nostrils but in what circumstances if it did damage while in motion it is man's direct agency if on the other hand damage resulted after it was at rest it would be included according to both rab and samuel in the category of pit the derivative of spoliator is therefore equal to spoliator and our papa statement to the contrary refers to the derivative of fire what is the derivative of fire shall i say it is a stone a knife and luggage which having been placed upon the top of one's roof were thrown down by a normal wind and did damage then in what circumstances if they did damage while in motion they are equivalent to fire and why should they be different just as fire is aided by it? External force and being your possession is under your control so also is the case with these derivatives which are aided by an external force and being your possession are under your control the derivative of fire is therefore equal to fire and our papa statement to the contrary refers to the derivative of foot foot have we not established that the derivative of foot is equal to foot there is a payment of half damages done by pebbles kicked from under an animal's feet a payment established by tradition on account of what legal consequences it designated derivative of foot so that the payment should likewise be enforced even from the best of the defendant's possessions but did not rob a question whether the half damage of pebbles is collected only from the body of the animal or from any of the defendant's possessions this was doubtful only to rob whereas our papa was almost certain about it that the latter is the case but according to rob who remained Doubtful on this point on account of what legal consequences a term derivative of foot so that it may also enjoy exemption where the damage was done on public ground the spoliator and the fire etc. What is meant by Mabe Rab said Mabe denotes man doing damage but Samuel said Mabe signifies tooth of trespassing cattle Rab maintains that Mabe denotes man for it is written the watchman said the morning cometh and also the night if ye will inquire inquire yes Samuel. On the other hand holds that Mabe signifies tooth for it is written how is Esau searched out how are his hidden places sought out but how is this deduced as rendered by our Joseph how was Esau ransacked how were his hidden treasures exposed why did not Rab agree with the interpretation of Samuel he may object does the mission employ the term Mabe which could denote anything exposed why on the other hand did not Samuel follow the interpretation of Rab he may object does it. Mishnah employed the term boy which could denote an inquirer but in fact the scriptural quotations could hardly bear out the interpretation of either of them why then did not Rab agree with Samuel that ox in the Mishnah covers all kinds of damage done by ox how then will Samuel explain the fact that ox has already been dealt with Rab Judah explained that ox in the Mishnah denotes horn while Mabe stands for tooth and this is the sequence in the Mishnah the aspects of horn which does not afford gratification from the injury are not of such order of gravity as those of tooth which does afford gratification from the damaged Talmud, Mas Baba Kama nor are the aspects of tooth which is not prompted by malicious intention to injure of such order of gravity as those of horn which is prompted by malicious intention to do damage but can this not be deduced a fortiori of tooth which is prompted by no malicious intention to injure involves liability to pay how much more so should. This applied to horn which is prompted by malicious intention to do damage explicit scriptural warrant for the liability of horn is nevertheless essential as otherwise you might have possibly thought that I assume immunity for horn on an analogy to the case of man and maidservants just as a man and maidservant although prompted by malicious intention to do damage do not devolve any liability upon their master so is the law here in the case of horn or ashi however said is not the immunity in the case of damage done by man and maidservants due to the special reason that but for this a servant provoked by his master might go on burning down another's crops and thus make his master liable to pay sums of money day by day the sequence of the analysis in the mission must accordingly be in the reverse direction the aspects of horn which is actuated by malicious intention to do damage are not of such low order of gravity as those of tooth which is not actuated by Malicious intention to do damage again the aspects of tooth which affords gratification while doing damage are not of such low order of gravity as those of horn which affords no gratification from the damage but what about foot was it entirely excluded in the mission of the generalization whenever damage has occurred the offender is liable includes foot but why has it not been stated explicitly Rabba therefore said the ox stated in the mission implies foot while Mabe stands for tooth. And this is the sequence in the mission of the aspects of foot which does frequent damage are not of such low order of gravity as those of tooth the damage by which is not frequent again the aspects of tooth which affords gratification from the damage are not of such low order of gravity as those of foot which does not afford gratification from the damage but what about horn was it entirely excluded in the mission of the generalization whenever damage has occurred the offender is liable. Includes horn, but why has it not been stated explicitly? Those which are muad of initio are mentioned explicitly in the Mishnah, but those which initially are tam and only finally become muad are not mentioned explicitly. Now, as to Samuel, why did he not adopt Rab's interpretation of the Mishnah term Mabah? He may object if you were to assume that it denotes man. The question would arise: Is not man explicitly dealt with in the subsequent Mishnah muad cattle and cattle doing damage on the plaintiff's premises and man? But why then was man omitted in the opening Mishnah? In that Mishnah, damage done by one's possessions is dealt with, but not that done by one's person. And how could even Rab uphold his interpretation since man is explicitly dealt with in the subsequent Mishnah? Rab may reply: The purpose of that Mishnah is only to enumerate man among those which are considered muad. What then is the import of the analysis introduced by the aspects are not etc. This is the Sequence the aspects of ox which entails the payment of cover for loss of human life are not of such low order of gravity as those of man who does not pay monetary compensation for manslaughter again the aspects of man who in case of human bodily injury is liable for additional four items are not of such low order of gravity as those of ox which is not liable for those four items the feature common to them all is that they are in the habit of doing damage is it usual for ox horn to do damage as muad but even as muad is it usual for it to do damage since it became muad this became its habit is it usual for man to do damage when he is asleep but even when asleep is it usual for man to do damage while stretching his legs or curling them this is his habit there having to be under your control is not the control of man's body exclusively his own whatever view you take the whole carnet taught the principal categories of damage are four and man is one of them now is not the control of a man's body exclusively his own you must therefore say with Arabah who requested the tenant to learn the control of man's body is exclusively his own Talmud, Mas Baba Kama be that here also it is to be understood that the control of man's body is his own Armari however demurred say perhaps Mabed denotes water doing damage as it is written as when the melting fire burneth fire to be causeth to bubble water is it written water bubbles it is written fire causes. Bubbling Arzi but demurred say then that Mabed denotes fire as it is fire to which the act of Tibet in the text is referred if this be so what is then the explanation of the Mabed and the fire if you suggest the latter to be the interpretation of the former then instead of four there will be three if however you suggest that ox constitutes two kinds of damage then what will be the meaning of the Mishnaic text nor are the aspects of either of the ox and Mabed in which there is life is. There any life in fire again what will be conveyed by the concluding clause as those of the fire are ashai taught there are 13 principal categories of damage the unpaid billy and the borrower the paid billy and the higher depreciation pain suffered healing loss of time degradation and the four enumerated in the mission of us making a total of 13 why did Artana mention only the four and not the others according to Samuel this pres
The sphere of man damaging chattel and they are nevertheless reckoned by our Ashaya. Direct damage and indirect damage are treated by him independently. Our Ashaya taught there are 24 principal kinds of damage double payment, fourfold or fivefold payment, theft, robbery, false evidence, rape, seduction, slander, defilement, adulteration, vitiation of wine, and the 13 enumerated above by our Ashaya, thus making the total 24. Why did not our Ashaya reckon the 24 he dealt only with? Damage involving civil liability but not with that of a punitive nature but why omit theft and robbery which also involve civil liability these kinds of damage may be included in the unpaid billy and the borrower why then did not our high comprehend the former in the latter he reckoned them separately as in the one case the possession of the chattel was acquired lawfully while in the other the acquisition was unlawful why did not our Ashai Talmud, Mas Baba Kama deal with false evidence? The liability for which is also civil he holds the view of our Akiba who maintains that the liability for false evidence is penal in nature and cannot consequently be created by confession but if our Ashai follows our Akiba why does he not reckon ox as two distinct kinds of damage ox damaging chattel and ox injuring men for have we not learned that our Akiba said a mutual injury arising between men and ox even while Atam is assessed in full and the balance paid accordingly this distinction. Could however not be made since it is elsewhere taught that our Akiba himself has qualified this full payment for our Akiba said you might think that in the case of Tam injuring man payment should be made out of the general estate it is therefore stated this judgment shall be done unto it to emphasize that the payment should only be made out of the body of the Tam and not out of any other source whatsoever why did our Ashai omit rape seduction and slander the liabilities for which are also civil? What particular liability do you wish to refer to if for actual loss this has already been dealt with under depreciation if for suffering this has already been dealt with under pain if for humiliation this has already been dealt with under degradation if again for deterioration this is already covered by depreciation what else then can you suggest to find with this type of liability our Ashai is not concerned why then omit defilement adulteration and vitiation of wine the liabilities for? Which are civil? What is your view in regard to intangible damage? If you consider intangible damage a civil wrong, defilement has then already been dealt with under depreciation. If on the other hand, intangible damage is not a civil wrong, then any liability for it is penal in nature with which our Ashai is not concerned. Are we to infer that our High considers intangible damage not to be a civil wrong? For otherwise, would not this kind of damage already have been reckoned by him under depreciation? He may in any case have found it expedient to deal with tangible damage and intangible damage under distinct heads. It is quite conceivable that our Tana found it necessary to give the total number of the principal kinds of damage in order to exclude those of our Ashai. The same applies to our Ashai who also gave the total number in order to exclude those of our High. But what could be excluded by the total number specified by our High? It is intended to exclude denunciation and profanation of. Sacrifices the exclusion of profanation is conceivable as sacrifices are not your reckoned but why is denunciation omitted denunciation is in a different category on account of its verbal nature with which our high is not concerned but is not slander of a verbal nature and yet reckoned slander is something verbal but dependent upon some act but is not false evidence of verbal effect not connected with any act and yet it is reckoned the latter though not connected with any act is reckoned because it is described in the divine law as an act as the text has it then shall you do unto him as he had purpose to do unto his brother it is quite conceivable that the tenor of the mission characterizes his kinds of damage as principles in order to indicate the existence of others which are only derivatives but can our high and our ashai characterize theirs as principles in order to indicate the existence of others which are derivatives if so what are they said are about all of them are Characterized as principles for the purpose of requiring compensation out of the best of possessions, how is this uniformity in procedure arrived at by means of a uniform interpretation of each of the following terms? Instead, compensation, payment, money, the aspects of the ox are in some respects not of such low order of gravity as those of the spoliator map. And what does this signify? Our in the name of Rabbah said the point of this is let scripture record only one kind of damage and from it you will deduce the liability for the other. In response, it was declared one kind of damage could not be deduced from the other, nor are the aspects of either of them in which there is life. What does this signify? Our measure in the name of Rabbah said the point of it is this Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B let scripture record only two kinds of damage and from them you will deduce a further kind of damage. In response, it was declared even from two kinds of damage it would. Not be possible to deduce one more Rabbah however said if you retain any one kind of damage along with pit in scripture all the others but horn will be deduced by analogy horn is accepted as the analogy breaks down since all the other kinds of damage are mu ad of initio according however to the view that horn on the other hand possesses a greater degree of liability because of its intention to do damage even horn could be deduced for what purpose then did scripture record them all for their specific laws horn in order to distinguish between tam and mu ad tooth and the foot to be immune for damage done by them on public ground pit to be immune for damage done by it to inanimate objects and according to our Judah who maintains liability for inanimate objects damaged by a pit in order still to be immune for death caused by it to man man to render him liable for four additional payments when injuring man fire to be immune for damage to hidden goods but according to our Judah. Who maintains liability for damage to hidden goods by fire? What specific purpose could be served? Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, to include damage done by fire, lapping his neighbor's plowed field and grazing his stones. The feature common to them all. What else is this clause intended to include? Have a set of stone, a knife, and luggage which, having been placed by a person on the top of his roof, fell down through a normal wind and did damage. In what circumstances did they do the damage? If while they were in motion they are equivalent to fire, how is this case different? Just as fire is aided by an external force and being your possession is under your control, so also is the case with those which are likewise aided by an external force and being your possessions are under your control. If on the other hand damage was done after they were at rest and if abandoned, according to both Rab and Samuel, they are equivalent to pit. How is their case different? Just as pit is from its very Inception a source of injury and being your possession is under your control so also is the case with those which from their very inception as nuisances are likewise sources of injury and being your possession are under your control furthermore even if they were not abandoned according to Samuel who maintains that we deduce the law governing all nuisances from pit they are again equivalent to pit indeed they were abandoned still they are not equivalent to pit why is liability attached to pit if not because no external force assisted how then can you assert the same in the case of those which are assisted by an external force fire however will refute this reasoning but you may ask why is liability attached to fire if not because of its nature to travel and do damage pit however will refute this reasoning the argument is thus endlessly reversible and liability can be deduced only from the common aspects Rabbah said this clause is intended to include a Nuisance which is rolled about from one place to another by the feet of man and by the feet of animal and causes damage in what circumstances did it do the damage if it was abandoned according to both Rab and Samuel it is equivalent to pit how does its case differ just as pit is from its very inception a source of injury and is under your control so also is the case with that which from its very inception as a nuisance is likewise a source of injury and is under your control furthermore even if it were not abandoned according to Samuel who maintains that we deduce the law governing all nuisances from pit it is again equivalent to pit indeed it was abandoned still it is not equivalent to pit why is liability attached to pit if not because the making of it solely caused the damage how then can you assert the same in the case of such nuisances the making of which did not directly cause the damage ox however will refute this reasoning but you may ask why is Liability attached to ox if not because of its habit to walk about and do damage pit will refute this reasoning the argument is thus endlessly reversible as the aspect of the one is not comparable to the aspect of the other and liability therefore can be deduced only from the common aspects are at a bi said to include that which is taught all those who open their gutters or sweep out the dust of their cellars into public thoroughfares are in the summer period acting unlawfully but lawfully in winter in all cases however even though they act lawfully if special damage resulted they are liable to compensate but in what circumstances if the damage occurred while the nuisances were in motion is it not man's direct act if on the other hand it occurred after they were at rest again in what circumstances if they were abandoned then according to both Rab and Samuel
accidentally fell into a public thoroughfare and did damage involves no liability for compensation if an order had been served by the proper authorities to fell the tree and pull down the wall within a specified time and they fell within a specified time and did damage the immunity holds goods but if after the specified time liability is incurred but what were the circumstances of the wall and the tree if they were abandoned and according to both Rab and Samuel they are equivalent to Pitt. How is their case different just as Pitt does frequent damage and is under your control so also is the case with those which likewise do frequent damage and are under your control furthermore even if they were not abandoned according to Samuel who maintains that we deduce the law governing all nuisances from Pitt they are again equivalent to Pitt indeed they were abandoned still they are not equivalent to Pitt why is liability attached to Pitt if not because of its being from its very Inception a source of injury how then can you assert the same in the case of those which are not sources of injury from their inception ox however will refute this reasoning but you may ask why is liability attached to ox if not because of its nature to walk about and do damage pit will refute this reasoning the argument is thus endlessly reversible and liability can be deduced only from common aspects whenever any one of them does damage the offender is have liable the offender is have the offender is hey it should be the phrase Rab Judah on behalf of Rab said this tana of the Mishnah text was a Jerusalemite who employed an easier form to indemnify with the best of his estate our rabbis taught of the best of his field and of the best of his vineyard shall he make restitution refers to the field of the plaintiff and to the vineyard of the plaintiff this is a view of our Ishmael our Akiba says scripture only intended that damages should be collected out of the best and this applies even more so to sacred property would our Ishmael maintain that the defendant whether damaging the best or worst is to pay for the best our EDB Avin said this is so where he damaged one of several furrows and it could not be ascertained whether the furrow he damaged was the worst or the best in which case he must pay for the best Rabba however demurred saying since where we do know that he damaged the worst he would only have to pay for the worst now that we do not know whether the furrow damaged was the best or the worst why pay for the best it is the plaintiff who has the onus of proving his case by evidence our Ahabi Jacob therefore explained we are dealing here with a case where the best of the plaintiff's estate equals in quality the worst of that of the defendant and the point at issue is as follows our Ishmael maintains that the qualities are estimated in relation to those of the plaintiff's estate but our Akiba is of the opinion that it is the qualities of it. Defendants' possessions that have to be considered what is the reason underlying our Ishmael's view the term field occurs both in the latter clause and the earlier clause of the verse now just as in the earlier clause it refers to the plaintiff's possession so also does it in the latter clause our Akiba however maintains that the last clause of the best of his field and of the best of his vineyard shall he make restitution clearly refers to the possessions of the one who has to pay our Ishmael. On the other hand contends that both the textual analogy of the terms and the plain textual interpretation are complementary to each other the analogy of the terms is helpful towards establishing the above statement while the plain textual interpretation helps to qualify the application of the above in a case where the defendant's estate consists of good and bad qualities and the plaintiff's estate likewise comprises good quality but the bad of the defendant's estate is not so good as it. Good quality of the estate of the plaintiff, for in this case the defendant must pay out of the better quality of his estate as he cannot say to him come and be paid out of the bad quality which is below the quality of the estate of the plaintiff, but he is entitled to the better quality of the defendant. Our Akiva said scripture only intended that damages be collected out of the best, and this applies even more so to sacred property. What is the import of the last clause? It could hardly be suggested that it refers to a case where a private ox or an ox consecrated to the sanctuary, for does not the divine law distinctly say the ox of one's neighbor, excluding thus any liability for damage done to consecrated chattel again? It could hardly deal with a personal undertaking by one to pay a maintenance to the treasury of the temple, thus authorizing the treasurer to collect from the best, for surely he should not be in a better position than a private creditor Talmud, Mas Babakame. Who can collect nothing better than a medium quality if however you hold that our Akiba authorizes the payment of all loans out of the best the treasurer of the temple could still hardly avail himself of this privilege as the analogy between these two kinds of liability could be upset as follows a private creditor is at an advantage in that for damages he will surely be paid out of the best but is not the temple treasury at a very great disadvantage in this respect it may still be maintained. That it applies to the case where a private ox or a consecrated ox and in answer to the difficulty raised by you that the divine law definitely says the ox of one's neighbor thus exempting for damage done to consecrated property it may be suggested that our Akiba shares the view of our Simeon Bimanesia as taught our Simeon Bimanesia says in the case of a consecrated ox goring a private one there is total exemption but for a private ox whether Tam or Mumad goring a consecrated ox full damages. Must be paid if this is our Akiba's contention. Once could it be proved that the point at issue between our Ishmael and our Akiba is as to the best of the plaintiffs equaling the worst of the defendants? Why not say that on this point they are both of opinion that the qualities are estimated in relation to the plaintiff's possessions, whereas the disagreement between them is on the point at issue between our Simeon Bimanesia and the rabbis, i.e., the majority against him, our Akiba holding the view of our Simeon Bimanesia and our Ishmael that of the rabbis. If so, what would be the purport of the first clause of our Akiba scripture only intended that damages be collected out of the best again would not then even the last clause and this even more so applies to sacred property be rather logically phrased. Furthermore, our Ashi said it was explicitly taught of the best of his field and of the best of his vineyard shall he make restitution refers to the field of the plaintiff and to the vineyard of it. Plaintiff, this is a view of our Ishmael our Akiba on the other hand says the best of the defendant's field and the best of the defendant's vineyard have they pointed out to Rabbi the following contradiction scripture records out of the best of his field and out of the best of his vineyard shall he make restitution thus indicating that payment must be made only out of the best and not out of anything else whereas it is taught he should return includes payment in kind even with brand there is no contradiction the latter applies when the payment is made willingly while the former refers to payments enforced by Lawla the son of Arlai thereupon said this distinction is evident even from the scriptural term he shall make restitution meaning even against his will Abbe on the other hand said to him is it written Yishalam restitution shall be made what is written is Yishalam he shall make restitution which could mean of his own free will but said Abbe the contradiction can be Salt as the master did in the case taught an owner of houses fields and vineyards who cannot find a purchaser is considered needy and may be given the tithe for the poor up to half the value of his estate now the master discussed the circumstances under which this permission could apply if property in general and is included dropped in value why not grant him even the value of more than the half of his estate's value since the depreciation is general if on the other hand property in general appreciated but is on account of his going about looking here and there for ready money fell in price Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi why give him anything at all and the master thereupon said no the above law is applicable to cases where in the month of Nissan property has a higher value whereas in the month of Tishri it has a lower value people in general wait until Nissan and then sell whereas this particular proprietor being in great need of ready money finds himself compelled to sell in Tishri at the existing lower price he is therefore granted half because it is in the nature of property to drop in value up to a half but it is not in its nature to drop more than that now a similar case may also be made out with reference to payment for damage which must be out of the best if the plaintiff however says give me medium quality but a larger quantity the defendant is entitled to reply it is only when you take the best quality which is due to you by law that you may calculate on the present price failing that whatever you take you will have to calculate according to the higher price anticipated but our Ahabi Jacob demurred if so you have weakened the right of plaintiffs for damages in respect of inferior quality when the divine law states out of the best how can you maintain that inferior qualities are excluded our Ahabi Jacob therefore said if any analogy could he drawn it may be made in the case of a creditor a creditor is paid by law out of medium quality if however he Says give me worse quality but greater quantity the debtor is entitled to say it is only when you take that quality which is due to you by law that you may calculate on the present price failing that whatever you take you will have to calculate according to the higher price anticipated our son of R.I.K.A. demurred if so you will close the door in the face of prospective borrowers the creditor will rightly contend were my money with me I would
Another town that is only in the case of land which is accepted therefrom that the payment has to be made out of the best so that intending purchasers jump at it are Samuel B. Abba of Akronia asked of Abba when the calculation is made is it based on his own the defendant's property or upon that of the general public this problem has no application to our Ishmael's view that the calculation is based upon the quality of the plaintiff's property it can apply only to our Akiba's view which takes it. Defendant's property into account what would according to him be the ruling does the divine law in saying the best of his field intend only to exclude the quality of the plaintiff's property from being taken into account or does it intend to exclude even the quality of the property of the general public here Abba said to him the divine law states the best of his field how then can you maintain that the calculation is based on the property of the general public he raised an objection it is taught if the defendant's estate consists only of the best creditors of all descriptions are paid out of the best if it is of medium quality they are all paid out of medium quality if it is of the worst quality they are all paid out of the worst quality it is only when the defendant's possessions consist of both the best the medium and the worst that creditors for damages are paid out of the best creditors for loans out of the medium and creditors for marriage contracts out of the worst when however the estate consists only of the best and of the medium qualities creditors for damages are paid out of the best while creditors for loans and for marriage contracts will be paid out of the medium quality again if the estate consists only of the medium and the worst qualities creditors for either damages or loans are paid out of the medium quality whereas those for marriage contracts will be paid out of the worst quality Talmud, Mas Baba Kama if however the estate consists only of the best and of the worst qualities creditors for damages are paid out of the best whereas those for loans and marriage contracts are paid out of the worst quality now the intermediate clause states that if the estate consists only of the medium and the worst qualities creditors for either damages or loans are paid out of the medium quality whereas marriage contracts will be paid out of the worst quality if therefore you still maintain that the calculation is based only upon the qualities of the defendant's estate is not the medium when there is no better with him is best why then should not the creditors for loans be thrown back on the worst quality this intermediate clause deals with a case where the defendant originally possessed property of a better quality but has meanwhile disposed of it and Arhista likewise explained this intermediate clause to deal with a case where the defendant originally possessed property of a better quality but has meanwhile Disposed of it this explanation stands to reason for it is taught elsewhere if the estate consisted of the medium and the worst qualities creditors for damages are paid out of the medium quality whereas those for loans and marriage contracts will be paid out of the worst quality now these two barithas do not contradict each other unless we accept the explanation that the one deals with a case where the defendant originally owned property of a better quality but which he has meanwhile disposed of while the other states the law for a case where he did not have property of a quality better than the medium in his possession it may however on the other hand be suggested that both barithas state the law when a better quality was not disposed of and there is yet no contradiction as the second barith presents a case where the defendant's medium quality is as good as the best quality of the general public whereas in the first barith the medium quality was not so good as the best of the public it may again be suggested that both barithas present a case where the defendant's medium quality was not better than the medium quality of the general public and the point at issue is this the second barith bases the calculation upon the qualities of the defendant's estate but the first bases it upon those of the general public Rubin has said the point at issue is the view expressed by Olaf Rola said creditors for loans may according to Pentateuchal law be paid out of the worst as it is said thou shalt stand without and the man to whom thou dost lend shall bring forth the pledge without unto thee now it is certainly in the nature of man debtor to bring out the worst of his chattels why then is it laid down that creditors for loans are paid out of the medium quality this is a rabbinic enactment made in order that prospective borrowers should not find the door of their benefactors locked before them now this enactment referred to by Ola is accepted by the first barrier, whereas the second disapproves of this enactment, our rabbis taught if a defendant disposed of all his land to one or to three persons at one and the same time they all have stepped into the place of the original owner. If, however, the three sales took place one after another, creditors of all descriptions will be paid out of the property purchased last. If this property does not cover the liability, the last but one purchased estate is resorted to for the balance. If this estate again does not meet the whole obligation, the very first purchased estate is resorted to for the outstanding balance. If the defendant disposed of all his land to one, under what circumstances was it disposed of? It could hardly be suggested that it was affected by one and the same deed. For if in the case of three persons whose purchases may have been after one another, you state that they all have stepped into the place of the original owner. What need is there to mention one? Person purchasing all the estate by one and the same deed, it therefore seems pretty certain that the estate disposed of to one person was affected by deeds of different dates. But then, why such a distinction? Just as in the case of three purchasers in succession, each can in the first instance refer any creditor to the very last purchased property, saying, When I bought my estate, I was careful to leave with the defendant plenty for you to be paid out of. Why should not also one purchaser by deeds of different dates be entitled to throw the burden of payment onto the very last purchased property, saying, When I acquired title to the former purchases, I was very careful to leave for you plenty to be paid out of. We are dealing here with a case where the property purchased last was of the best quality. Also, Arshis hate stated that this law applies when the property purchased last was of the best quality. If this be the case, why, on the other hand, should not creditors? Of all kinds come and be paid out of the best quality as this was the property purchased last because the defendant may say to the creditors if you acquiesce and agree to be paid out of the qualities respectively allotted to you by law you may be paid accordingly otherwise I will transfer the deed of the worst property back to the original owner in which case you will all be paid out of the worst if so Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B why should the same not be said regarding creditors for damages? It must therefore he surmised that we deal with the case where the vendor has meanwhile died and as his heirs are not personally liable to pay the original liability which accompanied the purchased properties must always remain upon the purchaser who could consequently no longer threaten the creditors and say this if you acquiesce but the reason the creditors cannot be paid out of the best is that the vendee may repudiate their demand and say to them on what account have the rabbis. Enacted that property disposed of by debtor cannot be attached by his creditors so long as there are available possessions still not disposed of if not for the sake of protecting my interests in the present instance I have no interest in availing myself of this enactment exactly as Rabba for Rabba elsewhere said whoever asserts I have no desire to avail myself of a rabbinical enactment such as this is listened to to what does such as this refer to Arhuna for Arhuna said a woman is entitled to say to her husband I don't expect any maintenance from you and I do not want to work for you it is quite certain that if the vendee has sold the medium and worst qualities and retained the best creditors of all descriptions may come along and collect out of the best quality for this property was acquired by him last and since the medium and worst qualities are no more in his possession he is not in a position to say to the creditors take payment out of the medium and worst properties as I have no interest in availing myself of the rabbinic enactment but what is the law when the vendee disposed of the best quality and retained the medium and the worst of a at first was inclined to say creditors of all descriptions are entitled to come and collect out of the best but Rabba said to him does not a vendee selling property to a subvendee assign to him all the rights connected therewith that may accrue to him hence just as when the creditors come to claim from the vendee he is entitled to pay them out of the medium and the worst respectively irrespective of the fact that when the medium and the worst qualities were purchased by him the best property still remained free with the original vendor and in spite of the enactment that properties disposed of cannot be dis reigned on at the hands of the vendee so long as there is available with the debtor property and disposed of the reason of the exception being that the vendee is entitled to say that he has no interest in availing himself of this enactment so is the subvendee similarly entitled to say to the creditors take payment out of the medium and the worst for the subvendee entered into the sale only upon the understanding that any right that his vendor may possess in connection with the purchase should also be assigned to him Rabba said if Reuben disposed of all his lands to Simeon who in his turn sold one of the fields to Levi Reuben's creditor may come and collect out of the land which is in it. Possession either of Simeon or Levi this law applies only when Levi bought medium quality but if he purchased either the best or the worst the law is otherwise as Levi may
To him you Reuben are no party to me for Reuben will surely say to him if you will deprive Simeon of the field purchased by him from me he will turn on me there are some who say even if there were no warranty there the same law applies as Reuben may say to the alleged creditor I don't want Simeon to have any grievance against me and Abbe further said if Reuben sold the field to Simeon without a warranty for indemnity Talmud, Mas Baba Kamae and there appeared claimants questioning it. Vendor's title so long as Simeon had not yet taken possession of it he might withdraw but after he had taken possession of it he could no longer withdraw what is the reason for that because the vendor may say to him you have agreed to accept a bag tied up with knots from what moment in this case is possession considered to be taken from the moment he sets his foot upon the landmarks of the purchased field this applies only to a purchase without a warranty but if there is a warranty that laws otherwise some however say even if there is a warranty the same law applies as the vendor may still say to him produce the distress warrant against you and I will indemnify you or who not said the payment for damages is either with money or with the best of the estate are not objected to or who not from the very that he should return shows that payment in kind is included even with brandis deals with a case where nothing else is available if nothing else is available is it not obvious you might have thought that we tell him to go and take the trouble to sell the brand and tender the plaintiff ready money it is therefore made known to us that this is not the case RC said money is on a PAR with land what is the legal bearing of this remark if to tell us what is best is this not practically what Arhuna said it may however refer to two heirs who divided an inheritance one taking the land and the other the money if then a creditor came and DIS tearing on the land it agreed there could come forward and share the money with his brother but is this not self-evident is the one a son to the deceased and the other one not a son there are some who argue quite the reverse the one brother may say to the other I have taken the money on the understanding that if it be stolen I should not be reimbursed by you and you also took the land on the understanding that if it be DIS tearing on there should be no restitution to you out of anything belonging to me it will Therefore refer to two heirs who divided lands among themselves after which a creditor came along and DIST reigned on the portion of one of them but has not RC already once enunciated this law for it was stated in the case of heirs who divided the land of the inheritance among themselves if a creditor came along and DIST reigned on the portion of one of them Rab said the original apportionment becomes null and void Samuel said the portion is waived but RC said the portion is refunded by a quarter in land or by a quarter in money Rab who said that the partition becomes null and void maintains that heirs even after having shared remain co Samuel who said that the portion is waived maintains that heirs after having shared stand to each other in the relationship of and each being in the position of a purchaser without a warranty of indemnity RC who said that the portion is refunded by a quarter in land or by a quarter in money is in doubt as to whether heirs after Having shared still remain coheres or stand in the relationship of entities and on account of that doubt there must be refunded a quarter in land or a quarter in money what then is the meaning of money is on a PAR with land in respect of being counted as best but if so is not this practically what Arhuna said read and so also said RC Arzera said on behalf of Arhuna for the performance of a commandment one should go up to a third a third of what Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi you could hardly suggest a third of one's possessions for if so when one chance to have three commandments to perform at one and the same time would one have to give up the whole of one's possessions Arzera therefore said for performing a commandment in an exemplary manner one should go up to a third of the ordinary expense involved in the observance thereof Arashi queried is it a third from within the ordinary expense or is it a third from the aggregate amount that stands undecided in the West? They said in the name of our Zerah to a third a man must perform it out of his own but from a third onwards he should perform it in accordance with the special portion the Holy One blessed be he has bestowed upon him Mishnah whenever I am under an obligation of controlling anything in my possession I am considered to have perpetrated any damage that may result when I am to blame for a part of the damage I am liable to compensate for the damage as if I had perpetrated the whole of the damage. The damaged property must be of a kind to which the law of sacrilege has no application the damaged property should belong to persons who are under the jurisdiction of the law the property should be owned the place of the damage is immaterial with the exception of premises owned by the defendant or premises owned jointly by the plaintiff and the defendant whenever damage has occurred the offender is liable to indemnify with the best of his estate tomorrow our rabbis taught whenever I am. Under an obligation of controlling anything in my possession I am considered to have perpetrated any damage that may result how is that when an ox or pit which was left with a deaf mute and insane person or a miner does damage the owner is liable to indemnify this however is not so with a fire with what kind of case are we here dealing if you say that the ox was chained and the pit covered which corresponds in the case of fire to a hot coal what difference is there between the one and it? Other if on the other hand the ox was loose and the pit uncovered which corresponds in the case of fire to a flame the statement this however is not so with the fire would here indicate exemption but surely Rush Lakish said in the name of Ezekiel they have not laid down the law of exemption unless there was handed over to him a coal which he has blown up but in the case of a flame there will be full liability the reason being that the danger is clear still the ox may have been chained and it. Pit covered and the fire likewise in a coal yet your contention why should we make a difference between the one and the other could be answered thus an ox is in the habit of loosening itself so also a pit is in the nature of getting uncovered but a hot coal the longer you leave it alone the more it will get cooler and cooler according to our Yohanan however who said that even when there has been handed over to him a flame the law of exemption applies the ox here would likewise be loose and it. Pit uncovered but why should we make a difference between the one and the other there in the case of the fire it is the handling of the deaf mute that causes the damage whereas here in the case of the ox and the pit it is not the handling of the deaf mute that causes the damage our rabbis taught there is an excess in the liability for ox over that for pit and there is on the other hand an excess in the liability for pit over that for ox the excess in the liability for ox over that. For pit is that ox involves payment of cover and the liability of 30 shekels for the killing of a slave when judgment for manslaughter is entered against ox it becomes vitiated for any use and it is in its habit to move about and do damage whereas all this is not so in the case of pit the excess in the liability for pit over that for ox is that pit is from its very inception a source of injury and is new of initio which is not so in the case of ox talmud mas baba kama there is an excess in the liability for ox over that for fire and there is on the other hand an excess in the liability for fire over that for ox the excess in the liability for ox over that for fire is that ox involves payment of cover and the liability of 30 shekels for the killing of a slave when judgment for manslaughter is entered against ox it becomes vitiated for any use if the owner handed it over to the care of a deaf mute and insane person or a minor he is still Responsible for any damage that may result, whereas all this is not so in the case of fire. The excess in the liability for fire over that for ox is that fire is new of initio, which is not so in the case of ox. There is an excess in the liability for fire over that for pit, and there is on the other hand an excess in the liability for pit over that for fire. The excess in the liability for pit over that for fire is that pit is from its very inception a source of injury if its owner handed it over to the care of a deaf mute and insane person or a minor. He is still responsible for any damage that may result, whereas all this is not so in the case of fire. The excess in the liability for fire over that for pit is that the nature of fire is to spread and do damage, and it is apt to consume both things fit for it and things unfit for it. Whereas all this is not so in the case of pit. Why not include in the excess of liability for ox over that for pit the fact that. Ox is also liable for damage done to inanimate objects which is not so in the case of pit the above barita is in accordance with Arjuna who enjoins payment for damage to inanimate objects also in the case of pit if it is in accordance with Arjuna look at the concluding clause the excess in the liability for fire over that for pit is that the nature of fire is to spread and do damage and it is apt to consume both things fit for it and things unfit for it whereas all this is not so. In the case of pit things fit for it are they not of wood things unfit for it are they not utensils now all this is not so in the case of pit but if the statement is in accordance with Arjuna did you not say that Arjuna enjoins payment for damage to inanimate objects also in the case of pit the barita is therefore indeed in accordance with the rabbis but it mentions some points and omits others what else does it omit that it omits that
move about and do damage when I have perpetrated a part of the damage. Our rabbis taught when I have perpetrated a part of the damage, I become liable for the compensation for the damage as if I had perpetrated the whole of the damage. How is that if one had dug a pit nine handbreadths deep and another came along and completed it to a depth of ten handbreadths, the latter person is liable? Now this ruling is not in accordance with rabbi, for it was taught if one had dug a pit nine handbreadths deep and another came along and completed it to a depth of ten handbreadths, the latter person is liable. Rabbi says the latter person is liable in cases of death, but both of them in cases of injury. Our papa said the Mishnah ruling deals with cases of death and is unanimous. Some read may we say that the Mishnah is not in accordance with rabbi. Our papa thereupon said it deals with cases of death and is unanimous. Are there Are there no other instances? Behold, there is a case where an ox was. Handed over to the care of five persons and one of them was careless so that the ox did damage that one is liable but in what circumstances if without the care of that one the ox could not be controlled is it not obvious that it is that one who perpetrated the whole of the damage if on the other hand even without the care of that one the ox could be controlled what if anything at all has that one perpetrated or she's hate however demurred behold there is a case where a man adds a bundle of dry twigs to an existing fire but in what circumstances Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi if without his cooperation the fire would not have spread is it not obvious that he is totally to blame if on the other hand even without his cooperation the fire would have spread what if anything at all has he perpetrated or Papa demurred behold there is that case which is taught five persons were sitting upon one bench and did not break it when however there came along one person more and sat upon it. Broke down the ladder is liable supposing him at it or Papa to have been as stout as Papa B. Abba but under what circumstances if without him the bench would not have broken is it not obvious that he is totally to blame if on the other hand without him it would also have broken what if anything at all has he perpetrated be this as it may how can the bury though be justified it could hold good when without the newcomer the bench would have broken after two hours whereas now it broke in one hour. They therefore can say to him if not for you we would have remained sitting a little while longer and would then have got up but why should he not say to them had you not been sitting there through me the bench would not have broken no it holds good when he did not sit at all on the bench but merely leaned upon them and the bench broke down is it not obvious that he is liable you might have argued damage done by a man's force is not comparable with that done directly by his body. Is therefore made known to us that a man is responsible for his force just as he is for his body, for whenever his body breaks anything, his force also participates in the damage. Are there no other instances? Behold, there is that which is taught when ten persons beat a man with ten sticks, whether simultaneously or successively, so that he died, none of them is guilty of murder or Judah B. But there is says if they hit successively, the last is liable, for he was the immediate cause of the death. Cases of murder are not dealt with here. You may also say that controversial cases are not dealt with. Are they not? Did not we suggest that the mission is not in accordance with Rabbi, that the mission is not in accordance with Rabbi, but in accordance with the Rabbis? We may suggest, whereas that it is in accordance with our Judah B. But there and not in accordance with the Rabbis, we are not inclined to suggest I am liable to compensate for the damage, I become liable for the replacement of the damages. Not stated but to compensate for the damage we have thus learned here that which the rabbis taught elsewhere to compensate for damage imports that the owner's plaintiffs have to retain the carcass as part payment what is the authority for this ruling RMI said scripture states he that killeth a beast yashalmena shall make it good do not read yashalmena he shall pay for it but yashalmena he shall complete its sufficiency arkahana infers it from the following if it be torn in pieces let him bring compensation up to add the value of the carcass he shall not make good that which was torn up to the value of the carcass he must pay but for the carcass itself he has not to pay hezekiah infers it from the following and the dead shall be his own which refers to the plaintiff it has similarly been taught in the school of hezekiah and the dead shall be his own refers to the plaintiff you say the plaintiff why not the defendant you may safely assert this is not the case why is this not the case? Abay said, if you assume that the carcass must remain with the defendant, why did not the divine law stating he shall surely pay ox for ox stop at that? Why write at all? And the dead shall be his own. This shows that it refers to the plaintiff, and all the quotations serve each its specific purpose. For if the divine law had laid down this ruling only in the verse, he that killeth a beast shall make it good, the reason of the ruling would have been assigned to the infrequency of the occurrence. Whereas in the case of an animal torn in pieces by wild beasts, which is comparatively a frequent occurrence, the opposite view might have been held. Hence, special reference is essential. If on the other hand, this ruling had been made known to us only in the case of an animal torn in pieces, it would have been explained by the fact that the damage there was done by an indirect agency. Whereas in the case of a man killing a beast, where the damage was done by a direct agency. The opposite view might have been held again were this ruling intimated in both cases it would have been explained in the one case on account of its infrequency and in the other account of the indirect agency whereas in the damage to which and the dead shall be his own refers which is both frequent and direct an opposite view might have been taken if on the other hand this ruling had been intimated only in the case referred to by and the dead shall be his own it would have been explained by the fact of the damage having been done only by man's possession whereas in cases where the damage resulted from man's person an opposite view might have been taken hence all quotations are essential Arkahana said to rab the reason for the ruling is that the divine law says and the dead shall be his own and but for this I might have thought that the carcass shall remain with the defendant yet how can this be if when there are with him several carcasses he is entitled to pay him with them for the master stated he shall return includes payment in kind even with brand what question then about the carcass of his own animal no the verse is required only for the law regarding the decrease of the value of the carcass may we say that the decrease of the value of the carcass is a point at issue between tanatic authorities for it has been taught if it be torn in pieces let him bring it for witness talmud mas baba kama let him bring witnesses that it had been torn by sheer accident and free himself abyssal says let him in all cases bring the torn animal to the court now is not the following the point at issue the latter maintains that a decrease in value of the carcass will be sustained by the plaintiff whereas the former view takes it to be sustained by the defendant no it is unanimously held that the decrease will be sustained by the plaintiff here however the trouble of providing for bringing up the carcass from the pit is the point at issue as indeed taught Others say whence could it be derived that it is upon the owner of the pit to bring up the damaged ox from his pit we derive it from the text money shall he return unto to the owner and the dead beast of a said to Rabba what does this trouble about the carcass mean if the value of the carcass in the pit is one zoos whereas on the banks its value will be four zoos is he not taking the trouble of bringing up the carcass solely in his own interest he Rabba however said no it applies. When in the pit its value is one zoos and on the banks its value is similarly one zoos but is such a thing possible yes as the popular adage has it a beam in town cost a zoos and a beam in a field cost a zoos Samuel said no assessment is made in theft and robbery but in cases of damage I however maintain that the same applies to borrowing and Abba agrees with me it was therefore asked did he mean to say that to borrowing the law of assessment does apply and Abba agrees with me or did he perhaps Mean to say that to borrowing the law of assessment does not apply and Abba agrees with me come and hear a certain person borrowed an axe from his neighbor and broke it he came before Rab who said to him go and pay the lender for his sound axe now can you not prove hence that the law of assessment does not apply to borrowing on the contrary for since Arkahana and RC interposed and said to Rab is this really the law and no reply followed we can conclude that assessment is made it has been stated Ula said on behalf of our Eliezer assessment is also made in case of theft and robbery but our poppy said that no assessment is made in these cases the law is no assessment is made in theft and robbery but assessment is made in cases of borrowing in accordance with Arkahana and RC Ula further said on behalf of our Eliezer when a placenta comes out from a woman partly on one day and partly on the next day the counting of the days of impurity commences with the first day of the emergence Rabbah however said to him what is in your mind to take the stricter course is not this a strictness that will lead to lenient since you will have to declare her pure by reckoning from the first day Rabbah therefore said out of mere apprehension notice is taken of the first day to be considered impure but actual counting commences only with the second day what is a new point made known to us that even a part of an emerging placenta
By delivery he follows another tanna for it has been taught the rabbis say both one and the other are acquired by pulling our Simeon says both one and the other by lifting up all further said on behalf of our Eliezer in the case of heirs who are about to divide the estate among themselves whatever is worn by them will also be assessed and taken into account but that which is worn by their sons and daughters is not assessed and not taken into account our Papa said there are circumstances. When even that which is worn by the ears themselves is not assessed, this exception applies to the eldest of the ears as it is in the interest of them all that his words should be respected. Ola further said on behalf of our Eliezer, one Billy handing over his charge to another Billy does not incur thereby any liability. This ruling unquestionably applies to an unpaid Billy handing over his charge to a paid Billy, in which case there is a definite improvement in the care, but even when a paid Billy hands over his charge to an unpaid Billy, where there is definitely a decrease in the care, still he thereby incurs no liability since he transfers his charge to a responsible person. Rabbah, however, said one Billy handing over his charge to another Billy becomes liable for all consequences. This ruling unquestionably holds good in the case of a paid Billy handing over his charge to an unpaid Billy, where there is a definite decrease in the care, but even when an unpaid Billy hands over his Charged to a paid billy where there is definitely an improvement in the care still he becomes liable for all consequences as the depositor may say to the original billy you would be trusted by me should occasion demand an oath from you but your substitute would not be trusted by me in the oath which he may be required to take all further said on behalf of our Eliezer the laws that the strength may be made on slaves said our nominal did our Eliezer apply the statement even in the case of heirs of the debtor no only to the debtor himself to the debtor himself could not a debt be collected even from the cloak upon his shoulder we are dealing here with a case where a slave was mortgaged as in the case stated by Rabba for Rabba said where a debtor mortgaged his slave and then sold him to another person the creditor may dis tearing on him in the hands of the purchaser but where an ox was mortgaged and afterwards sold the creditor cannot dis tearing on it in the hands of it. Purchaser the reason for the distinction being that in the former case the transaction of the mortgage aroused public interest whereas in the latter case no public interest was aroused Talmud, Mas Baba Kama after Arnaman went out Ola said to the audience the statement made by Arnaman refers even to the case of heirs Arnaman said Ola escaped my criticism a case of this kind arose in Nihardia and the judges of Nihardia dist reigned on slaves in the hands of heirs a further case took place in Pumadiva and Arhanabi Bizna dist reigned on slaves in the hands of heirs but Arnaman said to them go and withdraw your judgments otherwise I will dist reign on your own homes to reimburse the aggrieved heirs Rabba however said to Arnaman there is Ola there is Arnaman there are the judges of Nihardia and there is Arhanabi Bizna who are all joining issue with you what authorities is the master following he said to him I know of very the Farabami learned to is. Effective only when there is realty belonging to the debtor but not when he possesses slaves only personality is transferred along with realty but not along with slaves may we not say that this problem is a point at issue between the following tanaim for it was taught where slaves and lands are sold if possession is taken of the slaves no title is thereby acquired to the land and similarly by taking possession of the lands no title is acquired to the slaves in the case of lands and chattels if possession is taken of the lands title is also acquired to the chattels but by taking possession of the chattels no title is acquired to the lands in the case of slaves and chattels if possession is taken of the slaves no title is thereby acquired to the chattels and similarly by taking possession of the chattels no title is acquired to the slaves but elsewhere it has been taught if possession is taken of the slaves the title is thereby acquired to the chattels now is not this Problem the point at issue the latter Beritha maintains that slaves are considered realty in the eye of the law whereas the former Beritha is of the opinion that slaves are considered personality R.I.K. the son of R.M.I. however said generally speaking all authorities agree that slaves are considered realty the latter Beritha stating that the transfer of the chattels is effective is certainly in agreement the former Beritha stating that the transfer of the chattels is ineffective may maintain that the realty we require is such as shall resemble the fortified cities of Judah and being immovable for we have learned property which is not realty may be acquired incidentally with property which is realty through the medium of either purchase money bill of sale or taking possession and it has been asked what is the authority for this ruling and Hezekiah thereupon said scripture states and their father gave them great gifts of silver and of gold and of precious Things with fortified cities in Judah. Alternatively, there are some who report R.I.K. the son of R.M.I. said generally speaking, all authorities agree that slaves are considered personality. The former Beritha stating that the transfer of the chattels is ineffective is certainly in agreement. The latter Beritha stating that the transfer of the chattels is effective deals with the case when the chattels sold were worn by the slave, but even if they were worn by him, what does it matter? He is but property in motion, and property in motion cannot be the means of conveying anything it carries. Moreover, even if you argue that the slave was then stationary, did not Rabba say that whatsoever cannot be the means of conveying while in motion cannot be the means of conveying even while in the state of standing or sitting. This law applies to the case where the slave was put in stocks, but behold, has it not been taught if possession is taken of the land title is thereby acquired also to the Slaves there the slaves were gathered on the land this implies that the Beritha which stated that the transfer of the slaves is ineffective deals with a case where the slaves were not gathered on the land that is all very well according to the version that R.I.K. the son of R.M.I. said that slaves are considered personality there is thus the stipulation that if they were gathered on the land the transfer is effective otherwise ineffective but according to the version which reads that slaves are considered realty why the stipulation that the slaves be gathered on the land Talmud, Mas Baba Kambi did not Samuel say that if ten fields in ten different countries are sold as soon as possession is taken of one of them the transfer of all of them becomes effective but even if your reasoning be followed that it is in accordance with the version reading that slaves are considered personality why again the stipulation that the slaves be gathered on the land has it not been established that the personality need not be gathered on the land you can therefore only say that there is a distinction in law between movable personality and immovable personality likewise here also we say there is a distinction in law between movable realty and immovable realty slaves if realty are movable realty whereas there in the case of the ten fields land is but one block the damaged property must be of a kind to which the law of sacrilege has no application etc so long as the penalty of sacrilege does not apply who is the ten of this view are Yohanan said this is so in the case of minor sacrifices according to our Jose the Galilean who considers them to be private property for it has been taught if a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbor this indicates also minor sacrifices as these are considered private property so are Jose the Galilean but behold we have learned if one betrothes a woman by means of the priestly portion whether of major Sacrifices or of minor sacrifices of betrothal is not valid. Are we to say that this mission is not in accordance with our Jose the Galilean? You may even reconcile it with our Jose the Galilean, for our Jose the Galilean confines his remark to sacrifices that are still alive, whereas in the case of sacrifices that have already been slaughtered, even our Jose the Galilean agrees that those who are entitled to partake of the flesh acquire this right as guests at the divine table. But so long as the sacrifice is still alive, does he really maintain that it is private property? Behold, we have learned the firstling if unblemished may be sold only while alive, but if blemished it may be sold both while alive and when slaughtered, it may similarly be used for the betrothal of a woman. And our nomin said on behalf of Rabbi Abu this is so only in the case of the firstling at the present time, in which on account of the fact that it is not destined to be sacrificed, the priests possess a proprietary. Right, but at the time when the temple still existed, when it would have been destined to be sacrificed, the law would not have been so. And Rabbi asked Arnaman, was it not taught if a soul sin and committed trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbor? This indicates also minor sacrifices, as these are considered private property. This is the view of our Jose the Galilean. And Rabbi replied that the latter case deals with firstlings from outside Palestine and is in accordance with our Simeon, who maintains that if they were brought to Palestine in an unblemished condition, they will be sacrificed. Now, this is so only if they were brought to Palestine, which implies that there is no necessity to bring them there in the first instance for that specific purpose. Now, if it is a f
Redeem it may, however, if unblemished be sold while alive, and if blemished it may be sold alive or slaughtered. In the case of the tithe, it is stated it shall not be redeemed, and it can be sold neither alive nor slaughtered, neither when unblemished nor when blemished. Rubin connected all the above discussion with the concluding clause. Abba Jose B. Dust I said that Ben is a meant to include only the firstling. What does he mean to exclude? It can hardly be peace offerings for if the firstling, which is holy from the very moment it opens a matrix, is private property. What question could there be about peace offerings? Are you and therefore said he meant to exclude the tithe as taught in regard to the firstling? It is stated thou shalt not redeem it may, however, if unblemished be sold while alive, and if blemished it may be sold alive or slaughtered. In regard to the tithe, it is stated it shall not be redeemed, and it can be sold neither while alive nor when slaughtered, neither when. Unblemished nor blemished, but does he not say the firstling alone is a difficulty? Indeed, Rabbah on the other hand said what is meant by the damaged property must be of a kind to which the law of sacrilege has no application is that the property is not of a class to which the law of sacrilege may have any reference but is such as is owned privately. But why does not the text say private property? This is a difficulty. Indeed, Rabbah said in the case of peace offerings that did damage payment will be made out of their flesh, but no payment could be made out of their emurim. Is it not obvious that the emurim will go up and be burnt on the altar? No, we require to be told that no payment will be made out of the flesh for the proportion due from the emurim, but according to whose authority is this ruling made? If according to the rabbis, is this not obvious? Do they not maintain that when payment cannot be recovered from one party, it is not requisite to make it up from the other party if According to our Nathan, it is certainly otherwise, for did he not say that when no payment can be made from one party, it has to be made up from the other party? If you wish, you may say the ruling was made in accordance with our Nathan, or if you wish, you may say that it was made in accordance with the rabbis, you may say that it was made in accordance with the rabbis, for their ruling is confined to a case where the damage was done by two separate agencies, whereas in the case of one agency, the plaintiff may be justified in demanding payment from whatever source he finds it convenient. Alternatively, you may say that the ruling was made in accordance with our Nathan, for it is only there in the case of an ox pushing another's ox in a pit that the owner of the damaged ox is entitled to say to the owner of the pit, I have found my ox in your pit, whatever is not paid to me by your co-defendant must be made up by you, Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi, but in the case in hand, could the plaintiff say that? Flesh did the damage and the emurim did no damage. Rabbi said in the case of a thanksgiving offering that did damage payment will be made out of the flesh, but no payment could be made out of its bread. Bread is this not obvious? He wanted to lead up to the concluding clause. The plaintiff partakes of the flesh while he for whose atonement the offering is dedicated has to bring the bread. Is not this also obvious? You might have thought that since the bread is but an accessory to the sacrifice, the defendant may be entitled to say to the plaintiff, if you will partake of the flesh, why should I bring the bread? It is therefore made known to us that this is not the case, but that the bread is an obligation upon the original owner of the sacrifice. The damaged property should belong to persons who are under the jurisdiction of the law. What person is thereby meant to be accepted if a heathen is not this explicitly stated further on an ox of an Israelite that Gordon ox of a heathen is? Not subject to the general law of liability for damage that which has first been taught by implication is subsequently explained explicitly the property should be owned what is thereby accepted Rab Judah said it accepts the case of alternative defendants when the one pleads it was your ox that did the damage and the other pleads it was your ox that did the damage but is not this explicitly stated further on if two oxen pursue another ox and one of the defendants pleads it was your ox that did the damage and the other defendant pleads it was your ox that did the damage no liability could be attached to either of them what is first taught by implication is subsequently explained explicitly in a very that it has been taught the exception refers to ownerless property but in what circumstances it can hardly be where an owned ox an ownerless ox for who is there to institute an action if on the other hand an ownerless ox an owned ox why not go and take possession of it Ownerless doer of the damage somebody else has meanwhile stepped in and already acquired title to it. Rubin said it accepts an ox which gored and subsequently became consecrated or an ox which gored and afterwards became ownerless. It has also been taught thus moreover said our Judah even if after having gored the ox was consecrated by the owner or after having gored it was declared by him ownerless he is exempt as it is said and it hath been testified to his owner and he hath not kept it in but it hath killed a man or a woman the ox shall be stoned that is so only where conditions are the same at the time of both the manslaughter and the appearance before the court does not the final verdict also need to comply with the same condition surely the very verse the ox shall be stoned circumscribes also the final verdict read therefore that is so only when conditions are the same at the time of the manslaughter and the appearance before the court and the final verdict with the exception. A premises owned by the defendant because he may argue against the plaintiff what was your ox doing on my premises or premises owned jointly by plaintiff and defendant are his dasset on behalf of Abami where damage is done in jointly owned courts there is liability for tooth and foot and the Mishnah text is to be read thus with the exception of premises owned by the defendant where there is exemption but in the case of premises owned jointly by plaintiff and defendant whenever damage has occurred the offender is liable or Eliezer on the other hand said there is no liability there for tooth and foot and the text is to be understood thus with the exception of premises owned by the defendant or a premises owned jointly by plaintiff and defendant where there is also exemption but whenever damage has occurred otherwise the offender is liable etc introduces horn this would be in conformity with Samuel but according to Rab who affirmed that ox in the Mishnah text was intended to include all kinds of damage done by ox what was meant to be introduced by the clause the offender is liable to introduce that which our rabbis have taught whenever damage has occurred the offender is liable introduces liability in the case of a paid billy and a borrower an unpaid billy and a hire where the animal in their charge did damage tam paying half damages and muad paying full damages if however a wall broke open at night or robbers took it by force and it went out and did damage there is exemption the master said whenever damage has occurred the offender is liable introduces liability in the case of an unpaid billy and a borrower a paid billy and a hire under what circumstances if the ox of the lender damaged the ox of the borrower why should not the former say to the latter if my ox had damaged somebody else's you would surely have had to compensate now that my ox has damaged your own ox how can you claim compensation from me again if the ox of the borrower damaged the ox of the lender why should not the latter say to the former if my ox had been damaged by somebody else's you would surely have had to compensate me for the full value of the ox now that the damage resulted from your ox how can you offer me half damages it must therefore still be that the ox of the lender damaged the ox of the borrower but we deal with the case where he the borrower has taken upon himself responsibility for the safety of the ox Talmud, Mas Baba Kama but not responsibility for any damage that it may do if so explain the concluding clause if a wall broke open at night or if robbers took it by force and it went out and did damage there is exemption from this it may surely be inferred that if this had happened in the daytime the borrower would have been liable why so if he did not take upon himself responsibility for any damage that it may do the meaning must be as follows but if he has taken upon himself responsibility for damage that it May do he would be liable to compensate yet if a wall broke open at night or if robbers took it by force and it went out and did damage there is exemption in such a case as it really so did not our Joseph learn in the case of jointly owned premises or in there is liability for tooth and for foot is not this a refutation of our Eliezer our Eliezer may answer you as follows do you really think so our Barith is not divided in their opinions on the matter for it was taught for general rules. Were stated by our Simeon B. Eliezer to apply to the laws of torts in the case of damage done in premises owned by the plaintiff and not at all by the defendant there is liability in all if owned by the defendant and not at all by the plaintiff there is total exemption but if owned by the one and the other e.g. jointly owned premises or a valley there is exemption for tooth and for foot whereas for goring pushing biting falling down and kicking tam pays half damages and muad pays full damages if not owned by the one and the other e.g. premises not belonging to them both there is liability for tooth and for foot whereas for goring pushing biting falling down and kicking tam pays half damages and muad pays full damages it has thus been taught here that in the case
Indeed it is so if however you think that they are divided in their views the objection of Arzera and the answer of Abbe form the point at issue to revert to the above text for general rules were stated by Arsimian B. Eliezer to apply to the laws of torts where damage is done in premises owned by the plaintiff and not at all by the defendant there is liability in all it is not stated for all but in all i.e. in the whole of the damage is it not in accordance with Artarfan who maintains that the unusual damage occasioned by horn in the plaintiff's premises will be compensated in full rent. However, the concluding clause, if not owned by the one and the other, e.g., premises not belonging to them, both there is liability for tooth and for foot. Now, what is the meaning of not owned by the one and the other? It could hardly mean owned neither by the one nor by the other, but by somebody else. For have we not to comply with the requirement and it feed in another man's field which is lacking in this case? It means, therefore, of course, not owned by them both, but exclusively by the plaintiff. And yet, it is stated in the concluding clause, Tam pays half damages and Muad pays full damages, which follows the view of the rabbis who maintain that the unusual damage occasioned by horn in the plaintiff's premises will still be compensated only by half damages. Will the commencing clause be according to Artarfan and the concluding clause according to the rabbis? Yes, even as Samuel said to Rab Judah. Shine leave this Baritha alone and follow my view that the commencement of the Baritha is according to Artarfan and its conclusion according to the Rabbis Rabbana however said in the name of Rabbah the whole Baritha is according to Artarfan what is meant by not owned by the one and the other is that the right of keeping fruits there is owned not by both the one and the other but exclusively by the plaintiff whereas the right of keeping cattle there is owned by both the one and the other in the case of tooth the premises are in practice the plaintiff's ground whereas in the case of horn they are jointly owned ground if so how are the rules four in number are they not only three are nomin b Isaac replied Talmud, Mas Baba Kama b the rules are three in number but the places to which they apply may be divided into formation the valuation is made in money but may be paid by money's worth in the presence of the court and on the evidence of witnesses who are free men and persons under the jurisdiction of the law, women are also subject to the law of torts. Both the plaintiff and defendant are involved in the payment. Tomorrow, what is the meaning of the valuation in money? Rab Judah said this valuation must be made only in specie. We thus learn here that which has been taught by our rabbis elsewhere in the case of a cow damaging a garment. While the garment also damaged the cow, it should not be said that the damage done by the cow is to be set off against the damage done to the garment and the damage done to the garment against the damage done to the cow. The respective damages have to be estimated at a money value by money's worth. This is explained by what our rabbis taught elsewhere. Money's worth implies that the court will not have recourse for distraint save to immovable property. Nevertheless, if the plaintiff himself seized some chattels beforehand, the court will collect payment for him out of them. The master stated money's worth implies that the court. Will not have recourse for distraint save to immovable property. How is this implied? Rabbi Biola said the article of distress has to be worth all that is paid for it in money. What does this mean? An article which is not subject to the law of deception are not slaves and deeds also not subject to the law of deception. Rabbi Biola therefore said an article title to which is acquired by means of money are not slaves and deeds similarly acquired by means of money are ashi therefore said money's worth implies that which has money's worth whereas chattels are considered actual money. Rabbi Judah behind and pointed out the following contradiction to our the son of our Joshua it has been taught money's worth implies that the court will not have recourse for distraint save to immovable property. Behold was it not taught he shall return includes money's worth even brand in the former bury that we are dealing with the case of ears if we are dealing with ears read the concluding clause of it. Plaintiff himself seized some chattels beforehand, the court will collect payment for him out of them. Now, if we are dealing with theirs, how may the court collect payment for him out of them? As already elsewhere stated by Rabbah on behalf of Arnam, and that the plaintiff seized the chattels while the original defendant was still alive. So here too the seizure took place while the defendant was still alive in the presence of the court. Apparently exempts a case where the defendant sold his possessions before having been summoned to court. May it hence be derived that in the case of one who borrowed money and sold his possessions before having been summoned to court, the court does not collect the debt out of the estate which has been disposed of the text, therefore accepts a court of limit on the evidence of witnesses, thus accepting a confession of an act punishable by a fine for which subsequently there appeared witnesses, in which case there is exemption that would accord with. The view that in the case of a confession of an act punishable by a fine for which subsequently there appeared witnesses there is exemption but according to the opposite view that in the case of a confession of an act punishable by a fine for which subsequently appeared witnesses there is liability what may be said to be the import of the text the important point comes in the concluding clause Talmud, Mas Baba Kama free men and persons under the jurisdiction of the law free men. Exclude slaves persons under the jurisdiction of the law excludes heathens moreover it was essential to exclude each of them for if the exemption had been stated only in reference to a slave we would have thought it was on account of his lack of legal pedigree whereas a heathen who possesses a legal pedigree might perhaps have been thought not to have been excluded had on the other hand the exemption been referred only to a heathen we should have thought it was on account of his not being. Subject to the commandments of the law, whereas a slave who is subject to the commandments might have been thought not to have been excluded, it was thus essential to exclude each of them independently. Women are also subject to the law of torts whence is derived this ruling. Rab Judah said on behalf of Rab, and so was it also taught at the school of our Ishmael. Scripture states when a man or woman shall commit any sin, Scripture has thus made woman and man equal regarding all the penalties of it. Law in the school of Eliezer it was taught now these are the ordinances which thou shalt set before them. Scripture has thus made woman and man equal regarding all the judgments of the law. The school of Hezekiah and Hosea the Galilean taught Scripture says it hath killed a man or a woman. Scripture has thus made woman and man equal regarding all the laws of manslaughter in the Torah. Moreover, all the quotations are necessary. Had only the first inference been drawn, I might have said that the Divine law exercised mercy towards her so that she should also have the advantage of atonement whereas judgments which concern as a rule man who is engaged in business should not include woman again were only the inference regarding judgments to have been made we might perhaps have said that woman should also not be deprived of a livelihood whereas the law of atonement should be confined to man as it is he who is subject to all commandments but should not include woman since she is not subject to all the commandments moreover were even these two inferences to have been available we might have said that the one is on account of atonement and the other on account of livelihood whereas regarding manslaughter it might have been thought that it is only in the case of man who is subject to all commandments that compensation for the loss of life must be made but this should not be the case with woman again were the inference only made in the case of compensation for manslaughter it might have been thought to apply only where there is loss of human life whereas in the other two cases where no loss of human life is involved I might have said that man and woman are not on the same footing the independent inferences were thus essential the plaintiff and defendant are involved in the payment it has been stated the liability of half damages is said by our papa to be civil whereas our Huna, the son of our Joshua considers it to be penal our papa said that it is civil for he maintains that average cattle cannot control themselves not to gore strict justice should therefore demand full payment in case of damage it was only divine law that exercised mercy and released half payment on account of the fact that the cattle have not yet become Muad Arhuna the son of our Joshua who said that it is penal on the other hand maintains that average cattle can control themselves not to gore justice should really require no payment at all it was divine law that imposed upon the owner a fine in case of damage so that additional care should be taken of cattle we have learned the plaintiff and the defendant are involved in payment that is all very well according to the opinion which maintains that the liability of half damages is civil the plaintiff who receives only half his due is thus indeed involved in the payment but according to the opinion that the liability of half damages is penal in which case the plaintiff is given that which is really not his due how is he involved in the payment this may apply to the loss caused by a decrease in the value of the carcass which is sustained by the plaintiff a decrease in the value of the carcass has not this ruling been laid down in a previous mission to compensate for the damage implying that the owner's plaintiffs have to retain the carcass as part payment one mission gives the law in the case of tam whereas the other deals with muad moreover these independent indications are of importance for worthy Ruling laid down only in
In either case a liability to compensate is established by this admission. Now does this admission not deal with the case of Tam no only with Muad but what is the law in the case of Tam would it really be the fact that no liability is established by admission if this be the case why state in the concluding clause by Ox killed a slave no liability is created by this admission why indeed not indicate the distinction in the very same case by stating the rule that liability is established by mere admission is confined to Muad whereas in the case of Tam no liability is created by mere admission the mission all through deals with Muad come and here this is the general rule in all cases where the payment is more than the actual damage done no liability is created by mere admission now does this not indicate that in cases where the payment is less than the damage the liability will be established even by mere admission no this is so only when the payment corresponds exactly to the Amount of the damages, but what is the law in the case where the payment is less than the damage? Would it really be the fact that no liability is established by admission? If this be the case, why state this is the general rule in all cases where the payment is more than the actual damage done? No liability is created by mere admission. Why not state simply this is the general rule in all cases where the payment does not correspond exactly to the amount of the damages, which would both imply less and imply more? This is indeed a refutation. Still, the law is definite that the liability of half damages is penal. But if this opinion was refuted, how could it stand as a fixed law? Yes, the sole basis of the refutation is in the fact that the Mishnah text does not run where the payment does not correspond exactly to the amount of the damages. This wording would, however, be not altogether accurate, as there is a liability of half damages in the case of pebbles, which is in accordance with a. Policy tradition held to be civil on account of this fact the suggested text has not been adopted now that you maintain the liability of half damages to be penal the case of a dog devouring lambs or a cat devouring hens is an unusual occurrence and no distress will be executed in Babylon provided however the lambs and hens were big for if they were small the occurrence would be usual should however the plaintiff sees chattels belonging to the defendant it would not be possible for us to dispossess him of them so also were the plaintiff to plead fix me a definite time for bringing my case to be heard in the land of Israel we would have to fix it for him were the other party to refuse to obey that order we should have to excommunicate him but in any case we have to excommunicate him until he abates the nuisance in accordance with the dictum of our Nathan for it was taught our Nathan says whence is it derived that nobody should breed a bad dog in his house or keep an impaired ladder in his house we learn it from the text thou bring not blood upon thine house m-i-s-h-n-a-h there are five cases of tam and five cases of muad animal i-s muad neither to gore nor to collide nor to bite nor to fall down nor to kick tooth however i-s muad to consume whatever is fit for it foot i-s muad to break things in the course of walking ox after becoming muad ox doing damage on the plaintiff's premises and man so also the wolf the lion the bear the leopard the bart alice panther and the snake are muad our eliezer says if they have been tamed they are not muad the snake however is always muad gemara considering that it is stated tooth i-s muad to consume it must be assumed that we are dealing with a case where the damage has been done on the plaintiff's premises it is also stated animal i-s muad neither to gore meaning that the compensation will not be in full but only half damages will be paid which is in accordance with the rabbis who say that for the unusual Damage done by horn even on the plaintiff's premises only half damages will be paid right now the concluding clause ox after having become muad ox doing damage on the plaintiff's premises and man which is in accordance with our tarfan who said that for the unusual damage done by horn on the plaintiff's premises full compensation must be paid is the commencing clause according to the rabbis and the concluding clause according to our tarfan yes and samuel said to rab judah shinah leave it mission alone and follow my view the commencing clause is in accordance with the rabbis and the concluding clause is in accordance with our tarfan our eliezer in the name of rab however said talmud mas baba comma the whole mission is in accordance with our tarfan the commencing clause deals with premises set aside for the keeping of the plaintiff's fruits whereas both plaintiff and defendant may keep their, their cattle in respect of tooth the premises are considered in the eye of the law the Plaintiffs whereas in respect of horn they are considered their common premises are Kahana said I repeated the statement in the presence of Arzibad of Nihartia and he answered me how can you say that the whole Mishnah is in accordance with Artarfan has it not been stated tooth as Muad to consume whatever is fit for IT that which is fit for it is included but that which is unfit for it is not included but did not Artarfan say that for the unusual damage done by horn on the plaintiff's premises. Full compensation must be paid it must therefore still be maintained that the Mishnah is in accordance with the rabbis but there are some phrases missing there the reading should be thus there are five cases of Tam all the five of them may eventually become Muad tooth and foot are however Muad of initio and their liability is confined to damage done on the plaintiff's premises Rabbin Adimur we learn later on what is meant by the statement ox doing damage on the plaintiff's premises etc. It is all very well if you say that this damage has previously been dealt with we may then well ask what is meant by it but if you say that this damage has never been dealt with previously how could it be asked what is meant by it Rabbana therefore said the mission is indeed incomplete but its meaning is this there are five cases of Tam all the five of them may eventually become Muad tooth and foot are Muad of initio in this way ox is definitely Muad as to ox doing damage on the plaintiffs. Premises there is a difference of opinion between Artarfan and the rabbis there are other damage doers which like these cases are similarly Muad as follows the wolf the lion the bear the leopard the panther and the snake this very text has indeed been taught there are five cases of Tam all the five of them may eventually become Muad tooth and foot are Muad of initio in this way ox is definitely Muad as to ox doing damage on the plaintiffs premises there is a difference of opinion between R. Tarfan and the rabbis there are other damage doers which like these are similarly muad as follows the wolf the lion the bear the leopard the panther and the snake some arrived at the same interpretation by having first raised the following objection we learned there are five cases of tam and five cases of muad are there no further instances behold there are the wolf the lion the bear the leopard the panther and the snake the reply was rabbinah said the mission is incomplete and its reading should be as follows there are five cases of tam all the five of them may eventually become muad tooth and foot are muad of initio in this way ox is definitely muad as to ox doing damage on the plaintiff's premises there is a difference of opinion between our tarfan and the rabbis there are other damage doers which like these are similarly muad as follows the wolf the lion the bear the leopard the panther and the snake nor to fall down our eliezer said this is so only when it falls down on Large pitchers, but in the case of small pitchers, it is a usual occurrence. May we support him from the following teaching animal is muad to walk in the usual manner and to break or crush a human being or an animal or utensils. This, however, may mean through contact sideways. Some read our Eliezer said, Do not think that it is only in the case of large pitchers that it is unusual, whereas in the case of small pitchers, it is usual. It is not so, for even in the case of small pitchers, it is unusual. And objection was brought or crush a human being or an animal or utensils. This may perhaps mean through contact sideways. Some arrived at the same conclusion by having first raised the following objection we have learned nor to fall down, but was it not taught or crush a human being or an animal or utensils? Our Eliezer replied, There is no contradiction. The former statement deals with the case of large pitchers, whereas the latter deals with small pitchers, the wolf, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the Bartalis Panther, what is Bartalis Rab Judah said Nafraza, what is Nafraza, our Joseph said Apia, an objection was raised, our Mayor adds also the Zabuay, our Eliezer adds also the snake, now our Joseph said that Zabuay means Apia, this however is no contradiction for the latter appellation, Zabuay refers to the male, whereas the former Bartalis refers to the female as taught elsewhere, the male Zabuay hyena after seven years turns into a bat, the bat after seven years turns into an arpit, the arpit. After seven years turns into Kimosh, the Kimosh after seven years turns into a thorn, the thorn after seven years turns into a demon, the spine of a man after seven years turns into a snake, should he not bow while reciting the benediction, we give thanks unto thee, the master said, our Mayor adds also the Zabuay Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi, our Eliezer adds also the snake, but have we not learned, our Eliezer says if they had been tamed, they are not muad, the snake however is always muad, read the snake Samuel. Said in the case of a lion on public ground seizing and devouring an
The case of Samuel, why not make the same supposition? Arnaman B. Isaac therefore said alternative cases are dealt with in the Baritha if it either tears to pieces for the purpose of preservation or seizes and devours it. The payment must be in full. Rubina, however, said that Samuel dealt with the case of a tame lion and was following the view of R. Eliezer that that was unusual with such a lion. If so, even in the case of seizing, there should be liability. Rubina's statement has therefore no reference to Samuel's case but to the Baritha which we must thus suppose to deal with the tame lion and to follow the view of R. Eliezer that that was unusual with such a lion. If so, no more than half damages should be paid. The lion dealt with has already become mad. If so, why has this Baritha been taught in conjunction with the secondary kinds of tooth, whereas it should have been taught in conjunction with the secondary kinds of horn? This is indeed a difficulty. M. I. S. H. N. A. H. What is it? Difference in law between Tam and Muad in the case of Tam only half damages are paid and only out of the body of the tort fees and cattle whereas in the case of Muad full payment is made out of Aliyah the best of the estate tomorrow what is Aliyah R. Eliezer said the best of the defendants estate as stated in scripture and Hezekiah slept with his fathers and they buried him Bimaili in the best of the sepulchres of the sons of David and R. Eliezer said Bimaili means near the best of the family i.e. David and Solomon regarding King Asa it is stated and they buried him in his own sepulchres which he had made for himself in the city of David and laid him in the bed which was filled with Bisamine Uzenim sweet odors and divers kinds of spices what is Bisamine Uzenim R. Eliezer said divers kinds of spices but R. Samuel Binamani said sense which incite all those who smell them to immorality regarding Jeremiah it is stated for they have digged a ditch to take me and it snares for my feet. R. Eliezer said they maliciously accused him of having illicit intercourse with a harlot, but R. Samuel B. Namani said they maliciously accused him of having immoral connections with another man's wife. No difficulty arises if we accept the view that the accusation was concerning a harlot, since it is written for a harlot is a deep ditch, but according to the view that the accusation was concerning another man's wife, how is this expressed in the term ditch employed in? Jeremiah's complaint is that another man's wife, when committing adultery, excluded from the general term of harlot. On the other hand, there is no difficulty on the view that the accusation was concerning another man's wife, for scripture immediately afterwards says, Yet, Lord, thou knowest all their counsel against me to slay me, but according to the view that the accusation was concerning a harlot, how did they thereby intend to slay him? This they did by throwing him into a pit of my rabbi. Gave the following exposition what is the meaning of the concluding verse but let them be overthrown before thee deal thus with them in the time of thine anger Jeremiah thus addressed the Holy One blessed be he Lord of the universe even when they are prepared to do charity cause them to be frustrated by people unworthy of any consideration so that no reward be forthcoming to them for that charity to come back to Hezekiah regarding whom it is stated and they did him honor at his death this signifies that they set up a college near his sepulchre there was a difference of opinion between our Nathan and the rabbis one said for three days Talmud, Mas Baba Kamae and the other said for seven days others however said for thirty days our rabbis taught and they did him honor at his death in the case of Hezekiah the king of Judah means that there marched before him thirty six thousand warriors with bare shoulders this is the view of our Judah our Nehemiah however said to him did they not do the same before Ahab in the case of Hezekiah they placed the scroll of the law upon his coffin and declared this one fulfilled all that which is written there but do we not even now do the same on appropriate occasions we only bring out the scroll of the law but do not place it on the coffin it may alternatively be said that sometimes we also place it on the coffin but do not say he fulfilled the law Rabbi Barhanna said I was once following Aryuhanan for the purpose of asking him about the above matter he however at that moment went into a toilet room when he reappeared and I put the matter before him he did not answer until he had washed his hands put on phylacteries and pronounced the benediction and he said to us even if sometimes we also say he fulfilled the law we never say he expounded the law but did not the master say the importance of the study of the law is enhanced by the fact that the study of the law is conducive to the practice of the law this however offers no difficulty the latter statement deals with studying the law the former with teaching the law are Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon Biyohe what is the meaning of the verse blessed are ye that sow beside all waters that send forth thither the feet of the ox and the ass whoever is occupied with the study of the law and with deeds of charity is worthy of the inheritance of two tribes as it is said blessed are ye that sow now sowing in this connection signifies charity as stated so to yourselves in charity reaping kindness again water in this connection signifies the law as stated lo everyone that thirst hath come yet to the waters he is worthy of the inheritance of two tribes he is worthy of an inheritance like Joseph as it is written Joseph is a fruitful bough whose branches run over the wall he is also worthy of the inheritance of Issachar as it is written Issachar is a strong ass there are some who say his enemies will fall before him as it is written with them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth he is worthy of understanding like Issachar as it is written and of the children of Issachar which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I-M-I-S-H-N-A-H with reference to what is foot muad I-T-I-S muad to break things in the course of walking any animal I-S muad to walk in its usual way and to break things but if it was kicking or pebbles were flying from under its feet and utensils were in consequence broken only half damages will be paid if it trod upon the utensil and broke it and a fragment of it fell upon another utensil which was also broken for the first utensil full damages must be paid but for the second only half damages will be paid poultry are muad to walk in their usual way and to break things if a string became attached to their feet or where they hop about and break utensils only half damages will be paid Talmud. Mas Baba Kama Bgemara Rabba is said to Rabba is not foot mentioned in the commencing clause identical with animal mentioned in the second clause he answered him in the commencing clause the Mishnah deals with principles whereas in the second clause derivatives are introduced but according to this the subsequent Mishnah stating tooth is muad any animal is muad what principles and what derivatives could be distinguished there Rabba however answered him humorously I expounded one Mishnah it is now for you to expound the other but what indeed is the explanation regarding the other Mishnah are as she said in the first clause the Mishnah speaks of tooth of beast whereas in the second place tooth of cattle is dealt with for it might have been thought that since he shall put in biro his cattle is stated in scripture the law concerning tooth should apply only to cattle but not to beast it is therefore made known to us that beast is included in the term animal if so cattle should be dealt with first beast which is deduced by means of interpretation is more important to the Mishnah which thus gives it priority if so also in the opening Mishnah dealing with foot the same method should have been adopted to state first that which is not recorded in scripture what a comparison there in the case of tooth where both beast and cattle are principles that which is introduced by means of interpretation is preferable but here in the case of foot how could the principle be deferred and the derivative placed first you may alternatively say since in the previous chapter the Mishnah concludes with foot it commences here with foot our rabbis taught an animal is muad to walk in its usual way and to break things that is to say in the case of an animal entering into the plaintiff's premises and doing damage either with its body while in motion or with its hair while in motion or with the saddle which was upon it or with the load which was upon it or with the bit in its mouth or with the bell on its neck similarly in the case of an ass doing damage with its load the payment must be in full Simica says in the case of pebbles or in the case of a pig burrowing in a dunghill and doing damage the payment is also in full in the case of a pig actually doing damage is it not obvious that the payment must be in full read therefore when it had caused something of the dunghill to fly out so that damage resulted therefom the payment will be in full but have pebbles ever been mentioned in this Baritha that Simicus makes reference to them there is something missing in the text of the Baritha where the reading should be as follows pebbles though being quite usual with cattle involved nevertheless only half damages in the case of a pig digging in a dunghill and causing something of it to fly out so that damage resulted therefrom only half damages will therefore be paid Simicus however says in the case of pebbles and similarly in the case of a pig digging in a dunghill and causing something of it to fly out so that damage resulted therefrom the payment must be in full our rabbis taught in the case of poultry flying from one place to another and breaking utensils with their wings the payment must be in full but if the damage was done
Damages Rabba in answer said it may indeed be subject to the law applicable to damage done by body yet the payment of half damages in the case of pebbles is a hollow sheet principle based on a special tradition Rabba said whatever would involve defilement in the activities of Azad will in the case of damage involve full payment whereas that which in the activities of Azad would not involve defilement will in the case of damage involve only half damages was Rabba's sole intention to intimate. To us the law of pebbles no Rabba meant to tell us the law regarding cattle drawing a wagon over utensils which were thus broken it has indeed been taught in accordance with the view expressed by Rabba an animal is meant to break things in the course of walking how is that in the case of an animal entering into the plaintiff's premises and doing damage either with its body while in motion or with its hair while in motion or with the saddle which was upon it or with the load which was Upon it or with the bit in its mouth or with the bell on its neck similarly in the case of an ass doing damage with its load or again in the case of a calf drawing a wagon over utensils which were thus broken the payment must be in full our rabbis taught in the case of poultry picking at a cord attached to a pail so that the cord was snapped asunder and the bucket broken the payment must be in full rabbi asked in the case of cattle trading upon a utensil which has not been broken at once but which was rolled away to some other place where it was then broken what is the law shall we go by the original cause of the damage in our determination of the law which would thus amount to damage done by the body or shall only the result i.e. the breaking of the utensil be the determining factor amounting thus to pebbles but why not solve the problem from a statement made by rabbi for rabbi said if a man threw his fellow's utensil from the top of a roof and another one came and end. Broke it with a stick before it fell upon the ground where it would in any case have been broken the latter is under no liability to pay as we say it was only a broken utensil that was broken by him is not this the best proof that it is the cause of the damage which is the determining factor to Rabba that was pretty certain whereas to Rabba it was doubtful come and here hopping with poultry is not muad some however say it is muad could hopping in itself be thought in any way not to be habitual with poultry does it not therefore mean hopping that results in making a utensil fly from one place to another so that it is broken so that the point at issue is this the latter view maintains that the original cause of the damage is the determining factor but the former maintains that only the result i.e. the breaking of the utensil is the determining factor no Talmud, Mas Baba Kama the hopping only caused pebbles to fly so that the point at issue is the same as that. Between Simicus and the rabbis come and here in the case of poultry picking at a cord attached to a pail so that the cord was snapped asunder and the bucket broken the payment must be in full could it not be proved from this very though that it is the original cause of the damage that has to be followed you may however interpret the liability of full payment to refer to the damage done to the cord but behold is not the damage of the cord unusual with poultry and only half damage is hot. To be paid it was smeared with dough but does it not say and the bucket was broken this very though must therefore be in accordance with Simicus who maintains that also in the case of pebbles full payment must be made but if it is in accordance with Simicus read the concluding clause where a fragment of the broken bucket to fly and fall upon another utensil breaking it the payment for the former i.e. the bucket must be in full but for the latter only half damages will be paid now does. Simicus ever recognize half damages in the case of pebbles if you however submit that there is a difference according to Simicus between damage occasioned by direct force and that caused by indirect force what about the question raised by Arashi is damage occasioned by indirect force according to Simicus subject to the same law applicable to direct force or not subject to the law of direct force why is it not evident to him that it is not subject to the law of direct force hence it above Beretha is accordingly more likely to be in accordance with the rabbis and proves thus that it is the original cause that has to be followed as the determining factor our BBB however said the bucket that was broken was not rolled but continuously pushed by the poultry from one place to another so that it was broken by actual bodily touch Rob again queried will the half damages in the case of pebbles be paid out of the body of the torfees and animal or will it be paid out of the best of the defendant's estate will it be paid out of the body of the tortfeasant animal on account of the fact that nowhere is the payment of half damages made out of the best of the defendant's estate or shall it nevertheless perhaps be paid out of the best of the defendant's estate since there is no case of habitual damage being compensated out of the body of the tortfeasant animal come and here hopping with poultry is not muad some however say it is muad could hopping. Be said in any way not to be habitual with poultry does it not therefore mean hopping and making pebbles fly so that the point at issue is as follows the former view maintaining that it is not treated as muad requires payment to be made out of the body of the tortfeasant poultry whereas the latter view maintaining that it is treated as muad will require the payment of the half damages for pebbles to be made out of the best of the defendant's estate no the point at issue is that between Simicus and the rabbis come and here in the case of a dog taking hold of a cake with live coal sticking to it and going with it to a stack of grain where he consumed the cake and set the stack on fire full payment must be made for the cake whereas for the stack only half damages will be paid now what is the reason that only half damages will be paid for the stack if not on account of the fact that the damage of the stack is subject to the law of pebbles it has moreover been taught in connection with this mission that the half damages will be collected out of the body of the tortfeasant dog does not this ruling offer a solution to the problem raised by Rabba but do you really think the law of pebbles to be at the basis of this ruling according to our Eliezer who maintains that the payment even for the stack will be in full and out of the body of the tortfeasant dog do we find anywhere full payment being collected out of the body of tortfeasant animals? Must not this ruling therefore be explained to refer to a case where the dog acted in an unusual manner in handling the coal our Eliezer being of the same opinion as our Tarfan who maintains that even for the unusual damage by horn if done in the plaintiff's premises the payment will be in full this explanation however is not essential for that which compels you to make our Eliezer maintain the same opinion as our Tarfan is only as requiring full payment out of the body of the dog it may. Therefore be suggested on the other hand that our Eliezer holds a view expressed by Simicus that in the case of pebbles full damages will be paid and that he further adopts the view of our Judah who said that in the case of Muad half of the payment i.e. the part of Tam remains unaffected i.e. is always subject to the law of Tam the statement that payment is made out of the body of the dog will therefore refer only to one half the part for which even Tam would be liable but our Sami the son. Of Arashi said Lorub and I submit that the view you have quoted in the name of Arjuna is confined to cases of Tam turned into Muad i.e. horn whereas in cases which are Muad of Initio Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba you have surely not found him maintaining so you can therefore only say that our Eliezer's statement regarding full payment deals with a case where the dog has already become Muad to set fire to stacks in an unusual manner and the point at issue will be that our Eliezer maintains that there is such a thing as becoming Muad also regarding the law of pebbles whereas the rabbis maintain that there is no such thing as becoming Muad in the case of pebbles but if so what about another problem raised elsewhere by Rabbah is there such a thing as becoming Muad regarding the law of pebbles or is there no such thing as becoming Muad in the case of pebbles why then not say that according to the rabbis there could be no such thing as becoming Muad in the case of pebbles. Whereas according to our Eliezer there may be a case of becoming Muad even in the case of Pebbles Rabbah however may say to you the problem raised by me as to the possibility of becoming Muad is of course based on the view of the rabbis who differ in this respect from Simicus whereas here in the case of the dog both the rabbis and our Eliezer may hold the view of Simicus who maintains that Pebbles always involve payment in full the reason however that the rabbis order only half damages to be paid is on account of the fact that the dog handled the coal in an unusual manner while it had not yet become Muad for that the point at issue between them would be exactly the same as between our Tarfan and the rabbis but our Tarfan who took the view that the payment will be in full may perhaps never have intended to make it dependent upon the body of the tortfeasant and cattle certainly so for he derives his view from the law of horn on public ground and it only stands to reason that Deoie it is sufficient to a derivative by means of a KALW a homer to involve nothing more than the original case from which it has been deduced but behold our Tarfan is expressly not in favor of the principle of Deo he is not in favor of Deo only when the KALW a homer would thereby be rendered completely ineffective but where the KALW a homer would not be rendered ineffective he too
Flynow does it not deal with the case where the same act has been repeated three times so that the point at issue between the authorities will be that the one master the latter maintains that the law of Muad applies also to pebbles whereas the other master the former holds that the law of Muad does not apply to pebbles no it presents a case where no repetition took place the point at issue between them being the same as between Simicus and the rabbis come and here in the case of an animal dropping excrements into dough Arjuta maintains that the payment must be in full but R. Eliezer says that only half damages will be paid now does it not deal here with a case where the act has been repeated three times so that the point at issue between the authorities will be that Arjuta maintains that the animal has thus become Muad whereas R. Eliezer holds that it has not become Muad no it deals with a case where no repetition took place the point at issue between them being the same which is between Simicus and the rabbis but is it not unusual with an animal to do so the animal was pressed for space in which case it is no more unusual but why should not Arjuna have explicitly stated that the halachah is in accordance with Simicus and similarly R. Eliezer should have stated that the halachah is in accordance with the rabbis a specific ruling in regard to excrements is of importance for otherwise you might have thought that since these excrements formed a part of the animal and were poured out from its body they should still be considered as a part of its body it has therefore been made known to us that this is not so come and your Rami B. Ezekiel learned in the case of a cock putting its head into an empty utensil of glass where it crowed so that the utensil thereby broke the payment must be in full while R. Joseph on the other hand said that it has been stated in the school of Rab that in the case of a horse neighing or an aspiring so that Utensils were thereby broken only half damages will be paid now does it not mean that the same act has already been repeated three times Talmud, Mas Baba Kama so that the point at issue between the contradictory statements will be that the one master the former maintains that the law of Muad applies also to pebbles whereas the other master the latter holds that the law of Muad does not apply to pebbles no we suppose the act not to have been repeated the point at issue being the same as that between Simicus and the rabbis but is it not unusual for a cock to crow into a utensil there had been some seeds there in which case it was not unusual Arashi asked would an unusual act reduce pebbles by half i.e. to the payment of quarter damages or would an unusual act not reduce pebbles to the payment of quarter damages but why not solve this question from that of Rabba for Rabba asked the following is there such a thing as becoming Muad in the case of pebbles or is there no such thing as becoming Muad in the case of pebbles now does not this query imply that no unusual act affects the law of pebbles Rabba may perhaps have formulated his query upon a mere supposition as follows if you suppose that no unusual act affects the law of pebbles is there such a thing as becoming Muad in the case of pebbles or is there no such thing as becoming Muad let it stand undecided Arashi further asked is damage occasioned by indirect force according to Simic is subject to the law applicable to direct force or not so is he acquainted with the special halashi tradition on the matter but he confines its effect to damage done by indirect force or is he perhaps not acquainted at all with this tradition let it stand undecided if it was kicking or pebbles were flying from under its feet and utensils were broken only half damages will be paid the following query was put forward does the text mean to say if it was kicking so that damage resulted from a kicking or in the case of pebbles flying in the usual way only half damages will be paid being thus in accordance with the rabbis or does it perhaps mean to say if it was kicking so that damage resulted from a kicking or when pebbles were flying as a result of the kicking only half damages will be paid thus implying that in the case of pebbles flying in the usual way the payment would be in full being therefore in accordance with Simicus come and hear the Concluding clause if it trod upon the utensil and broke it and a fragment of it fell upon another utensil which was also broken for the first utensil full compensation must be paid but for the second only half damages now how could the Mishnah be in accordance with Simicus who is against half damages in the case of pebbles if you however suggest that the first utensil refers to the utensil broken by a fragment that flew off from the first broken utensil and the second refers thus to the utensil broken by a fragment that flew off from the second broken utensil and further assume that according to Simicus there is a distinction between damage done by direct force and damage done by indirect force so that in the latter case only half damages will be paid then if so what about the question of Arashi is damage occasioned by indirect force according to Simicus subject to the law of direct force or not subject to the law of direct force why is it not evident to him are Ashi that it is not subject to the law applicable to direct force Arashi undoubtedly explains the mission in accordance with the rabbis and the query is put by him as follows does it mean to say if it was kicking so that damage resulted from a kicking or in the case of pebbles flying in the usual way only half damages will be paid thus implying that in the case of pebbles flying as a result of kicking only quarter damages would be paid on account of the fact that an unusual act reduces payment in the case of pebbles or does it perhaps mean to say if it was kicking so that damage resulted from a kicking or when pebbles were flying as a result of the kicking half damages will be paid thus making it plain that an unusual act does not reduce payment in the case of pebbles let it stand undecided our abu asked of our mi some say of our high b abu the following problem in the case of an animal walking in a place where it was unavoidable for it not to make Pebbles fly from under its feet while in fact it was kicking and in this way making pebbles fly and doing damage what would be the law should it be maintained that since it was unavoidable for it not to make pebbles fly there the damage would be considered usual or should it perhaps be argued otherwise since in fact the damage resulted from kicking that caused the pebbles to fly let it stand undecided our Jeremiah asked our Zara in the case of an animal walking on public ground and making pebbles fly from which there resulted damage what would be the law should we compare this case to horn and thus impose liability or since on the other hand it is a derivative of foot should there be exemption for damage done on public ground he answered him it stands to reason that since it is a secondary kind of foot there is exemption on public ground again he asked him in a case where the pebbles were kicked up on public ground but the damage that resulted therefom was done in the Plaintiff's premise is what would be the law he answered him if the cause of raising the pebbles is not there to institute liability how could any liability be attached to the falling down of the pebbles thereupon here Jeremiah raised an objection from the following in the case of an animal walking on the road and making pebbles fly either in the plaintiff's premises or on public ground there is liability to pay now does not this bury the deal with the case where the pebbles were made both to fly up on public ground and to do damage on public ground no though the pebbles were made to fly on public ground the damage resulted on the plaintiff's premises but did you not say he asked him further that in such a case there would still be exemption on account of the argument if the cause of raising the pebbles is not there to institute liability how could any liability be attached to the falling down of the pebbles he answered him I have since changed my mind on this Matter he raised another objection if it trod upon the utensil and broke it and a fragment of it fell upon another utensil which was also broken for the first utensil full compensation must be paid but for the second only half damages and it was taught on the matter this ruling is confined to damage done on the plaintiff's premises whereas if it took place on public ground there would be exemption regarding the first utensil though with respect to the second there would be liability to pay. Now does not the Beritha present a case where the fragment was made both to fly up on public ground and to do damage on public ground no though the fragment was made to fly on public ground the damage resulted on the plaintiff's premises but did you not say that in such a case there would still be exemption on account of the argument if the cause of raising the pebbles is not there to institute liability how could any liability be attached to the falling down of the pebbles Talmud? Mas Baba Kamabi answered him I have since changed my mind on this matter but behold Aryohan and said that in regard to the liability of half damages there is no distinction between the plaintiff's premises and public ground now does not this statement also deal with the case where the pebbles were made both to fly up on public ground and to do damage on public ground no though the pebbles were made to fly up on public ground the damage resulted on the plaintiff's premises but did you not say that in such a case there would still be exemption on account of the argument if the cause of raising the pebbles is not there to institute liability how could any liability be attached to the falling down of the pebbles he answered him I have since changed my mind on this matter alternatively you might say that Aryohan referred only to the liability attached to Horn Arjuta to the prince and Arashai had both been sitting near the entrance of the house of Arjuta when they following matter was raised between them in the case of an animal knocking about with
Horn the animal is prompted by a malicious desire to do damage whereas in the case before us there is no malicious desire to do damage let it stand undecided poultry are meant to walk in their usual way and to break things if a string became attached to their feet or where they hop about and break utensils only half damages will be paid Aruna said the ruling regarding half damages applies only to a case where the string became attached of itself but in a case where it was attached by a human being the liability would be in full but in the case where the string was attached of itself who would be liable to pay the half damages it could hardly be suggested that the owner of the string would have to pay it for in what circumstances could that be possible if when the string was kept by him in a safe place so that the fact of the poultry taking hold of it could in no way be attributed to him surely it was but a sheer accident if on the other hand it was not kept in a safe place should he not be liable for negligence to pay in full it was therefore the owner of the poultry who would have to pay the half damages but again why differentiate his case so as to excuse him from full payment if there was exemption from full payment on account of the inference drawn from the verse if a man shall open a pit which implies that there would be no liability for cattle opening a pit half damages should for the very reason similarly not be imposed here as there could be liability only when man created a pit but not when cattle created a pit the machinate ruling regarding half damages must therefore be applicable only to a case where the poultry made the string fly from one place to another where it broke the utensils being a subject to the law of pebbles and the statement made by Arhuna will accordingly refer to a case which has been dealt with elsewhere is in the case of an ownerless string Arhuna said that if it had become attached of itself to poultry and no damage resulted to an animate object tripping over it while it was still attached to the poultry there would be exemption but if it had been attached to the poultry by a human being he would be liable to pay in full under what category of damage could this liability come Arhuna Bimano said under the category of pit which is rolled about by feet of man and feet of animal Mishnah with reference to what is tooth muat itis muat to consume whatever is fit for it Animal is out to consume both fruits and vegetables but if it has destroyed clothes or utensils only half damages will be paid this ruling applies only to damage done on the plaintiff's premises but if it is done on public ground there would be exemption where however the animal has derived some benefit from the damage done by a payment will in any case be made to the extent of the benefit when will payment be made to the extent of the benefit if it consumed food in the market payment to the extent of the benefit will be made but if it consumed in the sideways of the market the payment will be for the actual damage done by the animal so also if it consumed at the entrance of a shop payment to the extent of the benefit will be made but if it consumed inside the shop the payment will be for the actual damage done by the animal Gemara or rabbis taught tooth is muad to consume whatever is fit for it how is that in the case of an animal entering the plaintiff's Premises and consuming food that is fit for it or drinking liquids that are fit for it the payment will be in full similarly in the case of a wild beast entering the plaintiff's premises tearing an animal to pieces and consuming its flesh the payment will be in full so also in the case of a cow consuming barley and ass consuming horse beans a dog licking oil or a pig consuming a piece of meat the payment will be in full our papa thereupon said since it has been stated that things which in the usual way would be unfit as food for particular animals but which under pressing circumstances are consumed by them come under the designation of food in the case of a cat consuming dates and an ass consuming fish the payment will similarly be in full there was a case where an ass consumed bread and shoot also the basket in which the bread had been kept Rab Judah thereupon ordered full payment for the bread but only half damages for the basket why can it not be argued that since it was Usual for the ass to consume the bread it was similarly usual for it to chew at the same time the basket too it was only after it had already completed consuming the bread that the ass chewed the basket but could bread be considered the usual food of an animal here is a very though which contradicts this if it the animal consumed bread meat or broth only half damages will be paid now does not this ruling refer to a domestic animal no it refers to a wild beast to a wild beast is not meat its usual food the meat was roasted alternatively you may say it refers to a deer you may still further say alternatively that it refers to a domestic animal but the bread was consumed upon a table talmud moss babakama there was a case where a goat noticing turnips upon the top of a cask climbed up there and consumed the turnips and broke the jar rubber thereupon ordered full payment both for the turnips and for the jar the reason being that since it was usual with it to consume turnips it was also usual to climb up for the milfa stated in the case of an animal on public ground stretching out its neck and consuming food that had been placed upon the back of another animal there would be liability to pay the reason being that the back of the other animal would be counted as the plaintiff's premises may we say that the following teaching supports his view in the case of a plaintiff who had a bundle of grain hanging over his back and somebody else's animal stretched out its neck and consumed the grain out of it there would be liability to pay no just as Rabba elsewhere referred to a case where the animal was jumping an act which being quite unusual would be subject to the law of horn so also this teaching might perhaps similarly deal with the case of jumping with reference to what was Rabba's statement made it was made with reference to the following statement of Arashai in the case of an animal on public ground going along and consuming there would be Exemption, but if it was standing and consuming, there would be liability to pay. Why this difference? If in the case of walking, there is exemption, since it is usual with animal to do so, is it not also in the case of standing usual with it to do so? It was on this question that Rabba said standing here implies jumping, which being unusual was therefore subject in the law of horn. Arzera asked in the case of a sheep that was rolling about what would he the law in what circumstances when e.g. grain had originally been placed in the plaintiff's premises but was rolled thence into public ground by the animal which consumed the grain while standing on public ground. What would then be the law? Come and here that which are high taught in the case of a bag of food lying partly inside and partly outside of the plaintiff's premises. If the animal consumed inside, there would be liability to pay, but if it consumed outside, there would be exemption. Now, did not this teaching refer to a case? Where the bag was being continually rolled, no red which the animal consumed for the part which had originally been lying inside there would be liability, but for the part that had always been outside there would be exemption. You might alternatively say that our high referred to a bag containing long stalks of grass animal is moved to consume both fruits and vegetables, but if it has destroyed clothes or utensils, only half damages will be paid. This ruling applies only to damage done on the plaintiff's premises, but if it is done on public ground, there would be exemption to what ruling does the last clause refer rap said it refers to all the cases dealt with in the mission, even to the destruction of clothes and utensils. The reason being that whenever the plaintiff himself acted unlawfully, the defendant, though guilty of misconduct, could be under no liability to pay Samuel. On the other hand, said it refers only to the ruling regarding the consumption of fruits and vegetables. Whereas in the case of clothes and utensils there would be liability even when the damage was done on public ground the same difference of opinion is found between Rush Lakish and Aryohan and for Rush Lakish said it refers to all the cases even to the destruction of clothes and utensils in this Rush Lakish was following a view expressed by him in another connection where he stated in the case of two cows on public ground one lying down and the other walking about if the one that was walking kicked the one that was lying there would be exemption since the latter two misconducted itself by laying itself down on public ground whereas if the one that was lying kicked the one that was walking there would be liability to pay Aryohan and on the other hand said the ruling in the mission refers only to the case of fruits and vegetables whereas in the case of clothes and utensils there would be liability even when the damage was done on public ground might it thus be inferred that Aryohanan was also against the view expressed by Rush Lakish even in the case of the two cows no in that case he could indeed have been in full agreement with him for while in the case of clothes and utensils it might be customary with people to place their garments on public ground whilst having a rest nearby in the case of the cows it is not usual for an animal to lie down on public ground where however the animal has derived some benefit from the damage done by a payment. Will in any case be made to the extent of the benefit how could the extent of the benefit be calculated Rabbi said it must not exceed the value of straw i.e. the coarsest possible food for animals but Rabbi said the value of barley on the cheapest scale i.e. two thirds of the usual price there is a very in agreement with Rabbi and there is another very in agreement with Rabbi there is a very in agreement with Rabbi Bizarre Simeon he said the payment to the extent of the benefit would not be more than the value of straw there is a very in
Interesting matters. He answered the discussion was whether one who occupied his neighbor's premises unbeknown to him would have to pay rent or not, but under what circumstances it could hardly be supposed that the premises were not for hire and he the one who occupied them was similarly a man who was not in the habit of hiring any for what liability could there be attached to a case where the defendant derived no benefit and the plaintiff sustained no loss if on the other hand the premises were for hire and he was a man whose wanted was to hire premises why should no liability be attached since the defendant derived the benefit and the plaintiff sustained a loss no the problem arises in a case where the premises were not for hire but his wont was to hire premises what therefore should be the law is the occupier entitled to plead against the other party what loss have I caused to you since your premises were in any case not for hire Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B or Mai. The other party retorts since you have derived the benefit as otherwise you would have had to hire premises you must pay rent accordingly Rami Bihama thereupon said to Arhista the solution to the problem is contained in the Mishnah in what Mishnah he answered him when you will first have performed for me some service thereupon he Arhista carefully lifted up his scarf and folded it then Rami Bihama said to him the Mishnah is where however the animal has derived some benefit from the damage done. By a payment will in any case be made to the extent of the benefit said Rabbah how much worry and anxiety is a person such as Rami Bihama spared whom the master of all helps for though the problem before us is not at all analogous to the case dealt with in the Mishnah Arhista accepted the solution suggested by Rami Bihama the difference is as follows in the case of the Mishnah the defendant derived the benefit and the plaintiff sustained the loss whereas in the problem before us the Defendant derived the benefit but the plaintiff sustained no loss Rami Bihama was however of the opinion that generally speaking fruits left on public ground have been more or less abandoned by their owner who could thus not regard the animal that consumed them there as having exclusively caused him the loss he sustained and the analogy therefore was good come and here in the case of a plaintiff who by his fields has encircled the defendant's field on three sides and who has made a fence on the one side as well as on the second and third side so that the defendant is enjoying the benefit of the fences no payment can be enforced from the defendant since on the fourth side his field is still open wide to the world and the benefit he derives is thus incomplete should however the plaintiff make a fence also on the fourth side the defendant would no doubt have to share the whole outlay of the fences now could it not he deduce from this that wherever a defendant has derived Benefit though the plaintiff has thereby sustained no loss there is liability to pay for the benefit derived that case is altogether different as the plaintiff may there argue against the defendant saying it is you that by having your field in the middle of my fields have caused me to erect additional fences and incur additional expense come and here in the same case our Jose said it is only if the defendant subsequently of his own accord makes a fence on the fourth side that there would devolve upon him a liability to pay his share also in the existing fences made by the plaintiff the liability thus applies only when the defendant fences the fourth side but were the plaintiff to fence the fourth side too there would be no liability whatsoever upon the defendant now could it not be deduced from this that in a case where though the defendant has derived benefit the plaintiff has thereby sustained no loss there is no liability to pay that ruling again is based on a different principle since the defendant may argue against the plaintiff saying for my purposes a partition of thorns of the value of zoos would have been quite sufficient come and here a structure consisting of a lower story and an upper story belonging respectively to two persons has collapsed the owner of the upper story thereupon asks the owner of the lower story to rebuild the ground floor but the latter does not agree to do so the owner of the upper story is then entitled to build the lower story and to occupy it until the owner of the ground floor refunds the outlay now seeing that the whole outlay will have to be refunded by the owner of the lower story it is evident that no rent may be deducted for the occupation of the lower story could it thus not be inferred from this ruling that in a case where though the defendant has derived the benefit the plaintiff has thereby sustained no loss there is no liability to pay that ruling is based on a different Principal as the lower story is by law accessory to the upper story come and here in the same case our Judah said even this one who occupies another man's premises without an agreement with him must nevertheless pay him rent is not this ruling a proof that in a case where the defendant has derived benefit though the plaintiff has thereby sustained no loss there is full liability to pay that ruling is based on a different principle since we have to reckon there with the blackening of it. Walls in the case of newly built premises the plaintiff thus sustaining an actual loss the problem was communicated to RMI and his answer was what harm has the defendant done to the other party what loss has he caused him to suffer and finally what indeed is the damage that he has done to him our high B Abba however said we have to consider the matter very carefully when the problem was afterwards again laid before our high B Abba he replied why do you keep on sending the problem to me if I had found the solution would I not have forwarded it to you it was stated our Kahana quoting our Yohanan said in the case of the above problem there would be no legal obligation to pay rent but our Abab similarly quoting our Yohanan said there would be a legal obligation to pay rent our Papa thereupon said the view expressed by our Abab on behalf of our Yohanan was not stated explicitly by our Yohanan but was only arrived at by inference for we learned he who misappropriates a stone or a beam belonging to the temple treasury does not render himself subject to the law of sacrilege but if he delivers it to his neighbor he is subject to the law of sacrilege whereas his neighbor is not subject to the law of sacrilege so also when he builds it into his house he is not subject to the law of sacrilege until he actually occupies that house for such a period that the benefit derived from that stone or that beam would amount to the value of a parrot and Samuel thereupon said at the last Ruling referred to a case where the stone or the beam was not fixed into the actual structure but left loose on the roof now Arabab sitting in the presence of Aryohanan said in the name of Samuel that this ruling proved that he who occupied his neighbor's premises without an agreement with him would have to pay him rent and Aryohanan kept silent Arabab imagined that since Aryohanan remained silent he thus acknowledged his agreement with this inference but in fact this was not. So Aryohanan paid no regard to this view on account of his acceptance of an argument which was advanced later by Rabba for Rabba said the conversion of sacred property even without the knowledge of the temple treasury is subject to the law of sacrilege Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, just as the use of private property under an agreement is subject to the law of contracts Arabab Bizab sent the following message to Mari the son of the master Askar who to his opinion regarding. The case of one who occupies his neighbor's premises without any agreement with him must he pay him rent or not but in the meanwhile Arhuna's soul went to rest Rabbi Arhuna thereupon replied as follows thus said my father my master in the name of Rabbi he is not legally bound to pay him rent but he who hires premises from Reuben may have to pay rent to Simeon but what connection has Simeon with premises hired from Reuben that the rent should be paid to him read therefore thus Reuben and the premises were discovered to be the property of Simeon the rent must be paid to him but if so do not the two statements made above in the name of Rab contradict each other the latter statement ordering payment to Simeon deals with premises which were for hire whereas the former ruling remitting rent in the absence of an agreement refers to premises which were not for hire it has similarly been stated Arhai Bi'ab quoting Rab said some say that Arhai Bi'ab quoting Arhuna Said he who occupies his neighbor's premises without any agreement with him is not under a legal obligation to pay him rent. He, however, who hires premises from the representatives of the town must pay rent to the owners. What is the meaning of the reference to owners? Read therefore, thus representatives of the town and the premises are discovered to be the property of particular owners. The rent must be paid to them. But if so, how can the two statements be reconciled with each other? The latter statement ordering payment to the newly discovered owners deals with premises which are for hire, whereas the former ruling remitting rent in the absence of an agreement refers to premises which are not for hire. R. C. Haras stated that Arhuna quoting Rab had said he who occupies his neighbor's premises without having any agreement with him is under no legal obligation to pay him rent. For scripture says through emptiness, even the gate gets smitten. Marson of Arashi remarked, I myself have. Seen such a thing and the damage was as great as though done by Goring Ox or Joseph said premises that are inhabited by tenants keep in a better condition what however is the practical difference between them there is a difference between them in the case where the owner was using the premises for keeping their wood and straw there was a case where a certain person built a villa upon ruins that had belonged to orphans Arnaman thereupon confiscated the
The animal turning its head to the sideways no payment will be made for the actual damage done but according to Samuel how then can it happen that there will be liability to pay for actual damage only when e.g. the animal had quitted the marketplace altogether and walked right into the sideways of the marketplace there are some authorities who read this argument between Rab and Samuel independent of any Mishnah text in the case of an animal standing in a marketplace but turning its head into the sideways and unlawfully consuming food which was lying there Rab maintains that there will be liability for the actual damage whereas Samuel says that there will be no liability for the actual damage but according to Samuel how then can it happen that there will be liability to pay for actual damage only when e.g. the animal had quitted the marketplace altogether and had walked right into the sideways of the marketplace are and B.I.S. raised an objection so also if it Consumed at the entrance of a shop payment to the extent of the benefit will be made how could the damage in this case have occurred unless of course by the animal having turned its head to the entrance of the shop yet the text states payment to the extent of the benefit that is to say only to the extent of the benefit derived by the animal but not for the actual damage done by it he raised the objection and he himself answered it the entrance to the shop might have been at a corner in which case the animal had access to the food placed there without having to turn its head there are some authorities however who say that in the case of an animal turning its head to the sideways of the marketplace there was never any argument whatsoever that there would be liability for the actual damage done the point at issue between Rab and Samuel was in the case of a plaintiff who left unfenced the part of his side of budding on public ground and the statement ran as follows Rab said that the liability for the actual damage done could arise only in a case where the food was placed in the sideways of the market to which the animal turned its head but in the case of a plaintiff leaving unfenced a part of his side of budding on public ground and spreading out their fruits which were consumed by the defendant's animal there would be no liability to pay for the loss sustained Samuel however said that even in the case of a plaintiff leaving unfenced a part of his side a budding onto the public ground there would be liability to pay for the loss sustained might it not be suggested that the basic issue between Rab and Samuel would be that of a defendant having dug a pit on his own side and while abandoning the site still retains his ownership of the pit Rab who here upholds exemption for the loss sustained by the owner of the fruits maintains that a pit dug on one's own side is subject to the law of pit so that fruits left on an unfenced side Adjoining the public ground constitute a nuisance which may in fact be abetted by all and everybody whereas Samuel who declares liability for the loss sustained by the owner of the fruits would maintain that a pit dug on one's own side could never be subject to the law of pit rab could however refute the suggestion and reason thus in spite of your argument I may nevertheless maintain Talmud, Mas Baba Kama be that in other respects a pit dug on one's own side is not subject to the law of pit but the case before us here is based on a different principle since the defendant is entitled to plead in reply to the plaintiff you had no right at all to spread out your fruits so near to the public ground as to involve me in liability through my cattle consuming them Samuel on the other hand could similarly contend in other respects a pit dug on one's own side may be subject to the law of pit for it may be reasonable in the case of a pit for a plaintiff to plead that the pit may have been totally overlooked by the animals that unwittingly fell in but in the case of fruit spread out on private ground is it possible to plead with reason that they may have been overlooked surely they must have been seen may it not be suggested that the case of an animal turning its head to the sideways is a point at issue between the following tannic authorities for it has been taught in the case of an animal unlawfully consuming the plaintiff's fruits on the market the payment will be only to the extent of the benefit but when the fruits had been placed on the sideways of the market the payment would be assessed for the damage done by the animal this is the view of our and our Judah, but our Jose and our Eliezer say it is by no means usual for an animal to consume fruits only to walk there now is not our Jose merely expressing the view already expressed by the first mentioned tannic authorities unless the case of an animal turning its head to the sideways was the point at issue between them so that the first mentioned tannic authorities maintain that in the case of an animal turning its head to the sideways the payment will still be fixed to the extent of the benefit it had derived whereas our Jose would maintain that the payment will be in accordance with the actual damage done by it no all may agree that in the case of an animal turning its head to the sideways the law may prevail either in accordance with Rab or in accordance with Samuel. The point at issue however between the tannic authorities here in the Beritha may have been as to the qualifying force of in another man's field the first tannic authorities maintain that the clause and it shall feed in another man's field is meant to exclude liability for damage done on public ground whereas the succeeding authorities are of the opinion that the clause and it shall feed in another man's field exempts liability only for damage done to fruits which had been spread. On the defendant's domain, on the defendant's domain, is it not obvious that the defendant may plead what right had your fruit to be on my ground? But the point at issue between the authorities mentioned in the Beritha will therefore be in reference to the cases dealt with above by Ilfa and by Arashai Mishnah. If a dog or a goat jumps down from the top of a roof and breaks utensils on the plaintiff's ground, the compensation must be in full for any of them is considered muad in respect of that damage. If, however, a dog takes hold of a cake with live coal sticking to it and goes with it to a barn, consumes the cake and sets the barn on fire, the owner of the dog pays full compensation for the cake, whereas for the barn he pays only half damages. Gamara, the reason of the liability in the commencing clause is that the dog or goat has jumped from the roof, but were it to have fallen down from the roof and thus broken utensils, there would be exemption. It can thus be. Inferred that the authority here accepted the view that the inception of potential negligence resulting in mere accident carries exemption it has been explicitly taught to the same effect if a dog or goat jumps down from the top of a roof and breaks utensils on the plaintiff's ground the compensation must be in full were it however to have fallen down and thus broken the utensils there would be exemption this ruling seems to be in accord with the view that where there is negligence at the beginning but the actual damage results from mere accident there is exemption but how could the ruling be explained according to the view that upholds liability the ruling may refer to a case where the utensils had for example been placed very near to the wall so that were the animal to have jumped it would by jumping have missed them altogether in which case there was not even negligence at the beginning Arzibit in the name of Rabba however said there are certain circumstances where there will be liability even in the case of the animal falling down this might come to pass when the wall had not been in good condition still what was the negligence there it could hardly be that the owner should have borne in mind the possibility of bricks falling down and doing damage for since after all it was not bricks that came down but the animal that fell down why should it not be subject to the law applicable to a case where the damage which might have been done by negligence at the inception actually resulted from accident no it has application where the wall of the railing was exceedingly narrow or rabbis taught in the case of a dog or goat jumping and doing damage if it was in an upward direction there is exemption but if in a downward direction there is liability in case however of man or poultry jumping and doing damage whether in a downward or upward direction there is liability Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, but was it not elsewhere taught in the case of a dog or go jumping and doing damage whether in a downward or upward direction there is exemption our papa thereupon interpreted the latter ruling to refer to cases where the acts done by the animals were the reverse of their respective natural tendencies e.g. the dog jumped by leaping and the goat by climbing if so why complete exemption the exemption indeed is only from full compensation while there still remains liability for half damages if a dog takes hold etc it was stated our Yohan and said fire involves liability on account of the human agency that brings it about Reshlakish however maintained that fire is chattel why did Reshlakish differ from our Yohan and his contention is human agency must emerge directly from human force whereas fire does not emerge from human force why on the other hand did not our Yohan agree with Reshlakish he may say chattel contains tangible properties whereas fire has no tangible properties we have learned if a dog takes hold of a cake to which life Coals were stuck and goes with it to a barn consumes the cake and sets the barn alight the owner pays full compensation for the cake whereas for the barn he pays only half damages this decision accords well with the view that the liability for fire is on account of the human agency that caused it in the case of the dog there is thus some liability upon the owner of the dog as the fire there was caused by the action of the dog but according to the principle that fire is chattel why indeed should the owner of the dog be liable could the fire be said to be the chattel of the ow
However, the shopkeeper left his candle outside his shop. He is liable. Arjuna says, in the case of a Chanaka candle, the shopkeeper would always be quit. Now, this accords well with the view that fire implies human agency. The agency of the camel could thus be traced in the setting light of the whole building. But according to the view that fire is channel, why should the owner of the camel be liable? Was the fire in this case the channel of the owner of the camel? Reshlakish may reply that the camel in this case passed along the entire building and set every bit of it on fire. If so, read the concluding clause. If, however, the shopkeeper left his candle outside his shop, he is liable. Now, if the camel set the whole of the building on fire, why indeed should the shopkeeper be liable? The camel in this case stood still all of a sudden, but it is immediately objected. If the camel stood still and yet managed to set fire to every bit of the building, is it not still more fitting that the Shopkeeper should be free, but the owner of the camel fully liable are who not be in the name of Rika. Thereupon said the rulings apply to a case where the camel stood still to pass water Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba so that in the commencing clause the owner of the camel is liable for he should not have overloaded his camel, but in the concluding clause the shopkeeper is liable for leaving his candle outside his shop. Come and here in the case of a barn being set on fire where a goat was bound to it and a slave being loose was nearby it and all were burnt, there is liability for barn and goat. In the case, however, of the slave being chained to it and the goat nearby it and all being burnt, there is exemption for barn and goat. Now this is in accordance with the view maintaining the liability for fire to be based upon human agency. There is therefore exemption here since capital punishment is attached to that agency, but according to the view that fire is chattel, why should there be exemption with there be exemption also in the case of cattle killing a slave or simian Lakish may reply to you that the exemption refers to a case where the fire was actually put upon the body of the slave so that no other but the major punishment is inflicted if so is it not obvious why stated at all no it has application in the case where the goat belonged to one person and the slave to another come and here in the case of fire being entrusted to a deaf mute and idiot or a minor and damage resulting no action can be instituted in civil courts but there is liability according to divine justice this again is perfectly consistent with the view maintaining that fire implies human agency and as the agency in this case is the action of the deaf mute there is no liability but according to the other view that fire is chattel why exemption would there similarly be exemption in the case of any other chattel being entrusted to a deaf mute and idiot or a minor behold the following has already been stated in connection there with Resh Lakish said in the name of Hezekiah that the ruling applies only to a case where it was a flickering coal that had been handed over to the deaf mute who fanned it into flame whereas in the case of a ready flame having been handed over there is liability on the ground that the instrument of damage has been fully prepared Are Yohanan on the other hand stated that even in the case of a ready flame there is exemption maintaining that it was only the handling by the deaf mute that caused the damage there could therefore be no liability unless chopped wood chips and actual fire were carelessly given him Rabbah said both scripture and the to support the view of Are Yohanan scripture for it is written if fire break out break out implies of itself and yet scripture continues he that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution it could thus be inferred that fire implies human agency a very for it was taught the verse though commencing with damaged Talmud, Mas Baba Kama done by property concludes with damage done by the person in order to declare that fire implies human agency. Rabbah said the following difficulty confronted Abbe according to the view maintaining that fire implies human agency. How and when was it possible for the divine law to make exemption for damage done by fire to hidden things he solved it thus its application is in the case of a fire which would ordinarily not have spread beyond a certain point but owing to the accident of offense collapsing not on account of the fire the conflagration continued setting alight and doing damage in other premises where the original human agency is at an end if so even regarding unconcealed goods is not the human agency at an end hence the one maintaining that fire implies human agency also holds that fire is chattel so that liability for unconcealed goods would arise in the case where the falling fence could have been but was not repaired in time to prevent the further spread of the fire since it would equal chattel left unguarded by the owner but if the one who holds that fire implies human agency also maintains that fire is chattel what then is the practical point at issue the point at issue is whether fire will involve the additional four items the owner of the dog pays full compensation for the cake whereas for the barn he pays only half damages who is liable for the barn the owner of the dog but why should not the owner of the coal also be made liable his burning coal was well guarded by him if the burning coal was well guarded by him how then did the dog come to it by breaking in armory the son of Arkahana thereupon said this ruling implies that the average door is not beyond being broken in by a dog now in whose premises was the cake devoured it could hardly be suggested that it was devoured in the barn of another party for do we not require and shall feed in the field of another the plaintiff, which is not the case here, no, it applies where it was devoured in the barn of the owner of the cake. You can thus conclude that the plaintiff's food carried in the mouth of the defendant's cattle Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B is still considered kept in the plaintiff's premises. For if it is considered to be in the defendant's premises, why should not he say to the plaintiff, What is your bread doing in the mouth of my dog? For there had been propounded a problem. Is the plaintiff's food carried in the mouth of the defendant's cattle considered as kept in the premises of the plaintiff or as kept in the premises of the defendant? Now, if you maintain that it is considered to be in the defendant's premises, how can tooth for which the divine law imposes liability ever have practical application? Armari, the son of Arkahana, however, replied, It can have application in the case where the cattle scratched against the wall for the sake of gratification and pushed it. Down or where it soiled fruits by rolling upon them for the purpose of gratification, but Marzitra demur do we not require as a man take it away done till it all be gone, which is not the case here. Rubina therefore said it has application in the case where the cattle rubbed paintings off the wall or as she similarly said it may have application in the case where the cattle trampled on fruits and spoiled them completely come and here if he incited a dog against him, i.e. his fellow man. Or incited a serpent against him to do damage, there is exemption for whom is there exemption? There is exemption for the incited but liability upon the owner of the dog. Now if you contend that whatever is kept in the mouth of the defendant's cattle is considered as kept in the defendant's premises, why should he not say to the plaintiff what is your hand doing in the mouth of my dog? Say therefore there is exemption also for the incited, or if you like you may say the damage was done by the Dog bearing its teeth and wounding the plaintiff come and here if a man caused another to be bitten by a serpent Arjuta makes him liable whereas the sages exempt him and Arahabi Jacob commented should you assume that according to Arjuta the poison of a serpent is ready at its fang so that the defendant having committed murder is executed by the sword whereas the serpent being a mere instrument is left unpunished then according to the view of the sages the poison is spitten out by the serpent of its own free will so that the serpent being guilty of slaughter is stoned whereas the defendant who caused it is exempt now if you maintain that whatever is kept in the mouth of the defendant's cattle is considered to be in the defendant's premises why should not the owner of the serpent say to the plaintiff what is your hand doing in the mouth of my serpent regarding the killing of the serpent we certainly do not argue thus whence can you derive this for it was taught where a man enters another's premises without permission and is gored there to death by the owner's ox, the ox is stoned, but the owner is exempted from paying cover for lost life. Now the owner is exempted from paying cover. Why is it not because he can say what were you doing on my premises? Why then regarding the ox should not the same argument be put forward against the victim? What had you to do on my premises? Hence, when it is a question of killing obnoxious beasts, we do not argue. Thus the goats of Itarbu used to do damage to the fields of Arjosephi. Therefore said to Abbe, go and tell their owners that they should keep them indoors. But Abbe said, What will be the use in my going? Even if I do go, they will certainly say to me, Let the master construct a fence around his land. But if fences must be constructed, what are the cases in which the divine law imposed liability for tooth? Perhaps only when the cattle pulled down the fence and broke in or when the fence. Collapsed at night it was however announced by our Joseph or as others say by Rabbah let it be known to those that go up from Babylon to Eretz Yisrael as well as to those that come down from Eretz Yisrael to Babylon that in the case of goats that are kept for the market day but meanwhile do damage a warning is to be extended twice and thrice to their owners if they comply with the terms of the warning well and
Liable in full with that is the reason of our mayor as it was taught our mayor said Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba, if regarding at long intervals during three days there is full liability how much more so for regarding at short intervals they however said to him as Abba disproves your argument as by noticing her discharges at long intervals three cases of discharge in three days she becomes fully unclean whereas by noticing her discharges at short intervals i.e. on the same day she does not become fully unclean but he answered them behold scripture says and this shall be his uncleanness in his issues Ab has thus been made dependent upon the number of cases of noticing and Zaba upon that of days but once is it certain that and this is to exempt Zaba from being affected by cases of noticing say perhaps that it meant only to exempt Zab from being affected by the number of days the verse says and of him that hath on issue of the man and of the woman male is thus made analogous to Female just as female is affected by the number of days so is man affected by days but why not make female analogous to male and say just as male is affected by cases of noticing so also let female be affected by cases of noticing but divine law has emphatically excluded that by stating and this on what ground however do you say that the scriptural phrase excludes the one and not the other it only stands to reason that when cases of noticing are dealt with cases of noticing are excluded for is it reasonable to maintain that when cases of noticing are dealt with days should be excluded our rabbis taught what is muad after the owner has been worn for three days but it may return to the state of tam if children keep on touching it and no growing results this is the dictum of our Jose our Simeon says cattle become muad after the owner has been worn three times and the statement regarding three days refers only to the return to the state of tam our nomin quoting Adabi. Ahabah said the Halachah is in accordance with our Judah regarding Muad for our Jose agrees with him but the Halachah is in accordance with our Meir regarding Tam since our Jose agrees with him on this point Rabbah however said to our Naman why sir not say that the Halachah is in accordance with our Meir regarding Muad for our Simeon agrees with him and the Halachah is in accordance with our Judah regarding Tam since our Simeon agrees with him on this point he answered him I side with our Jose because the reasons of our Jose are generally sound there arose the following question do the three days under discussion apply to the growing of the cattle so that cases of growing on the same day do not count as more than one or to the owner who has to be warned on three different days the practical difference becomes evident when three sets of witnesses appear on the same day and testify to three cases of growing that occurred previously on three different days if the three days apply to the Growing of the cattle there would in this case be a declaration of Muad but if the three days refer to the warning given the owner there would in this case be no declaration of Muad as the owner may say they have only just now testified against me while the law requires this to be done on three different days come and your cattle cannot be declared Muad until warning is given the owner when he is in the presence of the court of justice if warning is given in the presence of the court while the owner is absent or on the other hand in the presence of the owner but outside the court no declaration of Muad will be issued unless the warning be given before the court and before the owner in the case of two witnesses giving evidence of the first time of growing and another two of the second time and again two of the third time of growing three independent testimonies have been established there however taken as one testimony regarding Hazama where the first set found Zomemim. Remaining two sets would be unaffected. The defendant would, however, escape full liability, and the Zomemim would still not have to pay him for conspiring to make his cattle muad. Were also the second set found Zomemim, the remaining testimony would be unaffected. The defendant would escape full liability, and the Zomemim would still not have to compensate him for conspiring to make his cattle muad. Were the third set also found Zomemim, they would all have to share the liability for conspiring to make the cattle muad. For it is with reference to such a case that it is stated, then shall you do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. Now, if it is suggested that the three days refer to the growing of the cattle, whereas the owner may be warned in one day, the ruling is perfectly right, as the three peers may have given evidence in one day Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi, But if it be suggested that the three days refer to the warning given the owner, why should not? The first set say could we have known that after three days there would appear other sets to render the cattle muad arashi thereupon said I repeated this argument to our kahana and he said to me and even if the three days refer to the growing of the cattle is the explanation satisfactory why should not the last set say how could we have known that all those present at the court had come to give evidence against the same ox our aim in coming was only to make the defendant liable for half damages but we may be dealing with a case where all the sets were hinting to one another thus definitely conspiring to act concurrently arashi further said that we may deal with a case where all the sets appeared in court simultaneously Rubina even said where the witnesses know only the owner but could not identify the ox how then can they render it muad by saying as you have in your herd an ox prone to growing it should be your duty to control the whole of the herd there arose it. Following question in the case of a neighbor's dog having been set on a third person what is the law the insider could undoubtedly not be made liable but what about the owner of the dog are we to say that the owner is entitled to plead what offense have I committed here or may we retort since you were aware that your dog could easily be incited and do damage you ought not to have left it unguarded are there there to said come and your cattle become again tam when children keep on touching them and no growing results implying that we're going to result therefrom there would be liability though it were caused by incitement Abe however said is it stated if growing results therefrom there is liability what perhaps is meant is if growing does result therefrom there will be no return to the state of tam though regarding that particular growing no liability will be incurred come and here if he incited a dog or incited a serpent against him there is exemption does this not mean that the insider is free but the owner of the dog is liable no read the insider too is free Rabbah said assuming that in the case of inciting a neighbor's dog against a third person the owner of the dog is liable if the incited dog turns upon the insider the owner is free on the ground that where the plaintiff himself has acted wrongly the defendant who follows suit and equally acts wrongly against the former could not be made liable to him or Papa thereupon said to Rabbah a statement was made in the name of Reshlakish agreeing with yours for Reshlakish said in the case of two cows on public ground one lying and the other walking if the walking cow kicks the other there is no liability as the plaintiff's cow had no right to be lying on the public ground but if the lying cow kicks the other cow there will be liability Rabbah however said to him in the case of the two cows I would always order payment as on behalf of the plaintiff we may argue against the defendant your cow may be Entitled to tread upon my cow, she has however no right to kick her mission. What is meant by ox doing damage on the plaintiff's premises in case of growing, pushing, biting, lying down, or kicking if on public ground the payment is half, but if on the plaintiff's premises are tarfon orders payment in full, whereas the sages order only half damages or tarfon thereupon said to them, seeing that while the law was lenient to tooth and foot in the case of public ground allowing total exemption, it was nevertheless strict with them regarding damage done on the plaintiff's premises where it imposed payment in full in the case of horn where the law was strict regarding damage done on public ground imposing at least the payment of half damages does it not stand to reason that we should make it equally strict with reference to the plaintiff's premises so as to require compensation in full their answer was it is quite sufficient that the law in respect of the thing inferred should be equivalent. To that from which it is derived just as for damage done on public ground the compensation in the case of horn is half so also for damage done on the plaintiff's premises the compensation should not be more than half our tarfon however rejoined but neither do I Talmud, Mas Baba Kama and for horn doing damage on the plaintiff's premises from horn doing damage on public ground I infer horn from foot seeing that in the case of public ground the law though lenient with reference to tooth and foot is nevertheless strict regarding horn in the case of the plaintiff's premises where the law is strict with reference to tooth and foot does it not stand to reason that we should apply the same strictness to horn they however still argued it is quite sufficient if the law in respect of the thing inferred is equivalent to that from which it is derived just as for damage done on public ground the compensation in the case of horn is half so also for damage done on the plaintiff's premises. The compensation should not be more than half Gemara does our tarfon really ignore the principle of Deo is not Deo of biblical origin as taught how does the rule of KALWA Homer work and the Lord said unto Moses if her father had but spit in her face should she not be ashamed seven days how much the more so than in the case of divine reproof should she be ashamed fourteen days yet the number of days remain seven for it is sufficient if the law in respect of the thing inferred be
Regret the minimum of seven days has been decreed in the words letter be shut out from the camp seven days and our tarfan he maintains that the ruling in the words letter be shut out etc. is but the result of the application of the principle of Dayo decreasing the number of days to seven and the rabbis they argue that this is expressed in the further verse and Miriam was shut out from the camp and our tarfan he maintains that the additional statement was intended to introduce the principle of Dayo for general application so that you should not suggest limiting its working only to that case where the dignity of Moses was involved excluding thus its acceptance for general application it has therefore been made known to us by the additional statement that this is not the case our papa said to Abbe behold there is a tana who does not employ the principle of Dayo even when the afortiori would thereby not be defeated for it was taught once do we know that the discharge of semen Verily in the case of Zab causes defilement either by touching or by carrying it is a logical conclusion for if a discharge that is clean in the case of a clean person is defiling in the case of Zab is it not cogent reasoning that a discharge which is defiling in the case of a clean person should defile in the case of Zab now this reasoning applies to both touching and carrying but why not argue that the afortiori serves a useful purpose in the case of touching whilst the principle of Dayo can be employed to exclude defilement by mere carrying if however you maintain that regarding touching there is no need to apply the afortiori on the ground that apart from all inferences Zab could surely not be less defiling than an ordinary clean person my contention is that the case may not be so and that the afortiori may still be essential for I could argue by reason of uncleanness that chance of him by night is stated in scripture to imply that the law of defilement applies only to those whose uncleanness has been occasioned solely by reason of their discharging semen viral excluding us Zab whose uncleanness has been occasioned not solely by his discharging semen viral but by another cause altogether may not the afortiori thus have to serve the purpose of letting us know that Zab is not excluded but where in the verses it stated that the uncleanness must not have concurrently resulted also from any other cause who is the tana whom you may have heard maintain. That semen viral of Zab causes of itself defilement by mere carrying he could surely be neither our Eliezer nor our Joshua for it was taught the semen viral of Zab causes defilement by touching but causes no defilement by mere carrying this is the view of our Eliezer our Joshua however maintains that it also causes defilement by mere carrying for it must necessarily contain particles of gonorrhea now the sole reason there of our Joshua's view is that semen viral cannot possibly be altogether free. From particles of gonorrhea but taken on its own it would not cause defilement the tana who maintains this must therefore be he who is responsible for what we have learned more severe than the former causes of defilement Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B are the gonorrheal discharge of Zab his saliva his semen viral his urine and the blood of menstruation all of which defile whether by touching or by mere carrying but why not maintain that the reason here is also because the semen viral of Zab cannot possibly be altogether free from particles of gonorrhea if this had been the reason semen viral should have been placed in juxtaposition to gonorrheal discharge why then was it placed in juxtaposition to saliva if not on account of the fact that it's causing defilement is to be inferred from the law applicable to his saliva Araha Vifti said to Rabbin behold there is this tana who does not employ the principle of Dayo even when the purpose of the afortiori would thereby not be Defeated for it was taught once do we learn that mats become defiled if kept within the tent where there is a corpse it is a logical conclusion for if tiny earthenware jugs that remain undefiled by the handling of zab become defiled when kept within the tent where there is a corpse does it not follow that mats which even in the case of zab become defiled should become defiled when kept within the tent where there is a corpse now this reasoning applies not only to the law of defilement for a single day but also to defilement for full seven days but why not argue that the afortiori well serves its purpose regarding the defilement for a single day whilst the principle of Dayo is to be employed to exclude defilement for seven days he rubbed answered him the same problem had already been raised by Arnaman B. Zachariah to Abay and Abay answered him that it was regarding mats in the case of a dead reptile that the tana had employed the afortiori and the text should run as Follows whence do we learn that mats coming in contact with dead reptiles become defiled it is a logical conclusion for if tiny earthenware jugs that remain undefiled by the handling of zab become defiled when in contact with dead reptiles does it not follow that mats which even in the case of zab become defiled should become defiled by coming in contact with dead reptiles but once the ruling regarding mats kept within the tent of a corpse in the case of dead reptiles it is stated rhymant or skin while in the case of a corpse it is also stated rhymant skin just as in the case of rhymant or skin stated in connection with dead reptiles mats are included to become defiled so is it regarding rhymant skin stated in connection with the corpse that mats similarly become defiled this is irishawa must necessarily be free for if it were not free the comparison made could be thus upset seeing that in the case of dead reptiles causing defilement to mats their minimum for causing Uncleanness is the size of a lentil. How can you draw an analogy to corpses where the minimum to cause uncleanness is not the size of a lentil but that of an olive? Because Irishawa must thus be free, is it not so? For indeed the law regarding dead reptiles is placed in juxtaposition to semen viral as written, or a man whose seed goeth from him and there immediately follows, or whosoever touch it any creeping thing. Now in the case of semen viral it is explicitly stated, and every garment and every skin whereon is the seed of copulation. Why then had the divine law mentioned again rhymant or skin in the case of dead reptiles? It may thus be concluded that it was inserted to be free for exegetical purposes. Still it has so far only been proved that one part of the Irishawa is free. This would therefore be well in accordance with the view maintaining that when the Irishawa is free, even in one of its texts only an inference may be drawn and no refutation will be. Entertained, but according to the view holding that though an inference may be drawn in such a case, refutations will nevertheless be entertained. How could the analogy between dead reptiles and corpses be maintained? The verbal congruity in the text dealing with corpses is also free, for indeed the law regarding corpses is similarly placed in juxtaposition to semen viral as written, and whoso touch it anything that is unclean by the dead or a man whose seed goeth from him, etc. Now in the case of semen viral, it is explicitly stated, and every garment and every skin whereon is the seed of copulation. Why then had the divine law mentioned again rhyming skin in the case of corpses? It may thus be concluded that it was inserted to be free for exegetical purposes. The Gazirish is thus free in both texts. Still, this would again be only in accordance with the view maintaining that when an inference is made by means of reasoning from an analogy, the subject of the inference is placed. Back on its own basis, but according to the view that when an inference is made by means of an analogy, the subject of the inference must be placed on a PAR with the other in all respects. How can you establish the law that mats kept in the tent of a corpse become defiled for seven days since you infer it from dead reptiles where the defilement is only for the day? Said Rabbi Scripture states, and ye shall wash your clothes on the seventh day to indicate that all defilements in the case of corpses cannot be for less than for seven days. But should we not let tooth and foot involve liability for damage done even on public ground because of the following? A force you arrive in the case of horn where even for damage done on the plaintiff's premises only half payment is involved. There is yet liability to pay for damage done on public ground. Does it not necessarily follow that in the case of tooth and foot where for damage done on the plaintiff's premises a payment is in full there? Should be liability for damage done on public ground. Scripture, however, says, and it shall feed in another man's field, excluding us damage done on public ground. Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, but have we ever suggested payment in full? It was only half payment that we were arguing for. Scripture further says, and they shall divide the money of it to indicate that this is confined to the money of it, i.e., the goring ox, but does not extend to compensation for damage caused by another ox. But should we not let tooth and foot doing damage on the plaintiff's premises involve the liability for half damages only because of the following? A force arrive in the case of horn where there is liability for damage done even on public ground. There is yet no more than half payment for damage done on the plaintiff's premises. Does it not follow that in the case of tooth and foot where there is exemption for damage done on public ground, the liability regarding damage done on the plaintiff's premises should? Be for half compensation only scripture says he shall make restitution meaningful compensation but should we not on the other hand let horn doing damage on public ground involve no liability at all because of the following force you arrive in the case of t
Injuring men to pay additional four items does it not follow that in the case of ox where there is a liability to pay ransom for killing man there should similarly be a liability to pay the additional four items when injuring man scripture states if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor thus excluding ox injuring the owner's neighbor it has been asked in the case of foot treading upon a child and killing it in the plaintiff's premises what should be the law regarding ransom shall. We say that this comes under the law applicable to horn on the ground that just as with horn in the case of manslaughter being repeated twice and thrice it becomes habitual with the animal involving thus the payment of ransom so also seems to be the case here with hardly any distinction or shall it perhaps be argued that in the case of horn there was on the part of the animal a determination to injure whereas in this case the act was not prompted by a determination to injure come and herein. The case of an ox having been allowed by its owner to trespass upon somebody else's ground and they're going to death the owner of the premises the ox will be stoned while its owner must pay full ransom whether the ox was tam or muad this is the view of Artarfan now whence could Artarfan infer the payment of full ransom in the case of tam unless he shared the view of Arhose the Galilean maintaining that tam involves the payment of half ransom for manslaughter committed on public ground in which case he could rightly have inferred ransom in full for manslaughter on the plaintiff's premises by means of the aforciori from the law applicable to foot this thus proves that ransom has to be paid for manslaughter committed by foot Arshimai of Nihardia however said that the tana might have inferred it from the law applicable to mere damage done by foot but if so cannot the inference be refuted for indeed what analogy could be drawn to damage done by foot the liability for which is common also with fire whereas ransom does not apply to fire the inference might have been from damage done to hidden goods in which case the liability is not common with fire still what analogy is there to hidden goods the liability for which is common with pit whereas ransom for manslaughter does not apply to pit the inference might have been from damage done to inanimate objects for which there is no liability in the case of pit still what analogy is there to inanimate objects the liability for which is again common with fire the inference might therefore have been from damage done to inanimate objects that were hidden for which neither fire nor pit involve liability but still what comparison is there to hidden inanimate objects the liability for which is common at least with men whereas ransom is not common with man does this therefore not prove that he must have made the inference from ransom for manslaughter in the case of foot proving thus that ransom has to be paid for manslaughter committed by foot this certainly is proved Araha of Diffie said to Robin it even stands to reason that ransom has to be paid in the case of foot for if you say that in the case of foot there is no ransom and that the tana might have made the inference from the law applicable to mere damage done by foot his reasoning could easily be refuted for what analogy could be drawn to damage done by foot for which there is liability in the case of foot whereas this is not the case with ransom does this by itself not show that the inference could only have been made from ransom in the case of foot proving thus that ransom has to be paid for manslaughter committed by foot it certainly does show this mission a man is always new and whether he acts inadvertently or willfully whether awake or asleep if he blinded his neighbor's eye or broke his articles full compensation must therefore be made tomorrow blinding a neighbor's eye is placed here in juxtaposition to Breaking his articles to indicate that just as in the latter case only depreciation will be indemnified whereas the additional four items of liability do not apply so also in the case of inadvertently blinding his neighbor's eye only depreciation will be indemnified whereas the additional four items do not apply Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi whence is this ruling deduced Hezekiah said and thus taught a tana of the school of Hezekiah scripture states wound instead of a wound to impose it. Liability for depreciation in the case of inadvertence as in that of willfulness in the case of compulsion as in that of willingness but was not that verse required to prescribe indemnity for pain even in the case where depreciation is independently paid if that is all scripture should have stated bound for a wound why state wound instead of a wound unless to indicate that both inferences be made from it Rabbi said in the case of a stone lying in a person's bosom without his having knowledge of it so that when he rose it fell down regarding damage there will be liability for depreciation but exemption regarding the additional four items concerning sabbath there will similarly be exemption as it is only work that has been deliberately purposed that is forbidden by the law in the case of manslaughter there is exemption from fleeing to a city of refuge regarding the release of a slave there exists a difference of opinion between our simian Gamaliel and the rabbis as it was taught if the master was a physician and the slave requested him to attend to his eye and it was accidentally blinded or the slave requested the master to scrape his tooth and it was accidentally knocked out he may now laugh at the master for he has already obtained his liberty our simian Gamaliel, however says scripture states and he destroyed it to make the freedom conditional upon the master intending to ruin the eye of the slave if the person however had at some time been aware of the stone in his bosom but subsequently forgot all about it so that when he rose it fell down in the case of damage there is liability for depreciation but though the exemption regarding the additional four items still holds good in the case of manslaughter he will have to flee to a city of refuge for scripture says at unawares implying the existence of some previous knowledge as to the dangerous weapon and in the case before us such knowledge did at a time exist concerning sabbath however there is still exemption regarding the release of a slave the difference of opinion between our simian be Gamaliel and the rabbi still applies where he intended to throw the stone to a distance of two cubits but it fell at a distance of four if it caused damage there is liability for depreciation regarding the additional four items there is still exemption so also concerning sabbath for work deliberately planned is required to make it an offense in the case of manslaughter and if a man lie not in wait is stated by divine law excluding a case where there was mentioned to throw a stone to a distance of two cubits but which fell at a distance of four regarding the release of a slave the difference of opinion between our simian be Gamaliel and the rabbi still applies where the intention was to throw the stone to a distance of four cubits but it fell eight cubits away if it caused damage there will be liability for depreciation regarding the additional four items there is still exemption concerning sabbath if there was express intention that the stone should fall anywhere there is liability for an offense but in the absence of such express intention no offense was committed in the case of manslaughter and if a man lie not in wait excludes a case where there was intention to throw a stone to a distance of four cubits but which fell at a distance of eight regarding the release of a slave the difference of opinion between our simian be Gamaliel and the rabbi still Applies Rabbi again said in the case of one throwing a utensil from the top of a roof and another one coming and breaking it with a stick before it fell upon the ground where it would in any case have been broken the latter is under no liability to pay the reason being that it was only a utensil which was already certain to be broken that was broken by him Rabbi further said in the case of a man throwing a utensil from the top of the roof while there were underneath mattresses and cushions which were meanwhile removed by another person or even if he who had thrown it removed them himself there is exemption the reason being that at the time of the throwing of the utensil his agency had been void of any harmful effect Rabbi again said in the case of one throwing a child from the top of the roof and somebody else meanwhile appearing and catching it on the edge of his sword there is a difference of opinion between our Judah Bithera and the rabbis for it was taught in the case of Ten persons beating one to death with ten sticks whether simultaneously or consecutively none of them Talmud, Mas Baba Kama is guilty of murder Arjuna Bibathera however says if consecutively the last is liable for he was the immediate cause of the death in the case where an ox meanwhile appeared and caught the falling child on its horns there is a difference of opinion between our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan Bibarika and the rabbis for it was taught and he shall give for the redemption of his life denotes the value of the life of the killed person our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan Bibarika interprets it to refer to the value of the life of the defendant Rabbi further said in the case of one falling from the top of the roof and doing damage by coming into close contact with a woman there is liability for four items though where she is deceased brother's wife he would thereby not yet have acquired her for wife the four items in this case include depreciation pain medical expenses and loss of time but not degradation for we have learned there is no liability for degradation unless there is intention to degrade rabble further said in the case of one who threw a wind of unusual occurrence fell from the top of the roof upon a human being and did damage as well as cause degradation there will be liability for depreciation but exemption from additional four items if however the fall had been through a wind of usual occurrence and damage as well as degradation was occasioned there is liability
He pushed him into fire or into water and it was yet possible for him to emerge but death resulted there is exemption regarding the case upon his belongings we have similarly learned if a man says to another tear my garment break my jug there is nevertheless liability for any damage done to the garment or to the jug but if he said upon the understanding that you will incur no liability there is exemption Rabbi however asked if a man placed a live coal upon the heart of a slave and injury results therefrom what should be the law does it come under the law applicable in the case of a coal having been placed upon the body of the master himself or to that applicable in the case of a coal having been placed upon the chattel of his assuming that it is subject to the law applicable in the case of a coal having been placed upon the heart of the master himself what should be the law regarding a live coal placed upon an ox from which damage resulted he himself answered the query Thus his slave is on a par with his own body whereas his ox is on a par with his chattels. Chapter 3 Mishnah If a man places a KAT pitcher on public ground and another one comes and stumbles over it and breaks it he is exempt if the other one was injured by it the owner of the habit barrel is liable to compensate for the damage tomorrow to commence with pitcher and conclude with barrel and we have likewise learned also elsewhere if one man comes with his habit barrel and another comes with his beam and it so happened that the cad pitcher of this one breaks by collision with the beam of that one he is exempt here on the other hand the commencement is with barrel and the conclusion with pitcher we have again likewise learned elsewhere in the case of this man coming with a habit barrel of wine and that one proceeding with a cad pitcher of honey and as the habit barrel of honey cracked the owner of the wine poured out his wine and saved the honey into his barrel. He is entitled to no more than his service here again the commencement is with pitcher and the conclusion with barrel are papa thereupon said both cat and habit made a note one and the same receptacle but what is the purpose in this observation regarding buying and selling but under what circumstances it could hardly be thought to refer to a locality where neither cat is termed habit nor habit designated cat for are not these two terms then kept their distinct no it may have application in a locality where though the majority of people refer to cat by the term cat and to habit by the term habit yet there are some who refer to habit by the term cat and to cad by the term habit you might perhaps have thought that the law follows the majority talmud mas baba comma b it is therefore made known to us that we do not follow the majority in disputes on matters of money and another one comes and stumbles over it and breaks it he is exempt why exempt has not one to keep one's eyes Open when walking they said at the school of Rab even in the name of Rab the whole of the public ground was filled with barrel Samuel said it is with reference to a dark place that we have learned the law in the mission our Yohanan said the pitcher was placed at the corner of a turning our Papa said our mission is not consistent unless in accordance with Samuel or our Yohanan for according to Rab why exemption only in the case of stumbling over the pitcher why not the same ruling even when one directly broke it RZ but thereupon said in the name of Rab the same law applies even when the defendant directly broke it for and stumbles was inserted merely because of the subsequent clause which reads if the other one was injured by it the owner of the barrel is liable to compensate for the damage and which of course applies only to stumbling but not to direct breaking in which case it only stands to reason that it is the plaintiff who is to blame for the damage he caused to himself it was therefore on this account that stumbling was inserted in the commencing clause. Our Abba said to our Ashi in the West the following explanation is stated in the name of our of the exemption is because it is not the habit of men to look round while walking on the road. Such a case occurred in Nihardia where Samuel ordered compensation for the broken utensil and so also in Pamadiba where Rabba similarly ordered compensation to he paid. We understand this in the case of Samuel who abided by the dictum he himself propounded but regarding Rabba are we to say that he also embraced the view of Samuel our Papa thereupon said in the case of Rabba the damage was done at the corner of an oil factory and since it was usual to keep their barrels he ought to have kept his eyes open while walking there are his daughters patched the following query to our nominees there has already been fixed a fine of three sellers for kicking with the knee five for kicking with the foot thirteen for a blow with the Saddle of an ass what is the fine for wounding with the blade of the hoe or with the handle of the hoe the reply was forwarded as follows his da his da is it your practice in Babylon to impose fines tell me the actual circumstances of the case as it occurred he thereupon dispatched him thus there was a well belonging to two persons it was used by them on alternate days one of them however came and used it on a day not as the other party said to him this day is mine but as the latter paid no he to that he took a blade of a hoe and struck him with it or not and thereupon replied no harm if he would have struck him a hundred times with the blade of a hoe for even according to the view that a man may not take the law in his own hands for the protection of his interest in a case where an irreparable loss is pending he is certainly entitled to do so it has indeed been stated Rab Judah said no man may take the law into his own hands for the protection of his interests whereas our nomin Said a man may take the law into his own hands for the protection of his interests in a case where an irreparable loss is pending. No two opinions exist that he may take the law into his own hands for the protection of his interests. The difference of opinion is only where no irreparable loss is pending. Rav Judah maintains that no man may take the law into his own hands for the alleged protection of his interests. For since no irreparable loss is pending, let him resort to the judge. Whereas R. Naman says that a man may take the law into his own hands for the protection of his interests. For since he acts in accordance with the prescriptions of the law, why need he take the trouble to go to court? Our Kahana, however, raised an objection. Ben Bag Bag said, Do not enter stealthily into thy neighbor's premises for the purpose of appropriating without his knowledge anything that even belongs to thee, lest thou wilt appear to him as a thief. Thou mayest, however, break his teeth and tell. Him I am taking possession of what is mine does not disprove that a man may take the law into his own hands for the protection of his rights. He thereupon said Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, it is true that Ben Bag Bag supports thy view, but he is only one against the rabbis who differ from him. Our Janay even suggested that break his teeth may also mean to bring him before a court of justice, but if so, why and thou mayest tell him, should it not read, and they will tell him again, I am taking possession of what is mine, should it not be, he is taking possession of what is his. This is indeed a difficulty come and here in the case of an ox throwing itself upon the back of another's ox so as to kill it if the owner of the ox that was beneath arrived and extricated his ox so that the ox that was above dropped down and was killed. There is exemption now does not this ruling apply to Muad where no irreparable loss is pending? No, it only applies to Tam where an irreparable loss is indeed. Pending, but if so, read the subsequent clause. If the owner of the ox that was beneath pushed the ox from above, which was thus killed, there would be liability to compensate. Now, if the case dealt with is of Tamwai liability, since he was able to extricate his ox from beneath, which in fact he did not do, he had no right to push and directly kill the assailing ox. Come and here in the case of a trespasser having filled his neighbor's premises with pitchers of wine and pitchers of oil, the owner of the premises is entitled to break them when going out and break them when coming in. Does not disprove that a man may take the law into his own hands for the protection of his rights. Our nom and B. Isaac explained he is entitled to break them and make a way when going out to complain to the court of justice as well as break them when coming back to fetch some necessary documents. Come and here once is derived the ruling that in the case of a Hebrew bondman whose term of service that had been extended by the boring of his ear has been terminated by the arrival of the jubilee year if it so happened that his master while insisting upon him to leave injured him by inflicting a wound upon him there is yet exemption we learn it from the words and yet shall take no satisfaction for him that is come again implying that we should not adjudicate compensation for him that is determined to come again as a servant does not disprove that a man may take the law into his own hands for the protection of his interests we are dealing here with a case where the servant became suspected of intending to commit theft but how is it that up to that time he did not commit any theft and just at that time he became suspected of intending to commit theft up to that time he had the fear of his master upon him whereas from that time he is no more subject to his master's control our nom and b isaac said we are dealing with a bondman to whom his master assigned a canaanite maid servant as Wife up to the expiration of the term this arrangement was lawful whereas from that time this becomes unlawful come and here I have a man places a pitcher on public ground and another one comes and stumbles over it and breaks it he is exempt now is not this so only when the other one stumbled over it whereas in the case of direct
Distinction be made by continuing the very case in the following manner provided that there were some other means at her disposal to save him whereas if she was unable to save him by any other means there would be exemption this very same thing was indeed meant to be conveyed in the subsequent clause provided that there were some other means at her disposal to save him for were she unable to save him by any other means the resort to force in her case should be considered as if exercised by an officer of the court in the discharge of his duties and there would be exemption come and here in the case of a public road passing through the middle of a field of an individual who appropriates the road but gives the public another at the side of his field the gift of the new road holds good whereas the old one will not thereby revert to the owner of the field now if you maintain that a man may take the law into his own hands for the protection of his interests why should he not arm himself with a whip and sit there as he but thereupon said in the name of robber this is a precaution lest an owner on further occasions might substitute a roundabout way for an old established road our measure she even suggested that the ruling applies to an owner who actually replaced the old existing road by a roundabout way or as she said to turn a road from the middle to the side of a field must inevitably render the road roundabout for if for those who reside at that side it becomes more direct for those who reside at the other side it is made far and roundabout but if so why does the gift of the new road hold good why can the owner not say to the public authorities take years the old path and return me mind the new one that could not be done because of rab judah for rab judah said a path once taken possession of by the public may not be obstructed come and here if an owner leaves pe on one side of the field whereas the poor arrive at another side and glean there both sides are subject to the law of PEO. Now if you really maintain that a man may take the law into his own hands for the protection of his interests, why should both sides be subject to the law of PEO? Why should the owner not arm himself with a whip and sit robber thereupon said the meaning of both sides are subject to the law of PEO is that they are both exempt from tithing as taught if a man after having renounced the ownership of his vineyard rises early on it. Following morning and cuts off the grapes there applies to them the laws of Paradol for getting and PEO whereas there is exemption from tithing Mishnah if his pitcher broke on public ground and someone slipped in the water or was injured by the pots hurt he is liable to compensate our Judah says if it was done intentionally he is liable but if unintentionally he is exempt Gamara Rab Judah said on behalf of Rab the Mishnah ruling refers only to garments soiled in the water Talmud, Moss. Baba Kamba B for regarding injury to the person there is exemption since it was public ground that hurt him when repeating the statement in the presence of Samuel he said to me well is not the liability for damage occasioned by a stone and knife or luggage derived from pit so that I adopt regarding them all the interpretation and ox excluding men and ass excluding inanimate objects this qualification however applies only to cases of killing whereas as regards mere injury in the case of men. There is liability though with respect to inanimate objects there is always exemption Rab however maintains that these statements apply only to nuisances abandoned by their owners whereas in cases where they are not abandoned they still remain their owners chattel or ashai however raised an objection and an ox or an ass fall therein an ox excluding men and ass excluding inanimate objects hence the rabbi stated if there fell into it an ox together with its tools and they thereby broke or an ass together with its equipment which rent there is liability for the beast but exemption as regards the inanimate objects to what may the ruling in this case be compared to that applicable in the case of a stone and knife and luggage that had been left on public ground and did damage should it not on the contrary read what case may be compared to this ruling it must therefore indeed mean thus what may be said to be similar to this ruling the case of a stone and knife and luggage that had been left on public ground and did damage it thus follows that where a bottle broke against the stone there is liability now does not the commencing clause contradict the view of rab whereas the concluding clause opposes that of samuel but even on your view does not the text contradict itself stating exemption in the commencing clause and liability in the concluding clause rab therefore interprets it so as to accord with his reasoning whereas samuel on the other hand expounds it so as to Reconcile it with his view rab in accordance with his reasoning interprets it thus the above statement was made only regarding nuisances that have been abandoned whereas where they have not been abandoned there is liability it therefore follows that where a bottle broke against the stone there is liability Samuel on the other hand in reconciling it with his view expounds it thus since you have now decided that a stone and knife and luggage constitute nuisances that are equivalent in law. To pit it follows that according to our Judah who orders compensation for inanimate objects damaged by pit where a bottle smashed against the stone there is liability our Eliezer said this ruling refers only to a case where the person stumbled over the stone and the bottle broke against the stone for if the person stumbled because of the public ground though the bottle broke against the stone there is exemption whose view is here followed of course not that of our Nathan there are however some who on the other hand read our Eliezer said do not suggest that it is only where the person stumbled upon the stone and the bottle broke against the stone that there is liability so that where the person stumbled because of the public ground though the bottle broke against the stone there would be exemption for even in the case where the person stumbled because of the public ground provided the bottle broke against the stone there is liability whose view is here followed of course that of Nathan R. Judah says if it was done intentionally he is liable but if unintentionally he is exempt what does intentionally denote Rabbi said it is sufficient if there was an intention to bring the pitcher below the shoulder said Abay to him does this imply that our mayor imposes liability even when the pitcher slipped down by sheer accident he answered him yes our mayor imposes liability even where the handle remained in the carrier's hand but why is it not sheer accident and has not the divine law? Prescribed exemption in cases of accident as recorded but unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing you can hardly suggest this ruling to apply only to capital punishment whereas regarding damages there should always be liability for it was taught if his pitcher broke and he did not remove the pot's hurts or his camel fell down and he did not raise it our mayor orders payment for any damage resulting therefom whereas the sages maintain Talmud, Mas Baba Kama that no action can be instituted against him in civil courts though there is liability according to divine justice the sages agree however with our mayor that in the case of a stone and knife and luggage which were left on the top of the roof and fell down because of a wind of usual occurrence and did damage there will be liability our mayor on the other hand agrees with the sages that regarding bottles that were placed upon the top of the roof for the purpose of getting dry and fell down because of a wind of unusual occurrence and did damage there is exemption does not this prove that even regarding damages all agree that there is exemption in cases of sheer accident Abay therefore said it is on two points that they differ in the Mishnah they differ regarding damage done at the time of the fall of the pitcher and they again differ regarding damage occasioned by the pots hurt subsequently to the fall the difference of opinion regarding damage done at the time of the fall of the pitcher arises on the question whether stumbling implies negligence or not one master maintaining that stumbling does imply negligence whereas the other master is of the opinion that stumbling does not necessarily imply negligence the point at issue in the case of damage occasioned by the pots hurt subsequently to the fall is the law is applicable to abandoned nuisances one master maintaining that for damage occasioned by abandoned nuisances there is liability whereas the other master maintains exemption but how can you prove this from the text which presents two independent cases as follows someone slipped in the water or was injured by the pots hurt for indeed is not one case the same as the other unless it was intended to convey someone slipped in the water while the pitcher had been falling or was injured by the pots hurt subsequently to the fall now that the mission presents two independent cases it is only reasonable to assume that the very the similarly deals with the same two problems that is all very well as regards the pitcher where the two problems have application in the case of damage done at the time of the fall or subsequently to the fall respectively but how in the case of the camel for though concerning damage occasion subsequently to the fall it may well have application where the carcass has been abandoned yet in the case of damage done at the time of the fall what point of difference can be found are aha thereupon said it deals with the case where the camel was let in water along the slippery shore of a river but under what circumstances if where there was another better way is it not a case of culpa if on the other hand there was no other way to pass through is it not a case of no alternative the point at issue can therefore only be where the driver stumbled and together with him the camel also stumbled but in the case of abandoning nuisances where could the condition of intention laid down by Arjuna come and said Arjuna said intention in this case refers to the retaining of the ownership of the pots hurt so also said Arashi that
that there is a difference of opinion, but how in the case of damage done at the time of the fall would there be unanimity granting exemption? Surely are you had an statement further on that we should not think that the mission of there follows the view of Armadier who maintains that stumbling constitutes carelessness implies that Armadier imposes liability. What else would you suggest that there be unanimity imposing liability? Surely the very statement made further on by Aryohanan himself that we should not think that the mission of there follows the view of Armadier implies that the rabbis would exempt. Hence what he Aryohanan intends to convey to us is that abandoned nuisances have only in this connection been exempted from liability by the rabbis since the very inception of the nuisances was by accident, whereas abandoned nuisances in other circumstances involve liability, even according to the rabbis, it was stated in the case of abandoned nuisances causing damage are Yohanan and are. Eliezer differ one imposes liability and the other maintains exemption. May we not say that the one imposing liability follows the view of Armadier, whereas the other who maintains exemption follows that of the rabbis as to Armadier's view. No one could dispute that there should be liability where they differ as to the view of the rabbis. The one who exempts does so because of the rabbis, while the other who imposes liability can say to you, it is I who follow the view even of the rabbis for the rabbis who declare abandoned nuisances exempt do so only in one particular connection where the very inception of the nuisances had been by accident, whereas abandoned nuisances in other connections involve liability. May it not be concluded that it was our Eliezer who imposed liability for our Eliezer said in the name of our Ishmael, there are two laws dealing with matters that are really not within the ownership of man but which are regarded by scripture as if they were under his ownership. They are the following pit in public ground and leaven after midday on Passover Eve it may indeed be concluded thus but did our Eliezer really say so did not our Eliezer express himself to the contrary for we have learned if a man turns up dung that had been lying on public ground and another person is subsequently injured thereby there is liability for the damage and our Eliezer thereupon said this Mishnah ruling applies only to one who by turning over the dung intended to acquire title to it for if he had not intended to acquire title to it there would be exemption now does not this prove that abandoned nuisances are exempt our Adabi Ahabah suggested that the amendment made by our Eliezer referred to one who has restored the dung to its previous position Robin thus said the instance given by our Adabi Ahabah may have its equivalent in the case of one who on coming across an open pit covered it but opened it up again but Mars the son of Armari said to Robin what a comparison in the latter case by merely covering the pit the evil deed of the original offender has not yet been undone whereas in the case before us by removing the dung from its place the evil deed of the original offender has been undone may it not therefore on the other hand have its equivalent only in the case of one who on coming across an open pit filled it up with earth but dug it out again where since the nuisance created by the original offender had already been completely removed by filling in the pit it stands altogether under the responsibility of the new offender our Ashi therefore suggested that the amendment made by our Eliezer referred to one who turned over the dung within the first three handbreadths of the ground in which case the nuisance created by the original offender is not yet considered in law as abetted but what influenced our Eliezer to make the Mishnah ruling refer to one who turned over the dung within the first three handbreadths of the ground and thus to confine its application only to one who intended to acquire title to the dung excluding thereby one who did not intend to acquire title to it why not indeed make the ruling refer to one who turned over the dung above the first three handbreadths so that even where one did not intend to acquire title to it the liability should hold good robber thereupon said because of a difficulty in the Mishnah text which occurred to him why indeed have turning up in the Mishnah text and not Simply raising if not to indicate that turning up implies within the first three handbreadths of the ground now then that our Eliezer was the one who maintained liability our Yohanan would of course be the one who maintained exemption but could our Yohanan really maintain this surely we have learned if a man hides thorns and broken glass in public ground or makes offensive thorns or if a man's fence falls upon public ground and damage results therefrom to another person there is liability for the damage and our Yohanan thereupon said this Mishnah ruling refers to a case where the thorns were projecting into the public thoroughfare for if they were confined within private premises there would be exemption now why should there be exemption in the case where they were confined within private premises if not because they would only constitute a nuisance on private premises does this then not imply that it is only a nuisance created upon public ground that involves liability proving thus that abandoned nuisances do involve liability. No, it may still be suggested that abandoned nuisances are exempt. The reason for the exemption in the case of thorns confined to private premises is as it has already been stated in this connection that Araha, the son of Rika, said because it is not the habit of men to rub themselves against walls. But again, could Aryohanan really maintain this? Surely Aryohanan stated the halachah is in accordance with anonymous Mishnah rulings, and we have learned. If a man digs a pit in public ground and an ox or ass falls in and dies, there is liability. Does this not prove that there is liability for a pit dug in public ground? It must therefore be concluded that Aryohanan was indeed the one who maintained liability. Now then, that Aryohanan was the one who maintained liability. Our Eliezer would of course be the one who maintained exemption, but did not our Eliezer say Talmud, Mas Babakama, Talmud, Mas Babakama in the name of Arishmael, etc., which Proofs that abandoned nuisances do involve liability. This presents no difficulty. One view is his own, whereas the other is that of his master mission. If a man pours out water into public ground and some other person is injured by it, there is liability for the damage. If he hides thorns and broken glass or makes offensive thorns, or if a fence falls into the public ground and damage results therefrom to some other persons, there is similarly liability for the damage. Kamara Rab said this. Mishnah ruling refers only to a case where his garments were soiled in the water for regarding injury to himself. There should be exemption since it was ownerless ground that hurt him. But Arhuna said to Rab, why should not the topmost layer of the ground mixed up with private water be considered as private clay? Do you suggest the ruling to refer to water that has not dried up? No, it deals with a case where the water has already dried up. But why at all two texts for one and the same? Ruling one text refers to the summer season whereas the other deals with winter as indeed explicitly taught elsewhere all those who open their gutters or sweep out the dust of their cellars into public thoroughfares are in the summer period acting unlawfully but lawfully in winter in all cases even though when acting lawfully if special damage resulted they are liable to compensate if he hides thorns etc. Are you said this Mishnah ruling refers only to a case where the thorns were projecting into the public ground for if they were confined within private premises there would be no liability on what account is their exemption in the latter case Araha the son of Rika thereupon answered because it is not the habit of men to rub themselves against walls our rabbis taught if one hit thorns and broken glasses in a neighbor's wall and the owner of the wall came and pulled his wall down so that they fell into the public ground and did damage the one who hit them is liable. Aryohan and thereupon said this ruling refers only to an impaired wall for in the case of a strong wall the one who hit the thorns should be exempt while the owner of the wall would be liable Robin commented this ruling proves that where a man covers his pit with a neighbor's lid and the owner of the lid comes and removes his lid the owner of the pit would be liable for any damage that may subsequently be caused by his pit is not this inference quite obvious you might perhaps have suggested this ruling to be confined to the case there where the owner of the wall had no knowledge of the identity of the person who hid the thorns in the wall and was accordingly unable to inform him of the intended pulling down of the wall whereas in the case of the pit where the owner of the lid very well knew the identity of the owner of the pit you might have argued that it was his duty to inform him of the intended removal of the lid it is therefore made known to us that this is not the case our rabbis taught the pious men of former generations used to hide their thorns and broken glasses in the midst of their fields at a depth of three handbreadths below the surface so that even the plow might not be hindered by them our hate used to throw them into the fire rabba threw them into the tigris rab judah said he who wishes to be pious must in the first instance particularly fulfill the laws of satanism but rabba said the matters dealt with in the tractate a both still others said matters dealt with in barakoth mission if a man removes his straw and stubble into the public ground to be formed into manure and damage results to some other person there is liability for the damage and whoever seizes them first acquires title to them our simian begamaliel says whoever creates any nuisances on public ground causing special damage is liable
as indeed explicitly taught Arjuna says in the case of a Hanukkah candle there is exemption on account of the sanction of the performance of a religious duty come and here in all those cases where the authorities permitted nuisances to be created on public ground if special damage results there will be liability to compensate but Arjuna maintains exemption R. Naman said the Mishnah refers to the time when it is not the season to take out foliage and thus it may be in accordance with R. Judah Arashi further said Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi the Mishnah states his straw and stubble which are slippery and may never be removed into public ground even according to Arjuna whoever seizes them first acquires title to them Rab said both to their corpus and to their increase in value whereas Zeir said only to their increase but not to their corpus wherein is the point at issue Rab maintains that they, the rabbis extended the penalty to the corpus on account of the increase. There up but Zeir is of the opinion that they did not extend the penalty to the corpus on account of the increase thereof we have learned if he turns up dung that had been lying on public ground and damage subsequently results to another person he is liable for the damage now in this case it is not stated that whoever seizes it first acquires title to it this ruling has been inserted in the commencing clause and applies as well to the concluding clause but has it not in this connection. Been taught in a that they are prohibited to be taken possession of on account of the law of robbery when the Baritha states they are prohibited on account of robbery. The reference is to all the cases presented in the Mishnah text and is intended to protect the one who had seized of them first having thereby acquired title to them, but surely it was not meant by seeing that it was taught if a man removes straw and stubble into the public ground to be formed into manure. And damage results to another person he is liable for the damage and whoever seizes them first acquires title to them as this may be done irrespective of the law of robbery. However, where he turns up dung on public ground and damage subsequently results to another person he is liable to compensate, but no possession may be taken of the dung on account of the law of robbery. Arnaman B. Isaac thereupon explained what an objection to it is from the case of dung it is only in the case. Of an object that is susceptible to increase in value that the penalty is extended to the corpus for the purpose of discouraging any idea of gain whereas with regard to an object that yields no increase there is no penalty at all the question was asked according to the view that the penalty extends also to the corpus for the purpose of discouraging the idea of gain is this penalty imposed at once or is it only after some gain has been produced that the penalty will be imposed come and here an objection was raised against rap from the case of dung but do you really think this solves the problem the objection from the case of dung was raised only before Arnaman expounded the underlying principle for after the explanation given by Arnaman what objection indeed could there be raised from the case of dung might not one suggest the argument between rap and Zeir to have been the point at issue between the following tanaim for it was taught if a bill contains a Stipulation of interest the penalty is imposed so that neither the principle nor the interest is enforced these are the words of our mayor whereas the sages maintain that the principle is enforced though not the interest now can we not say that rab adopts the view of our mayor whereas zeir follows that of the rabbis rab may explain himself to you as follows i made my statement even according to the rabbis for the rabbis maintain their view only there where the principle as such is quite lawful whereas here in the case of nuisances the corpus itself is liable to do damage zeir on the other hand may explain himself to you thus i made my statement even in accordance with our mayor for our mayor expressed his view only there where immediately at the time of the bill having been drawn up the evil had been committed by stipulating the usury whereas here in the case of nuisances who can assert that special damage will result might not one suggest the argument between rab and zeir to have been the point at issue between these ten aim for it was taught if a man removes straw and stubble into the public ground to be formed into manure and damage results to another person he is liable for the damage and whoever seizes them first acquires title to them they are prohibited to be taken possession of on account of the law of robbery R. Simeon B. Gamaliel says whoever creates any nuisances on public ground and causes special damage is liable to compensate though whoever takes possession of them first acquires title to them and this may be done irrespective of the law of robbery now is not the text a contradiction in itself you read whoever seizes them first acquires title to them and you state in the same breath they are prohibited to be taken possession of on account of the law of robbery it must therefore mean thus whoever seizes them first acquires title to them is to their increase whereas they are prohibited to be taken possession of on account of the law of robbery refers to their corpus Arsimian B. Gamaliel thereupon proceeded to state that even concerning their corpus whoever seizes them first acquires title to them now according to Zeir his view must unquestionably have been the point at issue between these tanaim but according to Rab are we similarly to say that his view was the point at issue between these tanaim Rab may say to you it is indeed unanimously held that the penalty must extend to the corpus for the purpose of discouraging the idea of gain the point at issue between the tanaim here is whether this halacha should be made the practical rule of the law for it was stated Arhu not on behalf of Rab said this halacha should not be made the practical rule of the law whereas Arhu Abiyahaba said this halacha should be made the practical rule of the law but is this really so did not Arhu not declare barley that had been spread out on public ground ownerless just as Arhu Abiyahaba declared Talmud. Mas Baba Kama, the refuse of boiled dates that had been placed on public ground ownerless we can well understand this in the case of our Adabi Ahaba who acted in accordance with his own dictum but in the case of our Hunat are we to say that he changed his view these owners in that case had been warned several times not to repeat the nuisance mission if two potters were following one another and the first stumbled and fell down and the second stumbled because of the first the first is liable for the damage done to the second Gemara are Yohanan said do not think that the tana of this mission is our mayor who considers stumbling as implying carelessness that involves liability for even according to the rabbis who maintain that stumbling is mere accident for which there is exemption there should be liability here where he had meanwhile had every possibility to rise and nevertheless did not rise but our Naman B. Isaac said you may even say that the mission speaks also of a Case where he did not yet have any opportunity to rise, for he was surely able to caution and nevertheless did not caution. Our Yohanan, however, considers that where he did not yet have any opportunity to rise, he could hardly be expected to caution as he was surely somewhat distracted. We have learned if the carrier of the beam was in front, the carrier of the barrel behind, and the barrel broke by gliding with the beam, he is exempt. But if the carrier of the beam stopped suddenly, he is liable. Now, does this not mean that he stopped for the purpose of shouldering the beam as is usual with carriers, and it yet says that he is liable presumably because he failed to caution? No, he suddenly stopped to rest, which is rather unusual in the course of carrying. But what should be the law in the case where he stopped to shoulder the beam? Would there then be exemption? Why then state in the subsequent clause where he, however, warned the carrier of the barrel to stop, he is exempt? Good. The distinction not be made in the statement of the same case in the following manner provided that he stopped to rest but if he halted to shift the burden on his shoulder he is exempt it was however intended to let us know that even where he stopped to rest if he warned the carrier of the barrel to stop he is exempt come and here if a number of potters or glass carriers were walking in line and the first stumbled and fell and the second stumbled because of the first and the third because of the second the first is liable for the damage occasion to the second and the second is liable for the damage occasion to the third where however they all fell because of the first the first is liable for the damage sustained by them all if on the other hand they cautioned one another there is exemption now does this teaching not deal with the case where there has not yet been any opportunity to rise no on the contrary they have already had every opportunity to rise but what should be the law in the case where they have not yet had any opportunity to rise would there then be exemption if so why state in the concluding clause if on the other hand they cautioned one another there is exemption could the distinction not be made in the statement of the same case in the following manner provided that they have already had every opportunity to rise but if they have not yet had any opportunity to rise there is exemption this is what it intended to let us know that even where they have already had every opportunity to rise if they cautioned one another there is exemption Rabbi said the first is liable for damage done to the second whether directly by his person or by means of his chattels whereas the second is liable for damage to the third only if done by his person but not if caused by his chattels now in any case how could these rulings be made consistent for if stumbling implies carelessness why should not also the second be liable for all Kinds of damage if on the other hand stumbling does not amount to carelessness
Could there be in all of them why indeed not say the plaintiff's robber therefore said the first is liable for both injuries inflicted upon the person of the second and damage caused to the chattels of the second whereas the second is liable to compensate the third only for injuries inflicted upon his person but not for damage to his chattels the reason being that the person of the second is subject to the law applicable to Pitt and no case can be found where Pitt would involve liability for inanimate objects this accords well with the view of Samuel who holds that all nuisances are subject to the law applicable to Pitt but according to Rav who maintains that it is only where the nuisance has been abandoned that this is so whereas if not abandoned it is not so what reason could be advanced we must therefore accept the first version and as to the objection raised by you from the very that all of them are liable it has already been interpreted by our Adabi in the presence. Of Rabbinah to refer to a case where inanimate objects have been damaged by the chattels of the defendant, the master stated where however they all fell because of the first, the first is liable for the damage sustained by them all. How indeed can they all fall because of the first? Our Papa said where he blocked the road like a carcass closing the whole width of the road. Arzibit said like a blind man's staff mission if one comes with his barrel and another comes with his beam and it. Picture of this one breaks by collision with the beam of this one, he is exempt for the one is entitled to walk there and carry beams and the other is entitled to walk there and carry barrels where the carrier of the beam was in front and the carrier of the barrel behind and the barrel broke by collision with the beam. The carrier of the beam is exempt. Talmud, Mas Babakama, but if the carrier of the beam suddenly stopped, he is liable if however he cried to the carrier of the barrel. Halt he is exempt where however the carrier of the barrel was in front and the carrier of the beam behind and the barrel broke by collision with the beam he is liable if however the carrier of the barrel suddenly stopped he is exempt but where he cried to the carrier of the beam halt he is liable the same applies to one carrying a burning candle while another was proceeding with flax Gemara Rabbi Nathan questioned Arhunat if a man injures his wife through conjugal intercourse what is the legal position since he performed this act with full permission is he to be exempt for damage resulting therefrom or should perhaps greater care have been taken by him he said to him we have learned it for the one is entitled to walk there and carry beams and the other is entitled to walk there and carry barrels Rabbi however said there is an afforciori to the contrary if in the case of the wood where this one the defendant was entering as if into his own domain and the other the plaintiff was similarly entering as if into his own domain it is nevertheless considered in the eye of the law that he entered his fellows the plaintiff's domain and he is made liable should this case where this one the defendant was actually entering the domain of his fellow the plaintiff not be all the more subject to the same law but surely the mission states for the one is entitled to walk there and carry beams and the other is entitled to walk there and carry barrels indicating exemption where the entry was sanctioned there both of the parties were simultaneously active against each other whereas here it was only he that committed the deed as she considered not to have participated in the act at all is it not written the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people it is true that enjoyment is derived by both of them but it is only he to whom the active part can be ascribed where the carrier of the beam was in front etc Resh Lakish stated in the case of two cows on public ground one lying down maliciously and the other walking about if the one that was walking kicked the one that was lying there is exemption since the latter two misconducted itself by laying itself down on public ground whereas if the one that was lying kicked the one that was walking there is liability to pay may not the following be cited in support of this where the carrier of the beam was in front and the carrier of the barrel behind. And the barrel broke by collision with the beam he is exempt but if the carrier of the beam suddenly stopped he is liable for surely this latter case here is similar to that of the lying cow kicking the walking cow and liability is stated but do you really think that this liability need be proved the Mishnaic text however not only fails to be of any support in this respect but affords a contradiction to Resh Lakish in whose view the reason even for the liability is that the Lying cow kicked the walking cow thus implying that the latter sustained damage because of the former cow through sheer accident and there would be exemption now the case of the Mishnah surely deals with accidental damage and still states liability the Mishnah deals with the case where the beam blocked the whole passage as if by a carcass whereas here in the case dealt with by Resh Lakish the cow was lying on one side of the road so that the other cow should have passed on it. Other side but the concluding clause may be taken to support Resh Lakish where it is stated but if the carrier of the barrel was in front and the carrier of the beam behind and the barrel broke by collision with the beam he is liable if however the carrier of the barrel suddenly stopped he is exempt now surely this case resembles that of the walking cow kicking the lying cow and the text states exemption no the Mishnah deals with the case where the damage was done in a usual manner as he was passing in the ordinary way whereas here in the case dealt with by Resh Lakish it may be argued for the lying cow even if you are entitled to tread upon me you have still no right to kick me mission if two persons were passing one another on public ground one of them running and the other walking or both of them running and they were injured by each other both of them are exempt Gemara our mission is not in accordance with Isibi Judah for it has been taught Isibi Judah maintains that the man who had been running is liable since his conduct was unusual Isibi however agrees that if it were on a Sabbath before sunset there would be exemption for running at that time is permissible Ar Yohanan stated that the Halachah is in accordance with Isibi Judah but did Ar Yohanan really maintain this as Ar Yohanan not laid down the rule that the Halachah is in accordance with the ruling of an anonymous mission now did we not learn one of them running and the other Walking or both of them running both of them are exempt our mission deals with the case of a Sabbath before sunset what proof have you of that from the text or both of them running both of them are exempt for indeed what need was there for this to be inserted if in the case where one was running and the other walking there is exemption could there be any doubt where both of them were running it must accordingly mean thus where one was running and the other walking there is exemption provided however it was on a Sabbath before sunset for if on a weekday in the case of one running and the other walking there would be liability whereas where both of them were running even though on a weekday they would be exempt the master stated is he however agrees that if it were on a Sabbath before sunset there would be exemption for running at that time is permissible on Sabbath why is it permissible as shown by our Hannah for our Hannah used to say Talmud Moss. Baba Kama become let us go forth to meet the bride the queen some explicitly read to meet Sabbath the bride the queen Arjane however while dressed in his Sabbath attire used to remain standing and say come thou O queen come thou O queen Mishnah if a man splits wood on private premises and does damage on public ground or on public ground and does damage on private premises or on private premises and does damage on another's private premises he is liable Gemara and all the cases enumerated are necessary as serving respective purposes for if the Mishnah had stated only the case of splitting wood on private premises and doing damage on public ground the ruling could have been ascribed to the fact that the damage occurred at a place where many people were to be found whereas in the case of splitting wood on public ground and doing damage on private premises since the damage occurred in a place where many people were not to be found the opposite ruling might have been Suggested again if the Mishnah had dealt only with the case of splitting wood on public ground and doing damage on private premises the ruling could have been explained on the ground that the act was even at the very outset unlawful whereas in the case of splitting wood on private premises and doing damage on public ground in view of the fact that the act as such was quite lawful the opposite view might have been suggested again if the Mishnah had dealt only with these two cases the ruling could have been explained in the one case on account of the damage having occurred at a place where many people were to be found and in the other on account of the unlawfulness of the act whereas in the case of splitting wood on private premises and doing damage on another's private premises since the damage occurred in a place where many people were not to be found and the act was quite lawful even at the very outset the opposite view might have been suggested it was hence Essential to state explicitly all these cases are rabbis taught if a man entered the workshop of a joiner without permission and a ship of wood flew off and struck him in the face and killed him he the joiner is exempt but if he entered with the permission of the joiner he is liable liable for what our Jose B. Hanna said he is liable for the four additional items whereas regarding the law of refuge he is still exempt on account of the fact that the circumstances of this case do not exactly resemble those of the wood for in the case of the wood the one the plaintiff was entering as if into his own domain and the other the defendant was similarly entering as if into his own domain whereas in this case
Had to bear in mind that a person might sometimes digest through one additional stroke while then state he is liable to take refuge on his account. Arshimai of Nihardia thereupon said the officer committed the offense as he made a mistake in counting the number of strokes but not tapped Arshimai's shoe and said to him is it he who is responsible for the counting of the strokes was it not taught the senior judge recites the prescribed verses the second to him conducts the Counting of the strokes and the third directs each stroke to be administered. No sent Arshimai of Nihardia and was the judge himself who made the mistake in counting. A further objection was raised if a man throws a stone into a public thoroughfare and kills there by a human being, he is liable to take refuge. Now does not the offense here committed inadvertently approach willful carelessness, for surely he had to bear in mind that on a public thoroughfare many people were to be found. Yet it states he is liable to take refuge. Our Samuel B. Isaac said the offender threw the stone while he was pulling down his wall, but should he not have kept his eyes open, he was pulling it down at night. But even at night time, should he not have kept his eyes open, he was in fact pulling his wall down in the daytime, but was throwing it towards a dunghill. But how are we to picture this dunghill if many people were to be found there? Is it not a case of willful carelessness if, on the other hand, Many were not to be found there is it not sheer accident our papa thereupon said it could indeed have no application unless in the case of a dunghill where it was customary for people to resort at night time but not customary to resort during the day though it occasionally occurred that some might come to sit there even in the daytime it is therefore not a case of willful carelessness since it was not customary for people to resort there during the day nor is it sheer accident since it occasionally occurred that some people did come to sit there even in the daytime our papa in the name of robber referred to remark of our Jose B. Hanna to the commencing clause if a man entered the workshop of a joiner without permission and a ship of wood flew off and struck him in the face and killed him he is exempt and our Jose B. Hanna thereupon remarked he would be liable for the four additional items though he is exempt from having to take refuge he refers this remark to the Concluding clause will with more reason refer it to the commencing clause whereas he refers it to the commencing clause maintains that in the case dealt with in the concluding clause where the entrance had been made with the permission of the joiner he would be liable to take refuge but would he be liable to take refuge in that case was it not taught if a man enters the workshop of a smith and sparks fly off and strike him in the face causing his death he the smith is exempt even where the entrance had been made by permission of the smith in this very here we are dealing with an apprentice of the smith is an apprentice of a smith to be killed with impunity where his master had been urging him to leave but he did not leave but even where his master had been urging him to leave which he did not do may he be killed with impunity where the master believed that he had already left if so why should not the same apply also to a stranger Talmud, Mas Baba a stranger need not fear the master smith, whereas the apprentice is in fear of his master Arzi, but in the name of Rob referred to remark of our Jose B. Hanna to the following the verse and it lighteth upon his neighbor excludes a case where the neighbor brings himself within the range of the missile, hence the statement made by our Eliza B. Jacob if a man lets fly a stone out of his hand and another at that moment puts out his head through a window and receives the blow and is killed he is exempt now it was with reference to this case that our Jose B. Hanna said he is exempt from having to take refuge but he would be liable for the four additional items he refers this remark to this last case will with more reason refer it to the cases dealt with previously whereas he refers it to those dealt with previously would maintain that in this last case the exemption is from all kinds of liability our rabbis taught if employees come to the private residence of their employer to demand their wages from him and it so happens that their employer's ox scores them or their employer's dog bites them with fatal results he the employer is exempt from ransom others however maintain that employees have the right to come and demand their wages from their employer now what were the circumstances of the case if the employer could be found in his city offices what reason could be a for the view maintained by the others if on the other hand he could be found only at home what reason could be given for the anonymous view expressed by the first hand and know the application of the cases where the employer could sometimes be found in his city offices but could not always be found there the employees therefore called at his private door when the reply was yes one view maintains that yes implies enter and come in but the other view maintains that yes may signify remain standing in the place where you are it has Indeed been taught in accordance with the view maintaining that yes may in this case signify remain standing in the place where you are for it has been taught if an employee enters the private residence of his employer to demand his wages from him and the employer's ox scores him or the employer's dog bites him he the employer is exempt even where the entrance had been made by permission why should there indeed be exemption unless in the case where he called at the door and the employer said yes this thus proves that yes in such a case signifies remain standing in the place where you are mission in the case of two tam oxen injuring each other the payment of the difference will be in accordance with the law of half damages where both were mu had the payment of the difference will be in full where one was tam and the other mu had the payment of the difference for damage done by mu had to tam will be on the basis of full compensation whereas the payment of the difference for Damage done by Tam to Muad will be in accordance with the law of half damages. Similarly, in the case of two persons injuring each other, the payment of the difference will be in full. Where man has damaged Muad and Muad has injured man, the payment of the difference will be in full. But where man damaged Tam and Tam injured man, the payment of the difference for damage done by man to Tam will be on the basis of full compensation. Whereas the payment of the difference for damage done by Tam to Muad will be in accordance with the law of half damages. Our Akiva, however, says even in the case of Tam injuring man, the payment of the difference will be in full. Tomorrow, our rabbis taught the words of the Torah according to this judgment shall be done unto it. Imply that the judgment in the case of ox damaging ox applies also in the case of ox injuring man, just as where ox has damaged ox, half damages are paid in the case of Tam and full compensation in the case of Muad. So also where ox has. Injured man only half damages will be paid in the case of Tam and full compensation in the case of Muad. Our Akiba, however, says the words according to this judgment refer to the ruling that would apply to the circumstances described in the latter verse and not in the former verse. Could this then mean that the full payment is to be made out of the best of the estate? Not so for it is stated shall it be done unto itself to emphasize that payment will be made out of the body of Tam, but no payment is to be made out of any other source whatsoever. According to the rabbis, then what purpose is served by the word this to exempt from liability for the four additional items? Whence then does our Akiba derive the exemption in this case from liability for the four additional items? He derives it from the text and if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, which indicates that there is liability only where man injures his neighbor, but not where ox injures the neighbor of it. Owner and the rabbis had the deduction been from that text we might have referred it exclusively to pain but as to medical expenses and loss of time we might have held there is still a liability to pay we are therefore told that this is not the case mission if an ox tam of the value of 100 zuz has scored an ox of the value of 200 zuz and the carcass had no value at all the plaintiff will take possession of the defendant's ox that did the damage Amari who is the author of our mission it is our akiba as it has been taught the ox that did the damage has to be assessed by the court of law this is a view of our ishmael our akiba however says the body of the ox becomes transferred to the plaintiff what is the point at issue our ishmael maintains that he the plaintiff is but a creditor and that he has only a claim of money against him the defendant whereas our akiba is of the opinion that they both the plaintiff and defendant become the owners in common of the ox that did the damage they thus also differ as to the interpretation of the verse then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money of it. Our Ishmael maintains that it is the court on which this injunction is laid by divine law whereas our Akiva is of the opinion that it is the plaintiff and defendant on which it is laid. What is the practical difference between our Ishmael and our Akiva? There is a practical difference between them where the plaintiff consecrated the ox that did the damage. Rabba put the following question to our nom and should the defendant meanwhile dispose of the ox what would be the law according to our Ishmael? Shall we say that since our Ishmael considers the plaintiff to be a creditor whose claim against the defendant is only regarding money the sale is valid or that Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi since the ox is mortgaged to the plaintiff the defendant has no right to dispose of it. He replied the sale is not valid but has it not been taught in the case of the defendant having disposed of the ox the sale is valid the plaintiff will still be entitled to come forward and dist rain on it from the
Follow only the view of our Ishmael who said that the ox has to be assessed by the court if on the other hand it has been disposed of by the plaintiff would not the opening clause where he sold the ox the sale is not valid be in accordance with the view of our Ishmael while the concluding clause where he consecrated it the consecration holds good could follow only the view of our Akiba we may still say that it was the defendant who disposed of it and yet both rulings will be in agreement. With all where he sold the ox the sale is valid may be explained even in accordance with our Ishmael for the ox's mortgage to the plaintiff where he consecrated it the consecration holds good may again be interpreted even in accordance with our Akiba on account of the reason given by our Arabah for our Arabah elsewhere stated an extra precaution was taken lest people should say that consecrated objects could lose their status even without any act of redemption our rabbis taught if an ox does. Damage while still tam and as long as its case has not been brought up in court if it is sold the sale is valid if it is consecrated the consecration holds good if slaughtered and given away as a gift what has been done is legally effective but after the case has come into court if it is sold the sale is not valid if consecrated the consecration does not hold good if slaughtered and given away as a gift the acts have no legal effect so also where other creditors stepped in first and dist reigned on the ox while in the hands of the defendant no matter whether the debt had been incurred before the goring took place or whether the goring had occurred before the debt was incurred the distraint is not legally effective since the compensation for the damage must be made out of the body of the ox that did it but in the case of muad doing damage there is no difference whether the case had already been brought into court or whether it had not yet come into court if it has been Sold the sale is valid if consecrated the consecration holds good if slaughtered and given away as a gift what has been done is legally effective where other creditors have stepped in and dist reigned on the ox no matter whether the debt had been contracted before the goring took place or whether the goring had taken place before the debt was incurred the distraint is legally effective since the compensation is paid out of the best of the general estate of the defendant the master stated if it is sold the sale is valid this can refer to plowing done by the ox while with the vendee if consecrated the consecration holds good on account of the reason given by our vow if slaughtered and given away as a gift what has been done is legally effective we can quite understand that where it has been given away as a gift the act should be legally effective in respect of the plowing meanwhile done by the ox but in the case of it having been slaughtered why should the claimant not Come and obtain payment out of the flesh was it not taught the live ox the states the rule for when it was alive whence do we know that the same holds good even after it has been slaughtered because it says further and they shall sell the ox i.e. in all circumstances arshiz be therefore said what is referred to must be the diminution in value occasioned by its having been slaughtered are who not the son of joshua thereupon said this proves that if a man impairs securities mortgage to his creditor he incurs no liability is this not obvious it might perhaps have been suggested that it was only there where the defendant could argue i have not deprived you of anything at all of the quantity and could even say it is only the mere breath of life that i have taken away from your security that there should be exemption whereas in the case of impairing securities in general there should be liability we are therefore told that this is not the case but has not this been pointed out by Rabbi for has not Rabbi stated if a man destroys by fire the documents of a neighbor he incurs no liability it might perhaps have been suggested that it was only there where the defendant could contend it was only a mere piece of paper of yours that has actually been burnt that there should be exemption whereas in the case of spoiling a field held as security by digging their pit stitches and caves there should be liability we are therefore told that this is not so for in the case here the damage resembles that occasioned by digging pit stitches and caves and yet it is laid down that what has been done is legally effective where other creditors stepped in first and dist reigned on the ox in the hands of the defendant no matter whether the debt had been incurred before the goring took place or whether the goring had taken place before the debt was incurred the distraint is not legally effective since the compensation must be made out of the body of the ox that did the damage we understand is where the goring has taken place before the debt was incurred in which case the plaintiff for damages has priority but why should it be so where the debt has been contracted before the goring took place seeing that in that case the creditor for the debt has priority Talmud, Mas Baba Kama Talmud, Mas Baba Kama moreover even where the goring had taken place before the debt was contracted was not the creditor actually first in taking possession of the ox. Can it be concluded from this that where a creditor of a subsequent date has preceded a creditor of an earlier date in DIST reigning on the property of the debtor the distraint is of no legal avail no I may still maintain that in this case the distraint holds good whereas in the case there it is altogether different as the plaintiff for damages may argue had the ox already been with you before it would I not have been entitled to DIST reign on it while in your hands for surely out of the ox that did the damage I am to be compensated our rabbis taught where an ox of the value of 200 zoos scored an ox of the same value of 200 zoos and injured it to the amount of 50 zoos but it so happened that the injured ox subsequently improved and reached the value of 400 zoos since it can be contended that but for the injury it would have reached the value of 800 zoos compensation will be still paid as at the time of the damage where it has depreciated the compensation will be paid in accordance with the value at the time of the case being brought into court where it was the ox which did the damage that subsequently improved the compensation will still be made in accordance with the value at the time of the damage where it has on the other hand depreciated the compensation will be made in accordance with the value at the time of the case being brought into court the master has said where it was the ox which did the damage that Subsequently improved the compensation will still be made as at the time of the damage this ruling is in accordance with our Ishmael who maintains that the plaintiff is a creditor and he has a pecuniary claim against him the defendant read now the concluding clause where it on the other hand depreciated the compensation will be made in accordance with the value at the time of the case being brought into court this ruling on the other hand follows the view of our Akiva that they both plaintiff and defendant become the owners in common of the ox that did the damage is it possible that the first clause should follow the view of our Ishmael and the second clause follow that of our Akiva no the whole teaching follows the view of our Akiva for we deal here with the case where the improvement was due to the defendant having fattened the ox if the improvement was due to fattening how could you explain the opening clause where the injured ox subsequently improved and reached the Value of 400 zoos compensation will be paid as at the time of the damage for where the improvement was due to the act of fattening by the owner what need could there have been to state that compensation for the original damage has still to be paid our papa thereupon said the ruling in the opening clause applies to all cases whether where the ox improved by special fattening or where it improved by itself the statement of the rule was required for the case where the ox improved by itself even then compensation will be paid as at time of the damage the ruling in the concluding clause however could apply only to a case where the improvement was due to special fattening where it has depreciated the compensation will be made in accordance with the value at the time of the case being brought into court through what can it have depreciated shall I say that it has depreciated through hard work in that case surely the defendant can say you cause it to depreciate could you Expect me to pay for it or Ashi thereupon said the depreciation referred to is due to the injury in which case the plaintiff is entitled to contend the evil effect of the horn of your ox is still buried within the suffering animal mission where an ox of the value of 200 ZUZ gored an ox of the same value of 200 ZUZ and the carcass had no value at all our said that it was with reference to this case that it is written and they shall sell the live ox and divide the money. Of it Arjuta however said this is certainly the halacha but while you fulfill by this ruling the injunction and they shall sell the live ox and divide the money of it you do not fulfill the next injunction and the dead ox also they shall divide the case dealt with by scripture is therefore where an ox of the value of 200 ZUZ gored an ox of the same value of 200 ZUZ and the carcass was worth 50 ZUZ one party would here get half of the living ox together with half of the dead ox and the other party would similarly get half of the living ox together with half of the dead ox. Gemara our rabbis taught where an ox of the value of 200 zoos scored an ox of the same value of 200 zoos and the carcass was worth 50 zoos. One party would get half of the living ox together with half of the dead ox and the other party would similarly get half of the living ox together with half of the dead ox. This is the case of the goring ox dealt with in the Torah. According to the view of Arjuna, our mayor however says this is not the case of the goring ox dealt with in the Torah but where an ox of the value of 200 zoos scored an ox of
Loss in the value of the carcass has to be wholly sustained by the plaintiff, whereas Arjuna is of the opinion that the loss in the value of the carcass will be borne by the defendant to the extent of a half set of a to him. If this be the case, will it not turn out that according to Arjuna Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B injury by Tam would involve a more severe penalty than injury by Muad? And should you maintain that this indeed is so, as we have learned, Arjuna says in the case of Tam there is liability where the precaution taken to control the ox has not been adequate, whereas in the case of Muad there is no liability. It may be contended that you only heard Arjuna maintaining this with reference to precaution, which is specified in scripture. But did you ever hear him say this regarding compensation? Moreover, it has been taught Arjuna says one might say that where an ox of the value of a mina hundred zoos an ox of the value of five sela, i.e. twenty zoos and the carcass. Was worth a seller, i.e. for zoos, one party should get half of the living ox together with half of the dead ox, and the other party should similarly get half of the living ox and half of the dead ox. This cannot be so for we reason thus has Muad been singled out to entail a more severe penalty or a more lenient one. You must surely say to entail a more severe penalty now if in the case of Muad no payment is made but for the amount of the damage should this not the more so be true in the case of Tam the penalty in respect of which is less severe are you had and therefore said the practical difference between them arises where there has been an increase in the value of the carcass one master maintaining that it will accrue to the plaintiff whereas the other master holds that it will be shared equally by the two parties and it is just on account of this view that a difficulty was felt by Arjuna now that you say that the divine law is lenient to the defendant allowing him to share in the Increase of the value of the carcass, you might then presume that where an ox of the value of five sela, i.e. twenty zoos, scored an ox of the value of a main a hundred zoos, and the carcass was valued at fifty zoos, one party would take half of the living ox together with half of the dead ox, and the other party would similarly take half of the living ox and half of the dead ox. Say this cannot be so, for where could it elsewhere be found that an offender should by order of the court be made to benefit as you would have the offender here in this case to benefit? It is moreover stated he shall surely make restitution, emphasizing that the offender could only have to pay but never to receive payment. Why that additional quotation? Otherwise, you might have thought this principle to be confined only to a case where the plaintiff was a loser and that where no loss would be incurred to the plaintiff, as e.g., where an ox of the value of five sela, an ox similarly of the value of five. Sela i.e. 20 zoos and it so happened that the carcass increased in value and reached the amount of 30 zoos the defendant should indeed be entitled to share in the profit hence the verse he shall surely make full restitution is it is to emphasize that in all cases an offender could only have to pay but never to receive payment but our ahabi talafa said to rubba if so that the principle to compensate by half for the decrease in value brought about by the death is maintained only by our Mahir will it not be found that according to Arjuna Tam will involve the payment of more than half damages whereas the Torah emphatically stated and they shall sell the live ox and divide the money of it no Arjuna also holds that the decrease in value brought about by the death will be compensated by half in the body of the living ox whence could he derive this from the verse and the dead ox also they shall divide but did not Arjuna derive from this verse that one party will take Half of the living ox together with half of the dead ox and the other party will similarly take half of the living ox and half of the dead ox if that were all the text could have run and the dead ox they shall divide why insert also it shows that two lessons are to be derived from the verse Mishnah there are cases where there is liability for offenses committed by one's cattle though there would be no liability should these offenses be committed by oneself there are again cases where there is no liability for offenses committed by one's cattle though there would be liability were these offenses committed by oneself for instance if cattle has brought indignity upon a human being there is no liability whereas if the owner causes the indignity there would be liability so also if an ox puts out the eye of the owner's slave or knocks out his tooth there is no liability whereas if the owner himself has put out the eye of his slave or knocked out his tooth he would be liable to let him go free again if an ox has injured the father or mother of the owner there is liability though were the owner himself to injure his father or his mother there would be no civil liability so also where cattle has caused fire to be set to a barn on the day of sabbath there is liability whereas were the owner to set fire to a barn on sabbath there would be no civil liability as he would be subject to a capital charge kamara arabad recited in the presence of our and any work on the sabbath that has a destructive purpose entails no penalty for the violation of the sabbath with the exception however of the act of inflicting a bodily injury as also of the act of setting on fire said our and to him go and recite this outside for the exception made of the act of inflicting a bodily injury and of setting on fire is not part of the teaching and should you find grounds for maintaining that it is you may say that the infliction of a bodily injury refers to where the blood was required to feed a dog and in the case of setting on fire where there was some need of the ashes we have learned where cattle has caused fire to be set to a barn on the day of sabbath there is liability whereas were the owner to have set fire to a barn on sabbath there would be no civil liability now the act of the owner is here placed on a level with that of cattle which would show would it not that just as in the act of cattle there was certainly no intention to satisfy any need talmud mas babakama so also the owner similarly had no intention to satisfy there by any need and yet it is stated there would be no civil liability as he would be subject to a capital charge no it is the act of cattle which is placed on the same level as that of the owner himself to show that just as in the act of the owner there had surely been the intention to satisfy some need so also in the act of cattle there must have been the intention to satisfy some need but how is this possible in the Case of cattle are we replied the case here supposed is one of an intelligent animal which owing to an itching in the back was anxious to burn the barn so that it might roll in the hot ashes but how could we know of such an intention by seeing that after the barn had been burnt the animal actually rolled in the ashes but could such a thing ever happen yes as in the case of the ox which had been in the house of our papa and which having a severe toothache went into the brewery where it removed the lid that covered the beer and drank beer until it became relieved of the pain the rabbis however argued in the presence of our papa how can you say that the mission places the act of cattle on a level with the act of the owner himself for is it not stated if cattle has brought indignity upon a human being there is no liability whereas if the owner causes the indignity there is liability now if we are to put the act of cattle on a level with that of the owner himself how are we defined intention in the case of cattle where for instance there was intention to do damage as stated by the master that where there was intention to do damage though no intention to insult liability for insult will attach Rabbah however suggested that the Mishnah here deals with the case of inadvertence resembling thus cattle which acts as a rule without any specific purpose and the law was laid down in accordance with the teaching at the school of Hezekiah for it was taught at the school of Hezekiah scripture places in juxtaposition he that killeth a man and he that killeth a beast to imply that just as in the case of killing a beast you can make no distinction whether it was inadvertent or malicious whether intentional or unintentional whether by way of coming down or by way of coming up so as to exempt from pecuniary obligation but in all cases there is pecuniary liability so also in the case of killing man you should make no distinction whether it was Inadvertent or malicious whether intentional or unintentional whether by way of coming down or by way of coming up so as to impose a pecuniary liability but in all cases there should be exemption from pecuniary obligation said the rabbis to rabbi how can you assume that the ruling in the mission refers to an inadvertent act is it not stated there that were the owner to have set fire to a barn on sabbath there would be no civil liability as he would be subject to a capital charge it only means to say this since if he would have committed it maliciously he would have been liable to a capital charge as eg where he had need of the ashes there should be exemption from civil liability even in such a case as this where he did it inadvertently mission if an ox was pursuing another's ox which was afterwards found to be injured and the one plaintiff says it was your ox that did the damage while the other pleads not so but it was injured by rock against which it had been Rubbing itself, the burden of proof lies on the claimant. So also, where two oxen pursued one, and the one defendant asserts it was your ox that did the damage, while the other defendant asserts it was your ox that did the damage. Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B, neither of the defendants will be liable, but where both of the pursuing oxen belong to the same owner, liability will attach to both of them. Where, however, one of the oxen was big and the
Stated this Mishnah ruling shows that in this respect the colleagues differed from Simicus who maintained that money of which the ownership cannot be decided has to be equally divided between the two parties said our Abba be memel to our high B Abba did Simicus maintain his view even where the defendant was as positive as the claimant he replied yes Simicus maintained his view even where the defendant was as positive as the claimant but even if you assume otherwise how do you know? That the Mishnah is here dealing with a case where the defendant was as positive as the claimant because it says the plaintiff states it was Yorox that did the damage while the defendant pleads not so. Our Papa, however, demurred to the saying if in the case presented in the opening clause the defendant was as positive as the claimant, we must suppose that in the case presented in the concluding clause the defendant was similarly as positive as the claimant. Now read the concluding clause. Where, however, one ox was big and the other little, and the plaintiff asserts that the big one did the damage while the defendant pleads not so, for it was a little one that did the damage. Or again, where one ox was tam and the other muad, and the claimant maintains that the muad did the damage while the defendant pleads not so, for it was a tam that did the damage. The burden of proof is on the claimant. Now this implies, does it not, that where he does not produce evidence he will get paid in? Accordance with the pleading of the defendant, may it now not be argued that this ruling is contrary to the view of Rabbi Nathan, who said that where the plaintiff claims we and the defendant admits barley, he is not liable for either of them. You conclude then that the Mishnah deals with a case where one party was certain and the other doubtful, which then was certain and which doubtful. It could hardly be suggested that it was the plaintiff who was certain and the defendant who was doubtful. For would this still not be contrary to the view of Rabbi Nathan? It would therefore seem that it was the plaintiff who was doubtful and the defendant certain. And if the concluding clause deals with a case where the plaintiff was doubtful and the defendant certain, we should suppose that the opening clause likewise deals with a case where the plaintiff was doubtful and the defendant certain. But could Simicus indeed have applied his principle even to such a case that the Mishnah? Thought fit to let us know that this view ought not to be accepted, hence it must be said no, but that the concluding clause deals with a case where the plaintiff was doubtful and the defendant certain, and the opening clause presents a case where it was the plaintiff who was certain and the defendant doubtful, but even in that case the opening clause is not coordinate with the concluding clause. I can reply that a case where the plaintiff is certain and the defendant doubtful, and a case where the claimant is doubtful and the defendant certain are coordinate, whereas a case where the claimant is certain and the defendant also certain is not coordinate with a case where the claimant is doubtful and the defendant certain. The above text states Rabbi Nathan said where the plaintiff claimed we and the defendant admitted barley he is not liable for either of them. What does this tell us? Have we not already learned in a mission where the plaintiff claimed? We and the defendant admitted barley he is not liable if we had only the mission there to go by I might have argued that the exemption was only from the value of the wheat while there would still be liability for the value of barley we are therefore told by Rabbi Nathan that the exemption is complete we have learned where there were two injured oxen one big and the other little etc now this implies that where he does not produce evidence he will get paid in accordance with the pleading of the defendant but why not apply here the principle of complete exemption laid down in the case of wheat and barley the plaintiff is entitled to get paid only where he produces evidence to substantiate the claim but will have nothing at all where he fails to do so but has it not been taught he will be paid for the injury done to the little one out of the body of the big and for the injury done to the big one out of the body of the little one only where he had already seized them. We have learned if one was Tam and the other Muad and the plaintiff claims that the Muad injured the big one and the Tam the little one while the defendant pleads not so for IT was the Tam that injured the big one and the Muad that injured the little one the burden of proof falls on the claimant now this implies that where he does not produce evidence he will get paid in accordance with the pleading of the plaintiff but why should the principle of complete exemption laid down in the case of wheat and barley not be applied here Talmud, Mas Baba Kama the plaintiff is entitled to get paid only where he produces evidence to substantiate the claim but failing that he will have nothing at all but has it not been taught he will be paid for the injury done to the little one in accordance with the regulations applying to Muad and for the injury done to the big one out of the body of the Tam only where he had already seized them but where both of the pursuing oxen belong to the same owner liability will attach to both of them Rabbi Parazika said to Arashi it can be concluded from this that where oxen in the state of Tam belonging to the same owner did damage the plaintiff has the option to dist rain either on the one or the other no replied Arashi for we are dealing here in the mission with a case where they were mu'at if where they were mu'at how do you explain the concluding clause where however one of the oxen was big and the other little and the claimant maintains that the big one did the damage while the defendant pleads not so for it was the little one that did the damage the burden of proof falls on the claimant for indeed where they were mu'at what difference could there be whether the big one or the little one did the damage since at all events he has to pay the full value of the ox he thereupon said to him the concluding clause presents a case where they were Tam though the opening clause deals with a case where the Oxen were muad said Araha the elder to Arashi if the commencing clause deals with the case where the oxen were muad what is the meaning of liability will attach to both of them should not the text run the owner will be liable again what is the meaning of both of them the commencing clause also must therefore deal with the case where the oxen were tam and the ruling stated follows the view of Arakiba that plaintiff and defendant become the owners in common of the attacking ox now this is so. Where both of them the oxen are with the owner in which case he cannot possibly shift the claim from one to the other but if both of them are not with him he may plead go and produce evidence that it was this ox which is still with me that did the damage and then I will pay you chapter IV mission if a tam ox has scored four or five oxen one after the other compensation should in the first instance be made out of the body of the ox for the last offense should there be a surplus. Compensation is to be paid also for the penultimate offense should there still be a surplus compensation is to be made to the one before the later the liability the prior the claim this is the opinion of our mayor Arsimian says if an ox of the value of 200 ZUZ has scored an ox of the same value of 200 ZUZ and the carcass has no value at all the plaintiff will get a 100 ZUZ and the defendant will get a 100 ZUZ out of the body of the ox that did the damage should the same ox have scored another ox of the value of 200 ZUZ the second claimant will get a 100 ZUZ while the former claimant will get only 50 ZUZ and the defendant will have 50 ZUZ in the body of his ox should the ox have scored yet another ox of the value of 200 ZUZ the third claimant will get a 100 ZUZ while the second will get only 50 ZUZ and the first two parties will have a gold in our each in the body of the ox that did the damage Kamara who is it? Author of our mission, it is in accordance neither with the view of our Ishmael nor with that of our Akiba. For if it is in accordance with our Ishmael who maintains that they the claimants of damages are like any other creditors, how can it be said that the later the liability, the prior the claim, should it not be the earlier the liability, the prior the claim? If on the other hand it is in accordance with our Akiba who maintains that the ox becomes the common property of the plaintiff and the defendant, how can it be said that in the case of there being a surplus Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B compensation will be made for the penultimate offense? Should it not be compensation will be made proportionately for each offense? Robert replied, the mission is indeed in accordance with our Ishmael who holds that claimants of damages are like any other creditors. And as to your objection to the statement, the later the liability, the prior the claim, which you contend should be the earlier the liability, the prior. The claim it can be argued that we deal here with a case where each plaintiff has in turn seized the goring ox for the purpose of getting paid the amount due to him out of its body in which case each has in turn acquired in respect of the ox the status of a paid bailey liable for subsequent damages done by it but if so why does it say should there be a surplus compensation is to be paid also for the penultimate offense should it not be the surplus will revert to the owner Robina. Therefore said the meaning is this should there be an excess in the damage done to him over that done to the subsequent plaintiff the amount of the difference will revert to the plaintiff in respect of the preceding damage so too when Robin returned from Eretz Israel he stated on behalf of our Yohanan that it was for the failure to carry out their duty as Bailey's that liability was incurred by the earlier plaintiffs to the later how then have you explained the mission as being in Accordance with our Ishmael if so what of the next clause our Simeon says where an ox of
Another man's ear he has to give him a cellar in compensation. Arjuna in the name of Arjose the Galilean says a hundred zoos a certain man having been summoned for boxing another man's ear. Artobia B. Matina sent an inquiry to Arjoseph as to whether a Tyrian cellar is meant in the mission or merely a cellar of this country. He sent back a reply you have learned it and the first two parties will have a gold dinar each now should you assume that the Tana is calculating by the cellar of this. Country we may ask why does he not continue the division by introducing a further case where the amount left for the first two will come down to twelve zoos and one cellar to which Artobia replied has then a Tana to string out cases like a peddler what however is the solution the solution was gathered from a statement made by Rab Judah on behalf of Rab wherever money is mentioned in the Torah the reference is to Tyrian money but wherever it occurs in the words of the rabbis it means. Local money the plaintiff upon hearing that said to the judge since it will only amount to half a zoos I do not want it let him give it to the poor later however he said let him give it to me as I will go and obtain a cure for myself with it but our Joseph said to him the poor have already acquired a title to it for though the poor were not present here we in the court always act as the agents of the poor as Rab Judah said on behalf of Samuel orphans Talmud, Mas Baba Kama do not require a Prospol and so also Rami Bihamel learned that orphans do not require a Prospol since Rabban Gamaliel and his court of law are the representatives of orphans. The scoundrel Hanan having boxed another man's ear was brought before Arhuna who ordered him to go and pay the plaintiff half a zoos as Hanan had a battered zoos he desired to pay the plaintiff the half zoos which was due out of it but as it could not be exchanged he slapped him again and gave him the whole zoos mission if an ox was muet to do damage to its own species but was not muet to do damage to any other species of animals or if it was muet to do damage to the human species but not muet to any species of beasts or if it was muet to small cattle but not muet to large cattle in respect of damage done to the species to which it was muet the payment will have to be in full but in respect of damage done to that to which it was not muet the compensation will be for half the damage only they said before Arjuna. Here is one which was muet to do damage on Sabbath days but was not muet to do damage on weekdays he said to them for damage done on Sabbath days the payment will have to be in full whereas for damage done on weekdays the compensation will be for half the damage only when can this ox return to the state of ten when it refrains from going on three consecutive Sabbath days tomorrow it was stated Arzi but said the proper reading of the mission in the first clauses but was not muet Whereas our Papa said the proper reading is IT is not there for Muad Arzi but who said that but was not Muad is the proper reading of the mission maintained that until we know the contrary such an ox is considered Muad to all species but our Papa who said that IT is not there for Muad is the correct reading of the mission maintained that even though we do not know the contrary the ox is not considered Muad save to the species to which it had actually been Muad Arzi but inferred his view from the later clause of the mission whereas our Papa inferred his view from the opening clause Arzi but inferred his view from the later clause which states if it was Muad to small cattle but not Muad to large cattle now this is quite in order if you maintain that but was not Muad is the reading in the mission implying thus that in the absence of definite knowledge to the contrary the ox should be considered Muad to all species this clause would then teach us the further Point that even where the ox was muad to small cattle it would be muad also to large cattle in the absence of knowledge to the contrary but if you maintain that it is not therefore muad is the correct reading of the mission implying that even though we know nothing to the contrary the ox would not be considered muad could it not then be argued thus since in the case where the ox was muad to do damage to small creatures of one species it would not be considered muad with reference to small creatures of another species even if we have no definite knowledge to the contrary was there any need to state that where the ox was muad to small cattle it would not be considered muad to big cattle our papa however may say to you it was necessary to state this since otherwise you might have been inclined to think that since the ox started to attack a particular species it was going to attack the whole of that species without making a distinction between the large Creatures of that species and the small creatures of that species it was therefore necessary to let us know that with reference to the large creatures it would not be considered muad or papa on the other hand based his view on the opening clause which states where it was muad to the human species it would not be muad to any species of beasts now this would be quite in order if you maintain that it is not therefore muad is the text in the mission denoting that even where we have no knowledge to the contrary the ox would not be considered muad to other species it was therefore necessary to make it known to us that even where the ox was muad to the human species and though we knew nothing to the contrary it would still not be muad to animals but if you maintain that but was not muad is the correct reading of the mission implying that in the absence of knowledge to the contrary the ox would be considered muad to all species could we not then argue thus since in the case where the ox was muad to one species of beast it would in the absence of knowledge to the contrary be considered muad also to any other species of beast was there any need to state that where the ox was muad to the human species it would also be considered muad to animals Arzi but may however say to you the opening clause refers to the reversion of the ox to the state of Tam as e.g. where the ox had been muad to man and muad to beast but has subsequently refrained from doing damage to beast having stood near cattle on three different occasions without goring it might then have been argued that since it has not refrained from injuring men its refraining from goring cattle should in the eye of the law not be considered a proper reversion to the state of Tam we are therefore told that the refraining from goring cattle is in fact a proper reversion an objection was raised from the following Simica says if an ox is muad to man it is also muad to beast for she or I, if it is muad to injure man, how much more so is it muad to injure beast? Does this not prove that the view of the previous Tano was that it would not be muad? Arzi, but may however say to you, Simicus was referring to the reversion to the state of Tam, and what he said to the previous Tano was this referring to your statement that the refraining from goring beast is a proper reversion. I maintain that the refraining from goring beast is not a proper reversion and can prove it. By means of an argument, the for she or I, from the case of man, for since it has not refrained from attacking man, will it not assuredly continue attacking beast? Arashi said, Come and here, they said before Arjuna, here is one which is muad to do damage on Sabbath days, but not muad to do damage on weekdays. He said to them, For damage done on Sabbath days, the payment will have to be in full, whereas for damage done on weekdays, the compensation will be for half the damage only now. This is quite in. Order if you maintain that but was not muad is the correct reading the disciples were thus putting a question before him and he was replying to them accordingly but if you contend that is not therefore muad is the correct text would it not appear as if his disciples were giving instruction to him again what would then be the meaning of his reply to the marjan a thereupon said the same can also be inferred from the opening clause where it is stated in respect of damage done to the species to which it was muad the payment will have to be in full but in respect of damage done to that to which it was not muad the compensation will be for half the damage only now this would be in order if you maintain that but it was not muad is the correct text in which case the clause just quoted would be explanatory but if you maintain that it is not therefore muad is the correct text the statement is complete in itself and why then the further statement in respect of Damage done to the species to which it was muad the payment will have to be in full but in respect of damage done to that to which it was not muad the compensation will be for half the damage only have we not been told before how that in the case of muad the payment is for half the damage whereas in the case of muad the payment has to be in full yet even if you adopt the view of our papa where the animal gored an ox and ass and a camel successively it would still become muad to all species. A beast our rabbis taught if the animal sees an ox and gores it another ox and does not gore it a third ox and gores it a fourth ox and does not gore it a fifth ox and gores it a sixth ox and does not gore it the animal becomes muad to alternate ox and our rabbis taught if an animal sees an ox and gores it an ass and does not gore it a horse and gores it a camel and does not gore it a mule and gores it a wild ass and does not gore it the animal becomes muad to alternate beast of all species. The following question was raised if the animal successively gored Talmud, Mas Baba Kama be one ox a second ox and a third ox and ass and a camel what is the legal position shall the last ox be counted together with the first two oxen in which case the animal that gored will still be muad only to oxen whereas to any other species it will not be considered muad or shall per
consecutive goings took place on the Thursday, the eve of Sabbath, and the Sabbath, and on the next Sabbath, and the third Sabbath, what is the legal position? Shall the first Sabbath be counted together with Thursday, and the eve of Sabbath, and the goring ox thus become you at for all days, or shall perhaps the first Sabbath be counted together with the subsequent Sabbaths, in which case the goring ox would become you at only for Sabbaths? These questions must stand over if an ox has gored an ox. On the fifteenth day of a particular month, and another ox on the sixteenth day of the next month, and a third ox on the seventeenth day of the third month, there would be a difference of opinion between Rab and Samuel, for it was stated if the symptom of menstruation has once been noticed on the fifteenth day of a particular month, and on the sixteenth day of the next month, and then on the seventeenth day of the third month, Rab maintained that a periodical recurrence has thereby been. Established whereas Samuel said that this periodicity is not established until the skipping is repeated yet a third time Rabbah said where an ox upon hearing the sound of a trumpet course and upon hearing again the sound of a trumpet course a second time and upon hearing again the sound of a trumpet course a third time the ox will become muad with reference to the hearing of the sound of trumpets is not this self-evident you might have supposed that the goring at the first hearing of the sound of the trumpet should not be taken into account as it might have been due merely to the sudden fright that came over the ox we are therefore told that it would be taken into account Mishnah in the case of private owners cattle goring an ox consecrated to the temple or consecrated cattle goring a private ox there is no liability for it is stated the ox of his neighbor not that is to say an ox consecrated to the temple where an ox belonging to an Israelite has an ox. Belonging to a Canaanite, there is no liability, whereas where an ox belonging to a Canaanite or an ox belonging to an Israelite, whether Waltam or Muadi, the compensation is to be made in full tomorrow. The ruling in the Mishnah is not in accordance with the view of Arsimian Bimanazi, for it was taught where a private ox has gored consecrated cattle, or where consecrated cattle has gored a private ox, there is not liability, as it is stated, the ox of his neighbor, not that is to say an ox. Consecrated to the temple, Arsimian Bimanazi, however, says where consecrated cattle has gored a private ox, there is no liability, but if a private ox has gored consecrated cattle, whether Waltam or Muad, payment is to be made for full damage. I might ask what was the principle adopted by Arsimian if the implication of his neighbor has to be insisted upon, why then even in the case of a private ox goring consecrated cattle, should there not be exemption if on the other hand the implication of his Neighbor has not to be insisted upon why then in the case of consecrated cattle goring a private ox should there also not be liability if however you argue that he does in fact maintain that the implication of his neighbor has to be insisted upon yet where a private ox has gored consecrated cattle there is a special reason for liability inferred by means of an fortiori argument from the case of private cattle as follows if where a private ox has gored private cattle there is liability. Should not there be all the more liability where it has gored consecrated cattle why then did he not employ the principle of Dei that it was sufficient that the object to which the inference is made should be on the same footing as the object from which it was made and since Tam involves there the payment of half damages why then should it not here also involve the payment of half damages only Rush Lakish therefore said originally all cases came under the law of full compensation. When scripture therefore particular is his neighbor in the case of Tam it meant that it was only where damage had been done to a neighbor that Tam would involve half damages only thus implying that where the damage had been done to consecrated property whether by Tam or Muad the compensation must be in full Talmud, Mas Baba Kama for if this was not its intention scripture should have inserted the expression his neighbor in the text dealing with Muad where an ox belonging to an Israelite has gored an ox belonging to a Canaanite there is no liability etc but I might here assert that you are on the horns of a dilemma if the implication of his neighbor has to be insisted upon then in the case of an ox of a Canaanite goring an ox of an Israelite should there also not be exemption if on the other hand the implication of his neighbor has not to be insisted upon why then even in the case of an ox of an Israelite goring an ox of a Canaanite should there not be liability. Arabah thereupon said Barit says he stood and measured the earth he beheld and drove asunder the nations which may be taken to imply that God beheld the seven commandments which were accepted by all the descendants of Noah but since they did not observe them he rose up and declared them to be outside the protection of the civil law of Israel with reference to damage done to cattle by cattle or Yohanan even said that the same could be inferred from this verse he shined forth from Mount Paran implying that from Paran he exposed their money to Israel the same has been taught as follows if the ox of an Israelite gores an ox of a Canaanite there is no liability but if an ox of a Canaanite gores an ox of an Israelite whether the ox that did the damage was Tam or whether it had already been Muad the payment is to be in full as it is said he stood and measured the earth he beheld and drove asunder the nations and again he shined forth from Mount Paran why this further citation Otherwise you might perhaps think that the verse he stood and measured the earth refers exclusively to statements on other subjects made by Armatina and by our Joseph come therefore and here he shined forth from Mount Paran implying that from Paran he exposed their money to Israel what was the statement made by Armatina referred to above it was this Armatina said he stood and measured the earth he beheld etc what did he behold he beheld the seven commandments which were accepted by all the descendants of Noah and since there were some clans that rejected them he rose up and exiled them from their lands but how can the word in the text be etymologically explained to mean exile here it is written W A Yad of the nations and in another place it is similarly written Elinatter with all upon the earth which is rendered in the Targum to leap with all upon the earth what was the statement made by our Joseph referred to above it was this our Joseph said he stood and measured it Earth he beheld etc. What did he behold? He beheld the seven commandments which had been accepted by all the descendants of Noah and since there were clans that rejected them he rose up and granted them exemption. Does this mean that they benefited by breaking the law and if so will it not be a case of a sinner profiting by the transgression he committed? Mar the son of Urbana thereupon said it only means that even were they to keep the seven commandments which had first been accepted but subsequently rejected by them they would receive no reward would they not but it has been taught our mayor used to say whence can we learn that even where a Gentile occupies himself with the study of the Torah he equals in status the high priest we find it stated which if a man do he shall live in them it does not say priests love it and Israelites but a man which shows that even if a Gentile occupies himself with the study of the Torah he equals in status the high priest I mean in Saying that they would receive no reward that they will receive reward not like those who having been enjoined perform commandments but like those who not having been enjoined perform good deeds for our Hannah has stated greater is the reward of those who having been enjoined do good deeds than of those who not having been enjoined but merely out of free will do good deeds our rabbis taught the government of Rome had long ago sent two commissioners to the sages of Israel with a request to teach them the Torah it was accordingly read to them once twice and thrice before taking leave they made the following remark we have gone carefully through your Torah and found it correct with the exception of this point vizier saying that if an ox of an Israelite gores an ox of a Canaanite there is no liability whereas if the ox of a Canaanite gores the ox of an Israelite whether Tam or Muad compensation has to be paid in full in no case can this he write for it the implication of his Neighbor has to be insisted upon why then in the case of an ox of a Canaanite goring an ox of an Israelite should there also not be exemption if on the other hand the implication of his neighbor has not to be insisted upon why then even in the case of an ox of an Israelite goring an ox of a Canaanite should there not be liability we will however not report this matter to our government when our Samuel B. Judah lost a daughter the rabbi said to Allah let us go in and console him but he answered. Then what have I to do with the consolation of the Babylonians which is almost tantamount to blasphemy for they say what could have been done which implies that were it possible to do anything they would have done it he therefore went alone to the mourner and said to him scripture says and the Lord spake unto me distress not the Moabites neither contend with them in battle now we may well ask could it have entered the mind of Moses to wage war without divine sanction we must suppose. Therefore that Moses of himself reasoned a fortiori as follows if in the case of the Midianites who came only to assist the Moabites the Torah commanded vex the Midianites and smite them Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B in the case of the Moabites themselves should not the same injunction apply even more strongly but the Holy One blessed be he said to him the idea you have in your
them not nor meddle with them at all thus implying that they were not to be subjected even to requisitioning our high be abba further said that our joshua be had stated at all times should a man try to be first in the performance of a good deed as on account of the one night by which the elder daughter preceded the younger she preceded her by four generations in having a descendant in israel over jesse david and solomon for the younger had no descendant in israel until the advent of Rehoboam as it is written and the name of his mother was Nabah the Ammonites are rabbis taught if cattle of an Israelite has gored cattle belonging to a Kuti and there is no liability but where cattle belonging to a Kuti and gored cattle belonging to an Israelite in the case of Tam the payment will be for half the damage whereas in the case of Muad the payment will be in full our Meir however says where cattle belonging to an Israelite gored cattle belonging to a Kuti and there is no liability. Whereas in the case of cattle belonging to an Israelite whether in the case of Tam or in that of Muad the compensation is to be in full does this mean to say that our Meir maintains that the Kutians were lion proselytes but if so an objection would be raised from the following all kinds of stains found on women's underwear brought from Rikam are levitically clean but our Judah considers them unclean as the inhabitants of that place are mainly proselytes who are in error from among. Gentiles they are considered clean but where they were brought from among Israelites or from Kutians after having been obtained from private places all agree in declaring them unclean but where they were brought from Kutians who had already abandoned them to the public at large our mayor considers them unclean whereas the sages consider them clean for even they were not suspected of being lax in the exposing of women stained underwear now does this not prove that our mayor was of it? Opinion that Kutians were true proselytes are above upon said this was only a pecuniary disability that our mayor imposed upon them so that Israelites should not intermingle with them. Our zero raised an objection from the following: These are the damsels through whom the fine is imposed if a man has connection with a girl that is a bastard and ethan or a Kutian. Now if you maintain that our mayor imposed a pecuniary disability on them, why then not impose it in this case too so that Israelites should not mix with them. Obey thereupon said Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, no exception was made in this case so that the sinner should not profit thereby but let him pay the amount of the fine to the poor. Armari said it would in that case have remained a pecuniary obligation without definite claimants and would thus never have been discharged. Mishnah if an ox of an owner with unimpaired faculties scores an ox of a deaf mutant idiot or a minor the owner is liable where however an ox of a Deaf mutant idiot or a minor has scored an ox of an owner whose faculties are unimpaired. There is no liability if an ox of a deaf mutant idiot or a minor has scored the court of law. Point the guardian in whose presence witnesses will be able to testify that the ox has scored so that it will eventually be declared muad if the deaf mute recovers his hearing or speech or if the idiot becomes sane or if the minor comes of age. The ox previously declared muad will return to the state of Tam. These are the words of our Meir Arhose, however, says that the ox will remain in status quo in the case of a stadium ox killing a person. The death penalty is not imposed upon the ox as it is written if an ox gore, excluding cases where it is goaded to Gorgamara, is not the text in contradiction with itself. In the first clause, you state if an ox of a deaf mutant idiot or a minor gores an ox belonging to one whose faculties are unimpaired, there is no liability implying that a guardian is not. Appointed in the case of Tam to collect the payment of half damages out of its body, but read the following clause if an ox of a deaf mutant idiot or a minor has scored the court of law appoint a guardian in whose presence witnesses will be able to testify so that it will eventually be declared muad. Now does this not prove that a guardian is appointed in the case of Tam to collect the payment of half damages out of its body? Robert replied that the text of the concluding clause should be understood thus if the oxen are presumed to be goros then a guardian is appointed and witnesses will give evidence for the purpose of having the cattle declared muad so that should another goring take place the payment would have to come from the best of the general estate from the best of whose estate would the payment have to come are Yohanan said from the best of the estate of the orphans are Jose Bihanan said from the best of the estate of the guardian but did are Yohanan really say? So has it not been stated that our Judah said in the name of R.C. the estate of the orphans must not be dis reigned upon unless where usury is consuming it and our Yohanan said unless there is a liability either for a bond bearing interest or to a woman for her ketubah so as to save from further payment on account of her maintenance you must therefore reverse names to read as follows our Yohanan said from the best of the estate of the guardian whereas our Jose Bihanan said from the best of the estate of the orphans Rabbah however objected saying because there is a contradiction between our Yohanan in one place and our Yohanan in another place are you to ascribe to our Jose Bihanan an erroneous view was not our Jose Bihanan a judge able to penetrate to the innermost intention of the law we must therefore not reverse the names and the contradiction between the two views of our Yohanan can be reconciled by the consideration that a case of damage is altogether different our Yohanan Stated that the payment must be made out of the best of the estate of the orphans because if you were to say that it is to be out of the best of the estate of the guardians Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B people would certainly refrain from accepting this office and would do nothing at all in the matter. Our Jose Bihanan however said that the payment should be made out of the best of the estate of the guardians and that these should be reimbursed out of the estate of the orphans when the latter will have come of age whether or not guardians could be appointed in the case of Tam to collect payment out of its body is a point at issue between the following Tanaim in the case of an ox whose owner has become a deaf mute or whose owner became insane or whose owner has gone abroad to be Nikosa said on behalf of Simicus that it would have to remain Tam until witnesses could give evidence in the presence of the owner. The sages however say that a guardian should be appointed in whose Presence the evidence may be given should the deaf mute recover his faculty of hearing or speech or the idiot become sane or the minor come of age or the owner return from abroad to be Nikosa said on behalf of Simicus that the ox would revert to the state of Tam until evidence is given in the presence of the owner whereas our Jose said that it would retain its status quo now we have here to ask what is the meaning of it would have to remain Tam in the dictum of Simicus it could hardly mean that the ox cannot become muad at all for since it is stated in the concluding clause the ox would revert to the state of Tam it is implied that it had formerly been muad what then is the meaning of it would have to remain Tam we must say it would remain Tam complete that is we do nothing to diminish its value which would of course show that Simicus holds no guardian is appointed in the case of Tam to collect payment out of its body the sages however say that a guardian should be Appointed in whose presence evidence may be given from which it follows that they hold a guardian may be appointed in the case of Tam to collect payment out of its body and what is the point at issue in the concluding clause the point at issue there is whether or not a change of control should cause a change in the state of the ox Simicus maintains that a change in control causes a change in the state of the ox whereas our Jose holds that a change of control causes no change in the state of the ox our rabbis taught where an ox of a deaf mutant idiot or a minor has scored our Jacob pays half damages what has our Jacob to do with it but read our Jacob orders the payment of half damages with what case are we here dealing if with the Tam is this not obvious for does not any other owner similarly pay half damages if on the other hand we are dealing with a muad then where proper precautions were taken to control it why should any payment be made at all and if no precautions were Taken to control it, why should not damages be paid in full? Rabbi thereupon said, We are in fact dealing with a muad and with a case where precautions of some inferior sort were taken to control the ox, but not really adequate precautions. Our Jacob concurred with our Judah, who said that even in the case of muad, half of the payment, i.e., the part due from Tam, remains unaffected, being still subject to the law of Tam. He also concurred with our Judah in holding that to procure exemption from the law of muad, even inadequate precautions are sufficient. And he furthermore followed the view of the rabbis, who said that a guardian could be appointed in the case of Tam to collect payment out of its body. Said Abay to him, Do they really not differ? Has it not been taught where the ox of a deaf mutant idiot or a minor has scored? Our Judah maintains that there is liability to pay, and our Jacob says that the payment will be only for half the damage. Rabbi Ola thereupon said, The liability to pay mentioned. By our Judah is here defined as to its amount by our Jacob, but according to Abay who maintained that they did differ what was the point at issue between them, he may tell you that they were dealing with a case of Muad that had not been guarded at all in
Eliza P. Jacob says whether in the case of Tam or in the case of Mumat if precautions of at least some inferior sort have been taken to control the ox there would be no liability the new point made known to us by R. Jacob would thus have been that guardians should be appointed even in the case of Tam to collect payment out of its body why then did Rabba explain the former statement of R. Jacob to refer only to Mumad why did he not explain it to refer to Tam also in answer he said Rabba made one statement expressed two principles in which R. Jacob is in agreement with R. Judah Rabba and stated that the question whether or not a change of control should cause a change in the state of the ox might have been the point at issue between them e.g. where after the ox had been declared Mumad the deaf mute recovered his faculty or the idiot became sane or the minor came of age in which case R. Judah would maintain that the ox should remain in its status quo whereas R. Jacob would hold that a Change of control should cause a change in the state of the ox. Our rabbis taught in the case of guardians the payment for damages will be out of the best of the general estate though no kofar will be paid by them who is the tenant who holds that the payment of kofar is but an act of atonement which would justify the exemption in this case as minor orphans are not subject to the law of atonement. Arhista said it is Arishmael the son of Aryohan and be for it was taught the words. Then he shall give for the ransom of his life indicate the value of the life of the person killed but Arishmael the son of Aryohan and be interprets it to refer to the value of the life of the defendant. Now is this not the point at issue between them that the rabbis consider kofar to constitute a civil liability whereas Arishmael the son of Aryohan and be holds kofar to be of the nature of propitiation. Our papa said that this was not the case for we may suppose all to agree that. Kofar is a kind of propitiation and the point at issue between them here is merely that the rabbis hold that this propitiatory payment should be fixed by estimating the value of the life of the person killed whereas R. Ishmael the son of R. Yohan and B. Baraka maintains that it should be fixed by estimating the value of the life of the defendant. What reason have the rabbis for their view the expression laying upon is used in the later context and the same expression laying upon is used in an earlier context just as there it refers to the plaintiff so does it here also refer to the plaintiff but R. Ishmael the son of R. Yohan and B. Baraka argued that it is written and he shall give for the ransom of his life referring of course to the defendant and the rabbis they reply yes it does say the ransom of his life but the amount must be fixed by valuing the life of the person killed Rabbah in his conversations with Arnaman used to praise Arahabi Jacob as a great man he therefore said. To him when you come across him bring him to me when he later came to see him he said to him you may put problems to me whereupon he asked him if an ox of two partners kill a person how is the payment of kofar to be made shall this one pay kofar and the other one kofar but one kofar is mentioned by divine law and not two kofar shall this one pay half of the kofar and the other one half of the kofar a full kofar is commanded by divine law and not half of the kofar while he was still sitting. And pondering over this he further asked him we have learned in the case of debtors for valuations the sanctuary treasury may demand a pledge whereas in the case of those who are liable to sin offerings or for trespass offerings no pledge can be enforced now what would be the law in the case of those liable to kofar shall it be said that since kofar is a kind of propitiation it should be subject to the same ruling as sin offerings and trespass offerings the matter being of serious moment too. The defendant so that there is no necessity of enforcing a pledge from him or shall it perhaps be argued that since it has to be given to a fellow man it is considered a civil liability and as it does not go to the temple treasury it is consequently not taken too seriously by the defendant for which reason there may appear to be some necessity for requiring a pledge or again since the defendant did not in this case himself commit the wrong for it was his chattel that did the wrong and committed manslaughter the whole matter might be considered by him as of no serious moment and a pledge should therefore be enforced he said to him leave me alone I am still held prisoner by your first problem that has not yet been answered by me our rabbis taught if a man borrowed an ox on the assumption that it is in the state of Tam but is subsequently discovered to have already been declared new at if boring is repeated while still with the borrower the owner will pay one half of the damages and the borrower will pay the other half of the damages but if it was declared new and while in the possession of the borrower and after it was returned to the owner at court again the owner will pay half the damages while the borrower is exempt from any liability whatsoever the master stated if a man borrowed an ox on the assumption that it is in the state of Tam but was subsequently discovered to have already been declared new and if boring is repeated the owner will pay one half of the damages and the borrower will pay the other half of the damages but why should the borrower not plead against the owner I wanted to borrow an ox I did not want to borrow a lion rap said we are dealing here with a case where the borrower knew the ox to be a gorilla still why can he not plead against him I wanted to borrow an ox in the state of Tam but I did not want to borrow an ox that had already been declared new and this could not be pleaded because the owner might argue Against him in any case even had the ox been still tam would you not have to pay half damages now also you have to pay one half of the damages but still why can he not plead against him had the ox been tam damages would have been paid out of its body this could similarly not be pleaded because the owner might contend in any case would you not have had to reimburse me to the full extent of the value of the ox why can he still not plead against him Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B were the ox to have been tam I would have admitted the act of goring and become exempt from having to pay moreover even according to the view that the payment of half damages for goring in the case of tam is a civil liability why should the borrower still not argue had the ox been tam I would have caused it to escape to the pasture we must therefore suppose the case to have been one where the court of law stepped in first and took possession of the ox but if so why should the owner pay one half of it? Damages why not plead against the borrower you have allowed my ox to fall into the hands of the party against whom I am powerless to bring any legal action this could not be pleaded because the borrower might retort to him were I even to have returned the ox to you would the court of law not have taken it from you but why should the owner still not plead against the borrower were you to have returned it to me I would have caused it to escape to the pasture this could not be pleaded because the borrower might argue against him in any case would the damages not have been paid out of the best of your general estate this indeed could be effectively argued by the borrower where the owner possessed property but what could be argued in the case where the owner possessed no property what therefore the borrower could always argue against the owner is as follows just as I am under a personal obligation to you so am I under a personal obligation to that party who is your creditor. In virtue of the rule of our Nathan as it was taught our Nathan says whence do we conclude that if a claims a mana from B and B claims a similar sum from C the money is collected from C and directly handed over to A from the statement of scripture and give it unto him against whom he hath trespassed if it was declared new and while in the possession of the borrower and after it was returned to the owner at court again the owner will pay half damages while the borrower is exempt from any liability whatsoever does this concluding clause not appear to prove that a change in the control of the ox causes a change in its status while the preceding clause tends to prove that a change in the control of the ox causes no change in its status are you and thereupon said the contradiction is obvious he who taught one clause certainly did not teach the other clause in the text of the very the Rebbe, however said since the opening clause tends to prove that a change in the Control does not cause a change in the status. The concluding clause may also maintain that a change in the control does not cause a change in the status. For the ruling in the concluding clause could be based on the fact that the owner may argue against the borrower. You had no legal right to cause my ox to be declared new. And our papa, however, said since the concluding clause proves that a change in the control of the ox causes a change in its status, the opening clause may also maintain that a change in the control of the ox causes a change in its status. For the ruling in the opening clause could be based upon the reason that wherever the ox is put, it bears the name of its owner upon it. In the case of a stadium ox killing a person, the death penalty is not imposed upon the ox, etc. The question was raised: What would have been the position of such an ox with reference to its being sacrificed upon the altar? Rab said that it would have been eligible, whereas Samuel. Maintained that it would have been ineligible Rab considered it eligible since it committed manslaughter only by compulsion whereas Samuel considered it ineligible since it had been used as an instrument for the commission of the crime an objection was raised yes shall bring your offering of the cattle excludes an animal that has copulated with a woman and an animal that has copulated with a man even of the herd excludes an animal that has been used as an instrument of idolatry of the flock excludes an animal that has been set apart for
Animal whereas in the case of an animal goring and committing manslaughter the law does not place a compulsory act on the same footing as a voluntary one again in the case of an animal goring and committing manslaughter there is liability to pay cover whereas in the case of an animal copulating with a woman there is no liability to pay cover it is on account of these differences that it was necessary to specify both an animal copulating with a woman and an animal goring and committing. Manslaughter now it is here taught that in the case of an animal copulating with a human being the law makes no distinction between a compulsory and a voluntary act whereas in the case of an animal goring and committing manslaughter the law does not place a compulsory act on the same footing as a voluntary one what rule are we to derive from this is it not the rule in respect of eligibility for becoming a sacrifice upon the altar no the rule in respect of stoning this indeed stands also. To reason for if you maintain that it is with reference to the sacrifice that the law does not place a compulsory act on the same footing as a voluntary one in the case of an animal goring I would point out that with reference to its eligibility for the altar the scripture says nothing explicitly with regard either to a compulsory act or a voluntary act on its part does it therefore not stand to reason that what we are to derive from this is the rule in respect of stoning the master stated. In the case of an animal goring and committing manslaughter there is liability to pay cover whereas in the case of an animal copulating with a woman there is no liability to pay cover what are the circumstances it could hardly be that while copulating with a woman it killed her for what difference could be made between killing by means of a horn and killing by means of copulating if on the other hand the act of copulating did not result in manslaughter is the exemption from paying cover not. Due to the fact that no killing took place Abbe said we suppose in fact that it deals with a case whereby the act of copulating the animal did not kill the woman who however was brought to the court of law and by its orders executed in such a case you might perhaps have thought Talmud, Mas Baba Kama that the execution amounted to manslaughter on the part of the animal we are therefore told that this is not the case Rabbah on the other hand held that we deal here with a case where while copulating with a woman the animal did kill her and as for the objection what difference could be made between killing committed by means of horns and killing committed by means of copulating the answer would be that in the case of horn the animal purposes to do damage whereas in this case of copulating the intention of the animal is merely for self-gratification what is the point at issue between these two explanations whether cover should be paid in the case of foot treading. Upon the child in the premises of the plaintiff and killing it according to Abbe there would be liability to pay cover whereas according to Rabbah no payment of cover would have to be made it was taught in accordance with the view of Rabbah ox trained for the arena that killed the person is not liable to be stoned to death and is eligible for the altar for it had been compelled to commit the manslaughter mission if an ox scores a man and death results in the case of Muad there is liability to pay cover but in the case of Tam there is no liability to pay cover in both cases however the oxen are liable to be stoned to death the same judgment applies in the case of a minor son and the same judgment applies in the case of a minor daughter but where the ox has scored a man servant or a maid servant and death has resulted compensation has to be given to the amount of 30 sella whether the killed servant was worth a hundred mina or not worth any more than one dinar but since when it was still the state of Tam it had to be killed for manslaughter how could it ever have been possible to declare it? Muad Rabbah said we are dealing here with a case where e.g. it had been estimated that it might have killed three human beings. Arashi however said that such estimation amount to nothing and that we are therefore dealing here with a case where the ox scored and endangered the lives of three human beings. Arzibid on the other hand said the case is one where for instance it killed three animals but is an ox which has been declared Muad to kill animals also Muad to kill men. Arshimai therefore said the case is one where for instance it killed three heathens but is an ox which has been declared Muad to gore persons who are heathens also Muad with reference to those who are Israelites are Simeon Belagish therefore said the case is one where for instance it killed three persons who had already been afflicted with fatal organic diseases but is an Ox which has been declared Muad with reference to persons afflicted with fatal organic diseases also Muad regarding persons in sound condition are Papa therefore said the case is one where the ox on the first occasion killed a sound person but escaped to the pasture killed again a sound person but similarly escaped to the pasture Araha the son of Rik said the case is one where for instance two witnesses alleged in every case an alibi against the three peers of witnesses who had testified to the first three occasions of Goring and it so happened that after evidence had been given regarding the fourth time of Goring the accusation of the alibi with reference to the first three times of Goring fell to the ground as a new pair of witnesses gave evidence of an alibi against the same two witnesses who alleged the alibi against the three sets of witnesses who had testified to the first three occasions of Goring now this explanation would be satisfactory if the three Days required for the declaration of Muad refer to the goring of the ox so as to make sure that it has an ingrained tendency but if the three days are needed to warn the owner why should he not plead against the plaintiff I was not aware that the evidence as to the first three gorings was genuine this could not be pleaded where e.g. it was stated by the very last pair of witnesses that whenever the ox had gored and killed he had been present and witnessed every occasion Rabbana said the case of an ox not being stoned after any of the first three fatal gorings might be where though recognizing the owner of the ox the witnesses who testified to the first three time of goring did not at that time recognize the identity of the ox also but what could the owner have done where the ox that gored and killed had not been identified he is culpable because they could say to him knowing that an ox inclined to gore has been among your herd you ought to have guarded it. Whole of your herd in both cases however the oxen are liable to be stoned to death or rabbis taught from the implication of the statement the ox shall be surely stoned would I not have known that it becomes nibble and that by becoming nibble it should be forbidden to be consumed for food why then was it necessary to state further and his flesh shall not be eaten scripture must therefore have intended to tell us that were the ox to be slaughtered after the sentence has been passed upon it it would be forbidden to be consumed as food this rule is thus established as regards food whence could it be derived that it would also be forbidden for any other use whatsoever the text therefore says but the owner of the ox shall be quit how does this bear on the matter in hand Simeon Bezoma said the word quit is used here as in the colloquial expression so and so went out quit from his possessions without having any benefit of them whatsoever but how do we know that his flesh shall not be eaten refers to a case where the ox has been slaughtered after the sentence had been passed on it to indicate that it should be forbidden to be used as food why not rather suppose that where it has been slaughtered after the sentence had been passed on it the ox would be eligible to be used for food and take the words his flesh shall not be eaten as referring to a case where the ox had already been stoned and indicating that it should then be forbidden for any use whatsoever such an implication is even in conformity with the view of Arabab for Arabab said on behalf of our Eliezer wherever scripture says either it shall not be eaten or thou shalt not eat or you shall not eat a prohibition both in respect of food and in respect of any other use is implied unless where scripture makes an explicit exception as it did make an exception in the case of a thing that dies of itself which may be given unto a stranger or sold unto a heathen it may however be argued against this that these words of Arabab hold good only where the prohibition both in respect of food and in respect of any other use is derived from the one scriptural text visit shall not be eaten but here where the prohibition in respect of food is derived from the ox shall be surely stoned should you suggest that the words his flesh shall not be eaten were meant as a prohibition for any use we may ask why then did the divine law not plainly state no benefit shall be derived from it or again why not merely say it shall not be eaten why the additional words his flesh if not to indicate that even where it had been made and prepared to resemble other meat as where the ox was slaughtered it should still be forbidden Mars strongly demurred to this why not he said take this prohibition Talmud Mas Baba Kamba be to refer to a case where the slaughterer prepared a piece of sharp flint and with it slaughtered the ox which was thus dealt with as if it has been stoned whereas where it had been slaughtered by means of a knife the prohibition should not apply to this it may be replied is a knife specifically mentioned in scripture moreover we have learned if one slaughters with a hand sickle with a flint or with a reed the act of slaughtering has been properly executed and now that the prohibition in respect both of food and of any other use has been derived from the text his flesh shall not be eaten what additional teaching is afforded to me by the words the owner of the ox shall be
Abstained his disciples said to him Rabbi what is to be done with all the expositions of the term eth which you have already given he said to them just as I have received reward for the previous exposition so have I received reward for the present abstention when our Akiva however came he taught thou shall fear eth the Lord thy God implies that the scholarly disciples are also to be feared our rabbis taught but the owner of the ox shall be quit means according to the view of our Eliezer quit. From paying half kofar said our Akiva to him since any actual liability in the case of the ox itself being a tam is not paid except out of its body why cannot the owner say to the plaintiff bring it to the court of law and be reimbursed out of it our Eliezer then said to him do I really appear so simple in your eyes that you should take my exposition to refer to a case of an ox liable to be stoned to death my exposition referred only to one who killed a human being in the presence of one witness or in the presence of its owner in the presence of its owner would he not be admitting a penal liability our Eliezer maintains that Kofor partakes of a propitiatory character another Barry that teaches our Eliezer said to him Akiva do I really appear so simple in your eyes that you take my exposition to refer to an ox liable to be stoned to death my exposition referred only to one who had been intending to kill a beast but by accident killed a man or where it had been intending to kill an Egyptian and killed an Israelite or a non-Bible child and killed a Bible child which of the answers was given first Arkahana in the name of Rabbah said that the answer about intention was given first whereas Artabiomi in the name of Rabbah said that the answer about having killed a man in the presence of one witness etc was given first Arkahana who in the name of Rabbah said that the answer about intention was given first compared him to a fisherman who had been Catching fishes in the sea Talmud, Mas Babakama when he caught big ones he took them and when he subsequently caught little ones he took them also but Artabiomi who in the name of Rabbah said that the answer about having killed the man in the presence of one witness etc was given first compares him to a fisherman who was catching fishes in the sea and when he caught little ones he took them but when he subsequently caught big ones he threw away the little ones and took the big ones. Another berry that teaches and the owner of the ox shall be quit implies according to the statement of our Jose the Galilean quit from compensating in the case of Tam killing embryos said our Akiba to him behold scripture states if men strive together and hurt a woman with child etc implying that only men but not oxen are liable for killing embryos was not this a good question on the part of our Akiba Arola the son of our Edi said the implication drawn by our Jose is essential for otherwise. It might have occurred to you to apply our Akiba's inference men but not oxen exclusively to such oxen as are comparable to men just as men are muad so also here the oxen referred to are muad whereas in the case of Tam there should be liability the divine law has therefore stated the owner of the ox shall be quit implying exemption also in the case of Tam said Rabba thereupon is the native born to be on the earth and the stranger in the highest heavens no said Rabba the implication drawn by our Jose is essential for this reason that you might have been inclined to apply the inference men but not oxen only to oxen which could be compared to men just as men are muad so the oxen here referred to are muad and to have extended the exemption to cases of Tam by an argument of fortiori therefore the divine law purposely states further the owner of the ox shall be quit to indicate that only in the case of Tam will there be exemption whereas in the case of muad there will be Liability said Abbe to him if that is so why not argue in the same way in the case of payment for degradation thus scripture says men excluding oxen which could be compared with men just as the men are muad so the oxen thus exempted must be muad and a fortiori exemption is extended to cases of tam thereupon the divine law on another occasion purposely states the owner of the ox shall be quit to indicate that only in the case of tam will there be exemption whereas in the case of muad there will be liability for degradation now you could hardly say that this is indeed the case for if so why not teach that the owner of the ox shall be quit means according to our Jose the Galilean quit from compensating both in the case of tam killing embryos and in the case of it having caused degradation Abbe and Rabba both therefore said you might have been inclined to suppose that in the case of men it is only where no mischief resulted to the woman that a liability to pay for. The embryo is imposed upon them whereas where a mischief resulted to the woman no civil liability is imposed upon them but that it is not so with oxen as in their case even if mischief results to the woman a liability to pay is imposed the divine law has therefore on another occasion purposely stated the owner of the ox shall be quit to indicate exemption in all cases are at a be of a demur to the saying does then the matter of civil liability depend upon the non-occurrence of mischief to the woman does this matter not depend upon intention of the defendant are at a be of a therefore said you might have been inclined to think thus in the case of men where their purpose was to kill one another even if mischief results to a woman a civil liability will be imposed whereas where they purpose to kill the woman herself who was in fact killed no civil liability would be imposed in the case of oxen however even where their purpose was to kill the woman who is indeed Killed by them a civil liability should be imposed for the embryo to prevent your reasoning thus the divine law on another occasion purposely states the owner of the ox shall be quit to indicate exemption altogether in the case of oxen and so also our Hadiyah upon returning from the south came to the college and brought the teaching of a Baritha with him stating the case in accordance with the interpretation given by our Adabiyah above another Baritha teaches the owner of the ox shall be quit implies according to the statement of our Akiba quit from compensating for the killing of a slave Talmud, Mas Baba be but why should our Akiba not argue against himself since any actual liability in the case of the ox itself being a tam is not paid except out of its body why should not the owner say to the plaintiff bring it to the court of law and be reimbursed out of it our Samuel son of our Isaac thereupon said this creates no difficulty the case is one where the owner of the ox Slaughtered it before the passing of the sentence you might suggest in that case the payment should be made out of the flesh we are therefore told that since the ox as such had been liable to be stoned to death no payment could be made out of it even where it was slaughtered before the passing of the sentence but if so why did not our Akiba think of this reply to the objection he made to our Eliezer also is that the owner of the ox slaughters it beforehand he could indeed have done this but he thought that our Eliezer also probably had another explanation better than this which he would tell him but why did our Eliezer himself not answer him that he referred to a case where the owner slaughtered the ox beforehand he could answer it was only there where the ox aimed at killing a beast but by accident killed a man in which case it is not liable to be stoned to death and you might therefore have thought there was a liability for cover that there was a need for scripture to indicate that there is in fact no liability but here where the ox had originally been liable to be stoned to death no scriptural indication should be needed to exempt from liability even where the ox has meanwhile been slaughtered but should not the same argument be employed also regarding the exposition of our Akiba RC therefore said the explanation of this matter was delivered to me from the mouth of a great man to wit our Jose Bihanna who said you might be inclined to think that since our Akiba said even in the case of Tam injuring man the payment of the difference must be in full the compensation for killing a slave should also be paid out of the best of the general estate divine law therefore states the owner of the ox shall be quit implying that this is not the case at our zero to our did our Akiba himself not qualify this liability for it was taught our Akiba says as it might be thought that this full payment has to be made out of the best of the general estate it is therefore further stated according to this judgment shall it be done unto him to emphasize that payment is to be made out of its body but no payment is to be made out of any other source whatsoever Rabbah therefore gave a different explanation saying the implication is still essential for otherwise you might have thought that since I have to be more strict in the case of killing a slave than in the case of a freeman for in the case of a freeman worth one seller the payment will be one seller and of one worth thirty the payment will be thirty whereas in the case of a slave even where he was worth one seller the payment will have to be thirty there should be compensation for the killing of a slave even out of the best of the estate the divine law therefore states the owner of the ox should be quit implying that this is not the case it was taught in accordance with the explanation given by Rabbah the owner of the ox should be quit implies according to the statement of R. Akiba quit from compensation for the killing of a slave but is this not strictly logical for since there is liability to pay compensation for the killing of a slave and there is liability to pay compensation for the killing of a freeman just as where there is liability to pay compensation for the killing of a freeman a distinction has been made by you between Tam and Muad why then in the case where compensation has to be paid for the killing of a slave
Compensation for the killing of a slave or rabbis taught it is written but it hath killed a man or a woman Our Akiva says what does this clause come to teach us if that there is liability for the going to death of a woman as of a man has it not already been stated if an ox or a man or a woman it must therefore have intended to put the woman on the same footing as a man just as in the case of a man the compensation will go to his ears so also in the case of a woman the compensation will go to her ears did our Akiva thereby mean to put forward the view that the husband was not entitled to inherit her but has it not been taught and he shall inherit her this shows that the husband is entitled to inherit his wife this is a view of our Akiva Reshlakish therefore said our Akiva stated this only with reference to Kofar which since it has not to be paid save after the death of the victim is regarded as property in anticipation and the husband is not entitled to inherit property in Anticipation as he does property in actual possession but why should Kofar not be paid except after death scripture says but it hath killed a man or a woman the ox shall be stoned and its owner also shall be put to death if there be laid on him a ransom but did our Akiva not hold that damages for injury also are not inherited by the husband has it not been taught if one hurt a woman so that her embryo departed from her compensation for depreciation and for pain should be given to the woman. Compensation for the value of the embryo to the husband if the husband is not alive his due should be given to his ears and if the woman is not alive at the time of payment her due should be given to her ears hence if the woman was a slave that had been emancipated Talmud, Mas Babakama or a prosely test the defendant would be the first to acquire title to all the claims and thus be released from any liability rather thereupon said we deal in this latter case with a divorced. Woman so also said Arnaman that we deal here with a divorced woman but I might here object if she was divorced why should she not also share in the compensation for the value of the embryo our Papa thereupon said the Torah awarded the value of embryos to the husband even where the cohabitation had taken place not in a married state the reason being that scripture says according as the cohabitator of the woman will lay upon him but why should not rather refer the ruling to the case where the payment of the compensation had been collected in money and Arnaman to the case where it had been collected out of land for did Rabbi not say that where an outstanding debt had been collected out of land the firstborn son would take in it a double portion but where it had been collected in money the firstborn son would not take in it a double portion or again did Arnaman not say that on the contrary where the debt had been collected in money the firstborn would take in it a Double portion, but where it has been collected out of land, the firstborn son would not take in it a double portion. It could, however, be answered that these statements were made on the basis of the dispatch of the Western sages according to the view of the rabbis. Whereas in the case here, where Rabbi and Arnaman interpreted it to have referred to a divorced woman, they were stating the law is maintained by Rabbi Arsimian Bilakish said, where an ox killed a slave without purposing to do so, there would be exemption from the payment of thirty shekels, since it is written, he shall give unto their master thirty shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned, implying that where the ox would be liable to be stoned, the owner is to pay thirty shekels, but where the ox would not be liable to be stoned, the owner need not pay thirty shekels. Rabbi similarly said, where an ox killed a freeman without purposing to do so, there would be exemption from Kofar, for it is written, the ox should be. Stoned and its owner also shall be put to death if there be laid on him a ransom implying that where the ox has to be stoned the owner has not to pay Kofar Abbe raised an objection to this from the following mission if a man says my ox has killed so and so or has killed so and so's ox in either case the defendant has to pay in virtue of his own admission now does the payment in the former case not mean Kofar though the ox would not become liable to be stoned through the owners admission no it means for the actual value if it means payment for the pecuniary loss read the concluding clause if he says my ox has killed so and so slave the defendant is not liable to pay in virtue of his own admission now if the payment referred to in the first clause was meant for the pecuniary loss why is there no liability to pay for the pecuniary loss in the case of a slave he however said to him I could have answered you that the opening clause refers to the actual value of the killed person whereas the concluding clause refers to the fixed fine of 30 shekels as however I have no intention to answer you by means of forced interpretations I will say that both clauses do in fact refer to the actual value of the killed person Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi but it is only in the case of a freeman where Kofar may sometimes be paid on the strength of the defendant's own admission as where witnesses appeared and testified to the ox having killed a freeman without however knowing whether it was still Tam or already Muad and the owner admits it to have been Muad in which case Kofar would be paid on the strength of his own admission that we say where witnesses are not at all available payment will be made for the actual value of the loss whereas in the case of a slave where the fixed fine could never be paid through the defendant's own admission since even where witnesses appear and testify to the ox having killed a slave Without knowing whether it had still been Tam or already Muad and the owner admits that it had already been Muad no fine would be paid we say where no witnesses at all are available there will be no payment even for the amount of the value of the loss our Samuel son of our Isaac raised an objection from the following teaching wherever there is liability in the case of a freeman there is liability in the case of a slave both for Kofar and for stoning now how could Kofar ever be paid in? The case of a slave does it therefore not surely mean the payment for the amount of the value of the loss some say that he raised the objection and he himself answered it others say that Rabbi said to him what is meant is as follows wherever there is liability for Kofar i.e. in the case of a freeman killed intentionally by the ox as testified by witnesses there is a similar liability for the fine in the case of a slave and wherever there is liability for the amount of the value of it. Loss i.e. in the case of a freeman killed unintentionally as testified by witnesses there is also liability for the amount of the value of the loss in the case of a slave killed unintentionally as testified by witnesses Rabbah however said to him if so why in the case of fire unintentionally burning a human being to death as testified by witnesses should there also not be liability to pay the amount of the value of the loss and how did Rabbah know that no payment would be made in this case? Shall we say from the following mission where fire was set to a barn and a goat had been bound to it and a slave was loose nearby it and all were burnt with the barn there would be liability but where the slave had been chained to it and the goat loose nearby it and all were burnt with it there would be no liability but how could Rabbah prove his point from this case here did Rush Lakish not state that this case here should be explained as one where e.g. the defendant put the actual fire? Upon the body of the slave, so that no other but the major punishment had to be inflicted, but it may perhaps be suggested that Rabbah derived his point from the following very before it has been taught the excess in the liability for fire over that for pit is that fire is apt to consume both things fit for it and things unfit for it, whereas this is not so in the case of pit, it is not, however, said that in the case of fire where a human being has been burned to death unintentionally, there is liability to pay for the pecuniary loss, whereas it is not so in pit, but might the very then not perhaps have stated some points and omitted others, it must therefore have been that Rabbah himself was questioning whether in the case of fire burning a human being unintentionally there would be payment for the amount of the value of the loss, or whether there would be none, should we say that it was only in the case of cattle where if the manslaughter was unintentional, Kofar would be paid that for unintentional manslaughter the amount of the value of the loss is to be paid whereas in the case of fire where for intentional manslaughter no kofar would be paid there should be no payment of the amount of the value of the loss for unintentional manslaughter or shall we perhaps rather say that since in the case of cattle killing a person unintentionally where no kofar is paid the value of the loss is nevertheless paid so should it also be with fire where no kofar would be paid for intentional manslaughter that nevertheless the value of the loss caused by unintentional manslaughter should be paid but as no information was available to us on this matter it remained undecided when Ardini arrived from Palestine he said on behalf of Aryohan and the word kofar I understand what is taught by the expression of kofar it implies the inclusion of the payment of kofar in cases where there was no intention to kill just as kofar is paid where there was intention of a however said to him if so the same could now surely also be argued in the case of a slave is what is taught by the expression if a slave it implies that a slave killed unintentionally is subject to the same law as a slave killed intentionally if that is so why did Reshlakish say that where an ox killed a slave unintentionally there would be exemption from the 30 shekels he replied would you confute one person's view by citing another when Rabin arrived from Palestine he said on behalf of Aryohan and the word of slaves
Abgord daughter implies that there is liability in the case of little ones just as in that of grown UPS but surely this is only logical for since there is a liability in the case of man killing man there is similarly a liability in the case of cattle killing man just as where man has killed man no distinction is made between the victims being little ones or grown UPS so also where cattle killed man no distinction should be made between the victims being little ones or grown UPS. Moreover there is an a fortiori argument to the same effect for if in the case of man killing man where the law did no make murderers who are minors liable as it did make grown UPS it nevertheless imposed their liability for little ones as for grown UPS Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba now in the case of cattle killing man where the law made small cattle liable as it did make big cattle should it not stand to reason that there is liability for little ones as there is. For grown UPS no for it could have been argued that if you stated this ruling in the case of man killing man it was perhaps because where man injured man there was liability for the four additional items but how would you be able to prove the same ruling in the case of cattle where there could be no liability for the four additional items hence it is further laid down whether it have gored a son or have gored a daughter to impose liability for little ones as for grown UPS so far I know this only in the case of new adwents do I know it in the case of tam we infer it by analogy since there is liability for killing man or woman and there is similarly liability for killing son or daughter just as regarding the liability for man or woman you made no discrimination between tam and mu so also regarding the liability for son or daughter you should make no discrimination between tam and mu moreover there is an a fortiori argument to the same effect for if in the case of Man and woman who are in a disadvantageous position when damages had been done by them you have nevertheless made there no discrimination between Tam and Muad in the case of son and daughter who are in an advantageous position when damage has been done by them should it not stand to reason that you should make no discrimination between Tam and Muad no you cannot argue thus can we draw an analogy from a more serious to a lighter case so as to be more severe with regard to the latter if the law is strict with Muad which is a more serious case how can you argue that it ought to be equally strict with Tam which is a lighter case moreover you could also argue that the case of man and woman is graver since they are under obligation to observe the commandments of the law but how draw therefrom an analogy to the case of son and daughter seeing that they are exempt from the commandments it was therefore necessary to state further whether it have a son or have gorda. Daughter, the repetition of the word gord indicating that no discrimination should be made between goring in the case of tam and goring in the case of muad, between goring in the case of killing and goring in the case of mere injury. Mishnah, if an ox by rubbing itself against a wall caused it to fall upon the person and kill him, or if an ox while trying to kill a beast by accident killed a human being, or while aiming at a heathen killed an Israelite, or while aiming at non Bible infants. Killed a Bible child, there is no liability. Gamara Samuel said there is exemption for the ox in these cases only from the penalty of being stoned to death, but there is liability for the owner to pay Kofar. Rab, however, said there is exemption here from both liabilities, but why Kofar was not the ox tam, just as in an analogous case, Rab said that the ox was muad to fall upon human beings in pits, so also in this case we say that the ox was muad to rub itself against walls, which thus fell upon human beings but if so why should the ox not be liable to be stoned to death it is correct in this other case where we can explain that the ox was looking at some vegetables and so came to fall into a pit but here what ground could we give for assuming otherwise that an intention to kill on the part of the ox here also we may suppose that the ox had been rubbing itself against the wall for its own gratification but how can we know this by noticing that even after the wall had fallen the ox was still rubbing itself against the Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi, but granted all this is this matter of damage not on a PAR with that done by pebbles where there would be no liability for Kofar Armari the son of Arkahana thereupon said we speak of a wall gradually brought down by the constant pushing of the ox it has been taught in accordance with Samuel and in refutation of Rab there are cases where the liability is both for stoning to death and Kofar there are other cases where there is liability for Kofar but exemption from stoning to death there are again other cases where there is liability for stoning to death but exemption from Kofar and there are still other cases where there is exemption both from stoning to death and from Kofar how so in the case of Muad killing a person intentionally there is liability both for stoning to death and for Kofar in the case of Muad killing a person unintentionally there is liability for Kofar but exemption from stoning to death in the case of Tam killing a person intentionally there is liability for stoning to death but exemption from Kofar in the case of Tam killing a person unintentionally there is exemption from both penalties whereas in case of injury caused by the ox unintentionally Arjuna says there is liability to pay damages but Arsimian says there is no liability to pay what is the reason of Arjuna he derives the law of damages from that of Kofar just as for Kofar there is liability even where there was no intention to kill so also for damages for injuries there is liability even where there was no intention to injure Arsimian on the other hand derived the law of damages from that of the killing of the ox just as the stoning of the ox is not required where there was no intention to kill so also damages are not required where there was no intention to injure but why should Arjuna also not derive the ruling in this case from the law applying to the Killing of the ox it is proper to derive a ruling regarding payment from another ruling regarding payment but it is not proper to derive a ruling regarding payment from a ruling regarding killing why then should our simian also not derive the ruling in this case from the law applying to Kofar it is proper to derive a liability regarding the ox from another liability that similarly concerns the ox thus excluding Kofar which is a liability that concerns only the owner or if the ox while trying to kill a beast by accident killed a human being there is no liability where however the ox had aimed at killing one human being and by accident killed another human being there would be liability this implication of the mission is not in accordance with our simian for it has been taught our simian says even where the ox aimed at killing one person and by accident killed another person there would be no liability what was the reason of our simian scripture states the ox shall be stoned and its owner also shall be put to death implying that only in those cases in which the owner would be subject to be put to death were he to have committed murder the ox also would be subject to be put to death just as therefore in the case of the owner the liability arises only where he was aiming at the particular person who was actually killed so also in the case of the ox the liability will arise only where it was aiming at the particular person who was actually killed but whence do we know that this is so even in the case of the owner himself scripture states and lie in wait for him and rise up against him which indicates that he is not liable unless he bad been aiming at the particular person whom he killed what then do the rabbis make of the words and lie in wait it was said at the school of Arjani they accept on the strength of the manslaughter committed by a stone being thrown into a crowd how is this to be understood if you say that there were in the crowd non-heathens and one Israelite why not accept the case on the ground that the majority in the crowd were persons who were heathens and even where they were half and half does not an accused in a criminal charge have the benefit of the doubt the case is one where there were nine Israelites and one heathen for though in this case the majority in the crowd consisted of Israelites still since there was among them one heathen he was an essential part of it group and essential part is reckoned as equivalent to half and where there is a doubt in a criminal charge the accused has a benefit mission where an ox of a woman or an ox of minor orphans or an ox of a guardian or an ox of the wilderness or an ox of the sanctuary or an ox of a proselyte who died without legal ears has killed the person it is liable to be stoned to death our Judah says in the case of an ox of the wilderness an ox of the sanctuary and an ox of a proselyte who died Without ears there would be exemption from stoning to death since these have no private owners Gemara our rabbis taught the word ox occurs seven times in the section dealing with cattle killing men to include the ox of a woman the ox of minor orphans the ox of a guardian the ox of the wilderness the ox of the sanctuary and the ox of a proselyte who died without legal ears Arjuna however says an ox of the wilderness an ox of the sanctuary and an ox of a proselyte who died without ears are exempt from stoning to death since these have no private owners Arjuna said the exemption laid down by Arjuna extends even to the case where the ox gourd and was only subsequently consecrated to the temple or where the ox gourd and was only subsequently abandoned whence do we know this from the fact that Arjuna specified both an ox of the wilderness and an ox of a proselyte who died without ears now what actually is an ox of a proselyte who died surely since he
Final verdict read therefore that is so only when no change in status has taken place between the manslaughter the appearance before the court and the final verdict Mishnah if while an ox sentenced to death is being taken out to be stoned its owner declares it sacred it does not become sacred if he slaughters it its flesh is forbidden for any use if however before the sentence has been pronounced the owner consecrates it it is consecrated and if he slaughters it its flesh is permitted for food if the owner hands over his cattle to an unpaid billy or to a borrower to a paid billy or to a hire they enter into all liabilities in lieu of the owner in the case of Muad the payment would have to be in full whereas in the case of Tam half damages would be paid tomorrow our rabbis taught if an ox has killed a person and before its judgment is pronounced its owner sells it Talmud Mas Baba Kama the sale holds good if he declares it sacred it is sacred if it is slaughtered it's Flesh is permitted for food if a billy returns it to the house of its owner it is an effective restoration but if after its sentence had already been pronounced the owner sold it the sale would not be valid if he consecrates it it is not consecrated if it is slaughtered its flesh is forbidden for any use if a billy returns it to the house of its owner it is not an effective restoration our Jacob however says even if after the sentence had already been pronounced the billy returned it to its owner it would be an effective restoration shall we say that the point at issue is that in the view of the rabbis it is of no avail to plead regarding things which became forbidden for any use here is your property before you whereas in the view of our Jacob it can be pleaded even regarding things forbidden for any use here is your property before you rabbis said both parties in fact agree that even regarding things forbidden for any use the plea here is your property before you can be Advance for if it is as you said why did they not differ in the case of Levin on Passover but the point at issue here in the case before us must therefore be whether or not sentence may be pronounced over an ox in its absence the rabbis maintain that no sentence can be pronounced over an ox in its absence and the owner may accordingly plead against the billy if you would have returned it to me before the passing of the sentence I would have caused it to escape to the pastures whereas you have allowed my ox to fall into the hands of those against whom I am unable to bring any action our Jacob however maintains that the sentence can be pronounced over the ox even in its absence and the billy may accordingly retort to the owner in any case the sentence would have been passed on the ox what is the reason of the rabbi scripture says the ox shall be stoned and its owner also shall be put to death implying that the conditions under which the owner would be subject to be put to death were he to have committed murder are also the conditions under which the ox would be subject to be put to death just as in the case of the owner committing murder the sentence could be passed only in his presence so also the sentence in the case of an ox could be passed only in its presence but our Jacob argues that applies well enough to the case of the owner committing murder as he is able to submit please but is the ox also able to submit please where an owner has handed over his cattle to an unpaid billy or to a borrower etc our rabbis taught the following four categories of persons enter into all liabilities in lieu of the owner of his unpaid billy and borrower paid billy and hire if cattle so transferred kill a person if they are tam they would be stoned to death but there would be exemption from kofor whereas in the case of muad they would be stoned and the billies in charge would be liable to pay kofor in all cases however the value of the ox would have to be reimbursed to the owner by all of the billies with the exception of the unpaid billy I would here ask with what circumstances are we dealing if where the ox was well guarded why should all of them not be exempt from having to reimburse the owner if on the other hand it was not guarded well why should even the unpaid billy not be liable it might be said that we are dealing here with a case where inferior precautions were taken to control the ox but not really adequate precautions in the case of an unpaid billy his obligation to control was thereby fulfilled whereas the others did thereby not yet fulfill their obligation to control still I would ask whose view is here followed if that of our Meir Talmud Mas Baba Kamabi who maintained that Hira is subject to the same law as unpaid billy why is it not taught above with the exception of unpaid billy and Hira if on the other hand the view followed was that of our Judah who maintained that Hira should be Subject to the same law as paid billy why was it not taught with the exception of unpaid billy whereas in the case of Muad they all would be exempt from Kofar Arhuna behind and thereupon said this teaching is in accordance with our Eliezer who said that the only precaution for it Muad is the slaughter knife and who regarding Hira might agree with the view of our Judah that Hira should be subject to the same law as paid billy Abay however said it could still follow the view of our Meir but as transposed by Rabbi Biabab who learned thus how is the payment for the loss of the article regulated in the case of Hira our Meir says as in the case of paid billy our Judah however says as in the case of unpaid billy our Eliezer said where an ox had been handed over to an unpaid billy and damage was done by it the billy would be liable but where damage was done to it the billy would be exempt I would here ask what were the circumstances if where the billy had undertaken to guard the ox against damage why even in the case where it was injured should there be no liability if on the other hand where the billy had not undertaken to guard against damage why even in the case where damage was done by the ox should there not be exemption Rabbi thereupon said we suppose in fact that the billy had undertaken to guard the ox against damage but the case here is one where he had known the ox to be a gorer and it is natural that what he did undertake was to prevent the ox from going and doing damage to others but he did not think of the possibility of others coming and injuring it mission if the owner fastened his ox to the wall inside the stable with a cord or shut the door in front of it in the ordinary way but the ox got out and did damage whether it had been tam or already muad he would be liable this is the ruling of our Meir Arjuda however says in the case of tam he would be liable but in the case of muad he would be exempt since it is written and his owner hath not Kept him in thus excluding this case where IT was kept in our Eliezer says no precaution is sufficient for Muad save the slaughter knife tomorrow what was the reason of our Meir he maintained that normally oxen are not kept under control and the divine law enacted that Tam should involve liability to show that at least moderate precautions were required and the divine law stated further in the case of Muad and his owner hath not kept him in to show that for this really adequate precautions are required and the goring mentioned in the case of Tam is now placed on a PAR with the goring mentioned in the case of Muad Arjuda however maintained that oxen normally are kept under control and the divine law stated that in the case of Tam there should be payment to show that really adequate precaution is required the divine law however goes on to say and his owner hath not kept him in in the case of Muad this would imply that there should be the precaution of a superior Degree these words however constitute an amplification following an amplification and as the rule is that an amplification following an amplification intimates nothing but a limitation scripture has thus reduced the superior degree of the required precaution and should you object to this that Goring is mentioned in the case of Tam and Goring is mentioned in the case of Muad for mutual inference the answer is that in this case the divine law has explicitly restricted this ruling by stating and his owner hath not kept him in the word him confining the application to this one but not to another but surely these words are needed for the stated purpose if that were so the divine law should write surely hath not kept in why does it say hath not kept him in to show that the rule applies to this one but not to another it has been taught our Eliezer B. Jacob says whether in the case of Tam or in that of Muad as soon as even inferior precautions have been taken to control the ox there his exemption what is his reason he concurs with Arjuda in holding that in the case of Muad precaution even of an inferior degree is sufficient and he extended this ruling to Tam as he on the strength of the mutual inference conveyed by the mention of Goring in the case both of Tam and of Muad are at a Biyahabah said the exemption laid down by Arjuda applies only to the part of the payment due on account of the ox having been declared Muad but the portion due on account of Tam remains. Unaffected Rab said where the ox was declared Muad to gore with the right horn it would thereby not become Muad for goring with the left horn I would here ask in accordance with whose view was the statement made if in accordance with our Meir did he not say that whether in the case of Tam or in that of Muad precaution of a superior degree was needed if on the other hand in accordance with Arjuda why specify only the left horn even in the case of the right horn itself does not one part of the payment come under the rule of Tam and another under that of Muad I may say that in fact it is in accordance with Arjuda and that Rab does not concur in the view expressed by our Adabi Ahabah and what Rab thus intended to say was that it was only in such an instance that there would be in one ox part Tam and part Muad Talmud, Mas Baba Kama but in the case of an ox which was alt
will be paid for the injuries inflicted upon the cow but only quarter damages will be paid for the loss of the calf so also where a cow gored an ox and a live calf was found nearby so that it was unknown whether the birth of the calf preceded the goring or followed the goring half damages can be recovered out of the cow and quarter damages out of the calf Gamara Rav Judah on behalf of Samuel said this ruling is the view of Simicus who held that money the ownership of which cannot be decided has to be shared by the parties the sages however say that it is a fundamental principle in law that the onus propandi falls on the claimant why was it necessary to state this is a fundamental principle in law it was necessary to imply that even where the plaintiff is positive and the defendant dubious it is still the plaintiff on whom falls onus propandi or we may say it is also necessary in view of a case of this kind for it has been stated if a man sells an ox to another and it is found to be a gorerab maintained that the sale would be voidable whereas Samuel said that the vendor could plead I sold it to be slaughtered how so why not see whether the vendee was a person buying for field work or whether he was a person buying to slaughter Samuel's view can hold good where he was a person buying both for the one and the other but why not see if the money paid corresponded to the value of an ox for field work then it must have been purchased for field work if on it other hand it corresponded to that of an ox to be slaughtered then it must have been purchased for slaughter Samuel's view could still hold good where there was a rise in the price of meat so that the ox was worth the price paid for one for field work Talmud, Moss Baba Kamba B I may here ask if the vendor had not the wherewithal for making payment why not take the ox in lieu of money do not people say from the owner of your loan take payment even in brand no this is to be applied where he had the wherewithal for making payment Rab who said that it was avoidable purchase maintained that we decide according to the majority of cases and the majority of people buy for field work Samuel however said that the vendor might plead against him it was for slaughter that I sold it to the end that we do not follow the majority for we follow the majority only in ritual matters but in pecuniary cases we do not follow the majority but whoever has a pecuniary claim against his neighbor the onus Propandi falls upon him it has been taught to the same effect where an ox gored a cow and its newly born calf was found dead nearby so that it was unknown whether the birth of the calf preceded the goring or followed the goring half damages will be paid for injuries inflicted upon the cow but only quarter damages will be paid for the loss of the calf this is a view of Simicus the sages however say if one claims anything from his neighbor the onus propandi falls upon him or Samuel B. Namani stated once can we learn that the onus propandi falls on the claimant it is said if any man have any matters to do let him come unto them implying let him bring evidence before them but Arashi demurred saying do we need scripture to tell us this is it not common sense that if a man has a pain he visits the healer no the purpose of the verse is to corroborate the statement made by Arnaman on behalf of Rabbi Abu once can we learn that judges should give prior consideration to the first plaintiff it is said if any man have any matters to do let him come unto them implying let him cause his matters to be brought first before them the Nihardians however said it may sometimes be necessary to give prior consideration to the defendant as for instance in a case where his property would otherwise depreciate in value so also where a cow gordon ox etc we have here half damages plus quarter damages is it not only half of the damage that need be paid for what then? Half full damage is less a quarter to do here of a set half of the damage means one quarter of the damage and a quarter of the damage means one eighth of the damage it is true that where the cow and the calf belong to one owner the plaintiff would be entitled to plead against the owner of the cow in any case have you not to pay me half damages the ruling however applies to the case where the cow belonged to one and the calf to another again where the plaintiff claimed from the owner of the cow. First it would still also make no difference as he would be entitled to argue against the owner of the cow it was your cow that did me the damage and it is for you to produce evidence that there is a joint defendant with you but where the rule applies is to a case where he claimed from the owner of the calf first in which case the owner of the cow may say to him you have made clear your opinion that there is a joint defendant with me some however say that even where the plaintiff claimed from the owner of the cow first the latter might put him off by saying it is definitely known to me that there is a joint defendant with me Rabbah said is that a fourth of the damage and an eighth of the damage mentioned in the text is not half damages and quarter damages stated in the text Rabbah therefore said we suppose that in fact the cow and the calf belong to one owner and the meaning is this where the cow is available the payment of half damages will be made out of the cow Talmud, Mas Baba. Comma, but where the cow is not available quarter damages will be paid out of the body of the calf now this is so only where it is not known whether the calf was still part of the cow at the time she gored or whether it was not so but were we certain that the calf was still part of the cow at the time of the goring the whole payment of the half damages would be made from the body of the calf Rabbah here adopts the same line of reasoning as in another place as Rabbah has indeed stated where a cow has done damage payment can be collected out of the body of its calf the reason being that the latter is a part of the body of the former whereas in the case of a chicken doing damage no payment will be made out of its eggs the reason being that they are a separate body Rabbah further said where an ox has gored a cow and caused miscarriage the valuation will not be made for the cow separately and for the calf separately but the valuation will be made for the calf as at the time when it formed a part of the cow for if you do not adopt this rule you will be found to be making the defendant suffer unduly the same method is followed in the case of the cutting off the hand of a neighbor's slave and the same method is followed in the case of damage done to a neighbor's field said Araha the son of Rabbah to Arashi if justice demands why should not the defendant suffer because he is entitled to say to him since it was a pregnant cow that I deprived you of it is a pregnant cow which should be taken into valuation there is no question that where the cow belonged to one owner and the calf to another owner the value of the fat condition of the cow will go to the owner of the cow but what of the value of its bulky appearance our papa said it will go to the owner of the cow Araha the son of Araha said it will be shared by the two owners the law is that it will be shared by the two owners Mishnah if a potter brings his wares into the courtyard of another person without permission and the cattle of the owner of the courtyard breaks them there is no liability moreover should the animal be injured by them the owner of the pottery is liable to pay damages if however he brought them in with permission the owner of the courtyard is liable similarly if a man brings his produce into the courtyard of another person without permission and the animal of the owner of the premises consumes it there is no liability if it was harmed by it the owner would be liable if however he brought them in with permission the owner of the premises would be liable so also if a man brings his ox into the courtyard of another without Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B permission and the ox of the owner of the premises gores it or the dog of the owner of the premises bites it there is no liability moreover should it gore the ox of the owner of the premises its owner would be liable again if it falls there into a pit of the owner of the premises and makes the water. In it foul there would be liability so also if IT kills the owner's father or son who was inside the pit there would be liability to pay cover if however he brought it in with permission the owner of the yard would be liable rabbi however says in all these cases the owner of the premises would not be liable unless he has taken it upon himself to watch the articles brought into his premises Gamara the reason why the potter would be liable for damage occasioned by his pottery to the cattle of the owner of the premises is because the entry was without permission which shows that were it with permission the owner of the pots would not be liable for the damage done to the cattle of the owner of the premises and we do not say that the owner of the pots has by implication undertaken to watch the cattle of the owner of the premises who is the authority for this view rabbi who has laid down that without express stipulation no duty to watch is undertaken now look at the second clause if he brought them in with permission the owner of the premises would be liable this brings us round to the view of the rabbis who said that even without express stipulation he makes himself responsible for watching moreover it was further stated rabbi says in all these cases the owner of the premises would not be liable unless he has taken upon himself to watch are we to say that the opening clause and the concluding clause are in accordance with rabbi while the middle clause is in accordance with the rabbis are zero thereupon said the contradiction is obvious he who taught one clause cannot have taught the other clause rabbi however said the whole of the anonymous part of the mission is in accordance with the rabbis for where the entry was with permission the owner of the premises undertook the safeguarding of the pots even against breakage by the wind if a man brings his produce into the courtyard of another owner etc rab said this rule applies
consumed by an animal there will still be liability to the judgment of heaven or if you wish you may say that by the deadly poison mentioned was meant hot pericum which like a fruit is eaten by animals an objection could be raised from the following if a woman enters the premises of another person to grind wheat without permission and the animal of the owner consumes it there is no liability if the animal is harmed the woman would be liable now why not argue it should not have overeaten I can answer in what respect does this case go beyond that of the Mishnah which was interpreted to refer to damage occasioned by the animal having slipped over them what then was in the mind of the one who made the objection he might have said to you your explanation is satisfactory regarding the Mishnah where it says if it was harmed by it which admits of being interpreted that the animal slipped over them but here in the Beritha it says if the animal is harmed without the words by them so that surely the consumption of the wheat is what is referred to and the other he can contend that the omission of these words makes no difference come and here if a man brought his ox into the courtyard of another person without permission and it ate their wheat and got diarrhea from which it died there would be no liability but if he brought it in with permission the owner of the courtyard would be liable now why not argue it should not have eaten rubber thereupon said how can you Raise an objection from a case where permission was given against a case where permission was not given where permission was given the owner of the premises assumed liability for safeguarding the ox even against its strangling itself the question was raised where the owner of the premises has assumed responsibility to safeguard the articles brought into his premises what is the legal position has the obligation to safeguard been assumed by him only against damage from his own beast or has he perhaps also undertaken to safeguard from damage in general come and hear Rav Judah B. Simon learned in the tractate Nezikin of the school of Karna if a man brings his produce into the courtyard of another without permission and an ox from elsewhere comes and consumes it there is no liability but if he brought it in with permission there would be liability now who would be exempt and who would be liable does it not mean that the owner of the premises would be exempt and the owner of it Premises would be liable. I may say that this is not so. It is the owner of the ox who would be exempt and the owner of the ox who would be liable. But if it refers to the owner of the ox, Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, what has permission or absence of permission to do with the case? I will answer where the produce was brought in with permission. The case would be one of tooth doing damage in the plaintiff's premises and tooth doing damage in the plaintiff's premises entails liability. Whereas in the absence of permission, it would be a case of tooth doing damage on public ground and tooth doing damage on public ground entails no liability. Come and here if a man brings his ox into the premises of another person without permission and an ox from elsewhere comes and gores it, there is no liability. But if he brought it in with permission, there would be liability. Now who would be exempt and who would be liable? Does it not mean that it is the owner of the premises who would be exempt and the owner? Of the premises who would be liable, no, it is the owner of the ox from elsewhere who would be exempt, and similarly, it is the owner of the ox from elsewhere who would be liable. But if so, what has permission or the absence of permission to do with the case? I would answer that this teaching is in accordance with Artarfan, who held that the unusual damage occasioned by horn in the plaintiff's premises has to be compensated in full, where the ox was brought in with permission. The case would therefore be one of horn doing damage in the plaintiff's premises, and the payment would have to be for full damages, whereas in the absence of permission, it would amount to horn doing damage on public ground, and the payment would accordingly be only for half damages. A certain woman once entered the house of another person for the purpose of baking bread there, and a goat of the owner of the house came and ate up the dough from which it became sick and died, and giving judgment, Rabba ordered it. Woman to pay damages for the value of the goat. Are we to say now that Rabba differed from Rab since Rab said it should not have eaten? I may reply, are both cases parallel? There, there was no permission, and the owner of the produce did not assume any obligation of safeguarding the property of the owner of the premises. Whereas in this case, permission had been given, and the woman had accepted responsibility for safeguarding the property of the owner of the premises. But why should the rule in this case be different from what has been laid down? That if a woman enters the premises of another person to grind wheat without permission, and the animal of the owner of the premises eats it up, the owner is not liable, and if the animal suffers harm, the woman is liable. The reason being that there was no permission, which shows that where permission was granted, she would be exempt. I can answer in the case of grinding wheat, since there is no need of privacy at all, and the owner of the premises. Is not required to absent himself, the obligation to take care of his property still devolves upon him. Whereas in the case of baking, where since privacy is required, the owner of the premises absents himself from the premises, the obligation to safeguard his property must fall upon the woman. If a man brings his ox into the premises of another person, etc., Rabba said, if he brings his ox on another person's ground and it takes their pit stitches and caves, the owner of the ox would be liable for the damage done to the ground, and the owner of the ground would be liable for any damage resulting from the pit. For though the master stated it says, if a man shall dig a pit and not if an ox shall dig a pit, still here in this case, since it was the duty of the owner of the ground to fill in the pit and he did not fill it, and he is reckoned in the eyes of the law as having himself dug it, Rabba further said, if he brings his ox into the premises of another person without permission and the ox. Injures the owner of the premises or the owner of the premises suffers injury through the ox he is liable but if it lies down he has no liability but why should the fact of its lying down confer exemption our papa thereupon said what is meant by it lies down is that the ox lays down its excrements upon the ground and thereby soils the utensils of the owner of the premises the exemption is because the excrements are a case of pit and we have never found pit involving liability for damage done to inanimate objects this explanation is satisfactory if we adopt the view of Samuel who held that all kinds of nuisances come under the head of pit but on the view of Rab who said that they do not come under the head of pit unless they have been abandoned what are we to say it may safely be said that excrements as a rule are abandoned Rabba said further if one enters the premises of another person without permission and injures the owner of the premises or the owner of the premises suffers Injury through him there would be liability and if the owner of the premises injured him there would be no liability our papa thereupon said this ruling applies only where the owner had not noticed him for if he had noticed him the owner of the premises by injuring him would render himself liable as the trespasser would be entitled to say to him though you have the right to eject me you have no right to injure me these authorities followed the line of reasoning adopted by them elsewhere for Rabba or as others read our papa stated Talmud, Mas Baba Kama be where both of them plaintiff and defendant had a right to be where they were or where both of them on the other hand had no right to be where they were if either of them injured the other he would be liable but if either suffered injury through the other there would be no liability this is so only where both of them had a right to be where they were or where both of them on the other hand had no right to be where they were. But where one of them had a right and the other had no right, the one who had a right would be exempt, whereas the one who had no right would be liable if it falls there into a pit of the owner and makes the water in it foul, there would be liability. Rabba said this ruling applies only where the ox makes the water foul at the moment of its falling into the pit, for where the water became foul only after it fell in there would be exemption on the ground that the damage done by the ox should then be subject to the law applicable in the case of pit and water is an inanimate object, and we never find pit entailing liability for damage done to inanimate objects. Now this is correct if we accept the view of Samuel who said that all kinds of nuisances are subject to the law of pit, but on the view of Rab who held that this is not so unless they have been abandoned, what are we to say? We must therefore suppose that if the statement was made at all it was made in this form, Rabba said that. Ruling of the mission applies only where the ox made the water foul by the dirt of its body but where it made the water foul by the smell of its carcass there would be no liability the reason being that the ox in this case was only a secondary cause of the damage and for a mere secondary cause there is no liability where it kills the owner's father or his son who was inside the pit there would be liability to pay cover but why was the ox not tamrab thereupon said we are dealing with a case where the ox was meant to fall upon people in pits but if so should it not have already been killed on the first occasion our joseph thereupon said the ox was looking at some grass growing near the opening of the pit and thus fell into it samuel however said this ruling is in accordance with our jose the galilean who held that killing by tam entails the payment of half cover Ola, however said it accords with the ruling laid down by our jose the galilean in accordance with Artarfan who said that horn doing damage in the plaintiff's premises entails the payment of full damages so here the liability
that if no explicit mention was made as to the washing the owner of the premises would be liable and the owner of the ox exempt indicating that without express stipulation to the contrary the former takes it upon himself to safeguard the ox now read the concluding clause but if he said bring in your ox and I will wash it should the ox suffer injury there would be liability but should it do damage there would be no liability the reason being that he expressly said to him and I will Watch it. The reason I mean that the owner of the premises would be liable and the owner of the ox exempt from which I infer that if there is no express stipulation, the owner of the ox would be liable and the owner of the premises exempt. As in such a case, the owner of the premises does not take it upon himself to safeguard the ox. This brings us round to the view of Rabbi who laid down there would be no liability upon him unless where the owner of the premises had taken upon himself to safeguard is then the opening clause in accordance with the rabbis and the concluding clause in accordance with Rabbi R. Eliezer. Thereupon said the contradiction is obvious. He who taught one clause cannot have taught the other clause. Rabbi, however, said the whole of the Beretha can be explained as being in accordance with the rabbis since the opening clause required the insertion of the words watch it. There were correspondingly inserted in the concluding clause the words and I will take care. Of it, our Papa, however, said the whole of the Beretha is in accordance with Rabbi, for he concurred in the view of Artarfan, who stated that horn doing damage in the plaintiff's premises would entail the payment of full damages. It therefore follows that where he expressly said to him, Watch it, he certainly did not transfer a legal right to him to any place in the premises, so that the case becomes one of horn doing damage in the plaintiff's premises, and as already explained, where horn does damage in the plaintiff's premises, the payment must be for full damages. Where, however, he did not expressly say, Watch it, he surely granted him a legal right to place in the premises, so that the case is one of damage done on premises of joint owners, and as we know, where horn does damage on premises of owners in common, there is no liability to pay anything but half damages. Mishnah, if an ox while charging another ox incidentally injures a woman who as a result miscarries, no compensation need be. Made for the loss of the embryos, but if a man, while meaning to strike another man, incidentally struck a woman who thus miscarried, he would have to pay compensation for the loss of the embryos. How is the compensation for the loss of embryos fixed? The estimated value of the woman before her miscarriage is compared with her value after miscarriage. Talmud, Mas Baba Kama A.R. Simeon B. Gamaliel said, If this is so, a woman after having given birth increases in value, it is therefore the value of the embryos which has to be estimated, and this amount will be given to the husband. If, however, the husband is no longer alive, it would be given to his heirs. If the woman was a manumitted slave or a proselyte, and the husband also a proselyte is no longer alive, there would be complete exemption. Gamara, the reason why there is exemption is because the ox was charging another ox, from which we infer that if it was charging the woman, there would be liability to pay. Will this not be in contradiction to? The view of our Adabi for did not our Adabi state that even where cattle were charging the woman there would still be exemption from paying compensation for the loss of the embryos our Adabi might reply the same ruling of the Mishnah would apply even in the case of cattle making for the woman where there would similarly be exemption from paying compensation for the loss of the embryos and as for the Mishnah saying if an ox while charging other cattle the reason is that since it was necessary to state in the concluding clause but if a man while meaning to strike another man this being the case stated in scripture it was also found expedient to have a similar text in the commencing clause if an ox while charging another ox our Papa said if an ox scores a woman slave causing her to miscarry there would be liability to pay for the loss of the embryos the reason being that in the eyes of the law it was merely a case of a pregnant she ass being injured for Scripture says about Yahir with the ass thus comparing this folk to an ass how is the compensation for the loss of embryos fixed etc. Compensation for the embryos should it not also have been compensation for the increase in the woman's value caused by the embryos this indeed was what was meant how is the compensation for the embryos and for the increase in the woman's value due to embryos fixed her estimated value before miscarriage is compared with her value after miscarriage but are. Simeon B. Gamaliel said if this is so a woman after having given birth increases in value what did he mean by the statement Rabbi said he meant to say this does a woman increase in value before giving birth more than after does not a woman increase in value after giving birth more than before giving birth it is therefore the value of the embryos which has to be estimated and this amount will be given to the husband it was taught to the same effect as the value of a woman increase more. Before giving birth and after giving birth does not the value of a woman increase after having given birth more than before giving birth it is therefore the value of the embryos which has to be estimated and this amount will be given to the husband Rabbah however said what is meant is this is a woman's increase in value wholly for the benefit of the husband for whom she bears and has she no share at all in the increase in the value due to the embryo it is therefore the value of the embryos which has to be estimated and this amount will be given to the husband whereas the amount of the increase in the value caused by the embryos will be shared equally between husband and wife it was similarly taught our Simeon B. Gamaliel said is the increase in a woman's value wholly for the benefit of the husband for whom she bears and has she herself no share at all in the increase in her value due to the embryos no there is a separate estimation for depreciation and also for pain and it Value of the embryos is estimated and given to the husband, whereas the amount of the increase in her value caused by the embryos will be shared equally between husband and wife. But is not our Simeon B. Gamaliel contradicting himself in this? There is no contradiction for one case is that of a woman pregnant for the first time and the other of a woman who had already given birth to children. What was the reason of the rabbis who stated that the amount of the increase in the woman's value due to the embryos also belongs to the husband, as it was taught from the words so that her fruit depart from her? Cannot I understand that the woman was pregnant? Why then the words with child to teach you that the increase in her value due to pregnancy belongs to the husband? How then does our Simeon B. Gamaliel expound the phrase with child? He required it for the lesson taught in the following. Our Eliezer B. Jacob says liability is never incurred save when the blow is given over against the place of. The womb our papa said you are not to understand from this just over against the place of the womb for wherever the bruise could be communicated to the embryo will suffice what is excluded is a blow on the hand or foot where there would be liability if the woman was a manumitted slave or proselytes and the husband also a proselyte is no longer alive there would be exemption altogether rabbi said this rule applies only where the blow was given during the lifetime of the proselyte husband and it was only after this that he died for since the blow was given during the lifetime of the proselyte he acquired title to the impending payment so that when he subsequently died the defendant became quit of it as it was an asset of the proselyte but where the blow was given after the death of the proselyte it was the mother who acquired title to the embryo so that the defendant would have to make payment to her said artist master of this teaching our embryos packets of money to which a title can be acquired it is only when the husband is there that the divine law grants payment to him but not when he is no more an objection was raised where a woman is struck and a miscarriage results compensation for depreciation and pain is to be paid to the woman but for the loss of the embryos to the husband where the husband is no more alive it is given to his heirs so also where the woman is no more alive it is given to her heirs should she be a slave who has been monument or a proselytess whose husband also a proselyte is no longer alive the defendant becomes entitled to it I would reply is there anything more in this case than in that of the mission which has been interpreted to refer to where the blow was given during the lifetime of the proselyte and where it was only after this that the proselyte died why therefore not interpret the text here also as referring to a case where the blow was given during the lifetime of the proselyte and where it was only after this that the proselyte died moreover if you wish you may alternatively say that it might have referred even to a case where the blow was given after the death of the proselyte Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi but read in the text she would become entitled to it may we say that there is on this point a difference between Tanaitic authorities for it was taught if a daughter of an Israelite was married to a proselyte and became pregnant by him and a blow was given her during the lifetime of the proselyte the compensation for the loss of the embryos will be given to the proselyte but if after the death of the proselyte one Beretha teaches that there would be liability whereas another Beretha teaches that there would be no liability now does this not show that Tanaim differ on this point according to Rabbi there is certainly a difference between Tanaim on this matter but what of Arhista must he also hold that Tanaim were divided on it no he
said that this could not be done for as regards the increased value of the woman due to the embryo seeing that she has some hold upon it she can acquire a title to the whole of it whereas in regard to the compensation for the embryos themselves on which she has no hold she can acquire no title to them at all are yet but the elder inquired of our nominee if a man has taken possession of the deeds of a proselyte what is the legal position shall we say that a man who takes possession of a deed does so with intent to acquire the land specified in the document but has thereby not taken possession of the land nor does he even acquire title to the deed since his intent was not to obtain the deed or shall we perhaps say that his intent was to obtain the deed also he said to him tell me sir could he need it to cover the mouth of his flask he replied yes indeed he could need it to cover the flask rabbit stated if the pledge of an israelite is in the hands of a proselyte creditor and the proselyte dies without any legal issue and another Israelite comes along and takes possession of it it would be taken away from him the reason being that as the proselyte has died the lien he had upon the pledge has disappeared but if the pledge of the proselyte debtor is in the hands of an Israelite and the proselyte dies and another Israelite comes along and takes possession of it the creditor would become owner of the pledge to the extent of the amount due to him while the one who took possession of it would own the balance why should the premises of the creditor where the pledge was kept not render him the owner of the whole pledge did not our Jose B. Hanna to say that a man's premises effect a legal transfer of ownerless property placed there even without his knowledge it may be said that we are dealing here with a case where the creditor was not there for it is only where he himself is there in which case should he so desire he would be able to take possession of it that his premises could act on his behalf and effect the transfer whereas where he himself was absent in which case were he to desire to acquire title to it he would have been unable to take possession of it his premises could similarly not effect a transfer but the law is that it is only where if the pledge was not kept in the creditor's premises that he would acquire no title to admission if a man takes a pit in private ground and opens it onto a public place or if he takes it in public ground and opens it onto private property or again if he takes it in private ground and opens it onto the private property of another he becomes liable for any damage that may result Gemara our rabbis taught if a man takes a pit on private ground and opens it onto a public place he becomes liable and this is a pit of which the Torah speaks so our Ishmael our Akiba however says when a man abandons his premises without however abandoning his pit this is a pit of which the Torah speaks Rabbi thereupon said in the case of a pit on public ground there is no difference of opinion that there should be liability what is the reason scripture says if a man open or if a man dig now if from mere opening there is liability should there not be so all the more in the case of digging why then mention digging at all scripture must therefore mean to imply that it is on account of the act of opening and on account of the act of digging that the liability is at all brought upon him a difference arises Talmud, Mas Baba Kama only in regard to a pit on his own premises our Akiva maintains that a pit in his own premises should also involve liability since it says the owner of the pit which shows that the divine law is speaking of a pit which has an owner our Ishmael on the other hand maintaining that this simply refers to the perpetrator of the nuisance but what then did our Akiva mean by saying when a man abandons his premises without however abandoning his pit this is a pit. Stated in the Torah he meant that this is a pit with reference to which scripture first began to lay down the rules for compensation in the case of pit our Joseph said in the case of a pit on private ground there is no difference of opinion that there should be liability what is the reason divine law says the owner of a pit to show that it is a pit having an owner with which we are dealing they differ only in the case of a pit in public ground our Ishmael maintains that a pit on public ground should also involve liability since it says if open and if a man dig now if from your opening there is liability should there not all the more be so in the case of digging scripture therefore must mean to imply that it is on account of the act of opening and on account of the act of digging that the liability is at all brought upon him and our Akiva he might reply that both terms required to be explicitly mentioned for if the divine law had said only if a man opened it might perhaps have been said that it was only in the case of opening that covering up would suffice as a precaution whereas in the case of digging covering up would not suffice unless the pit was also filled up if on the other hand the divine law had said only if a man dig it might have been said that it was only where he dug it that he ought to cover it as he actually made the pit whereas where he merely opened it in which case he did not actually make the pit it might have been thought that he was not bound even to cover it hence it was necessary to tell us that this was not the case but that the two actions are on a par in all respects but what then did our Ishmael mean by saying if a man digs a pit in private ground and opens it onto a public place he comes liable and this is a pit of which the Torah speaks this is a pit with reference to which scripture opens the rules concerning damage caused by pit an objection was raised from the following if a man digs a pit in public ground and opens it to private property there is no liability in spite of the fact that he has no right to do so as hollows must not be made underneath a public thoroughfare but if he digs pits ditches or caves in private premises and opens them onto a public place there would be liability if again a man digs pits in private ground abutting on a public thoroughfare such as eg workmen digging foundations there would be no liability our jose b judah however says there is liability unless he makes a partition of ten handbreadths in height or unless he keeps the pit away from the place where men pass as well as from the place where animals pass at a distance of at least four handbreadths now this is so only in the case of foundations but were the digging made not for foundations there would apparently be liability in accordance with whose view is this all would be well if we follow rabbi since the opening clause would be in accordance with our ishmael and the later clause in accordance with our Akiba, but if we follow our Joseph, it is true there would be no difficulty about the concluding clause which would represent a unanimous view. But what about the prior clause which would be in accordance neither with our Ishmael nor with our Akiba? Our Joseph, however, might reply the whole text represents a unanimous view for the prior clause deals with the case where the man abandoned neither his premises nor his pit. Our Ashi thereupon said, since according to our Joseph, you have explained the text to represent a unanimous view, so also according to Rabbi, you need not interpret it as representing two opposing views of Tanaim, for as the prior clause was in accordance with our Ishmael, the later clause would also be in accordance with our Ishmael, and the statement that this ruling holds good only in the case of foundations, whereas if the digging is not for foundations, there would be liability refers to an instance where e.g. the digging was widened out into actual public ground and objection was. Again raised if a man digs a pit in private ground and opens it onto a public place he becomes liable but if he digs it in private ground abutting on a public thoroughfare he would not be liable no difficulty arises if we follow Rabbi since the whole text is in accordance with our Ishmael but if we follow our Joseph no difficulty it is true arises in the prior clause which would be in accordance with our Ishmael but what about the concluding clause which would be in accordance neither with our Ishmael nor with our Akiba he might reply that it deals with digging for foundations in regard to which the ruling is unanimous our rabbis taught if a man dug a well and left it open but transferred it to the public he would be exempt whereas if he dug it and left it open without dedicating it to the public he would be liable such also was the custom of Nihonya the digger of wells ditches and caves he used to dig wells and leave them open and dedicate them to the public when this matter became Known to the sages they observed this man has fulfilled this halacha only this halacha and no more read therefore this halacha also our rabbis taught it happened that the daughter of Nihonya the digger of wells once fell into a deep pit when people came and informed our Hannah Bidosa about it during the first hour he said to them she is well during the second he said to them she is still well but in the third hour he said to them she has by now come out of the pit they then asked her who brought you up her answer was a ram providentially came to my help with an old man leading it they then asked our Hannah Bidosa are you a prophet he said to them I am neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet I only exclaimed shall the thing to which that pious man has devoted his labor become a stumbling block to his seat Araha however said nevertheless his son died of thirst thus bearing out what the scripture says and it shall be very tempestuous round about him which teaches that the Holy One blessed be he is particular with those round about him even for matters as light as a single hair our Nihonya derived the same lesson from the verse God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him our Hannah said if a man says that the Holy One blessed be he is lax in the execution of justice his life shall be outlawed for it is stated he is a rock his work is perfect for all his ways are judgment but our Hannah or as others
that just as pit can cause death because it is usually 10 handbreadths deep so also all other similar nuisances must be such as can cause death i.e. 10 handbreadths deep where however they were less than 10 handbreadths deep and an ox ar and ass fell into them and died there would be exemption if they were only injured by them there would be liability Gamara Rav stated the liability imposed by the Torah in the case of pit is for the unhealthy air created by excavation but not for the blow given by it it could hence he inferred that he held that so far as the blow was concerned it was the ground of the public that caused the damage Samuel however said for the unhealthy air and plus forte raison for the blow and should you say that it was for the blow only that the Torah imposed liability but not for the unhealthy air you have to bear in mind that for the Torah pit is a pit even where it is full of pads of wool what is the practical difference between them there is a Practical difference between them where a man made a mount on public ground according to Rab there would in the case of a mount be no liability whereas according to Samuel there would in the case of a mount also be liability what was the reason of Rab because scripture says and it fall implying that there would be no liability unless where it fell in the usual way of falling Samuel on the other hand maintained that the words and it fall imply anything which is like falling we have learned. If so why was Pitt mentioned in scripture to teach that just as Pitt can cause death because it is usually ten handbreadths deep so also all other similar nuisances must be such as can cause death i.e. ten handbreadths deep now this creates no difficulty if we follow Samuel since the phrase so also all would imply mounts also but according to Rab what does the phrase so also all imply it was meant to imply trenches and wedge like dishes but are trenches and wedge like dishes not. Explicitly stated in the text they were first mentioned and then the reason for them explained what need was there to mention all the things specified in the text they all required to be explicitly stated for if only a pit had been explicitly mentioned I might have said that it was only a pit where in ten handbreadths of depth there could be sufficient unhealthy air to cause death on account of its being small and circular whereas in the case of a ditch which is long I might have thought that even in ten handbreadths of depth there would still not be sufficient unhealthy air to cause death if again only a ditch had been mentioned explicitly I might have said that it was only a ditch where in ten handbreadths of depth there could be sufficient unhealthy air to cause death on account of its being small whereas in a cave which is square I might have thought that even in ten handbreadths of depth there would still not be sufficient unhealthy air to cause Death again if only a cave had been mentioned explicitly I might have said that it was only a cave where in ten handbreadths of depth there could be sufficient unhealthy air to kill on account of its being covered whereas in the case of trenches which are uncovered I might have thought that even in ten handbreadths of depth there would still not be sufficient unhealthy air to cause death further if only trenches had been stated explicitly I might have said that it was only trenches where in ten handbreadths of depth there could be sufficient unhealthy air to cause death on account of there not being wider at the top than at the bottom whereas in which like dishes which are wider at the top than at the bottom I might have said that even in ten handbreadths of depth there would still not be sufficient unhealthy air to cause death it was therefore necessary to let us know that all of them are on a PAR in this respect we have learned where however they were less than ten handbreadths deep and an ox or an ass fell into them and died there would be exemption if they were only injured by them there would be liability now what could be the reason that where an ox or an ass fell into them and died there would be exemption is it not because the blow was insufficient to cause death no it is because there was no unhealthy air there but if so why where the animal was merely injured in such a pit should there be liability seeing that there was no unhealthy air there I might reply that there was not unhealthy air there sufficient to kill but there was unhealthy air there sufficient to injure a certain ox fell into a pond which supplied water to the neighboring fields the owner hastened to slaughter it but Arnaman declared it Trefa said Arnaman had the owner of this ox taken a cab of flour and come to the house of study where he would have learned that if the ox lasted at least twenty four hours before being slaughtered it would be Kasher I would not have caused him to lose the ox which was worth several cabs this seems to show that Arnaman held that a deadly blow can be inflicted even by an excavation less than 10 handbreadths deep robber raised an objection to Arnaman where however they were less than 10 handbreadths deep and an ox or an ass fell into them and died there should be exemption now is not the reason of this exemption because there was no deadly blow there Talmud, Mas Baba Kama no it is because there was no unhealthy air there but if so why where it was injured in such a pit would there be liability since there was no unhealthy air there he replied there was not unhealthy air there sufficient to kill but there was unhealthy air there enough to injure a further objection was raised the scaffold for stoning was of the height of two men's statures and it has been taught regarding this when you add the stature of the convict there will be there the height of three statures now if you Assume that a fall can be fatal even from a height of less than 10 handbreadths why was such a great height as that necessary but even according to your argument why not make the height 10 handbreadths only this must therefore be explained in accordance with Arnaman for Arnaman stated that Rabbi Biaboah had said scripture says and thou shalt love a neighbor as thyself which implies thou shalt choose for a convict the easiest possible execution but if so why not raise it still higher. He would then become disfigured altogether a further objection was raised if any man fall from hence from hence but not into it how is that so where the public road was 10 handbreadths higher than the roof and a man might fall from the former onto the latter there is no liability in respect of a parapet but if the public road was 10 handbreadths lower than the roof and a man might fall from the latter onto the former that there will be liability in respect of a parapet now if you Assume that a fall could be fatal even from a height of less than 10 handbreadths why should it be necessary to have the public road lower by full 10 handbreadths it was said in answer there is a difference in the case of a house since if it is less than 10 handbreadths in height it could not be designated house but if so even now when from the outside it is 10 handbreadths high were you to deduct from that the ceiling and the plaster from the inside it would surely not have the height of 10 handbreadths to this it was said in reply we are dealing here with a case where e.g. the owner of the house sank the floor from within but if so even where the height from the outside was not 10 handbreadths it could still be possible that from the inside it was 10 handbreadths as for instance where he sank the floor still more the reason of Arnaman must therefore have been this he considered that from the abdomen of the ox to the level of the ground must be at least four Handbreadths and the pond feeding the fields must be six handbreadths. This makes ten handbreadths with the result that when the ox received the blow, it was from the height of ten handbreadths that the blow was given. But why then does the Mishnah say just as pit can cause death because it is usually ten handbreadths deep? So also all other similar nuisances must be such as can cause death, i.e., ten handbreadths deep should not six handbreadths be enough. We could reply that the Mishnah deals with a case where the ox rolled itself over into the pit Mishnah where there is a pit in charge of two partners. If the first one passes by and does not cover it, and the second one also passes by and does not cover it, the second would be liable. Gamara, I would here ask how can we picture a pit in charge of two partners? True, we can understand this if we take the view of our Akiva who said that a pit in private ground would involve liability, in which case such a pit could be found where they jointly own the ground and also a pit in it and while they abandoned the ground roundabout they did not abandon the pit itself but if we take the view that a pit on private ground would involve exemption in which case liability could be found only where it was on public ground how then is it possible for a pit in public ground to be in charge of two partners for if you say that both of them appointed an agent and said to him go forth and dig for us and he went and dug for them we reply that there can be no agency for a simple act if again you say that the one dug five handbreadths and the other one dug another five handbreadths then we would point out that the act of the former has become eliminated it is true that according to rabbi we can imagine a pit in charge of two partners in respect of mere injury but in respect of death even according to rabbi or in respect whether of death or of mere injury according to the rabbis where could we find such a pit are you had Thereupon said we find such a pit where e.g. both of them removed a layer of ground at the same time and thereby made the pit ten handbreadths deep what opinion of rabbi and what opinion of the rabbis was referred to above it was taught where one had dug a pit of nine handbreadths deep and another one came along and completed it to a depth of ten handbreadths the latter would be liable rabbi says the last one is responsible in cases of death but both of them in cases of injury what was the reason of the rabbi scripture says if a man shall open or if a man shall dig now if for mere opening there is liability should there not be all the more so
pit capable of killing but was not dispersed and the dead shall be is required for the lesson drawn by Rabbah for did Rabbah not say if a sacred ox which has become disqualified for the altar falls into a pit there would be exemption as scripture says and the dead beast shall be is implying that it is only in the case of an ox whose carcass could be is that there would be liability to this I might rejoin can you not at the same time automatically derive from it that it is a man who made the pit capable of killing with whom we are dealing or rabbis taught if one person has dug a pit to a depth of ten handbreadths and another person comes along and completes it to a depth of twenty after which a third person comes along and completes it to a depth of thirty they all would be liable a contradiction was here pointed out if one person dug a pit ten handbreadths deep and another came along and lined it with plaster and cemented it the second would be liable Talmud, Mas Baba. Comma B are we to say that the former statement follows the view of rabbi whereas the latter follows that of the rabbis are Z but there upon said that the one statement as well as the other could be regarded as following the view of the rabbis for even there in their own case the rabbis would not say that the last digger should be liable save in a case where the first digger did not make the pit of the minimum depth capable of killing whereas in this case where the first digger made the pit of the minimum depth capable of killing even the rabbis would agree that all the diggers should be liable but what of the case of the second lining it with plaster and cementing it where the first digger made the pit of the minimum depth capable of killing and yet it was said that the second would be liable it may be answered that the case there was where the unhealthy air was not sufficient to kill and it was the other person who by diminishing the size of the pit increased the dangerous effect of the air so as to make it capable of killing some report that Arzibit said that the one statement as well as the other could be regarded as following the view of rabbi about the statement that they would all be liable there is on this supposition no difficulty and as for the other statement that the second digger would be liable this refers to a case where e.g. the unhealthy air was sufficient neither to kill nor to injure and it was the other person who by diminishing the size of it Pit increased the dangerous effect of the air so as to make it capable of both killing and injuring Rabbah said the case of a man putting a stone round the mouth of a pit and thereby completing it to a depth of ten handbreadths is one which brings us face to face with the difference of opinion between Rabbi and the Rabbis is this not obvious you might perhaps think that the difference of opinion was only where the increase in depth was made at the bottom in which case it was the unhealthy air added by the second digger that caused death whereas where the increase was made from the top in which case it was not the unhealthy air added by him that caused the death it might have been said that there was no difference of opinion we are therefore told that this is not the case Rabbah raised the question where the second comber filled in the one handbreadth which he had previously dug with earth or where he removed the stones which he had previously put round the mouth of the pit what would be the legal position are we to say that he has undone what he had previously done or rather perhaps that the act of the first digger had already been merged in the act of the second and the whole pit had since then been in the charge of the second let this remain undecided Rabbi Bibar had said that Samuel B. Martha stated where a pit is eight handbreadths deep but two handbreadths out of these are full of water there would be liability the reason being that each handbreadth full of water is equivalent in its capacity to cause death to two handbreadths without water the question was thereupon raised where a pit is of nine handbreadths but one of these is full of water what should be the law should we say that since there is not so much water there there is not so much unhealthier or rather that since the pit is deeper there is there a quantity of unhealthier again where the pit is of seven handbreadths and out of these three handbreadths are full of water what would be the legal position should we say that since there is much water there the unhealthy air is there in proportion or rather that since it is not deep there is no great quantity of unhealthy air there let these queries remain undecided Arshes by inquired of Rabbi if the second digger makes it wider what would be the law he replied does he not thereby diminish the unhealthy air said the other to him on the contrary does he not increase the risk of injury Arashi thereupon said we have to consider whether the animal died through bad air in which case the second digger could not be responsible as he diminished the unhealthy air or whether it died through the fall in which case the second digger should be responsible as he increased the risk of injury some report that Arashi said we have to see whether the animal fell from the side which was extended in which case the second digger would be responsible as he increased the risk of injury or whether it fell from the other side in which case the second digger would not be to blame as he diminished the unhealthier in the pit it was stated in regard to a pit as deep as it is why there is a difference of opinion between Rabbah and Arjoseph both of whom made their respective statements in the name of Rabbah B. Barhana who said it in the name of Armani one said that there is always unhealthier in a pit unless where its width is greater than its depth the other said that there could never be unhealthier in a pit unless where its depth was greater than its width if the first one passed by and did not cover IT from what point of time will the first one be exempt from responsibility there was a difference of opinion here between Rabbah and Arjoseph both of whom made their respective statements in the name of Rabbah B. Barhana who said it in the name of Armani one said from the moment when the first partner leaves the second in the act of using the well the other from it moment when he hands over the cover of the well to him the same difference is found between the following ten aim if one partner was drawing water from a well and the other came along and said to him leave it to me as I will also draw water as soon as the first left the second in the act of using it he would become exempt from any responsibility our Eliezer B. Jacob said the exemption commences from the time that the first hands over the cover to the second in regard to what principle do they differ our Eliezer B. Jacob held that there is bearer also that the one partner was drawing water from his own and so also the other partner was drawing the water from his own whereas the rabbis maintained that there is no bearer or and thereupon said they have followed here the same line of reasoning as elsewhere as we have learned where partners have vowed not to derive benefit from one another they would not be allowed to enter premises jointly owned by them our Eliezer B. Jacob however Says the one partner enters his own and the other partner enters his own. Now it was asked there in regard to what principle did they differ? Our Eliezer B. Jacob held that there is bearer also that the one partner would thus be entering his own and the other partner would similarly be entering his own. Whereas the rabbis maintained that there is no bearer. Our Eliezer said if a man sells a pit to another as soon as he hands over the cover of the pit to him, the conveyance is complete. What are the circumstances? If money was paid, why was the conveyance not completed by the money? If possession was taken of the pit, why was the conveyance not completed by possession? In fact, we suppose possession to have been taken of the pit and it was still requisite for the seller to say to the buyer, Go forth, take possession and become the owner. But as soon as he handed over the cover to him, this was equivalent in the eyes of the law to his saying to him, Go forth, take possession and complete it. Conveyance our Joshua B. Levi said if a person sells a house to another Talmud, Mas Baba Kama as soon as he hands over the key to him the conveyance is complete what are the circumstances if money was previously paid why was the conveyance not completed by the money if possession was taken why was the conveyance not completed by possession we suppose that in fact possession was taken of the house and it was still requisite for the seller to say to the buyer go forth take possession and become the owner but as soon as he handed over the key to him this was equivalent in the eye of the law to his saying to him go forth take possession and complete the conveyance Resh Lakish said in the name of Arjane if a man sells a herd to his neighbor as soon as he has handed over the Mishko Kith to him the conveyance is complete what are the circumstances if possession by pulling has already taken place why was the conveyance not completed by the act of pulling a delivery of it? Flock has already taken place why was the conveyance not completed by the act of delivery we suppose in fact that possession by pulling has already taken place and it was still necessary for the seller to say to the buyer go forth take possession by pulling and become the owner but as soon as he handed over the Mishko Kith to him this was equivalent in the eye of the law to his saying go forth take possession by pulling and complete the conveyance what is Mishko Kith here they explained it. The Belar Jacob however said the goat that leads the herd so to a certain Galilean in one of his discourses before Arista said that when the shepherd becomes angry with his flock he appoints for a leader one which is blind Misha if the first one covered it and the second one came along and found it open and nevertheless did not cover it the second would be liable if an owner of a pit had covered it properly and an ox or an ass nevertheless fell into it and was killed he would be exempt but if he did not cover it properly and an ox or ass fell into it and was killed he would be liable if it fell forward being frightened on account of the noise of digging there would be
Haman fell into the pit what would be the legal position but I would ask what were the circumstances if camels frequently passed there should he not be considered careless if camels did not frequently pass there should he not be considered innocent the question applies to the case where camels used to pass occasionally and we ask are we to say that since from time to time camels passed there he was careless since he ought to have kept this in mind or do we rather say that since at the time the camels had not actually been there he was innocent come and here if he had covered it properly and an ox or an ass nevertheless fell into it and was killed he would be exempt now what were the circumstances if it was covered properly both as regards oxen and as regards camels how then did anyone fall in there does it therefore not mean properly as regards oxen talmud mas baba kama be talmud mas baba kama be but not properly as regards camels again if camels frequently passed why should he be exempt where he had been so careless if on the other hand camels did not frequently pass is it not obvious that he is exempt since he was innocent did it therefore not refer to a case where camels used to pass occasionally and it so happened that when camels passed they weakened the cover so that the oxen coming later on fell and in such cases the text says he would be exempt does not this prove that since at that time camels had not actually been there he would be considered innocent the first would say no for it might still be argued that the pit had been covered properly both as regards oxen and as regards camels and as for the difficulty raised by you how did anyone fall in there this has already been removed by the statement of our Isaac B. Barhanna that the boards of the cover decayed from within come in here but if he did not cover it properly and an ox or an ass fell into it and was killed he would be liable now what were the circumstances if you Say that it means not properly covered as regards oxen which would of course imply also not properly covered as regards camels is it not obvious why then was it necessary to state liability does it not therefore mean that it was properly covered as regards oxen but not properly covered as regards camels again I ask what were the circumstances if camels frequently passed is it not obvious that he was careless if on the other hand no camels were to be found there was he not innocent does it not therefore speak of a case where camels used to arrive occasionally and it so happened that camels in passing had weakened the cover so that the oxen coming later fell in and in reference to such a case the text states liability does this not prove that since from time to time camels did pass he should be considered careless as he ought to have borne this fact in mind in point of fact I might reply the text may still speak of a pit covered properly as regards oxen though not properly as regards camels and of one where camels frequently passed and as for your question is it not obvious that he was careless the answer would be that since the prior clause contains the words if he covered it properly the later clause has the wording if he did not cover it properly some report that certainly no question was ever raised about this for since the camels used to pass from time to time he was certainly careless as he ought to have borne this fact in mind if a question was raised it was on the following point suppose he covered it with a cover that was strong enough for oxen but not strong enough for camels and in a place where camels frequently passed and it decayed from the inside what should be the legal position should we say mego i.e. since he had been careless with respect to camels he ought to be considered careless also with respect to the accidental decay or should we not say mego come in here if he covered it properly and an ox or an ass fell into it and was killed he would be exempt and it was stated in connection with this ruling that our Isaac B. Barhanna explained that the boards of the cover had decayed from the inside now what were the circumstances if we say that it means properly covered as regards oxen and also properly covered as regards camels and that it had decayed from the inside is it not obvious that there should be exemption for indeed what more could he have done does it not mean therefore properly covered as regards oxen though not properly covered as regards camels and in a place where camels frequently passed and it so happened that the cover decayed from the inside and in such a case the text states exemption does this not prove that we should not say mego i.e. since he was careless with respect to camels he ought to be considered careless with reference to the decay no it might still be argued that the pit was covered properly as regards camels as well as oxen and it so happened that it became Decayed from the inside and as for your question if it becomes decayed from inside what indeed should he have done the answer would be that you might have thought that he ought to have come frequently to the cover and knocked it to test its soundness and we are therefore told that he was not bound to do this come in here but if he did not cover it properly and an ox or an ass fell into it and was killed he would be liable now what were the circumstances should you say that it means not properly covered as regards oxen which would of course imply also not properly covered as regards camels why then was it necessary to state liability does it not therefore mean that it was covered properly as regards oxen but not properly as regards camels but again if camels frequently passed there is it not obvious that he was careless if on the other hand no camels were to be found there was he not innocent does it therefore not deal with the case where camels did frequently pass but it so happened that the cover decayed from the inside and in such a case the text states liability does this not prove that we have to say mego i.e. since he had been careless with respect to camels he should be considered careless also with reference to decay I would say no for it might still be argued that the pit had been covered properly as regards oxen but not properly as regards camels and in a place where camels were to be found frequently and it happened that camels had come along and weakened the cover so that when oxen subsequently came they fell into the pit and as for your question is it not obvious that he was careless the answer would be that since the prior clause contained the words if he covered it properly the later clause similarly uses the wording if he did not cover it properly come and here if there fell into it an ox that was deaf abnormal small blind or while it walked at night time there would be liability but in the case of a normal ox walking during the day there would be exemption why so why not say that since the owner of the pit was careless with respect to a deaf animal he should be considered careless also with reference to a normal animal does not this show that we should not say mego this does indeed prove that we do not say mego if it fell forward etc rap said forward means quite literally on its face and backward means also literally on its back talmud mas baba comma the fall in each case being into the pit rap thus adhere to his own view as elsewhere stated by rap that the liability in the case of pit imposed by the torah is for injury caused by the unhealthy air of the pit but not for the blow given by it samuel however said that where the ox fell into the pit whether on its face or on its back there would always be liability since samuel adhere to the view stated by him elsewhere that the liability is for the unhealthy air and a plus forte raison for the blow how then are we to understand the words where it fell backward on account of the noise of digging in which case we are told there should be exemption as for instance where it stumbled over the pit and fell to the back of the pit i.e. outside the pit an objection was raised from the following if it fell inside the pit whether on its face or on its back there would be liability is not this a contradiction of the statement of Rav Arhista replied Rav would admit that in the case of a pit in private ground there would be liability as the plaintiff could argue against the defendant whichever way you take it if the animal died through the unhealthy ear was not the unhealthy ears if on the other hand it died through the blow was not the blow given by your ground Rav however said we are dealing here with a case where the animal turned itself over it started to fall upon its face but before reaching the bottom of the pit it turned itself over and finally fell upon its back so that the unhealthy ear which Affected it at the outset really did the mischief. Our Joseph, however, said that we are dealing here with a case where damage was done to the pit by the ox, i.e., where the ox made foul the water in the pit, in which case no difference could be made whether it fell on its face or on its back, as there would always be liability. Our Hannah and I learned in a in support of the statement of Rab Scripture says, and it fall implying that there would be no liability unless where it fell in the usual way of falling. Hence the sages said if it fell forward on account of the noise of digging there would be liability, but if it fell backward on account of the noise of digging there would be exemption, though in both cases it fell into the pit. The master stated where it fell forward on account of the noise of digging there would be liability, but why not say that it was the digger who caused it or Shimai B. Ashi thereupon said this ruling is in accordance with our Nathan who stated that it was a Owner of the pit who did the actual damage and whenever no payment can be enforced from one co-defendant it is made up from the other as indeed it has been taught if an ox pushes another ox into a pit the owner of the ox is liable while the owner of the pit is exempt our Nathan however said that the owner of the ox would have to pay a half of the damages and the owner of the pit would have to pay the other half but was it not taught our Nathan says the owner of the pit has to pay three quarters and the owner of the ox one quarter there is no contradiction as the latter statement refers to Tam and the former to Muad on what principle
and the other half he could answer because the owner of the ox could say to the owner of the pit what will this year joining me in the defense benefit me or if you wish you may alternatively say that our Nathan did in fact hold that the one did half of the damage and the other did half of the damage and as for your question why not let the owner of the pit pay half and the owner of the ox a quarter while the remaining quarter will be lost to the plaintiff he might answer because the owner of the killed ox would be entitled to say to the owner of the pit as I have found my ox in your pit you have killed it whatever is paid to me by the other defendant I do not mind being paid by him but whatever is not paid to me by him I will require to be paid by you Rabbi said if a man puts a stone near the mouth of a pit which had been dug by another person and an ox coming along stumbles over the stone and falls into the pit we are here brought face to face with the difference of opinion between our Nathan and the rabbis but is this not obvious you might perhaps have said that the difference of opinion was confined to that case where the owner of the pit could say to the owner of the ox had not my pit been there at all your ox would in any case have killed the other ox whereas in this case the person who put the stone near the pit could certainly say to the owner of the pit if not for your pit what harm would my stone have done were the ox even to have stumbled over it might have fallen but would have got up again we are therefore told by this that the other party can retort if not for your stone the ox would not have fallen into the pit at all it was stated Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi were an ox of a private owner together with an ox that was sacred but became disqualified for the altar Gordon Animal Abbey said that the private owner would have to pay half damages whereas Rabbanah said that he would have to pay quarter damages both the one and it. Other are speaking of Tam but while Rabbanah followed the view of the rabbis Abbey followed that of our Nathan or if you wish you may say that both the one and the other followed the view of the rabbis but while Rabbanah was speaking of Tam Abbey was speaking of Muad some report that Abbey stated half damages and Rabbanah full damages the one ruling like the other would refer to the case of Muad but while one followed the rabbis the other followed the view of our Nathan if you wish you may say that the one ruling like the other followed the view of our Nathan but while one was speaking of Muad the other was speaking of Tam Rabbah said if an ox along with a man pushes certain things into a pit on account of depreciation they would all three be liable but on account of the four additional items or with respect to compensation for the value of lost embryos man would be liable but cattle and pit exempt in respect of kofar or the thirty shekels for the killing of a slave cattle would be liable but man and pit exempt in respect of damage done to inanimate objects or to a sacred ox which had become disqualified for the altar man and cattle would be liable but pit exempt the reason being that scripture says and the dead beast shall be is implying that it was only in the case of an ox whose carcass could be is that there would be liability excluding thus the case of this ox whose carcass could not be is does this mean that this last point was quite certain to Rabbah did not Rabbah put it as a query for Rabbah asked if a sacred ox which had become disqualified for the altar fell into a pit what would be the legal position shall we say that this verse and the beast shall be his confines liability to the case of an ox whose carcass could be is thus excluding the case of this ox whose carcass could never be is or shall we say that the words and the dead beast shall be is are intended only to lay down that the owner's plaintiffs have to retain the carcass as Part payment the fact is that after raising the question he himself solved it but once then would he derive the law that the owner's plaintiffs have to retain the carcass as part payment he would derive it from the clause and the dead shall be his own inserted in the case of cattle what reason have you for rising the clause and the dead shall be his own in the context dealing with cattle to derive from it the law that the owner's plaintiffs have to retain the carcass as part payment while you rise the clause and the dead beast shall be his in the context dealing with pit to confine liability to an animal whose carcass could be his why should I not reverse the implications of the clauses it stands to reason that the exemption should be connected with pit since there is in pit exemption also in the case of inanimate objects on the contrary should not the exemption be connected with cattle since in cattle there is exemption from half damages in the case of Tam in any case exemption from the whole payment is not found in the case of cattle where there fell into it an ox together with its implements which thereby broke etc. This Mishnah ruling is not in accordance with Arjuna for it was taught Arjuna imposes liability for damage to inanimate objects done by pit but what was the reason of the rabbis because scripture says and an ox or an ass fall therein implying ox but not man ass but not inanimate objects Arjuna however maintained that the word or was intended to describe inanimate objects while the other rabbis Talmud, Mas Baba Kama argued that the word or was necessary as a disjunctive and Arjuna he maintained that the disjunction could be derived from the use of the singular and it fall and the rabbis they could reply that even the singular and it fall could also imply many things may I say that the expression and it fall is intended as a generalization while an ox or an ass follows as a Specification and where a generalization is followed by a specification the generalization does not apply to anything save what is enumerated in the specification so that only in the case of an ox or an ass should there be liability but not for any other object whatsoever no for it could be said that the clause the owner of the pit shall make it could generalize again now where there is a generalization preceding a specification which is in its turn followed by another generalization you include only such cases as are similar to the specification thus here as the specification refers to objects possessing life so too all objects to be included must be such as possess life but why not argue since the specification refers to animate objects whose carcass would cause defilement whether by touching or by carrying should we not include only animate objects whose carcass would similarly cause defilement whether by touching or by carrying so that poultry would thus not be Included if so the divine law would have mentioned only one object in the specification but which of the two should the divine law have mentioned had it inserted only ox I might have said that an animal which was eligible to be sacrificed upon the altar should be included but that which was not eligible to be sacrificed upon the altar should not be included if on the other hand the divine law had only ass I might have thought that an animal which was subject to the sanctity of firstborn should be included but that one which was not subject to the sanctity of firstborn should not be included but still why indeed not exclude poultry scripture says and the dead shall be is implying all things that are subject to death if so whether according to the rabbis who exclude inanimate objects or according to our Judah who includes inanimate objects the question may be raised are inanimate objects subject to death it may be said that their breaking is their death but again According to Rab who stated that the liability imposed by the Torah in the case of Pit was for the unhealthy air of the pit but not for the blow it gave what either the rabbis or Arjuna maintained that inanimate objects could be damaged by unhealthy air it may be said that this could happen with new utensils that burst in bad air but was not this clause and the dead shall be is required for the ruling of Rabbah for did Rabbah not say where a sacred ox which had become disqualified for the altar fell into a pit there would be exemption as it is said and the dead shall be is implying that it was only in the case of an ox whose carcass could be is that there would be liability and thus excluding the case of this ox whose carcass could never be is but scripture says he should give money unto the owner of it implying that everything is included which has an owner if so why not also include even inanimate objects and human beings because scripture says specifically in Ox implying and not a man and ass implying and not inanimate objects now according to our Judah who included inanimate objects we understand the term ox because it was intended to exclude man but what was intended to be excluded by the term an ass Rabbah therefore said the term ass in the case of pit on the view of our Judah as well as the term sheep occurring in the section dealing with lost property on the view unanimously accepted remains difficult to explain if there fell into it an ox deaf. Abnormal or small there would be liability what is the meaning of an ox deaf abnormal or small it could hardly be suggested that the meaning is an ox of a deaf owner an ox of an abnormal owner an ox of a minor for would not this imply exemption in the case of an ox belonging to a normal owner are Yohanan said it means an ox which was deaf an ox which was abnormal an ox which was small Talmud Mas Baba Kamabi still would not this imply exemption in the case of an ox which was normal are. Jeremiah thereupon said a particularly strong case is taken there could be no question that in the case of a normal ox there should be liability but in the case of an ox which is deaf or abnormal or small it might have been thought that it was its deafness that caused the damage to it or that it was its smallness that caused it to fall so that the owner of the pit should be exempt we are therefore told that even here he is liable said Arahat Rabban but it has been taught if a creature possessing sense fell into it there would be exem
At night time there would be liability whereas if it was normal and walking during the day there would be exemption mission of both an ox and any other animal are alike before the law with reference to falling into a pit to exclusion from Mount Sinai to paying double in cases of theft to restoring lost property to unloading burdens too heavy for an animal to bear to abstaining from muzzling to heterogeneous animals being coupled or working together to Sabbath rest so also beasts and birds are like them if so why do we read an ox or an ass only because scripture spoke of the more usual animals in domestic life tomorrow with reference to falling into a pit since it is written he should give money unto the owner of it to include everything that an owner has as indeed already stated to exclusion from Mount Sinai as it is written whether it be animal or man it shall not lie beast is included in animal and the word whether includes birds to paying double as we said elsewhere. The expression for all manner of trespass is comprehensive to restoring lost property. This is derived from the words with all lost things of thy brother to unloading burdens too heavy for an animal to bear. We derive this by comparing the term ass with the term ass occurring in connection with the Sabbath to abstaining from muzzling. This we learn similarly by comparing the term ox with the term ox used in connection with Sabbath to heterogeneous animals. The rule as regards plowing we learn by comparing the term ox with the term ox used in connection with Sabbath and the rule as regards coupling we learn by comparing the term thy cattle with the term thy cattle used in connection with Sabbath. But whence are all these rules known to us in the case of Sabbath itself as it was taught? Our Jose says in the name of our Ishmael in the first Decalogue it is said thy man servant and thy maid servant and thy cattle whereas in the second Decalogue it is said thy ox. And I ask, and any of thy cattle now are not ox and ass included in any of thy cattle. Why then were they singled out to tell us that just as in the case of the ox and ass mentioned here, beasts and birds are on the same footing with them? So also in any other case where ox and ass are mentioned, all beasts and birds are on the same footing with them. But may we not say that thy cattle in the first decalogue is a generalization, and thy ox and thy ass in the second decalogue is a specification? And we know that where a generalization is followed by a specification, the generalization does not include anything save what is mentioned in the specification. Whence it would follow that only ox and ass are prohibited, but not any other thing. I may reply that the words and any of thy cattle in the second decalogue constitute a further generalization, so that we have a generalization preceding a specification, which in its turn is followed by another generalization, and in such a case you. Include also that which is similar to the specification so that as the specification here mentions objects possessing life there should thus also be included all objects possessing life but I may say the specification mentions living things whose carcass would cause defilement whether by touching or by carrying why not say that there should also be included all living things whose carcass would similarly cause defilement whether by touching or by carrying so that birds would thus not be included I may reply if that were the case the divine law would have inserted only one object in the specification but which of the two should the divine law have inserted for were the divine law to have inserted only ox I might have thought that an animal which was eligible to be sacrificed upon the altar should be included but one which was not eligible to be sacrificed upon the altar should not be included so that the divine law was thus compelled to insert also as if on the other. And the divine law had inserted only as I might have thought that an animal which was subject to the sanctity of first birth should be included but that which was not subject to the sanctity of first birth should not be included the divine law therefore inserted also ox it must therefore be said that and all thy cattle is not merely a generalization but an amplification does this mean to say that wherever the divine law inserts the word all it is an amplification what about tides where the word all occurs and we nevertheless expound it as an instance of generalization and specification for it was taught and thou shalt bestow that money for all that thy soul lust death after is a generalization for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink is a specification or for all that thy soul desired is again a generalization now where a generalization precedes a specification which is in its turn followed by another generalization you cannot include anything save what is similar to the specification is therefore the specification here mentions products obtained from products and which spring from the soil there may also be included all kinds of products obtained from products and which spring from the soil does this not prove that the expression all was taken as a generalization and not as an amplification I might say that the expression for all is but a generalization whereas all would be an amplification or if you wish I may say that the term all is also a generalization but in this case all is an amplification for why was it not written and the cattle just as in the first decalogue why did scripture insert here and all the cattle unless it was meant to be an amplification now that you decide that all is an amplification why was it necessary to have the cattle in the first decalogue and ox and ass in the second decalogue I may reply that ox was inserted to provide a basis for comparison of ox with the term ox used in Connection with muzzling so also as to provide a basis for comparison of ass with the term ass used in connection with unloading so again thy cattle to provide a basis for comparison of thy cattle with the expression thy cattle occurring in connection with heterogeneity if that is the case that heterogeneity is compared with sabbath breaking why should even human beings not be forbidden to plow together with an animal why have we learned a human being is allowed to plow the field and to pull a wagon with any of the beasts are proper thereupon said the reason of this matter was known to the papunin that is our ahabi jacob who said that as scripture says that thy man servant and thy maid servant may rest as well as thou it is only in respect of the law of rest that i should compare them to cattle but not of any other matter our hand of the ask our high be why in the first decalogue is there no mention of well-being whereas in the second decalogue talmud Mas Babakama there is a mention of well-being he replied while you are asking me why well-being is mentioned there ask me whether well-being is in fact mentioned or not as I do not know whether well-being is mentioned there or not go therefore to our tantum Behadalai who was intimate with our Joshua B. Levi who was an expert in Agata when he came to him he was told by him thus from our Joshua B. Levi I have not heard anything on the matter but our Samuel B. Nahum the brother of the mother of our Ahasan of our Hanan or as others say the father of the mother of our Ahasan of our Hanan said to me this because the first tablets containing the commandments were destined to be broken but even if they were destined to be broken how should this affect the mention of well-being our Ashi thereupon said God forbid well-being would then have ceased in Israel our Joshua said he who sees the letter Tate in a dream may regard it as a good omen for himself why so if because it is the initial letter of it Words have good written in scripture why not say on the contrary that it is also the initial letter of the verb Taita commencing the scriptural verse and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction we are speaking here of where he saw in a dream only one Taita whereas Taita contains two such letters but still why not say that it might have referred to the word Tama as in the verse her filthiness is in her skirts we are speaking of where he saw in a dream the letters Taita and Beth but again why not say that it might have referred to the verb to be you as in the verse her gates were sunk into the ground the real reason is that scripture used this letter on the very first occasion to express something good for from the beginning of Genesis up to the verse and God saw the light no Taita occurs our Joshua believe I similarly said he who sees the word Hest in a dream may take it as a sign that mercy has been exercised towards him in heaven and that he will be released. From trouble provided, however, he saw it in script, so also beasts and birds are like them, etc. Resh Lakish said, Rabbi taught here that a cock, a peacock, and a pheasant are heterogeneous with one another. Is this not obvious? Our Habiba said, since they can breed from one another, it might have been thought that they constitute a homogeneous species. We are therefore told by this that this is not the case. Samuel said, The domestic goose and the wild goose are heterogeneous with each other. Rabbison of our Hanan demurred, saying, What is the reason? Shall we say, because one has a long neck and the other has a short neck? If so, why should a Persian camel and an Arabian camel similarly not be considered heterogeneous with each other, since one has a thick neck and the other a slender neck? Abay therefore said, It is because one has its genitals discernible from without, while the other one has its genitals within. Our Papa said, It is because one becomes pregnant with only one egg if he contation. Whereas the other one becomes pregnant with several eggs at one fecundation, our Jeremiah reported that Resh Lakish said he who couples two species of sea creatures becomes liable to be lashed on what ground our Adabi Ahabah said in the name of Allah this rule comes from the expression after its kind in the section dealing with fishes by comparison with after its kind in reference to creatures of the dry land Reuba inquired if a man drove a wagon by means of a goat and a m
Properly he is liable if the wall broke down at night or if robbers broke in and they got out and did damage he would not be liable if however robbers took them out from the shed and left them at large and they did damage the robbers would be liable for the damage but if the owner had left them in a sunny place or he had handed a minor and they got away and did damage he handed them over to the care of a deaf mute and idiot he would be liable if he had handed them over to the care of a shepherd the shepherd would have entered into all responsibilities instead of him if a sheep accidentally fell into a garden and derived benefit from the fruit their payment would have to be made to the extent of the benefit whereas if it had gone down there in the usual way and done damage the payment would have to be for the amount of the damage done by it how is payment made for the amount of damage done by it by comparing the value of an area in that field requiring one SEI of seed as it was previously with what it's worth is now our simian however says if it consumed ripe fruits the payment should be for ripe fruits if one SEIT would be for one SEI of two SEAHS for two SEAHS Gamara our rabbis taught what is denominated properly and what is not properly if the door was able to stand against a normal wind it would be properly but if the door could not stand against a normal wind that would be not properly our many be patish thereupon said who can be the tana who holds that in the case of muad even an adequate precaution suffices to confer exemption it is our judah for we have learned if the owner fastened his ox to the wall inside the stable with a cord or shut the door in front of it properly and the ox got out and did damage whether it was tam or already muad he would be liable so our mayor our judah however says in the case of tam he would be liable but in the case of muad exempt for it is written and his owner hath not kept him in thus Excluding this case where it was kept in our Eliezer however says no precaution is adequate for Muad save the slaughter knife but does not an anonymous mission usually follow the view of our Mayor we may even say that it is in accordance with our Mayor for tooth and foot are different in this respect since the Torah required a lesser degree of precaution in their case as stated by our Eliezer or according to others as stated in the very that there are four cases of damage where the Torah requires a lesser degree of precaution there are these pit and fire tooth and foot pit as it is written and if a man shall open a pit or if a man shall dig a pit and not cover it implying that if he covered it he would he exempt fire as it is written he that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution that is to say only where he acted culpably as by actually kindling the fire tooth as it is written and he shall send forth that is to say only where he acted wrongly as by actually Sending it forth it was further taught and he shall send forth the note's foot as in the similar expression that send forth the foot of the ox and the ass and it shall consume the note's tooth as in the similar expression as the tooth consummate to entirety this is so only for the reason that he acted culpably as by actually sending it forth or feeding it there whereas where he did not act in such a manner this would not be so rabbi said the text of the mission also corroborates this view by taking here the case of sheep for have we not been dealing all along so far with an ox why then not say here also ox what special reason was there for taking here sheep is it not because the Torah required a lesser degree of precaution in their case on account of the fact that it is not horn that is dealt with here but tooth and foot that are dealt with here it is thus indicated to us that this kind of precaution is only in the case of tooth and foot which are of initio and this May be regarded as proved it was taught our Joshua said there are four acts for which the offender is exempt from the judgments of man but liable to the judgments of heaven they are these to break down a fence in front of a neighbor's animal so that it gets out and does damage to bend over a neighbor's standing corn in front of a fire to hire false witnesses to give evidence and to know of evidence in favor of another and not to testify on his behalf the master stated to break down a fence in front of a neighbor's animal under what circumstances if we assume that the wall was sound why should the offender not be liable even according to the judgments of man at least for the damage done to the wall it must therefore be Talmud, Mas Babakamba where the wall was shaky the master stated to bend over a neighbor's corn standing in front of a fire under what circumstances if we assume that the fire can now reach it in a normal wind why is he not liable also according to the Judgments of man it must therefore be where it would reach them only in an unusual wind. Arashi said what is referred to is covering the offender having caused the stocks to become hidden in the ease of fire. The master stated to hire false witnesses under what circumstances if we assume for his own benefit should he not pay the money and should he thus not also be liable even in accordance with the judgments of man it therefore must mean for the benefit of his neighbor to know of evidence in favor of another and not to testify on his behalf with what case are we dealing here if with a case where there are two witnesses is it not obvious that it is a scriptural offense as it is written if he do not utter it then he shall bear his iniquity it must therefore be where there is one witness Nemonaki who does deadly poison and trusts his fellow broken but are there no more cases of the same category is there not the case of a man who does work with the water of purification or with the red heifer of purification where he is similarly exempt according to the judgments of man but liable according to the judgments of heaven again is there not the case of one who placed deadly poison before the animal of a neighbor where he is exempt from the judgments of man but liable according to the judgments of heaven so also is there not the case of one who entrusts fire to a deaf mute and idiot or a minor and damage results where he is exempt from the judgments of man but liable according to the judgments of heaven again is there not the case of the man who gives his fellow a fright where he is similarly exempt from the judgments of man but liable according to the judgments of heaven and finally is there not the case of the man who when his pitcher has broken on public ground does not remove the pots hurts who when his camel falls does not raise it where our mayor indeed makes him liable for any damage resulting therefrom but the sages hold that he is exempt from the judgments of man though liable according to the judgments of heaven yes there are surely many more cases to come under the same category but these four cases were particularly necessary to be stated by him as otherwise you might have thought that even according to the judgments of heaven there should not be any liability it was therefore indicated to us that this is not so in the case of breaking down a fence in front of a neighbor's animal you might have said that since the wall was in any case bound to come down what offense was committed and that even according to the judgments of heaven there should be no liability it was therefore indicated to us that this is not so in the case of bending over a neighbor's standing corn in front of a fire you might also have said that the defendant could argue how could I know that an unusual wind would come and that consequently even according to the judgments of heaven he should not be liable it was therefore indicated to us that this is not the case so also according to Arashi who said that the reference is to covering you might have said that the defendant could contend I surely intended to cover and thus protect your property and that even according to the judgments of heaven he should not be liable it was therefore indicated to us that this is not so in the case of hiring false witnesses you might also have said that the offender should be entitled to plead where the words of the master are contradicted by words of a disciple whose words should be followed and that even according to the judgments of heaven he should not be liable it was therefore indicated to us that this is not so in the case where one knows evidence in favor of another and does not testify on his behalf you might also have said that the offender could argue who can say for certain that even had I gone and testified on his behalf the other party would have admitted the claim and would not perhaps have sworn falsely against my evidence and that even according to the judgments of heaven he should not be liable it was therefore indicated to us that this is not the case if the wall broke down at night or if robbers broke in etc rabbi said this is so only where the animal undermined the wall what then of the case where it did not undermine the wall would there then be liability under what circumstances if it be assumed that the wall was sound why then even where it did not undermine it should there be liability what else could the defendant have done but if on the other hand the wall was shaky why even in the case where the animal undermined it should there be exemption is not this a case where there is negligence at the beginning but damage results from accident at the end your view is correct enough on the assumption that where there is negligence at the beginning and damage results through accident at the end there is exemption but if we take the view that where there is negligence at the beginning of damage results from accident at the end there is liability what can be said this ruling of the mission therefore refers to a sound wall and even to a case where it did not undermine the wall for the statement of rabble was made with reference to the ruling in the concluding clause if the owner had left them in a sunny place or handed them over to the care of a deaf mute and idiot or a minor and they got away and did damage he would be liable rather thereupon said this would be so even where it undermined the wall for there would be no doubt that this would be so where it did not undermine the wall as there was negligence throughout but even where it did undermine the wall the ruling would also hold good you
Ruling of rab referred to a case where the animal was not actually placed but only beaten with a stick and thus driven to the corn. In the case of robbers, also the ruling in the mission similarly refers to a case where they had only beaten it if he handed them over to the care of a shepherd. The shepherd would enter into all the responsibilities instead of him. I would here ask instead of whom, if you say instead of the owner of the animal, have we not already learned elsewhere if an owner hands over his cattle to an unpaid bailey or to a borrower to a paid bailey or to a hire, each of them would enter into the responsibilities of the owner. It must therefore mean instead of a bailey and the first bailey would be exempt altogether. Would this not be a refutation of Rabba? For did Rabba not say one bailey handing over his charge to another bailey becomes liable for all consequences? Rabba might reply that he handed it over to a shepherd means the shepherd handed it over to his. Apprentice, as it is indeed the custom of the shepherd to hand over his sheep to the care of his apprentice, some say that since the text says he handed them over to the care of a shepherd and does not say he handed them over to another person, it could from this be proved that the meaning of he handed them over to the care of a shepherd is that the shepherd handed them over to his apprentice, as it is indeed the custom of the shepherd to hand over various things to the care of his apprentice, whereas if he handed it over to another person, this would not be so. May we say that this supports the view of Rabba, for did Rabba not say one billy handing over his charge to another billy becomes liable for all consequences? It may, however, be said that this is no support for the text, perhaps merely mention the usual case, though the same ruling would apply to a case where it was handed over to another person altogether, it was stated a person taking charge of a lost article. Which he has found is according to Rabbi in the position of an unpaid billy, but according to our Joseph in the position of a paid billy, Rabbi said he is in the position of an unpaid billy since what benefit is forthcoming to him. Our Joseph said he is in the position of a paid billy on account of the benefit he derives from not being required to give bread to the poor while occupied in minding the lost article found by him, hence he should be considered a paid billy. Some, however, explain it. Thus, our Joseph said that he would be like a paid billy as the divine law put this obligation upon him even against his will, he must therefore be considered as a paid billy. Our Joseph brought an objection to the view of Rabbi from the following Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, if a person returns the lost article which he had found to a place where the owner is likely to see it, he is not required any longer to concern himself with it if it is stolen or lost, he is responsible for it now what is meant. By if it is stolen or lost does it not mean if it is stolen while in his house or if it is lost while in his house no it means from the place to which it had been returned but was it not stated he is not required any longer to concern himself with it he answered him we are dealing here with a case where he returned it in the afternoon two separate cases are in fact stated in the text which should read thus if he returned it in the morning to a place where the owner might see it at a time when it was usual with him to go in and out so that he would most likely see it he would no more be required to concern himself with it but if he returned it in the afternoon to a place where the owner might see it since it was at the time when it was not usual with him to go in and out of the house and he could thus not be expected to see it if it was stolen or lost there he would still be responsible for it he then brought another objection from the following he is always responsible for its safety until he has returned it to the keeping of its owner now what is the meaning of the term always does it not mean even while in the keeper's house thus proving that he was like a paid billy rabbi said to him i agree with you in the case of living things for since they are in the habit of running out into the fields they need special washing rabbi on the other hand brought an objection to the view of our joseph from the following the text says return this tells me only that it can be returned to the house of the owner whence could it be derived that it may also be returned to his garden and to his deserted premises it says therefore further thou shalt return them that is to say everywhere now to what kind of garden and deserted premises may it be returned if you say to a garden which is closed in and to deserted premises which are closed in are these not equivalent to his house it must surely therefore refer to a garden that is not closed in and to Deserted premises that are not closed in does not this show that a person taking care of a lost article which he has found is like an unpaid billy. He replied in point of fact it refers to a garden which is closed in and to deserted premises which are closed in and as for your questions are these not equivalent to his house the answer would be that it is thereby indicated to us that it is not necessary to notify the owner as indeed stated by our Eliezer for our Eliezer said in all cases. Notification must be given to the owner with the exception however of returning a lost article as the Torah uses in this connection many expressions of returning said Abbe to our Joseph do you really not accept the view that a person minding a lost article which he has found is like an unpaid billy did our high B Abba not say that our Yohanan stated that if a man puts forward a plea of theft to account for the absence of an article which had been found by him he might have to make double. Payment now if you assume that the person minding the lost article is like a paid billy why should he have to refund double seeing that he has to return the principal he replied we are dealing here with a case where for instance he pleads that it was taken by all armed male factor but he rejoined all armed male factor is surely considered a robber he replied I hold that an armed male factor having regard to the fact that he hides himself from the public is considered a thief he brought a further objection from the following Talmud Mas Baba Kama be no because you say that a certain liability falls on the unpaid billy who is subject to pay double payment it does not follow that you can say the same in the case of the paid billy who does not pay double payment now if you assume that an armed male factor is considered a thief it would be possible that even a paid billy would in some cases have to make double payment as where he pleaded that the articles in his charge were taken by an armed male factor he replied what was meant is this no because you say that a certain liability falls on the unpaid billy who has to make double payment whatever please he puts forward it does not follow that you can say the same in the case of the paid billy who could not have to make a double payment except where he puts forward the plea that an armed male factor took away the article in his charge he again brought an objection from the following from the text edit be hurt or die i learn only the case of breakage or death whence could there also be derived cases of theft and loss and a fortiori argument may be applied here if in the case of paid billy who is exempt for breakage and death he is nevertheless liable for theft and loss in the case of borrower who is liable for breakage and death would it not be all the more certain that he should be liable also for theft and loss this a fortiori has indeed no refutation now if you assume that an armed Male factor is considered a thief. Why could there be no refutation of this? A fortiori, it could surely be refuted. Thus, why is liability attached to paid billy if not because he might have to pay double payment? Where he puts forward the plea that an armed male factor took the articles in his charge, he said to him, "This tana held that the liability to pay the principal in the absence of any oath is of more consequence than the liability for double payment, which is conditioned by taking the oath." May we say that he derived support from the following: If a man hired a cow from his neighbor and it was stolen, and the hirer said, "I would prefer to pay and not to swear," and it so happened that the thief was subsequently traced, he should make the double payment to the hirer. Now it was presumed that the statement followed the view of our Judah, who said that hirer is equal in law to paid billy. Since then, it says the hirer said, "I would prefer to pay and not to swear." This shows. That had he wished he could have freed himself by resorting to the oath under what circumstances could this be so where for instance he advances the plea that an armed male factor took it now seeing that it says and it so happened that the thief was subsequently traced he should pay the double payment to the hire can it not be concluded from this that an armed male factor is considered as a thief I might answer do you presume that this statement follows the view of our Judah who said that hire is equal in law to paid billy perhaps it follows the view of our mayor who said that hire is equal in law to unpaid billy if you wish I may say we should read the relevant views as they were transposed by Rabbi Abba who taught us how is the payment for the loss of articles regulated in the case of hire our mayor says as in the case of paid billy our Judah however says as in the case of unpaid billy our Zara said we are dealing here with a case where the hire advances the plea that it was taken by an armed male factor and it was afterwards discovered that it was taken by a male factor without arms if a sheep accidentally fell into a garden and derived benefit from the fruits their payment would have to be made to the extent of the benefit Rab said this applies to benefit derived by the animal from the lessening of the impact but what when it consumed them would there be no need to pay even to the extent of the benefit shall we say that Rab is here following the principle laid down by him elsewhere for did Rab not say it should not have eaten but what a comparison Rab said it
Paul Arcahana said it slipped in its own water. Rabba, however, said the rule would hold good even where another animal pushed it down. The one who explains the ruling to apply where another animal pushed it down would certainly apply it where it slipped in its own water. But the one who explains the ruling to apply where it slipped in its own water might maintain that where another animal pushed it down, there was negligence, and the payment should be for the amount of damage done by it. As the plaintiff would be entitled to say, you should have made them go past one by one. Arkahana said the Mishnah ruling applies only to the bed into which it fell. If, however, it went from one bed to another bed, the payment would be for the amount of damage done by it. Or Yohanan, however, said that even where it went from one bed to another bed and did so even all day long, the payment would be made only to the extent of the benefit unless it left the garden and returned there again with the knowledge. Of the owner, our papa thereupon said, Do not imagine this to mean unless it left the garden to the knowledge of the owner and returned there again with the knowledge of the owner. For as soon as it left the garden to the knowledge of the owner, even though it returned again without his knowledge, there would already be liability. The reason being that the plaintiff might rightly say, Since it had once become known to it where it can find fruit, you should have realized that whenever it broke loose, it would run to that place if it went down there in the usual way and did damage. The payment would have to be for the amount of damage done by it. Or Jeremiah raised the question where it had gone down there in the usual way but did damage by water resulting from giving birth. What would be the legal position if we accept the view that where there is negligence at the beginning but damage actually results in the end from sheer accident? There is liability. No question arises where we have to. Ask is if we accept the view that where there is negligence at the beginning but damage actually results in the end from sheer accident there is exemption what in that case is Allah should we say that this is a case where there was negligence at first but the final result was due to accident and therefore there should be exemption or should we say on the contrary that this case is one of negligence throughout for since the owner could see that the animal was approaching the time to give birth he should have watched Talmud, Mas Baba Kama be it and indeed taken more care of it let this remain undecided how is payment made for the amount of damage done by it by comparing the value of an area in the field requiring one SEI of seed as it was previously with what its worth is now etc. Whence is this derived our Matina said scripture says and shall feed in another man's field to teach that the valuation should be made in conjunction with another field but was this verse end? Shall feed in another man's field not required to exclude public ground from being subject to this law if so scripture would have said and shall feed in a neighbor's field or and shall consume another man's field why then is it said in another man's field unless to teach that the valuation should be made in conjunction with another field let us say then that the whole import of this verse was to convey only this ruling there being thus no authority to exclude public ground if so. Scripture would have inserted this clause in the section dealing with payment e.g. of the best of his own field and of the best of his own vineyard shall he make restitution as valued in conjunction with another field why then did scripture put it in juxtaposition with and shall feed unless to indicate that the two rulings are to be derived from it how is the valuation arrived at our Jose B. Hanan said the value of an area requiring one SEI of seed is determined in proportion to the Value of an area requiring 60 SEAHS of seed. Arjana said the value of an area requiring one tarkav of seed is determined in proportion to the value of an area requiring 60 tarkavs of seed. Hezekiah said the value of each stock consumed is determined in proportion to the value of 60 such stocks. An objection was raised from the following: If it consumed one cab and two cabs of grain, it would not be right to ask payment for their full value, but the amount consumed would have to be considered as if forming a little bed, which would thus be estimated. Now, does this not mean that the bed will be valued by itself? No, in the proportion of one to sixty. Our rabbis taught the valuation is made neither of a cab by itself, as this would be an advantage to him, nor of an area required for a core of seed, as this would be a disadvantage to him. What does this mean? Our papa said what is meant is this: neither is a cab of grain consumed valued in conjunction with 60 cabs, is it? Defendant would thereby have too great an advantage nor is a core valued in conjunction with 60 cores as this would mean too great a disadvantage for the defendant Arhu Nabima no demur to the saying why then does it say nor of an area required for a core of seed according to your interpretation should it not have been nor a core Arhu Nabima no therefore said in the name of Araha the son of Rika what is meant is this the valuation is made neither of a cab by itself as this would be too great an advantage to the plaintiff nor of a cab in conjunction with an area required for a core of seed as this would be too great a disadvantage for the plaintiff it must therefore be made only in conjunction with 60 times as much a certain person cut down a date tree belonging to a neighbor when he appeared before the exilarch the latter said to him I myself saw the place three date trees stood close together and they were worth 100 zoos go therefore and pay the other party. 33 and the third zoo said the defendant what have I to do with an exilarch who judges in accordance with Persian law he therefore appeared before Arnaman who said to him that the valuation should be made in conjunction with 60 times as much said Rabbah to him if the sages ordained this valuation in the case of chattels doing damage would they do the same in the case of damage done by man with his body Abe however said to Rabbah in regard to damage done by man with his body what is your opinion if not that which was taught if a man prunes the berries from a neighbor's vineyard while still in the budding stage it has to be ascertained how much it was worth previously and how much it is worth afterwards but nothing is said of valuation in conjunction with 60 times as much but has it not been taught similarly with respect to damage done by cattle for it was taught if a beast breaks off a plant our Jose says that the legislators of public enactments in Jerusalem stated that if the plant was of the first year two silver pieces should be paid but if it was in its second year four silver pieces should be paid if it consumed young blades of grain our Jose the Galilean says that it has to be considered in the light of the future value of that which was left in the field the sages however say that it has to be ascertained how much it the field was worth previously and how much it is worth now Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, Talmud, Mas Baba Kama. If it consumed grapes while still in the budding stage our Joshua says that they should be estimated as if they were grapes ready to be plucked off but the sages here too say that it will have to be ascertained how much it was worth previously and how much it is worth now our Simeon B. Judah says in the name of our Simeon these rulings apply where it consumed sprouts of vines or shoots of fig trees but where it consumed actual figs or half grapes they would be estimated as if they were Grapes ready to be plucked off now it is definitely taught here the sages say that it will have to be ascertained how much it was worth previously and how much it is worth now and it is not said explicitly that the valuation will be made in conjunction with 60 times as much nevertheless you must say that it is implied that the valuation is to be made in conjunction with 60 times as much so also then here in the case of man it is implied that the valuation is to be in conjunction with 60 times as much Abe said our Jose the Galilean and our Ishmael expressed the same view in this matter our Jose the Galilean as stated by us above and our Ishmael as taught elsewhere of the best of his own field and of the best of his own vineyard shall he make restitution this means the best of the field of the plaintiff and the best of the vineyard of the plaintiff this is a view of our Ishmael our Akiva however says scripture only intended to lay down that damages should be collected out of the best and this applies even more to sacred property nor can you say that he or Ishmael meant this in the sense of R.E.D.B. Abin who said that it deals with a case where e.g. the cattle consumed one bed out of several beds and we could not ascertain whether its produce was meager or fertile so that our Ishmael would thus be made to order the defendant to go and pay for a fertile bed in accordance with the value of the best bed at the time of the damage this could not be maintained by us for the reason that the onus probandi falls upon the claimant our Ishmael must therefore have meant the best of anticipation i.e. as it would have matured at the harvest time the master stated our Simeon B. Judah says in the name of our Simeon these rulings apply only where it consumed sprouts of vines or shoots of fig trees thus implying that where it consumed grapes in the budding stage they would be estimated as if they were grapes ready to be plucked off right now the Concluding clause where it consumed actual figs or half-ripe grapes they would be estimated as if they were grapes ready to be plucked off implying to the contrary that where it consumed grapes in the budding stage it would have to be ascertained how much it was worth previously and how much it is worth now is this not a contradiction Robin has said embody the new case in the text and teach thus these rulings apply only where it consumed sprouts of v
Intercourse by constraint Abbe further said the following Tanaim and Arsimian Bijuda expressed on this point the same view Arsimian Bijuda's view as stated by us above who are the other Tanaim referred to as taught our Jose says deduct the fees of the midwife but Benese says deduct food the one who says deduct the fees for the midwife would certainly deduct food but the one who says deduct food would not deduct the fees for the midwife as the plaintiff might say my wife is a lively person and does not need a midwife our papa and our the son of our Joshua in an actual case followed the view of our nomin and valued in conjunction with 60 times as much according to another report however our papa and our the son of our Joshua valued a palm tree in conjunction with the small piece of ground the law is in accordance with our papa and our the son of our Joshua in the case of an Aramean palm but it is in accordance with the eggs large in the case of a Persian palm elizer's year Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi once put on a pair of black shoes and stood in the marketplace of Nihardia when the attendants of the house of the Exilarch met him there. They said to him, What ground have you for wearing black shoes? He said to them, I am mourning for Jerusalem. They said to him, Are you such a distinguished person as to mourn over Jerusalem? Considering this to be a piece of arrogance on his part, they brought him and put him in prison. He said to them, I am a great man. They asked him, How? Can we tell you? Replied, Either you ask me a legal point or let me ask you one. They said to him, We would prefer you to ask. He then said to them, If a man cuts a date flower, what payment should he have to make? They answered him, The payment will be for the value of the date flower, but would it not have grown into dates? They then replied, The payment should be for the value of the dates, but he rejoined, Surely it was not dates which he took from him. They then said to him, You tell us, he replied, that Valuation would have to be made in conjunction with sixty times as much. They said to him, "What authority can you find to support you?" He thereupon said to them, "Samuel is alive, and his court of law flourishes in the town." They sent this problem to be considered before Samuel, who answered them the statement he made to you that the valuation should be in conjunction with sixty times as much as the damaged day flower is correct. They then released him. Our Simeon says, "If it consumed ripe fruits, etc." On what ground the statement of the divine law and shall feed in another man's field, teaching that valuation is to be made in conjunction with the field applies to produce which was still in need of a field, whereas these fruits in the case before us, since they were no more in need of a field, must be compensated at their actual value. Our Hunabi said that our Jeremiah stated that Rab gave judgment in contradistinction to the usual rule in accordance with our Meir and on another legal point. Decided the law to be in accordance with Arsimian, he gave judgment in accordance with Armeir on the matter taught if the husband drew up a deed for a would-be purchaser of a field which had been set aside for the payment of the marriage settlement of his wife and she did not endorse it and when a deed on the same field was drawn up for another purchaser she did endorse it she has thereby lost her claim to the marriage settlement this is the view of Armeir Arjuda however says she might still argue I made the endorsement merely to gratify my husband why therefore should you go against me the legal point where he decided the law to be in accordance with Arsimian was that which we learned Arsimian says if it consumed ripe fruits the payment should be for ripe fruits if one seit would be for one seit if two seahs for two seahs mission if a man puts his stacks of corn in the field of another without permission and the animal of the owner of the field eats them there is no liability moreover if it suffered harm from them the owner of the stacks would be liable if however he put the stacks there with permission the owner of the field would be liable tomorrow may we say that this mission is not in accordance with rabbi for if in accordance with rabbi did he not say that unless the owner of the premises explicitly took upon himself to safeguard he would not be liable our papa said here we were dealing with the watchman of the barns for since he said enter and place your stacks it surely amounted to enter and i will guard for you mission if a man sent out something burning through a deaf mute an idiot or a minor and damage resulted he would be exempt from the judgments of man but liable in accordance with the judgments of heaven but if he sent it through a normal person the normal person would be liable if one person first supplies the fire and another the wood he who supplies the wood would be liable where on the other hand the first Supplies the wood and the second the fire he who supplies the fire would be liable but where another person came along and fanned the flame the one who fanned it would be liable if it was the wind that fanned it all would be exempt. Kamara Reshlakish said in the name of Hezekiah the Mishnah ruling holds good only where he handed over a flickering coal to the deaf mute who fanned it into flame but if he handed over to him something already in flame he would be liable the reason being that it was his acts that were the immediate cause or you had and however said even where he handed something already in flame to him he would still be exempt the reason being that it was the handling of the deaf mute that caused the damage he could therefore not be liable unless where he handed over to him tinder talmud, mas baba kama shavings and alight in which case it was certainly his act that was the immediate cause but if he sent it through a normal person the normal person would be liable. Etc. If another person came along and Luba fanned it, etc. Our nomin B. Isaac said he who reads in the original text Luba is not mistaken, so also he who reads in the text Luba is similarly not mistaken. He who has in the text Luba is not mistaken, since we find in scripture Bilab Ash in a flame of fire, and so also he who has in the text Luba is not mistaken, as we find I created the movement of the lips. If it was the wind that fanned it, all would be exempt. Our rabbis taught where he fanned it along with the wind which also fanned it. If there was enough force in his blowing to set the fire ablaze, he would be liable, but if not, he would be exempt. But why should he not be liable, as in the case of one winnowing on Sabbath who is liable, though the wind was helping him? Abay thereupon said, We are dealing here with a case where e.g. he blew it up in one direction and the wind blew it up in a different direction. Rabbis said the case is one where e.g. he started to blow it. Up when the wind was only normal and would have been unable to set it ablaze, but there suddenly came on an unusual wind which made it blaze up. Our Zara said the case is one where e.g. he merely increased the heat by breathing heavily on it. Our Ashi said when we say that there is liability for winnowing where the wind is helping, this applies to Sabbath where the Torah prohibited any work with a definite object, whereas here regarding damage, such an act could be considered merely as a secondary cause and a mere secondary cause in the case of damage carries no liability mission. If he allowed fire to escape and it burnt wood stones or even earth, he would be liable as it says if fire break out and catch in thorns so that the stacks of corn or the standing corn or the field be consumed there with he that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. Kamara Rabba said, Why was it necessary for the divine law to mention both thorns, stacks, standing corn, and field? They are all necessary for. If the divine law had mentioned only thorns I might have said that it was only in the case of thorns that the divine law imposed liability because fire is found often among them and carelessness in regard to them is frequent whereas in the case of stacks which are not often on fire and in respect of which negligence is not usual I might have held that there is no liability if again the divine law had mentioned only stacks I might have said that it was only in the case of stacks that the divine law imposed liability as the loss involved there was considerable whereas in the case of thorns where the loss involved was slight I might have thought there was no liability but why was standing corn necessary to be mentioned to teach that just as standing corn is in an open place so is everything which is in an open space subject to the same law but according to our Judah who imposes liability also for concealed articles damaged by fire why had standing corn to be mentioned too? Include anything possessing stature once then did the other rabbis include anything possessing stature they derived this from the word or place before the standing corn and Arjuna he needed the word or as a disjunctive once then did the other rabbis derive the disjunction they derived it from the word or place before the field and Arjuna he held that because the divine law inserted or before the standing corn it also inserted or before the field but why was field needed to be inserted to include the case of fire lapping his neighbor's plowed field and grazing his stones but why did the divine law not say only field in which case the others would not have been necessary they were still necessary for if the divine law had said field only I might have said that anything in the field would come under the same law but not any other thing it was therefore indicated to us that this is not so our Samuel B. Naman, he stated that our Yohanan said calamity comes upon the world only when there are wicked persons in the world and it always begins with the righteous as it says if fire break out and catch in thorns when does fire break out only when thorns are found nearby it always begins however with the righteous as it says so that the stack of corn was consumed it does not say and it would consume the stack of
The end it is again said the sword without the terror within shall destroy why these further citations lest you might think that the advice given above refers only to the night but not to the day therefore come and here come my people enter thou into thy chamber and shut thy doors about thee and should you say that these apprehensions apply only where there is no terror inside whereas where there is terror inside it is much better to go out and sit among people in one company again come and here the sword without the terror within shall destroy implying that even where the terror is within the sword will destroy more without in the time of an epidemic Rabbi used to keep the windows shut as it is written for death is come up into our windows our rabbis taught when there is a famine in town withdraw your feet as stated and there was a famine in the land and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there and it is further said if we say we will enter into the city then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. Why the additional citation since you might think that this advice applies only where there is no danger to life in the new settlement whereas where there is a danger to life in the new place this should not be undertaken come and here now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Arameans if they save us alive we shall live our rabbis taught when there is an epidemic in the town one should not walk in the middle of the road as the angel of death walks then in the middle of the road for since permission has been granted him he stalks along openly but when there is peace in the town one should not walk at the sides of the road for since the angel of death has no permission he slinks along in hiding our rabbis taught when there is an epidemic in the town nobody should enter the house of worship alone as the angel of death keeps there his implements this however is the case only where no pupils are being taught there or where ten males do not pray there together our rabbis taught when dogs howl this is a sign that the angel of death has come to a town but when dogs frolic this is a sign that Elijah the prophet has come to a town this is so however only if there is no female among them when RMI and RSC were sitting before our Isaac the smith one of them said to him will the master please tell us some legal points while the other said will the master please give us some homiletical instruction when he commenced a homiletical discourse he was prevented by the one and when he commenced a legal discourse he was prevented by the other he therefore said to them I will tell you a parable to what is this like to a man who has had two wives one young and one old the young one used to pluck out his white hair whereas the old one used to pluck out his black hair he thus finally remained bald on both sides he further said to them I will accordingly tell you something which will be equally interesting to both of you if fire break out and catch and thorns break out implies of itself he that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution the holy one blessed be he said it is incumbent upon me to make restitution for the fire which I kindled it was I who kindled the fire in Zion as it says and he hath kindled the fire in Zion which hath devoured the foundations thereof and it is I who will one day build it anew by fire as it says for I said the Lord will be unto her a wall of fire round about and I will be the glory in the midst of her on the legal side the verse commences with damage done by chattel and concludes with damage done by the person in order to show that fire implies also human agency scripture says and David longed and said oh that one would give me water to drink of the well of Bethlehem which is by the gate and the three mighty men broke through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate etc what was his difficulty Rabbi stated that Arnaman had said his difficulty was regarding concealed articles damaged by fire whether the right ruling was that of Arjuna or of the rabbis and they gave him the solution whatever it was Arjuna however said the problem was this there were their stacks of barley which belonged to Israelites but in which Philistines had hidden themselves and what he asked was whether it was permissible to rescue oneself through the destruction of another's property the answer they dispatched to him was generally speaking it is forbidden to rescue oneself through the destruction of another's property you however our king and a king may break through fields belonging to private persons to make a way for his army and nobody is entitled to prevent him from doing so but some rabbis or as also read Rabbi Bimari said there were there both stacks of barley belonging to Israelites and stacks of lentils belonging to the Philistines the problem on which instruction was needed was whether it would be permissible to take the stacks of barley that belonged to the Israelites and put them before the beasts in the battlefield on condition of subsequently paying for them with the stacks of lentils that belonged to the Philistines the reply they dispatched to him was if the wicked restore the pledge give again the robbery implying that even where the robber subsequently pays for the robbery he still remains wicked you however our king and a king may break through Fields of private owners making us a way for his army and nobody is entitled to prevent him from doing so if we accept the view that he wanted to exchange we can quite understand how in one verse it is written where was a plot of ground full of lentils and in another verse it is written where was a plot of ground full of barley if we however take the view that he wanted to burn them down what need was there to have these two verses he however might say to you that there were also there stacks of lentils which belonged to Israelites and in which Philistines were hidden now on the view that he wanted to burn them down we can quite understand why it is written but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it but according to the view that he wanted to exchange what would be the meaning of and he defended it that he did not allow them to exchange according to these two views we can quite understand why there are two verses Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, but according to the View that his inquiry concerned concealed goods in the case of fire what need was there for the verses he might say to you that besides the problem of hidden goods in the case of fire one of the other problems referred to above was asked by him now according to the other two views we quite understand why it is written but he would not drink thereof for he said since there is a general prohibition I do not want it but according to the view that his inquiry concerned hidden goods in the case of fire was it not a traditional teaching which was dispatched to him and that being so what would be the meaning of but he would not drink thereof the meaning would be that he did not want to quote this teaching in their names for he said this has been transmitted to me from the court of law presided over by Samuel of Rama that no halachic matter may be quoted in the name of one who surrenders himself to meet death for words of the Torah but he poured it out unto the Lord we quite understand this according to the other two views as he acted thus for the sake of heaven but according to the view that his inquiry concerned hidden goods in the case of fire what would be the meaning of this verse but he pointed out unto the lord that he repeated this halashik statement in the name of general traditional learning mission if it crossed a fence four cubits high or a public road or a canal there would be no liability tomorrow but was it not taught if it crossed a fence four cubits high there would still be liability our papa thereupon said the tana of our ruling here was reckoning downwards at the height of six cubits there would be exemption at five cubits there would be exemption down to the height of four cubits there would still be exemption the tana of the barrier was on the other hand reckoning upwards at the height of two cubits there would be liability of three cubits there would be liability up to the height of four cubits there would still be liability Rabbi said the height of four cubits stated in the mission as not involving liability would also suffice even where the fire passed over to a field of thorns our papa however said the height of four cubits should be calculated from the top of the thorns Rab said the mishnah ruling applies only where the fire was rising in a column but where it was creeping along there would be liability even if it crossed a public road of about the width of a hundred cubits Samuel on the other hand said that the mission deals with a creeping fire for in the case of the fire rising in a column there would be exemption if it crossed a public road of any width whatsoever it was however taught in accordance with Rab this ruling applies only where it was rising in a column if it was creeping along and would happen to be in its path there would be liability were it even to pass over a public ground of about the width of a hundred mil if however it crossed a River or pool eight cubits wide there would be exemption of public road who was the tenant who laid this down Rabbi said he was our Eliezer as we have indeed learned our Eliezer says if it was sixteen cubits wide like the road in a public thoroughfare there would be exemption or a canal Rab said it means an actual river Samuel however said it means a pond for watering fields the one who says it is an actual river would maintain the same ruling even where there was no water there but the one who says it means a pond for watering fields would hold that so long as there was water there the ruling would apply but not where no water was there elsewhere we have learned divisions of fields with respect to PER affected by the following of Brook Shalul the private road and the public road what is Shalul Rab Judah stated that Samuel had said a low lying place where rain water collects RBB however said on behalf of our Yohanan a pond of water which as it were distributes. Spoil to the banks the one who says that it means a low-lying place where rainwater collects would certainly apply the ruling to a pond of water but the one who says that it means a pond of water would on the other hand maintain that low-lying places where rainwater collects would not cause a division as these Talmud, M
were observed there should be exemption does this not prove that Arsimian maintained a minimum limit of precaution Arnam and therefore stated that Rabu Bubab said the meaning of Arsimian's phrase all this depends upon the fire is that all should depend upon the height of the fire and that no general limits could be fixed Ar Joseph however stated that Rab Judah said on behalf of Samuel the Halachah is in accordance with Arsimian so also said Arnam and that Samuel said that the Halachah was in accordance with Arsimian mission if a man sets fire to a stack of corn in which there happen to be articles and these are burnt Ar Judah says that payment should be made for all that was therein whereas the sages say that no payment should be made except for a stack of wheat or for a stack of barley where fire was set to a barn to which a goat had been fastened and near which was a slave loose and all were burnt with the barn there would be liability if however the slave had been chained to it and the goat was loose nearby it and all were burnt with it there would be exemption the sages however agree with Arjuna in the case of one who set fire to a castle that the payment should be for all that was kept therein as it is surely the custom of men to keep valuables in their homes Kamara Arkahana said the difference of opinion was only where the man kindled the fire on his own premises from which it passed on and consumed the stack standing in his neighbor's premises Arjuna imposing liability for damage done to the moon in the case of fire whereas the rabbis grant exemption but if he kindled the fire on the premises of his neighbor both agreed that he would have to pay for all that was there said Robin to him if so why does it say in the concluding clause the sages however agree with Arjuna in the case of one who set fire to a castle that the payment should be for all that was kept therein now why not draw the distinction in the same Case by making the text run thus these statements apply only in the case where he kindled the fire on his own premises whence it traveled and consumed the stack standing in his neighbor's premises but where he kindled the fire in the premises of his neighbor all would agree that he should pay for all that was kept there rather therefore said they differed in both cases they differed where he kindled the fire in his own premises whence it traveled and consumed stack standing in his neighbor's premises are Judah imposing liability to pay for Tamun in the case of fire whereas the other rabbis hold that he is not liable to pay for Tamun in the case of fire they also differed in the case where he kindled the fire in the premises of his neighbor Arjuna holding that he should pay for everything that was there including even purses of money whereas the rabbis held that it was only for utensils which were usually put away in the stacks because e.g. threshing sludges and Cattle harnesses that payment would have to be made but for articles not usually kept in stacks no payment would have to be made our rabbis taught if a man sets fire to a stack of corn in which there were utensils and they were burnt our Judah says that payment should be made for all that was stored there whereas the sages say that no payment should be made except for a stack of wheat or for a stack of barley and that the space occupied by the utensils has to be considered as if it was full of corn talmud mas baba kama these statements apply only to the case where he kindled the fire on his own premises whence it traveled and consumed the stack standing in the premises of his neighbor but where he kindled the fire in the premises of his neighbor all agree that he would have to pay for all that was kept there our Judah however agreed with the sages that in the case where a man granted his neighbor the loan of a particular place in his field for the purpose of piling up a Stack if the borrower of the place piled up stacks and hid some valuable articles there no payment would have to be made except for the value of the stack alone so also where permission was granted for the purpose of piling up stacks of wheat and he piled up stacks of barley or permission was given for barley and he piled up wheat or even where he piled up wheat for which the permission was granted but covered it with barley or again where he piled up barley but covered it with wheat. In these cases no payment would be made except for the value of the barley alone Rabbi said if a man gives a gold dinar to a woman and says to her be careful with it as it is a silver coin if she damaged it she would have to pay for a gold dinar because he could rightly plead against her what business had you to damage it but if she was merely careless with it she would have to pay only for a silver dinar as she could rightly plead against him it was only silver that I undertook to take. Care of, but I never undertook to take care of gold, said our Mordecai to our Ashi. Do you state this in the name of Rabba? We derive it quite definitely from the Beritha, which states if a man piled up wheat for which the permission was granted but covered it with barley, or again if he piled up barley but covered it up with wheat, no payment would be made except for the value of the barley alone. Now, does this not prove that he is entitled to plead against the plaintiff? It was only barley that I undertook to take care of here too. She is surely entitled to plead against the depositor. I never undertook to take care of gold, Rab said. I have heard a new point with reference to the view of Arjuna in the Mishnah here, but do not know what it is said. Samuel to him does Abba really not know what he heard with reference to Arjuna who imposes liability for damage done to Tamun. In the case of fire, it is that the judges must make the ordinance enacted for the benefit of a robbed person extent. Also to the case of fire Amimar raised the question would they similarly make the ordinance enacted for the benefit of a robbed person extent also to the case of an informer or not according to the view that we should not give judgment against the defendant in cases where the damage was not actually done but merely caused by him there could be no question that also against informers we should not give judgment but the question could still be raised according to the view that we should give judgment against the defendant even in cases where the damage was not actually done but effectively and directly caused by him would the judges make the ordinance enacted for the benefit of a robbed person extent also to the case of an informer so that the plaintiff would by taking an oath as to the exact amount of his loss be paid accordingly or should this perhaps not be so let this remain undecided a certain man kicked another's money box into the river the owner came into court and said so much and so much did I have in it or as she was sitting and pondering on it what should be the law in such a case Rabbi said to Araha the son of Rabbi or as others report Araha the son of Rabbi said to Arashi is this not exactly what was stated in the Mishnah for we learned the sages agree with Arjuna in the case of one who set fire to a castle that payment should be for all that was kept therein as it is surely the custom of men to keep valuables in their homes is this not equivalent to the case in hand he however said to him if he would have pleaded that he had money there it would indeed have been the same but we are dealing with a case where he pleads that he had jewels there what should then be the legal position do people keep jewels in a money box or not let this remain undecided Aryamar said to Arashi if he pleads that he had silver cups in the castle which was burnt what would be the law he answered him we consider whether he was a wealthy man who was likely to have silver cups or whether he was a trustworthy man with whom people would deposit such things if he is he would be allowed to swear and be reimbursed accordingly but if not he would not be believed in his allegations without corroborative evidence are added the son of Aruya said to Arashi what is the practical difference between Gazlan and Hamson he replied to Hamson one who expropriates forcibly offers payment for what he takes whereas a Gazlan does not make payment the other rejoined if he is prepared to make payment how can you call him Hamson did Aruna not say that even where the vendor was threatened to be hanged unless he would agree to sell the sale would be a valid sale this however is no contradiction as in that case the vendor did finally say I agree whereas here in the case of Hamson he never said I agree Talmud Mas Baba Kama Bimish if a spark escapes from underneath a hammer and does damage there would be liability if Wale Camel laden with flax was passing through a public thoroughfare. The flax got into a shop and caught fire by coming in contact with the shopkeeper's candle and set alight the whole building. The owner of the camel would be liable if, however, the shopkeeper left his candle outside his shop, he would be liable. Arjuda says if it was a Hanukkah candle, the shopkeeper would not be liable. Tomorrow, Rabbana said in the name of Rabba from the statement of Arjuda, we can learn that it is ordained to place the Hanukkah candle within ten handbreadths from the ground. For if you assume that it can be placed even above ten handbreadths, why did Arjuda say that in the case of a Hanukkah candle there would be exemption? Why should the plaintiff not plead against him? You should have placed it above the reach of the camel and its rider. Does this therefore not prove that it is ordained to place it within the first ten handbreadths? It can, however, be argued that this is not so, for it could still be said. That it might be placed even above the height of ten handbreadths, and as for your argument, you ought to have placed it above the reach of the camel and its rider. It might be answered that since he was occupied with the performance of a religious act, the rabbis could not rightly make it so troubling to him. Our Kahana said that our Nathan Bimin Yamai expounded in the name of our Tanhum. If the Hanukkah candle is placed above the height of twenty cubits,
Application except in the case of a thief alone is be it noted is not taught here this omission supports the view of our high B Abba for our high B Abba stated that our Yohanan said he who falsely alleges a theft to account for the absence of a deposit entrusted to him may have to make double payment so also if he slaughtered or sold it he may have to make fourfold or fivefold payment some read as follows shall we say that this omission supports the view of our high B Abba who said in the name of our Yohanan he who falsely alleges a theft to account for the absence of a deposit entrusted to him may have to make double payment so also if he slaughtered or sold it he may have to make fourfold or fivefold payment but does your text say there is no difference between this and that except what it says is there is more frequent occasion while some points were stated in the text others were omitted as a measure of double payment applies both to a thing possessing it breath of life and to a thing which does not possess the breath of life etc. Whence is this derived as our rabbis taught for every matter of trespass is a generalization whether it be for ox for ass for sheep for rhyme is a specification or for any matter of lost thing generally says again we have thus here a generalization preceding a specification which is in its turn followed by another generalization and in such cases we include only that which is similar to the specification just as the specification here mentions an object which is movable and which has an intrinsic value there should therefore be included any object which is movable and which has an intrinsic value real estate is thus excluded not being movable slaves are similarly excluded as they are on the same footing in the eye of the law with real estate bills are similarly excluded as though they are movable they have no intrinsic value sacred property is also excluded as the text speaks of his neighbor but since the specification mentions a living thing whose carcass would cause defilement whether by touching or by carrying why not say there should be included any living thing whose carcass similarly causes defilement whether by touching or by carrying so that birds would not be included how can you seriously say this is not rhyme it mentioned here it may however be said that it is only regarding objects possessing life that we have argued why then not say in the case of objects possessing life that it is only a thing whose carcass causes defilement by touching and carrying that is included whereas a thing whose carcass does not cause defilement by touching and carrying should not be included Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba as each item in a generalization and specification is expounded by itself so that birds would not be included if so the divine law should have inserted only one item in the specification but which item should the divine law have inserted for were the divine law to have Inserted only ox I might have suggested that an animal which was eligible to be sacrificed upon the altar should be included but one which was not eligible to be sacrificed upon the altar should not be included if on the other hand the divine law had inserted only ass I might have thought that an animal which is subject to the sanctity of first birth should be included but that one which is not subject to the sanctity of first birth should not be included why then still not exclude birds whose carcasses would unlike those of the ox and the ass defile neither by touching nor by carrying it may still be said that if so the divine law would have inserted ox and ass why then was sheep inserted unless to indicate the inclusion of birds which would otherwise have been excluded but still why not say that you can only include birds which are ritually clean for food as these in some way resemble sheep and that they defile the garments worn by him who swallows them after they have Become nibble whereas birds ritually unclean for food which carry no defilement and do not cause the defilement of garments worn by him who swallows them should not be included the term all is an amplification does this mean to say that whenever the divine law uses the word all it is an amplification what about tithes where all occurs and we nevertheless expounded it as a case of generalization and specification for it was taught and thou shalt bestow that money for all that thy soul lust death after is a generalization for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink is a specification or for all that thy soul desired is again a generalization now where a generalization precedes a specification which is in its turn followed by another generalization you include only that which is similar to the specification as then the specification here mentions produce obtained from produce which springs from the soil there may also be included all kinds of produce obtained from produce which springs from the soil does this not prove that the expression all was taken as a generalization and not as an amplification it may however be said that the expression for all is only a generalization whereas all would be an amplification or if you wish I may say that the term all is also a generalization but in this case all is an amplification for at the very outset we find here a generalization preceding a specification followed in its turn by another generalization is it is written if a man deliver unto his neighbor which is a generalization money or stuff which is a specification to keep which general leases again should you assume that this verse for any matter of trespass etc was similarly inserted in order to give us a generalization preceding a specification followed in its turn by another generalization why did the divine law not insert these items of the specification of the latter verse along with the items of the former generalization specification and Generalization why was the verse for any matter of trespass inserted at all unless to prove that this all was meant as an amplification but now that you have decided that the term all is an amplification why do I need all these terms of the specification one to exclude real estate a second to exclude slaves and the third to exclude bills rhyme and to exclude articles which have no specification or for any matter of lost thing was meant as a basis for the view of our high view as our high B. Abba reported that our Yohanan said Talmud, Mas Baba Kama who falsely alleges the theft to account for the non-production of a fine may have to make double payment as it says for any matter of lost thing whereof one saith we have learned elsewhere if a man says to another where is my deposit and the billy says it was lost whereupon the depositor says I call upon you to swear and the billy says so be it if witnesses testify against him that he himself had consumed it he has to pay. Only the principal but if he admits this of himself he has to pay the principal together with the fifth and a trespass offering if the depositor says where is my deposit and the billy answers it was stolen whereupon the depositor says I call on you to swear and the billy says so be it if witnesses testify against him that he himself had stolen it he has to make double payment but if he admits this on his own accord he has to pay the principal together with the fifth and a trespass. Offering it is thus stated here that it is only where the billy falsely alleges theft that he has to make double payment whereas if he falsely alleges loss he has not to make double payment again even where he falsely alleges theft it is only where he confirms the allegation by an oath that he has to make double payment whereas where no oath follows he has not to make double payment what is the scriptural authority for all this as the rabbis taught if the thief be found this verse deals with the billy who falsely alleges theft or perhaps not so but with the thief himself as however it is further stated if the thief be not found we must conclude that the whole verse deals with the billy falsely advancing a plea of theft another very the teaches if the thief be found this verse deals with the thief himself you say that it deals with the thief himself why however not say that it is not so but that it deals with the billy falsely alleging theft when it further states if it Thief be not found this gives us the case of a billy falsely alleging theft how then can I explain the verse if the thief be found unless on the supposition that this deals with the thief himself we see at any rate that all agree that the verse if the thief be not found deals with a billy falsely alleging theft but how is this implied in the wording of the text Rabbah said we understand the verse to say that if it will not be found as he stated but that he himself had stolen it he has to pay double but whence can we conclude that this is so only in the case of an oath having been falsely taken by the billy as it was taught the master of the house shall come near unto the judges to take an oath you say to take an oath why not say however that this is not so but to stand his trial the words put his hand unto his neighbor's goods occur in the subsequent section and the words put his hand unto his neighbor's goods occur in the section which precedes the other one just as there it is associated with an oath so here also it should be associated with an oath now on the supposition that one verse deals with a thief and the other with a billy falsely alleging theft we quite understand why there are two verses but on the supposition that both of them deal with a billy falsely alleging theft why do I want two verses it may be replied that one is to exclude the case of a false allegation of loss from entailing double payment now on the supposition that one verse deals with a thief and the other with a billy falsely alleging theft in which case there will be no superfluous verse in the text once can we derive the exclusion of a false allegation of loss from entailing double payment from a definite article as instead of thief it is written the thief on the supposition that both of the verses deal with a billy falsely alleging theft in which case scripture excludes a billy falsely alleging loss how could the fact that instead of Thief it is written the thief be expounded he might say to you that it furnishes a basis for the view of our high B Abba reported in the name of our Yohanan as our high B Abba stated that our Yoh
on the supposition that both of them deal with a belief falsely alleging theft whence can the law of double payment be derived in the case of a thief himself and should you say that it can be derived by means of an a fortiori argument from the law of a belief falsely alleging theft we may ask is it not sufficient for the object to which the inference is made to be placed on the same footing as the object from which it is made so that just as there the penalty is entailed only where there is false swearing so here also it should be entailed only where there is false swearing it could be derived by the reasoning taught at the school of Hezekiah for it was taught at the school of Hezekiah should not scripture have mentioned only ox and theft as everything would thus have been included if so I might say that just as the specification mentions an object which is eligible to be sacrificed upon the altar any living object which is eligible to be sacrificed upon the altar should be included what can you include through this a sheep as subject to double payment Talmud, Mas Baba Kama but when the text continues sheep we have sheep explicitly stated how then am I to explain theft to include any object if that is so should scripture not have mentioned only ox sheep and theft since everything would have thus been included if so I might still say that just as the specification mentions an object which is subject to the sanctity of first birth so also any object which is subject to the sanctity of first birth should be included now what can you include through this an ass as subject to double payment but when the text goes on to mention ass we have ass explicitly stated what then do I make of theft to include any object if that is so should scripture not have mentioned only ox ass sheep and theft since everything would have accordingly been included if so I might still say that just as the specification mentions objects possessing life so also any other objects possessing life should be included what can you include through this all other objects possessing life but when the text continues alive we have objects possessing life explicitly stated how then am I to explain theft it must be to include any other object whatsoever the master stated should not scripture have mentioned only ox and theft but does it say ox and then theft is it not first theft and then ox which is written in the text and if you rejoin that the author of this argument took a hypothetical case as if it were written first ox and then theft how in that case would you be able to say just as the specification mentions etc since ox would be the specification and theft the generalization and in the case of a specification followed by a generalization the generalization is considered to add to the specification so that all objects would be included if on the other hand he based his argument on the actual order of the text this theft and then ox how again would you be able to say that everything would have been included or just as the specification mentions etc since theft would be the generalization and ox the specification and in the case of a generalization followed by a specification there is nothing included in the generalization except what is explicit in the specification so that here only ox would be included but no other object whatsoever rather thereupon said this tana based his argument upon the term alive that follows the specification so that he argued on the strength of a generalization followed by a specification which was in its turn followed by another generalization but is the last generalization analogous in implication to the first generalization there is however the tana of the school of Arish male who did expound texts of this kind on the lines of generalizations and specifications the problem was therefore this why do I require the words in the text if to be found it be found should not scripture have mentioned only theft and ox and alive and everything would have then been included if so I might say that just as the specification mentions an object which is eligible to be sacrificed upon the altar so also any object eligible to be sacrificed upon the altar is included what does this enable you to include sheep but when the text continues sheep we have sheep explicitly stated what then am I to make of theft it must be to include any object if that is so should scripture not have mentioned only theft ox sheep and alive since everything would have then been included if so I might still say that just as the specification mentions an object which is subject to the sanctity of first birth so also any object which is subject to the sanctity of first birth should be included what does this enable you to include as but when the text continues as we have as explicitly stated what then am I to make of theft it must be to include any object but in that Case should scripture not have mentioned only theft ox sheep ass and alive since everything would have then been included if so I might still say that just as the specification mentions objects possessing life so also any other object possessing life should be included what does this enable you to include all other objects possessing life but when the text continues alive objects possessing life are explicitly stated what then am I to make of theft it must be to include any other object whatsoever and if so why do I require the words if to be found it be found Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi but if this is so is not this a real difficulty there is however a refutation of it for once would you include any other object from the implication of the last generalization now since this very generalization consists in the term alive of what service then is the argument based upon the generalization followed by a specification which is in its turn followed by another generalization it can hardly be to add any inanimate object since the word alive is used there implying only objects possessing life but not any other object whatsoever it was therefore because of this that it was necessary to state if to be found it be found it may however still be argued does not this text contain two generalizations which are placed near each other Rubina thereupon said we dispose of this difficulty as stated in the west that wherever you find two generalizations near each other place a specification between them and explain them as a case of a generalization followed by a specification here then place ox between the infinitive and the finite verb if to be found it be found now what additional objects would this introduce if objects possessing life are these not to be derived from the term alive it must therefore be an object which does not possess life and we expound thus just as the specification mentions an object which is movable and which has an intrinsic value so also any object which is movable and which has an intrinsic value should be included to be subject to the double payment now when you again place ass between the infinitive and the finite verb if to be found it be found what additional objects could this introduce if an object not possessing life was not this derived from placing ox between the two generalizations it must therefore serve to introduce an object having specification but if so why do I require the word sheep it must therefore be taken as a case of an amplification preceding a diminution followed in its turn by another amplification as indeed taught at the school of Arishmael for it was taught at the school of Arishmael the words in the waters in the waters occurring twice in the text should not be treated as a generalization followed by a specification but as an amplification followed by a diminution followed in its turn by another amplification to add everything what then does it add in this case it adds all objects but if so why do I require all these specifications one to exclude real estate the second to exclude slaves and the third to exclude bills while theft and alive furnish a basis for the view of Rab who said that the value of the principle is to be resuscitated as it was at the time of theft but according to the view that one verse deals with the thief himself and the other with the belief falsely alleging theft so that the liability of a thief himself to pay double payment is thus derived from the text if the thief be found how is the text if to be found it be found etc to be expounded he may employ it for teaching a view expressed by Rabbi Ahila for Rabbi Ahila said what was the reason of Rab who maintained that a defendant admitting an offense for which the penalty is a fine would even where witnesses subsequently appeared still be exempt as it is written if to be found it be found implying that if at the very outset it is found by witnesses then it will be Considered found in the consideration of the judges accepting thus a case where it was a defendant who incriminated himself now again according to the view that both verses deal with the belief falsely advancing a plea of theft in which case the text if to be found it be found is employed to teach that there is double payment in the case of a thief himself whence in scripture do we derive the rule regarding a defendant incriminating himself from the text whom the judges shall condemn. Which implies but not him who condemns himself but according to the view that one verse deals with the thief and the other with the belief falsely advancing a plea of theft and that the text of if to be found it be found is to introduce the law where the defendant incriminates himself how could the text whom the judges shall condemn be expounded he might say to you that text was in the first instance employed to imply that a defendant admitting an offense entailing a fine without witnesses. Subsequently appearing would be exempt whereas the other view that both of the verses deal with a belief falsely advancing a plea of theft holds that a defendant admitting an offense entailing a fine for which witnesses subsequently appear is liable according to the view that one verse deals with a thief and the other with a belief falsely advancing a plea of theft so that the case of a thief is derived from the verse there we have no difficulty with the text if to be found it be found. Which is employed as a basis for the statement of Rabbi Ahila but why do I require all these specifications for the reason taught at the school of Arishmael that any section written in scripture and then repeated is repeated only for the sake of a new point that is added to it but why not say that even the thief himself should be subject to double payment only after having taken
not apply all the more strongly in the case of the thief himself into whose hands the article came unlawfully why then did scripture say he shall pay double in the case of the thief himself unless to imply liability even in the absence of an oath but how could this text if to be found it be found be employed to teach this is it not required for what was taught his hand Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba this gives me the rule only as applying to his hand whence do I learn that it applies to his roof his courtyard and his enclosure it distinctly lays down if to be found it be found i.e. in all places but if so the text should have said either if to be found to be found or if it be found it be found the variation in the text enables us to prove two points from it the above text states Rab said the principle is reckoned as at the time of the theft whereas double payment or fourfold and fivefold payments are reckoned on the basis of the value when the case was brought into court what was the reason of Rab scripture says theft and alive why does scripture say alive in the case of theft to imply that I should resuscitate the principle in accordance with its value at the time of theft said Arshis hey I am inclined to say that it was only when he was half asleep on his bed that Rab could have enunciated such a ruling for it was taught if a thief misappropriated a lean animal and fattened it he has to pay the double payment or fourfold and fivefold payments according to the value. At the time of theft is this not a contradiction to the view of Rab it might however be said that the thief has to pay thus because he can say am I to fatten it and you take it come and here if a thief misappropriated a fat animal and caused it to become lean he has to pay double payment or fourfold and fivefold payments according to the value at the time of theft does this not contradict the ruling enunciated by Rab there also the thief has to pay thus because we argue against him. What is the difference whether you killed it altogether or only half killed it but the ruling enunciated by Rab had reference to fluctuations in price how are we to understand this if we assume that it was originally worth one zoos and subsequently worth four zoos with the statement the principle will be reckoned as at the time of theft not lead us to suppose that Rab differs from Rab for Rab said if a man misappropriated from his fellow a barrel of wine which was then worth one zoos but which became subsequently worth four zoos if he broke it or drank it he has to pay for but if it broke of itself he has to pay one zoos would Rab really differ from this view it may however be said that Rab's rule apply to a case where e.g. it was at the beginning worth four zoos but subsequently worth one zoos in which case the principle will be reckoned as at the time of theft whereas double payment or fourfold and fivefold payments will be reckoned on the basis of the value when it case came into court our hand learned in support of the view of Rab if Abili advanced the plea of theft regarding a deposit and confirmed it by oath but subsequently admitted his perjury and witnesses appeared and testified to the same effect if he confessed before the appearance of the witnesses he has to pay the principal together with a fifth and a trespass offering but if he confessed after the appearance of the witnesses he has to pay double payment together with a trespass offering it. Fifth, however, is replaced by the doubling of the payment. So are Jacob Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba, be the sages. However, say scripture says in its principle and the fifth part thereof, implying that it is only where money is paid as principle that a fifth has to be added, but where the money is not paid as principle, no fifth will be added. Our Simeon Biyohi says no fifth or trespass offering is paid in a case where there is double payment. Now it is said here that the fifth is replaced by the doubling of the payment. This being the view of our Jacob, how are we to understand this? If we say it was at the beginning worth four and subsequently similarly worth four, how could the fifth be replaced by the doubling of the payment when the doubling of the payment amounts to four and the fifth to one? Does it therefore not refer to a case where at the beginning the value was four but subsequently fell to one zoo so that the doubling of the payment is one zoo and the fifth of the payment is also one zoo? Proving thereby that the principle will be reckoned as at the time of theft, whereas double payment or fourfold and fivefold payments will be reckoned on the basis of the value when the case comes into court. Rabba thereupon said it could still be maintained that at the beginning it was worth four, and now it is similarly worth four. For as to the difficulty with respect to the doubling of the payment being four and the fifth of the payment, one zoos it might be said that we are dealing here with a case where e.g. he took an oath and repeated it four times after which he confessed, and as the Torah says, and its fifths, the Torah has thus assigned many fifths to one principle. The master stated the sages, however, say scripture says in its principle and the fifth part thereof, implying that it is only where money is paid as principle that a fifth has to be added, but where the money is not paid as principle, no fifth will be added. The trespass offering will nevertheless have to be brought. Why? This difference if he has not to pay the fifth because it is written in its principle and the fifth part thereof why should he similarly not have to pay the trespass offering seeing it is written in its principle and the fifth part thereof and his trespass offering the rabbis might say to you that by the particle eth occurring before the term denoting his trespass offering scripture separates them and our simian biohe he maintains that by the bob conjunctive placed before the particle eth scripture combines them and the rabbis they may say that if this is so the divine law should have inserted neither the bob nor the eth and our simian biohe he might rejoin that as it was impossible for scripture not to insert eth so as to make a distinction between the chattel due to heaven and money due to ordinary men it was therefore necessary to add the bob so as to combine the verses early said if a thief misappropriates a lamb and it grows into a ram or a calf and it grows into an ox as the article has undergone a change while in his hands he would acquire title to it so that if he slaughters or sells it it is his which he slaughters it is his which he sells our hand and objected to our lay statement from the following teaching if he misappropriates a lamb and it grows into a ram or a calf and it grows into an ox he will have to make double payment or fourfold and fivefold payments reckoned on the basis of the value at the time of theft now if you assume that he acquires title to it by the change why should he pay is it not his which he slaughtered is it not his which he sold he replied what then is your opinion that a change does not transfer ownership why then pay on the basis of the value at the time of theft and not of the present value the other replied he does not pay in accordance with the present value for the reason that he can say to him did i steal an ox from you did i steal a ram from you said the other may the all merciful save me from Accepting this view, the other one retorted, May the all merciful save me from accepting your view. Our Zerah saying, Why should he not indeed acquire title to it through the change in name? Rabbah, however, said to him, An ox one day old is already called ox, and a ram one day old is already called ram. An ox one day old is called ox, as written when an ox or a sheep or a goat is born. A ram one day old is called ram, as written, and the rams of thy flocks have I not eaten. Does he mean that it was only the rams that he did not eat and that he did eat the sheep? Surely not. This shows that a ram one day old is already called ram, but all the same does the objection raised against our still not hold good. Our she's hate thereupon said, The teaching of the Beretha is in accordance with the view of Beth Shammai that a change leaves the article in the previous position and will accordingly not transfer ownership as taught if he gave her the harlot as her hire wheat of which she made flour. Or olives of which she made oil, or grapes of which she made wine. It was taught on one occasion that the produce is forbidden to be sacrificed upon the altar, whereas on another occasion it was taught it is permitted. And our Joseph said, Gorian of Asparach learned Beth Shammai prohibit the produce to be used as sacrifices, whereas Beth Hillel permitted. Now, what was the reason of Beth Shammai? Because it is written gam to include their transformations, but Beth Hillel maintained that the suffix of implies them and not their transformations. And Beth Shammai they maintained that the suffix Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba, indicates them and not their offsprings. And Beth Hillel they replied that you can understand the two points from it them and not their transformations, them and not their offsprings. But as to Beth Hillel, surely it is written gam gam presents a difficulty according to the view of Beth Hillel. Their difference extends only so far that one master maintains that a change transfers and. The other master maintains that a change does not transfer ownership but regarding payment they both agree that the payment is made on the basis of the original value even as it is stated he has to make double payment or fourfold and fivefold payments on the basis of the value at the time of the theft are we to say that this very the con refutes the view of Rab in the statement made by Rab that the principle will be reckoned as at the time of theft whereas double payment or fourfold and five fold payments will be reckoned on the basis of the value when the case comes into court said Rabba where he pays what cheap he pays in accordance with the original value but where he pays with money he pays in accordance with the present value Rabba said that a change transfers ownership is indicated
transferred to the finder. So in this case, the thief similarly acquires title to the article as soon as the owner renounces his claim. It thus seems that the transfer is of scriptural origin, or are we to say that this case is not comparable to that of a lost article? For it is only in the case of a lost article that the law applies, since when it comes into the hands of the finder, it does so lawfully. Whereas in the case of the thief into whose hands it entered unlawfully, the rule therefore might be merely a rabbinic authority, as the rabbis might have said that ownership should be transferred by renunciation in order to make matters easier for repentant robbers. But our Joseph said renunciation does not transfer ownership even by rabbinic ordinance. Our Joseph objected to rabbis view from the following: If a man misappropriated loving food before Passover, when Passover has passed, Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi, he can say to the plaintiff, Here is your stuff before you now as this plaintiff. Surely renounced his ownership when the time for prohibiting love and food arrived. If you assume that renunciation transfers ownership, why should the thief be entitled to say here is your stuff before you when he has a duty upon him to pay the proper value? He replied, I stated the ruling only where the owner renounces ownership at the time when the thief is desirous of acquiring it. Whereas in this case, though the owner renounced ownership, the thief had no desire to acquire it. Abbe objected to. Rabbi's statement from the following the verse says his offering implying but not one which was misappropriated. Now what were the circumstances if we assume before renunciation? Why do I require a text since this is quite obvious? Should we therefore not assume after renunciation which would show that renunciation does not transfer ownership? Said Rabbi to him, according to your reasoning, how are we to explain that which was taught? The verse says his bed implying but not one which was. Misappropriated under what circumstances that for instance wool was misappropriated and made into a bed but is there any accepted view that a change in substance resulting from an act does not transfer ownership what you have to say is that it refers to a case where the robber misappropriated a neighbor's bed so also here it refers to a case where he misappropriated a neighbor's offering of a objected to our Joseph's view from the following in the case of skins belonging to a private owner mere mental determination renders them capable of becoming ritually unclean whereas in the case of those belonging to a tanner no mental determination would render them capable of becoming unclean regarding those in the possession of a thief mental determination will make them capable of becoming unclean whereas those in the possession of a robber no mental determination will render capable of becoming unclean our Simeon says that the rulings are to be reversed regarding those in the Possession of a robber mental determination will render them capable of becoming unclean whereas regarding those in the possession of a thief no mental determination will render them capable of becoming unclean as in the last case the owners do not usually abandon hope of discovering who was the thief does not disprove that renunciation transfers ownership he replied we are dealing here with a case where for example he had already trimmed the stolen skin so that some change in substance was affected rabbi son of Arhan and demur to the saying this was learned here in connection with a dining cover and skins intended to be used as a cover do not require trimming as we have learned wherever there is no need for finishing work to be done mental resolve will render the article capable of becoming unclean whereas where there is still need for finishing work to be done no mental resolve will render it capable of becoming unclean with the exception however of a dining Cover Rabbi therefore said this difficulty was pointed out by Rabbi to our Joseph for 22 years without his obtaining any answer. It was only when our Joseph occupied the seat as head that he explained it by suggesting that a change in name is equivalent in the eye of the law to a change in substance. For just as a change in substance has an effect because for instance what was previously timber is now utensil so also a change in name should have an effect as what was previously called. Skin is now called dining cover but what about a beam where there is similarly a change in name as previously it was called a post and now ceiling and we have nevertheless learned that where a misappropriated beam has been built into a house the owner will recover only its value so as to make matters easier for repentant robbers. The reason is to make matters easier for repentant robbers Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, but if not for this it would have to be restored intact R. Joseph replied the beam retains its name even subsequently as taught the sides of the house these are the casings and the thick planks these are the beams are zero said a change which can revert to its original state is in the case of a change in name not considered a change but is a change in name that cannot revert to its original state considered a change what then about a trough the material of which was originally called the plank but now trough and we have nevertheless been taught that a trough which was first hollowed out and subsequently fixed into a mikwe will disqualify the mikwe but where it was first fixed into the mikwe and subsequently hollowed out it will not disqualify the mikwe but if you maintain that a change in name has a legal effect why then even where he fixed it first and subsequently hollowed it out should it not disqualify the mikwe the law regarding disqualification through drawn water is different altogether as it is only a rabbinic sanction but if so why even in the prior clause should it not also be the same there however the law of a receptacle applied to it while it was still detached whereas here it was never subject to the law of a receptacle while it was detached an objection was raised from the following if a thief or robber or an honest consecrates a misappropriated article it will be consecrated if he sets aside a portion for the priest's gift it will be terrible or again if he sets aside a portion for the Levite's gift the tithe will be valid now does this not prove that renunciation transfers ownership it may be said that in that case there was also a change in name as previously it was called people while now it is called terima so also in the case of consecration previously it was called Helen, but now it is called consecrated our Hista stated that our Jonathan said how do we learn from scripture that a change transfers ownership because it is said he shall restore the misappropriated object what then is the point of the words which he took violently away it must be to imply that if it still is as when he took it violently he shall restore it but if not it is only the value of it that he will have to pay but is this text which he took violently away not needed to exclude the case of robbery committed by a father in which the son need not add a fifth to the payment for robbery committed by his father but if so the divine law should have written only he shall restore the misappropriated object why should it further be written which he took violently away thus we can draw from it the two inferences some report Arhista stated that our Jonathan said how do we learn from scripture that a change does not transfer ownership because it is said he shall restore the misappropriated object i.e. in all cases but is it not written which he took violently away the text is needed to indicate that it is only for robbery committed by himself that he has to add a fifth but has not to add a Fit for robbery committed by his father Ola said how do we learn from scripture that renunciation does not transfer ownership because it is said and yet brought that which was misappropriated and the lame and the sick that which was misappropriated is thus compared to the lame just as the lame has no remedy at all Talmud, Mas Baba Kama be to render it qualified for the altar so also that which was misappropriated has no remedy at all no matter before renunciation or after renunciation. Rabbi said we derive it from the following is offering but not one which was misappropriated when is this if we say before renunciation is this not obvious what then is the point of the verse it must therefore apply to the time after renunciation and it may thus be proved from this that renunciation does not transfer ownership but did not Rabbi himself say that the text referred to a robber misappropriating an offering of his fellow if you wish I may say that he changed his mind on this. Matter or if you wish I may say that one of these statements was made by our Papa the measure of fourfold and fivefold payments does not apply except in the case of an ox or a sheep alone but why not compare the term ox to ox in the case of Sabbath so that just as their beasts and birds are on the same footing with the mighty ox and ass so also your beasts and birds should be on the same footing with the mighty ox and sheep Rabbi said scripture says an ox and a sheep an ox and a sheep twice to indicate that only ox and sheep are subject to this law but not any other object whatsoever I may ask which of these would otherwise be superfluous shall we say that ox and sheep of the concluding clause would be superfluous and the divine law should have written if a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and slaughter it or sell it he should restore five oxen instead of it and four sheep instead of it were the divine law to have thus written would I not have thought that he should pay nine for each of them and should you rejoin that it is written instead of it instead of it twice in the text so that one instead of it would then have been superfluous I might retort that this is required for a further exposition as taught it might be maintained that one who stole an ox worth a mina would be able to restore for it five frail ox in the text says however instead of it instead of it twice ox and sheep of the concluding clause is thus indispensable it thus appears that it is ox and sheep of the
slaughtered one and left the other or sold one and left the other we must say therefore that it is ox of the concluding clause and sheep of the first clause which would have been superfluous as the divine law should have written if a man shall steal an ox and slaughter it or sell it he shall restore five oxen instead of it and four sheep instead of the sheep why then do I require ox of the concluding clause and sheep of the first clause to prove from it that only ox and sheep are subject to this law but not any other object whatsoever one who steals from a thief what he has already stolen need not make double payment etc. Rap said this Mishnah ruling applies only where the theft took place before renunciation for if after renunciation the first thief would have acquired title to the article and the second thief would have had to make double payment to the first thief said Arshis hey I am inclined to say that it was only when he was half asleep and in bed that Rab could have enunciated this ruling for it was taught Arakiba said why has the Torah laid down that where the thief slaughtered or sold the sheep or ox he would have to make fourfold and fivefold payments respectively because he became thereby rooted in sin now when could this be said of him if before renunciation Talmud Mas Baba Kama could he then be called rooted in sin since the sale is of no validity it must therefore be after renunciation but if you assume that renunciation transfers Ownership why should he make fourfold and fivefold payments when it is his that he slaughters and is that he sells it may however be said as Rabbah stated elsewhere that it means because he doubled his sin so likewise here it means because he doubled his sin come and here he slaughtered it and sold it just as the slaughter cannot be undone so the sale cannot be undone now when could this be so if before renunciation why can it not be undone it must surely therefore be after renunciation but if you assume that renunciation transfers ownership why should he pay fourfold and fivefold when it is his that he slaughters and is that he sells as our nomin stated elsewhere that it means to accept a case where he transferred the animal for thirty days so also here it means to accept a case where he transferred the beast for thirty days an objection was raised against this if a man steals an article and another comes and steals it from him the first thief has to make double payment Whereas the second will not pay anything but the principal alone if however one stole a sheep or an ox and sold it after which another one came and stole it the first thief has to make fourfold and fivefold payments respectively while the second has to make double payment if one stole a sheep or an ox and slaughtered it and another one came and stole it the first thief will make fourfold and fivefold payments respectively whereas the second has not to make double payment but to repay the principal only now it has been taught in the middle clause if however one stole a sheep or an ox and sold it after which another came and stole it the first thief has to make fourfold and fivefold payments respectively while the second has to make double payment but when could this be if before renunciation why should the second make double payment is there any authority who maintains that a change in possession without renunciation transfers ownership it must therefore be after Renunciation, but if you assume that renunciation transfers ownership, why then has he to make fourfold and fivefold payments, seeing that it is his which he sold? And further, it was taught in the opening clause: if a man steals an article and another comes and steals it from him, the first thief has to make double payment, but the second will not pay anything. But the principal, now since it is the time after renunciation with which we are dealing, if you assume that renunciation transfers ownership, why should the second not pay anything? But the principal does not this show that renunciation does not transfer ownership. In contradiction to the view of Rab Rabbah said, do you really think that the text of this teaching is correct? For was it not taught in the concluding clause: if one stole a sheep or an ox and slaughtered it, and another came and stole it, the first thief will make fourfold and fivefold payments respectively, whereas the second has to pay nothing. But the principal now is. There any authority who maintains that a change in substance does not transfer ownership it must therefore surely still be said that the whole teaching refers to the time before renunciation but we have to transpose the ruling of the concluding clause to the case in the middle clause and the ruling of the middle clause to the case in the concluding clause and read thus if one stole a sheep or an ox and sold it and another came and stole it the first thief has to make fourfold and fivefold payments respectively but the second has not to pay anything but the principal as a change in possession without renunciation transfers no ownership if however one stole a sheep or an ox and slaughtered it and another came and stole it the first thief makes fourfold and fivefold payments respectively and the second makes double payment as ownership was transferred to the first thief by the change in substance our papa however said all the same you need not transpose the ruling since we may say that the concluding clause is in accordance with Beth Shammai who maintain that a change leaves the article in its previous status but if so that it was after renunciation will not the opening clause and middle clause be in contradiction to the view of Rabbi Arzi but therefore said the whole text could still refer to the time before renunciation as we are dealing here with a case where the owner abandoned hope of regaining the stolen object when it was already in the possession of the buyer but had not abandoned it while it was still in the possession of the thief so that so far as the buyer was concerned there was renunciation as well as a change in possession you should however not think that this is so because we need both renunciation and a change in possession for the purpose of transferring ownership as even renunciation alone would also transfer ownership to the thief it is however impossible to find a case in which both the first thief and the second thief should simultaneously pay except in this way it was stated if the thief sells before renunciation Arnaman said that he is liable while Arshis hate said that he is exempt Arnaman who said that he would be liable held that since the divine law says and he sold it and as the thief in this case did sell it it makes no difference whether it was before renunciation or after renunciation while Arshis hate who said that he would be exempt held that the liability was only where he sold it after renunciation where the act has a legal validity whereas before renunciation when the act has no legal validity there could be no liability as selling is compared to slaughter where it is necessary that the act should be a practical avail Arshis hate said once have I inferred the view expressed by me it was taught our Akiva said why does the Torah say that where the thief slaughtered and sold the stolen sheep or ox he should make fourfold and fivefold payments respectively because he became Thereby rooted in sin now when could this be said of him if before renunciation could he then be called rooted in sin since the sale is of no legal validity must it therefore not be after renunciation Rabbah said it only means because he doubled his sin come in here and he slaughtered it or sold it just as slaughter cannot be undone so the sale must be one which cannot be undone now when could this be so if before renunciation why can it not be undone must it therefore not be after renunciation thus proving that the liability is only if it is sold after renunciation but Arnaman interpreted it merely to accept the case where he transferred the animal for 30 days also our Eliezer maintained that the liability would be only after renunciation as our Eliezer stated Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba you can take it for granted that in the ordinary run of thefts there is renunciation on the part of the owner since the Torah has laid down that where the thief slaughtered or sold it. Stolen sheep or ox he should pay fourfold or fivefold payments respectively for is there not a possibility that the owner had not abandoned hope we must therefore say that in the ordinary run of thefts there is renunciation on the part of the owner but why should the liability not hold good even where hope was not abandoned I would say let not this enter your mind for selling is placed on a PAR with slaughter just as in the case of slaughter his act is a practical avail so also in the case of selling his act should be a practical validity and if it takes place before renunciation what would be the legal validity but again can it not be that the liability is confined to cases where we actually heard the owner abandoning hope I would reply let not this enter your mind for selling is put on a PAR with slaughter and just as slaughter involves liability if carried out immediately after the theft so would selling similarly involve liability soon after the theft are Yohanan said to him the law in the case of stealing a man could prove that even where there is no renunciation on the part of the owner there will be liability the statement seems to show that our Yohanan held that selling before renunciation involves liability what then about selling after renunciation our Yohanan said that the thief is liable but Resh Lakish said he is exempt our Yohanan who said that he would be liable held that the liability was both before renunciation and after renunciation but Resh Lakish who said that he would be exempt maintained that the liability was only before renunciation whereas after renunciation he would have already acquired title to the animal and it was his that he slaughtered and his that he sold our Yohanan objected to Resh Lakish's view from the following if he stole a sheep or an ox and after consecrating it slaughtered it he should make double payment but would not make fourfold and fivefold payments now when could this be if before renunciation how does the animal become consecrated does not the divine law say and when a man shall sanctify
Neither of them is able to consecrate it the one because it is not his the other because it is not in his possession we might reply that he had in mind the practice of the virtuous as we have learned the virtuous used to set aside money and to declare that whatever has been gleaned by passers by from this vineyard shall be redeemed by this money but if the owner consecrated the animal has not the principle thus been restored to the owner why then should a thief pay double on it we assume a case where the consecration took place after the case came into court and evidence had already been given against the thief what were the circumstances if the judges had already ordered him to go and pay the owner why should exemption be only where he consecrated the animal why even where the owner did not consecrate it should the thief be liable for did Robin not say that if after the judges said go forth and pay him the thief slaughtered or sold the animal he would be exempted Reason being that since the judges had given their final sentence on the matter when he sold or slaughtered the animal he became in the eye of the law robber and a robber has not to pay fourfold and fivefold payments Talmud, Mas Baba Kama but if they merely said to him you are liable to pay him and after that he slaughtered or sold the animal he would be liable to pay fourfold or fivefold payment the reason being that since they have not pronounced final sentence upon the matter he is still a thief no its application is necessary where they have as yet merely said to him you are liable to pay him the above text states are Yohanan said if a robber misappropriated an article and the owner has not abandoned hope of recovering it neither of them is able to consecrate it the one because it is not his the other because it is not in his possession could are Yohanan really have said this did not are Yohanan say that the Halajah is in accordance with an anonymous mission and we have Learned in the case of a vineyard in its fourth year the owners used to mark it with clods of earth the sign implying an analogy to earth just as in the case of earth a benefit may ensue from it so also the fruit of this vineyard will after being redeemed be permitted to be enjoyed that of orla used to be marked with pots herds a sign indicating a similarity with pots herds just as in the case of pots herds no benefit ensues from them so also the fruit of orla could not be enjoyed for any use. Whatever a field of graves used to be marked with lime the sign having the color of white like corpses the lime was dissolved in water and then poured out so as to make its color more white Arsimian B. Gamaliel said these practices were recommended only for the sabbatical year when the fruits on the trees were ownerless for in the case of the other years of the septenate you may let the wicked stuff themselves with it till they die the virtuous however used to set aside money and to declare. That whatever has been gleaned from this vineyard shall be redeemed by this money does not this contradict our Yohanan nor can you urge in reply that the Tana who recorded the practice of the virtuous was Arsimian B. Gamaliel and our Yohanan might therefore not have concurred with this anonymous view stated by a single Tana for did not Rabbi Barhana say that our Yohanan stated that whenever Arsimian expressed a view and a mission of the Halachah is in accordance with him with the exception of his view regarding surety ship Sidon and the last case dealing with evidence I may reply that you should not read whatever has been gleaned but read whatever will be gleaned from this vineyard but could our Yohanan have said this did not our Yohanan say that the virtuous and Ardosa said the same thing and as we know Ardosa definitely stated whatever has been gleaned for was it not taught Arjuna says in the morning the owner of the field should get up and say whatever the poor shall glean. During the day should be considered ownerless from the present moment whereas Ardosa says it is at evening tide that he should say whatever the poor have gleaned shall be ownerless I must transpose the view of Arjuta to Ardosa and the view of Ardosa to Arjuta but why transpose this teaching and not transpose instead the statement of our Yohanan assigning to the virtuous and to Arjuta the same thing it may however be said that it was impossible not to transpose this teaching since in this teaching it is stated that Arjuta upholds Barara and we find Arjuta holding in other places that there is not Barara as we have learned Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B if a man buys wine from among the Kutians and it was late on Friday towards sunset and he has no other wine for the Sabbath may say two logs out of a hundred which I intend to set aside are Teramatan are the first tithe and nine the second tithe and these he may redeem upon money anywhere in his possession and he may Commence drinking at once so our mayor but Arjuta our Jose and our Simon prohibit this to this I may rejoin when all is said and done why have you transposed the views mentioned in the Beritha because Arjuta would otherwise contradict Arjuta but would not now our Yohanan contradict our Yohanan for you stated according to our Yohanan that we should not read whatever has been gleaned but read whatever will be gleaned thus proving that he upholds Barara whereas in fact our Yohanan does not uphold Barara. For did not RC say that our Yohanan stated that brothers dividing an inheritance are like purchasers in the eye of the law so that they will have to restore the portions to one another on the advent of the Jubilee year we must therefore still read whatever has been gleaned and say that our Yohanan found another anonymous mission as we have indeed learned one who steals articles already stolen in the hands of a thief need not make double payment why should this be we grant you that he need. Not pay the first thief since scripture says and it be stolen out of the man's house implying but not out of the house of the thief but why not pay the owner we must say that this shows that the one is not entitled to payment because the stolen article is not his and the other one is not entitled to payment as the article is not in his possession but what induced him to follow that anonymous mission why should he not act in accordance with the anonymous mission dealing with the virtuous. Because he was supported by the verse and when the man shall sanctify his house to be holy unto the Lord just as his house is in his possession so anything also which is in his possession can be sanctified Abay said if Aryohanan had not stated that the virtuous and Ardosa said the same thing I might have said that while the virtuous accepted the view of Ardosa Ardosa did not uphold the practice of the virtuous the virtuous accepted the view of Ardosa for if the rabbis made things easier for a Thief need we say they did so for the poor but Ardosa did not uphold the practice of the virtuous for it was only for the poor that the rabbis made things easier whereas for the thief they did not make things easier Rabbis said had Aryohanan not stated that the virtuous and Ardosa said the same thing I should have said that the tana followed by the virtuous was Armeir for did not Armeir say that the second tithe is divine property and even so the divine law placed it in the owner's possession. In respect of redemption as written and if a man will redeem out of his tithe he shall add unto it the fifth part thereof the divine law thus designating it his tithe and ordering him to add a fifth the same applies to the vineyard in the fourth year as can be derived from the occurrence of the term holy there and in the case of the tithe for it is written here shall be holy to praise and it is written in the case of tithe and all tithe of the land whether of seed of the land or of the fruit. Of the tree it is holy just as the holy mentioned in connection with tithe although it is divine property has nevertheless been placed by the divine law in the possession of the owner for the purpose of redemption so also the holy mentioned in connection with the vineyard of the fourth year although the property is not his own has been placed by the divine law in his possession for the purpose of redemption now seeing that even when it is in his possession it is not his and yet he may redeem it. Hence he may be able to redeem it also when out of his possession but in the case of the gleaning of ears of corn which is his own property it is only when it is still in his own possession that he is able to declare it ownerless whereas when not in his possession he should not be entitled to declare it ownerless Rabbin said had Aryohanan not stated that the virtuous and Ardosa said the same thing I should have said that the Tana stating the case of the virtuous was Ardosa so that this Anonymous Mishnah would not refute the view of Aryohanan for Aryohanan Talmud, Mas Baba Kama would have been right in not concurring with an anonymous statement of a single Tana the Nihartian said we do not execute an assignment on movables which are outside the possession of the party said Arashi to Amimar on what ground he replied because of the view of Aryohanan for Aryohanan said if a robber has misappropriated an article and the owner has not abandoned hope of recovering it. Neither of them is able to consecrate it the one because it is not his the other because it is not in his possession some read that the Nihartian said we do not execute an assignment on movables the claim upon which was denied by Abeli the reason is that the claim was denied as the deed of assignment would then appear a lie whereas where it is not denied we would be able to execute the Nihartian's further said an assignment which does not contain the words go forth and take legal action. So that you may acquire title to it and secure the claim for yourself is of no validity the reason being that the defendant might say to him you have no claim against me but Abay said if it is written you will be entitled to a half or a third or a fourth of the claim it would be valid for since he is entitled to litigate regarding the
purposes were to give to dogs or if he slaughters and finds the animal trephot or if he slaughters it as unconsecrated in the Ezra he has to make fourfold or fivefold payment our Simeon however rules that there is exemption in these last two cases Gemara are we to say that the Mishnah is not in accordance with our Akiva for how could it be in accordance with our Akiva who said that the scriptural term matter implies not half a matter as indeed taught our Jose said when my father he left went to our Yohanan Binuri to learn Torah or as others when our Yohanan Binuri went to my father Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba he he said to him suppose a man had the use of a piece of land for one year as testified by two witnesses for a second year as testified by two other witnesses and for a third year as testified by still two other witnesses what is the position he replied this is a proper use of caption whereupon the other rejoined I also say the same but our Akiva joins issue on the matter for our Akiva. Used to say scripture states a matter implying but not half a matter Abbe however said you may even say that this is in accordance with our Akiva for would our Akiva not agree in a case where two witnesses state that a certain person had betrothed a woman and two other witnesses testify that another person had subsequently had intercourse with her that though the evidence regarding the intercourse presupposes the evidence regarding the betrothal in order to become relevant nevertheless. Since the evidence of betrothal does not presuppose the evidence of intercourse each testimony should be considered a matter complete in itself so also here though the evidence regarding the slaughter presupposes the evidence regarding the theft if it is to be relevant nevertheless since the evidence regarding the theft does not presuppose the evidence regarding the slaughter each testimony should be considered a matter complete in itself but according to the rabbis what will this term? Matter implying but not half a matter excluded will exclude a case where one witness testified that there was one hair on her back and the other states that there was one hair in front but since each hair is testified to by one witness would this not be both half a matter and half a testimony we must say therefore that it excludes a case where two witnesses testify that there was one hair on her back and two other witnesses state that there was one hair in front as in this case the one said testify that she was still a minor and the other similarly testify that she was still a minor if he steals and sells on the Sabbath day he has to make fourfold or fivefold payment but has it not been taught elsewhere that he would be exempt said Rami Biham if it was taught there that he would be exempt it was only where the purchaser said to him pluck figs off my fig tree and transfer to me in consideration of them the objects you have stolen it may however be argued that Seeing that if the purchaser claimed from him before us in the court we would be unable to order him to go and to pay since at the time of the alleged liability he became subject to a capital charge why should not even the sale itself be declared no sale at all our papa therefore said there would be exemption where the purchaser said to him throw your stolen objects from a public thoroughfare into my private courtyard and transfer to me thereby the objects you have stolen whom does this? Follow our Akiva who said that an object intercepted in the air is on the same footing regarding the law of Sabbath as if it had already come to rest for if we were to follow the other rabbis while the possession of the stolen objects would be transferred as soon as they reached the air of the courtyard of the purchaser's house in regard to Sabbath the capital liability would not be incurred until they have reached the actual ground Rabbi thereupon said it may still be in accordance with Rami. Behemoth for the hire of a harlot was prohibited by the Torah from being used for the temple even when given by a son for having incestuous intercourse with his mother irrespective of the fact that were she to have claimed it from him before us in the court we should not have been able to order him to go and give her the hire we see then that although were she to have claimed it from him by law we should have been unable to order him to go and pay her nevertheless when he of his own accord pays her the hire it will be subject to the law of the hire of a harlot so also here regarding payment for the fixed plot by the thief on the Sabbath if the purchaser had claimed it by law in our presence we should have been unable to order the thief to go and pay Talmud, Mas Baba Kama nevertheless since the thief was prepared to transfer the possession of the stolen objects to him by this procedure it should be considered a sale if he steals and slaughters on the day of atonement. Etc. I would ask why should this be so it is true that no capital punishment is attached here but there will at least be the punishment of lashes and is it not an established ruling that no man who is lashed can be ordered to pay it may however be said that the mission is in accordance with our mayor who said that a person who is lashed may also be ordered to pay but if in accordance with our mayor why should there be no liability even for slaughtering on the Sabbath and should you affirm that while he holds that one may be lashed and be ordered to pay he does not hold that one may be condemned to death and also ordered to pay I would ask does he really not maintain the second ruling was it not taught if he steals and slaughters on the Sabbath or if he steals and slaughters to serve idols or if he steals an ox condemned to be stoned and slaughters it he has to make fourfold or fivefold payment according to our mayor but the rabbis rule that there is exemption I might reply that this ruling applies to all cases save this for it was stated with reference to it that our Jacob stated that our Yohanan said or as others say that our Jeremiah stated on behalf of our Simeon Belagish that our Ali and the whole company said in the name of our Yohanan that the slaughter in that case was carried out by another person acting on behalf of the thief but how could the one commit an offense and the other be liable to a fine robber reply this offense here is different as scripture says and slaughter it or sell it just as selling becomes complete through the medium of another person so also slaughter may be affected by another person the school of our Ishmael taught the term or inserted between slaughter and selling was meant to include the case of an agent the school of Hezekiah taught the term instead was intended to include the case of an agent Marzich redeemer to this is there he said any action for which a man is not liable if done by himself but for which he is Liable if done by his agent Arashi said to him in that case it was not because he should not be subject to liability but because he ought to be subject to a penalty severer than that but if the slaughter was carried out by another one what is the reason of the rabbis who ruled that there was exemption we might say that the sages referred to were our Simeon who stated that a slaughter through which the animal would not ritually become fit for food could not be called slaughter in the eyes of the law but I would say I grant you this in regard to serving idols and an ox condemned to be stoned as through the slaughter the animal will in these cases not become fit for food but in the case of the Sabbath does not the slaughter render the animal fit for food for did we not learn that if a man slaughters on the Sabbath or on the day of atonement though he is liable for a capital offense his slaughter is ritually valid it may however be said that he concurred with our Yohan and Hasandler. As we have learned if a man cooks a dish on the Sabbath if inadvertently even he himself may partake of it but if deliberately he should not partake of it on that day so our mayor Arjuna says if inadvertently he may eat it only after the expiration of the Sabbath whereas if deliberately he should never partake of it or Yohanan Hasandler says if inadvertently the dish may be partaken of after the expiration of the Sabbath only by other people but not by himself whereas if deliberately it should never be partaken of either by him or by others what was the reason of our Yohanan Hasandler our high expounded at the entrance of the house of the prince scripture says ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore for it is holy unto you just as holy food is forbidden to be eaten so also what is unlawfully prepared on the Sabbath is forbidden to be partaken of but you might argue just as holy food is forbidden for any use so should whatever is unlawfully prepared on the Sabbath also be Forbidden for any use it is therefore stated further unto you implying that it still remains yours for general use it might moreover be thought that the prohibition extends even where prepared inadvertently it is therefore stated everyone that profaneth it shall surely be put to death as much as to say I speak only of the case when it is done deliberately but not when done inadvertently our aha and our differ in this matter one said that whatever is unlawfully prepared on the Sabbath is forbidden on scriptural authority whereas the other rabbi said that whatever is unlawfully prepared on the Sabbath is forbidden on rabbinic authority he who said that it was on scriptural authority bases his view on the exposition just stated whereas he who said that it was on rabbinic authority holds that when scripture says it is holy it means that it itself is holy but that which is unlawfully prepared on it is not holy now I grant you that according to the view that the prohibition is based on scriptural authority the rabbis because Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B of this have rightly ruled that there is exemption but according to the view that it is based on rabbinic authority why did the rabbis rule that there is exemption their exemption applies to the other cases to serving idols and an ox condemned to be stoned but why does our mayor imp
Verdict was issued the Billy restored it to the owner it would be a legal restoration and on another point he concurred with Arsimian who stated that an object the absence of which entails money loss is regarded as possessing an intrinsic value as we have learned Arsimian says in the case of consecrated animals for the loss of which the owner is liable to replace them by others the thief has to pay thus proving that an object whose absence entails money loss is regarded as possessing an intrinsic value Arkahana said when I reported this discussion in the presence of Arzib of Nihardi I asked how could you explain our mission to be only in accordance with Armeyer but not in accordance with Arsimian since it is stated in the concluding clause Arsimian however rules that there is exemption in the last two cases thus implying that in the other cases of the whole mission he agrees he however said to me no it merely implies that he agrees in the case of slaughtering or selling to use the meat for curative purposes or to give to dogs if he steals from his own father and after he had slaughtered or sold his father died etc. Rabba inquired of Arnaman if he steals an ox of two partners and after slaughtering it he confesses to one of them what would be the law shall we say that the divine law says five oxen implying but not five halves of oxen or do the five oxen mentioned by the divine law include also five halves of oxen he replied the divine law says five oxen implying but not five halves of oxen he however raised an objection against him from the following if he steals from his father and after he had slaughtered or sold his father died he has to make fourfold or fivefold payment seeing that the father died is not this case here on the par with a case where he went and confessed to one of the partners and it is yet stated that he has to make fourfold or fivefold payment he replied here we are dealing with a case where for instance his father has already appeared in the court before he died had he not appeared in court the son would not have had to make fourfold or fivefold payment if so instead of having the subsequent clause where he steals of his father who subsequently died and afterwards he slaughters or sells he has not to pay fourfold and fivefold payments why should not the mission make the distinction in the same case itself by stating this ruling applies only where the father appeared in court whereas if he did not manage to appear in court the thief would not have to make fourfold and fivefold payments he replied this is indeed so but since the opening clause runs if he steals from his father and after he had slaughtered or sold his father died the later clause also has the wording where he steals from his father and after his father died he slaughters or sells in the morning however he said to him when the divine law said five oxen it also meant even five halves of oxen and the reason why I did not Say this to you on the previous evening Talmud, Mas Babakama was because I had not yet partaken of a dish of beef and fell too feeble to arrive at a carefully thought out conclusion but why then this difference between the earlier clause and the later clause he replied in the earlier clause we can rightly apply to the offense the words and he slaughters it in the sense that the whole act is unlawful whereas in the concluding clause we cannot apply to the offense the words and he slaughters it in the sense that the whole act is unlawful if he slaughters and finds the animal trefa or where he slaughters it is unconsecrated in the Ezra he has to make fourfold or fivefold payment our Habibi of Huzna said to our Ashi this shows that from the legal point of view the term slaughter applies to the act only at its completion for if it applied to the whole process from the beginning to the end would he not as soon as he started the act of slaughtering in the slightest Degree render the animal ritually forbidden for any use so that what follows the beginning would amount to slaughtering an animal no more belonging to the owner Arhuna the son of Rabba said to him the liability might have been just for that commencement in the slightest degree Arashi however said to him this is no refutation since it says and he slaughters it we require the whole act of the slaughter which is absent here but what about the original difficulty he thereupon said to him Argamba stated thus in the name of Rabba we are dealing here with a case where for instance he cut a part of the organs of the animal outside of the Ezra but completed the slaughter inside of the Ezra some attached this argument to the following statement Arsimian said in the name of Arli by the elder the term slaughter applies to the act only at its very completion Ar Yohanan however said it applies to the whole process from the beginning to the end Ar Habibi of Huzna thereupon said to Arashi are we to say that our Yohanan held that the prohibition of slaughtering unconsecrated animals in the Ezra is not based on scripture Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi for if you assume that it has scriptural authority then as soon as he starts the act of slaughtering in the slightest degree would he not render the animal ritually forbidden for any use so that what follows the beginning would amount to slaughtering an animal no more belonging to the owner Araha the son of Rabba said to him the liability might be just for that commencement in the slightest degree Arashi however said to him this is no refutation since it says and he slaughters it we require the whole act of the slaughter which is absent here but what about the original difficulty he thereupon said to him that our Gamda stated thus in the name of Rabba when does he become liable when for instance he cuts a part of the organs of the animal outside of the Ezra but completes the slaughter inside of the Ezra Mishnah of the thief, Convicted of the theft of an ox on the evidence of two witnesses and of the slaughter or sale of it on the evidence of the same two and these witnesses are subsequently proved so memem they must pay the accused in full if however the theft has been established by the evidence of one pair of witnesses and the slaughter or sale by that of another pair and both pairs are proved so memem the first pair makes the accused double payment and the second pair threefold payment where only the second pair were proved so memem the thief makes double payment whereas they pay him threefold should one of the second pair of witnesses be proved so memem the testimony of the second pair becomes null and void should one of the first pair of witnesses be proved so memem the whole testimony of both pairs becomes null and void for if there was no theft there could be no illegal slaughter or sale tomorrow it has been stated if a witness has been proved as memem says that he becomes Disqualified retrospectively from the time when he gave his evidence in court, whereas Rabba says that he is disqualified only for the future from the time when he is proved. So Memebe makes a disqualification retrospective on the ground that the witness has been shown to have been wicked at the time when he gave evidence, and the Torah says, Do not accept the wicked as a witness. Rabba, on the other hand, holds that the disqualification begins only from the moment when his deceit is proved. Because the whole procedure of proving witnesses, so Memebe is anomalous, for this is a case of two witnesses against two. Why then accept the evidence of the one pair rather than that of the other? At least let it take effect only from the time when the anomalous procedure is employed. Some say that Rabba really agrees with Ebe that the disqualification is retrospective, but rejects here this principle on practical grounds because its adoption Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, might adversely affect. Purchasers, what practical difference is there between the two versions where two witnesses have proved one of the peers of mem and other two witnesses have proved the other one of the peers of mem or again where the disqualification of the witnesses is based upon an accusation of larceny brought by a subsequent peer according to the version which makes Rabba base his view on the fact of the procedure being anomalous he would not apply it here whereas according to the version which makes his reason. The fear of adversely affecting purchasers it would hold good even here our Jeremiah of 50 said our Papa decided in an actual case in accordance with the view of Rabba Arashi however stated that the law agrees with Abe and the law agrees with Abe against Rabba on the matters known as YLKG and we have learned if a thief is convicted of the theft of an ox on the evidence of two witnesses and of the slaughter or sale of it on the evidence of the same two and these witnesses are subsequently Proved Zomemem they must pay the accused in full does this not mean that they first gave evidence regarding the theft and then gave evidence again regarding the slaughter and that they were proved Zomemem regarding their evidence about the theft and then were proved Zomemem regarding their evidence about the slaughter now if you assume that a witness proved Zomemem becomes disqualified retrospectively it would surely follow that as soon as these witnesses were declared Zomemem regarding the theft it became clear retrospectively that when they gave evidence regarding the slaughter they were already disqualified why then should they pay the retaliation penalty regarding their evidence about the slaughter it may be said that we are dealing here with a case where they were first declared Zomemem regarding their evidence about the slaughter but it may still be argued that after all since when they were subsequently declared Zomemem regarding the theft it became clear retrospectively that when they gave evidence regarding the slaughter they had already been disqualified why then should they pay the retaliation penalty for the slaughter this law would apply only when they testified at one and the same time to both theft and slaughter and were afterwards declared so memem may we say that this matter formed the point at issue between the following tanaim if two witnesses gave evidence against the person that he had stolen an ox and the same
Subsequently declared Zomemim with reference to their evidence about the slaughter, the law would be that a testimony becoming annulled regarding a part of it becomes annulled regarding the whole of it, and the witnesses would thus be considered Zomemim also regarding the theft on what could such of you be based? Why indeed should the testimony given first about the theft be annulled through the annulment of a testimony given later? Must we not therefore say that two testimonies means one? Evidence resembling two testimonies, that is to say, where one set gives two testimonies one after the other, but not where there is one testimony in which all the statements are made at the same time. Now it was assumed that there was agreement on all hands that statements following one another within the minimum of time sufficient for the utterance of a greeting are equivalent in law to a single undivided statement. The point at issue therefore between them would be as follows: the rabbis would maintain that a witness proved Zomem is disqualified only for the future, and since it is from that time onwards that the effect of Zomem will apply, it is only with reference to the slaughter regarding which they were declared Zomem that the effect of Zomem will apply, whereas with reference to the theft regarding which they were not declared Zomem, the effect of Zomem will not apply. Our Jose would, on the other hand, maintain that a witness proved Zomem would become disqualified retrospectively. So that from the very moment they had given the evidence regarding which they were proved Zomem, they would be considered disqualified from which it would follow that when they were declared Zomem regarding the evidence about the slaughter, the effect of Zomem should also be extended to the evidence regarding the theft for statements following one another within the minimum of time sufficient for the utterance of a greeting are equivalent in law to a single undivided statement would be. View of Abbe thus be against that of the rabbis to this I might reply were statements following one another within the minimum of time sufficient for the utterance of a greeting equivalent in law to a single undivided statement it would have been unanimously held by these ten aim that the peer proved Zomem should become disqualified retrospectively but here it is this very principle whether statements following one another within the minimum of time sufficient for the utterance of a Greeting should or should not be equivalent in law to a single undivided statement that was the point at issue between them. The rabbis maintained that statements following one another within the minimum of time sufficient for the utterance of a greeting Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B are not equivalent in law to a single undivided statement, whereas our Jose maintained that statements following one another within the minimum of time sufficient for the utterance of a greeting are equivalent in law to a single undivided statement. But did our Jose really maintain that statements following one another within the minimum of time sufficient for the utterance of a greeting are equivalent in law to a single undivided statement? For we have learned if a man declares let this animal be a substitute for a burnt offering, a substitute for a peace offering, it will be a substitute for the burnt offering according to the view of our Mayor, whereas our Jose says it from the outset he intended this his words. Would have to be acted upon as it was impossible for him to utter two terms at the same time. But if he first declared substitute for a burnt offering and then changed his mind and said substitute for a peace offering, it will be a substitute for a burnt offering. Only now the statement we found strange for is not the case of a change of mind. Obvious and our Papa therefore said we assume that the change of mind took place within the minimum of time required for the utterance of a greeting. Does this not prove that our Jose maintained that statements following one another within the minimum of time sufficient for the utterance of a greeting would not be equivalent in law to a single undivided statement? It may be said that there are two different minimums of time within which two different kinds of greetings could be uttered. One sufficient for the greeting given by a disciple to his master and the other sufficient for the greeting of the master to the disciple. Where our Jose does not. Hold the two statements to be one is where the interval is sufficient for the greeting of a disciple to the master of his peace upon the master and teacher as this is too long but where it is only sufficient for the greeting of the master to the disciple peace upon the he holds that they do form one rabbi stated witnesses testifying to a capital charge who have been proved wrong by a pair of other witnesses and subsequently also proved Zomemim would be put to death as a confutation was a first step in the subsequent proof of an alibi though the proof of this was not yet complete at that time rabbi said the authority on which I base this is that which has been taught if a set of witnesses declare we testify that so and so has put out the eye of his slave and knocked out his tooth and so indeed the master himself says and these witnesses are by subsequent witnesses proved Zomemim they would have to pay the value of the eye to the slave how are we to Understand this if we assume according to the apparent meaning of the text that there was here no other pair of witnesses why should they pay the value of the eye to the slave after they have done their best to get him on deserved lafrit are they also to pay him the value of his eye moreover should they in such a case not have to pay the owner for the full value of the slave as they falsely demanded his freedom furthermore and so indeed the master himself says how could the master be satisfied with such a false allegation to his detriment does it therefore not mean a case e.g. in which a pair of witnesses had already appeared previously and stated that the master knocked out the slave's tooth and then put out his eye so that the master would have to pay him the value of his eye and a middle pair of witnesses appeared later and stated that the first put out the slave's eye and then his tooth so that he would not have to give him anything but the value of his tooth so that the first set of witnesses CO and the middle set and it is to this that the words refer and so indeed the master himself says for he was well satisfied with the statement alleged by the middle set the text then goes on and these are by subsequent witnesses proved Zomemim that is the middle set they would have to pay the value of the eye to the slave does not this show that the confutation is the first step in a subsequent proof of an alibi of a said no what we can assume is that the statement of these witnesses was transposed by a second set of witnesses who also proved them Zomemim that this was so is evident Talmud, Mas Baba Kama Talmud, Mas Baba Kama since the later clause deals with witnesses whose statements were transposed by the same set of witnesses that proved them Zomemim so also the earlier clause deals with the case where the statements of the witnesses were transposed by the same subsequent set of witnesses who proved their alibi for it says in the later. Clause if a set of witnesses declare we testify against so and so that he had first knocked out his slave's tooth and then put out his eye as indeed the servant says and they were by subsequent witnesses proved so memem they would have to pay the value of the eye to the master now how are we to understand this if we assume that the witnesses of the second set did not agree with those of the first set regarding any injury at all why then should the first witnesses not have to pay the master? The whole value of the slave does it therefore not mean that all the witnesses agreed that an injury was inflicted but that the witnesses of the second set reversed the order stated by the first set of witnesses while they also proved them so memem but still what were the circumstances if the witnesses of the second set postdated the injury why should the witnesses of the first set still not have to pay the master the whole value of the slave since they falsely alleged liability to have rested? Upon a man at the time when that man was in fact not yet subject to any liability we must therefore say that the witnesses of the second set antedated the injury but again if at the time when the witnesses of the first set gave evidence the master had not yet appeared before the court on the matter why should they still not have to pay him the whole value of the slave as at that time he was still a man subject to no liability it must therefore deal with the case where he had already made his appearance before the court Araha the son of Rika said to Arashi once could Rabba prove this point it could hardly be from the earlier clause for were the witnesses of the middle set those who were CONFU for indeed were they not proved so memem their statements would have remained the decisive evidence as the case would have been decided according to their allegations on the principle that in the total of 200 the sum of 100 is included does it not then clearly follow that it was the first set of witnesses who were the CONFU, whereas the middle set of witnesses were not CONFU at all. He replied, Rabbo maintained that as the earlier clause dealt with three sets of witnesses giving evidence, the later clause similarly presented the law in the case where three sets gave evidence and tried thus to prove his point from the later clause for this clause would thus have dealt with the case where e.g. a set of two witnesses had appeared and alleged that the master first knocked out his slave's tooth and then put out his eye and after the verdict was given in accordance with their testimony a set of other witnesses arrived and stated that the first put out his slave's eye and then his tooth thus contradicting the witnesses of the first set and as these latter were also proved so memem they would have to pay the value of the slave's eye to the master now if you assume that a confutation is not considered a first step in a subsequent proof of an alibi. Why should they have to pay anything after they had already been CONFU? Does this therefore not prove that a confutation does constitute a first step in a subsequent pro
Subsequently proved Zomemum they must pay the accused in full does this not mean that the witnesses have first given evidence regarding the theft and then some time later testified to the slaughter and that they were first proved Zomemum regarding the theft and then some time later proved Zomemum also regarding the slaughter now the fact that they were proved Zomemum regarding the theft is in itself a confutation of their evidence regarding the slaughter and it is nevertheless stated that they must pay the accused in full but if you assume that a confutation is not the first step in a subsequent proof of an alibi why should they pay the retaliation penalty for the slaughter does not this then show confutation is a first step in a subsequent proof of an alibi it may however be said that we are dealing here with a case where for example they were first proved Zomemum regarding the slaughter in this argument between Rabba and Abbe earlier sages already differed in the case where witnesses testifying to a capital charge were first contradicted by another set of witnesses and subsequently also proved Zomemum by a third set of witnesses are Yohanan and R. Eliezer differed one said they would be subject to the death penalty whereas the other said they would not be subject to the death penalty there is proof that R. Eliezer was the one who said they would not be subject to the death penalty for R. Eliezer said if witnesses were CONFU but not proved Zomemum is too. Their evidence regarding a charge of murder they would be lashed now if you assume that R. Eliezer was the one who said that were they subsequently to be proved Zomemum they would be subject to the death penalty why should they be lashed when CONFU should we not regard the prohibition here laid down as a preliminary warning that the death penalty will be exacted by a court of law and every prohibition which can serve as a preliminary warning of a death penalty to be exacted by a court of Law does not entail liability for lashes does not this show that R. Eliezer was the one who said that they would be subject to the death penalty this may indeed be regarded as proof it has been stated that where witnesses were CONFU'd but not proved so memo as to their evidence regarding a capital charge they would be lashed but as this is a case where two witnesses contradict other two witnesses how then could it appear right to you to rely upon those of the second set why not rely upon the others have a reply this could be so only where the alleged victim came to us on his own feet thus disproving the evidence of the first set mission if the theft of an ox or a sheep was testified to by two witnesses whereas the slaughter or sale of it was testified to by only one witness or by the thief himself he would have to make double payment but would not have to make fourfold and fivefold payments if he stole it and slaughtered it on the sabbath day or if he stole it and Slaughtered it for the service of idols, or if he stole it from his own father who subsequently died, and the thief then slaughtered it or sold it, or if he stole it and consecrated it to the temple, and afterwards he slaughtered it or sold it, he would have to make double payment, but would not have to make fourfold and fivefold payments. Our Simeon, however, says in the case of consecrated cattle, the loss of which the owner has to make good, the thief has to make fourfold or fivefold payment. But in the case of those, the loss of which the owner has not to make good, the thief is exempt. Gemara, is it not obvious that a testimony from the mouth of one witness should impose no liability to pay? It may, however, be said that what we are told here is that confession by the thief himself is analogous to evidence borne by one witness, just as in the case of evidence given by one witness. If another witness should come along and join him, the thief would be made liable. So also in the case of confession. By the thief himself, if witnesses should come along and corroborate it, he would become liable. This deviates from the view of Arhuna stated on behalf of Rab for Arhuna stated that Rab said if a man confessed to a liability for a fine, even though witnesses subsequently appeared and gave evidence to the same effect, he would be exempt. The above text states Arhuna stated that Rab said if a man confessed to a liability for a fine, even though witnesses subsequently appeared and gave evidence to the same effect, he would be exempt. Arhista objected to this view of Arhuna from the following. It happened that Argamaliel by accident put out the eye of Tabi his slave. He rejoiced over it very much as he was eager to have this meritorious slave set free. And when he met Arjashua, he said to him, Do you know that Tabi my slave has obtained his freedom? How was that said the other? Because he replied, I have accidentally put out his eye. Said Arjashua to him, Your words have no force in law. Since there were no witnesses for the slave, this of course implies that had witnesses at that time been available for the slave, Argamaliel would have been under obligation to set him free. Does not this show us that if a man confesses to a liability for a fine, if subsequently witnesses appear and testify to the same effect, he would be liable? Arhuna, however, said to him that this case of Argamaliel was different altogether as he made his confession not in the presence of the court of law, but was our Joshua not the president of the court of law? Talmud, Mas Babakama, he was, however, at that time not sitting in the court of law, but has it not been taught that he said to him, Your words have no force in law as you have already confessed? Must we not then say that Tanaim were divided on this matter so that the Tana who reported as there are no witnesses for the slave would maintain that if one confessed to liability for a fine and subsequently witnesses appeared and testified to the same effect he should be liable whereas the Tana who reported as you have already confessed would maintain that if one confessed to liability for a fine the witnesses subsequently appeared and corroborated the confession he would be exempt no they might both have agreed that if one confessed to the liability of a fine the witnesses subsequently appeared and testified to the same effect he would be exempt and the point on which they differed might have been this the Tana who reported as there are no witnesses for the slave was of opinion that the confession took place outside the court of law whereas the Tana who reported as you already confessed was of opinion that the confession was made at the court of law it was stated if a man confesses to liability for a fine and subsequently witnesses appear and corroborate the confession Rab held that he would be quit whereas Samuel held that he would be liable Rabbi Ahila said the reason of Rab was this we expound if it was to be found by witnesses it be considered found in the consideration of the judges accepting thus a case where a defendant incriminates himself now why do I require this reasoning seeing that this ruling can be derived from the text whom the judges shall condemn which implies not him who condemns himself it must be to show that if a man confesses to liability for a fine even though witnesses subsequently appear and testify to the same effect there would be exemption Samuel. However might say to you that the doubling of the verb in the verse if to be found it be found was required to make the thief himself subject to double payment as taught at the school of Hezekiah Rab objected to this view of Samuel from the following barrier if a thief notices that witnesses are preparing themselves to appear and he confesses I have committed the theft of an ox but I neither slaughtered it nor sold it he would not have to pay anything but the principal he Samuel. Replied, we are dealing here with a case where, for instance, the witnesses drew back from giving any evidence in the matter. But since it is stated in the concluding clause, our Eliezer son of Arsimian says that the witnesses should still come forward and testify. Must we not conclude that the first Tana maintained otherwise? Samuel thereupon said to him, Is there at least not our Eliezer son of Arsimian who concurs with me? I follow our Eliezer son of Arsimian now. According to Samuel, Tanaim certainly differed in this matter. Are we to say that also according to Rab Tanaim differed in this? Rab might rejoin my statement can hold good even according to our Eliezer son of Arsimian. For our Eliezer son of Arsimian would not have expressed the view he did there save for the fact that the thief made his confession because of his fear of the witnesses. Whereas here he confessed out of his own free will. Even our Eliezer son of Arsimian might have agreed that the confession would bar any pending liability. Our Hamnana stated it stands to reason that the ruling of Rab was confined to the case of a thief saying I have committed a theft and witnesses then coming and testifying that he had indeed committed the theft in which case he is quit as he had by the confession made himself liable at least for the principal but if he first said I did not commit the theft but when witnesses appeared and declared that he did commit the theft he turned around and said I even slaughtered the stolen sheep or ox or sold it and witnesses subsequently came and testified that he had indeed slaughtered it or sold it he would be liable to pay fourfold or fivefold payment as by this confession he was trying to exempt himself from any liability whatever but Rabba said I got the better of the elders of the school of Rab for Argamaliel by confessing the putting out of his slaves I was but exempting himself from any liability and yet when Arhista stated this case as a proof against Arhuna he was not answered thus it was similarly stated our high B Abba said in the name of our Yohanan that if a thief confessed I have committed a theft and witnesses then came along and testified that he had indeed committed the theft he would be exempt as in this case he had by the confession made himself liable at least for the principal for where he had first said I did not comm
indicate to us that it was only where the theft was testified to by two witnesses and the slaughter by one or by the thief himself in which case it was not the confession which made him liable for the principle that we argue that confession by the thief himself is meant to be analogous to the testimony borne by one witness so that just as in the case of testimony by one witness as soon as another witness appears and joins him liability would be established so also in the case of confession by the thief himself if witnesses subsequently appear and testify to the same effect he would become liable if however the very theft and slaughter or theft and sale were testified to by one witness or by the thief himself in which case the confession made him liable at least for the principle we would not argue that confession by the thief himself should be analogous to the testimony borne by one witness the proof from the very thief is as it was taught if a thief notices that witnesses are preparing themselves to appear and he confesses I have committed the theft of an ox but I neither slaughtered it nor sold it he would not have to pay anything but the principle now what need is there for the words and he confessed I have committed the theft of an ox but I neither slaughtered it nor sold it why not simply state I have committed the theft of an ox or I slaughtered it or I sold it is not the purpose to indicate that it was only where the thief confessed I have committed it Theft of an ox where it was he who by confession made himself liable for the principle that he would be exempt from the fine whereas if he had stated I have not committed any theft and when witnesses arrived and testified that he did commit a theft he turned around and confessed I have even slaughtered it or sold it and witnesses subsequently appeared and testified that he had indeed slaughtered it or sold it in which case it was not he who made himself liable for the principle he would have to be liable for the fine thus proving that a confession merely regarding the act of slaughter should not be considered a confession to bar the pending liability of a fine it may however be said that this is not so as the purpose of the apparently superfluous words might have been to indicate to us the very ruling that since he confessed I have committed the theft of an ox or a sheep even though he still said I have neither slaughtered it nor sold it and witnesses appeared and testified that he did slaughter it or sell it he would nevertheless be exempt from any fine the reason being that the divine law says fivefold or fourfold payment respectively but not fourfold or threefold payment respectively shall we say that the following ten aim differed on this point for it has been taught where two witnesses testified to a theft of an ox and other two witnesses subsequently gave evidence that the thief had slaughtered it or sold it and the witnesses regarding the theft were proved so memum since the testimony became annulled regarding a part of it it would become annulled regarding the whole of it but if only the witnesses to the slaughter were proved so memum he would have to make double payment whereas they would have to pay him threefold payment as restitution in the name of Simicus it was however stated that they would have to make double payment whereas he would have to make threefold payment for an ox and double payment for a ram now to what did Simicus refer it could hardly be to that of the opening clause for would Simicus not agree that a testimony becoming an old regarding a part of it should become an old regarding the whole of it if again you refer to the concluding clause did the rabbis not state correctly that the thief should make double payment while the false witnesses would have to make threefold payment it must therefore be that there was another point at issue between them is where a pair of witnesses came and said to him you have committed the theft of an ox and he said to them it is true that I have committed the theft of an ox and even slaughtered it or sold it but it was not in your presence that I committed the theft and he in fact brought witnesses who proved an alibi against the first witnesses that it was not in their presence that he committed the theft while the plaintiff brought further witnesses who gave evidence against the thief that he had committed the theft of an ox and Slaughtered it or sold it, they would thus differ as to the confession regarding the slaughter. The rabbis holding that though in regard to the theft, it was certainly because of the witnesses that he confessed. The confession regarding the slaughter should have the usual effect of confession and exempt him from the fine. Whereas Simicus held that since regarding the theft, it was because of witnesses that he confessed. The confession of the slaughter should not have the full effect of a confession, as it did not tend to establish any civil liability. So that the first witnesses who were found so would have to pay him double, whereas he would have to pay threefold for an ox and double for a ram. Araha, the son of Rik said, No, all might agree that the confession regarding the slaughter would not have the exempting effect of a confession. And where they differ here is regarding evidence given by witnesses whom you would be unable to make subject to the law applicable to. So Memum as e.g. where two witnesses came and said to him you have committed the theft of the ox and he said to them I did commit the theft of the ox and even slaughtered it or sold it it was however not in your presence that I committed the theft but in the presence of so and so and so and so and he in fact brought witnesses who proved an alibi against the first witnesses that it was not in their presence that he committed the theft but so and so and so and so mentioned by the thief came and testified against him that he did commit the theft of the ox and slaughtered it or sold it the point at issue in this case would be as follows the rabbis maintained that this last evidence was given by witnesses whom you would of course be unable to make subject to the law applicable to so as they were pointed out by the thief himself and any evidence given by witnesses whom you would be unable to make subject to the law applicable to so could not be considered valid evidence. Whereas Simicus maintained that evidence given by witnesses whom you would be unable to make subject to the law applicable to Zomemum would be valid evidence, but is it not an established tradition with us that any evidence given by witnesses whom you would be unable to make subject to the law applicable to Zomemum could not be considered valid evidence? This is the case only where the witnesses do not know the exact day or the exact hour of the occurrence alleged by them, in which case there is in fact no evidence at all. Whereas here your inability to make them subject to the law applicable to Zomemum was only because the thief himself was in every way corroborating their statements. The master stated they would have to make double payment, but since in this case the thief admitted that he did commit the theft so that he would surely be required to pay the principal, why should the witnesses prove Zomemum have to make double payment? Said Eliezer in the name of Rabbi Talmud. Moss Baba Kama the payment of doubling if he stole it and consecrated it to the temple and afterwards slaughtered it or sold it he would have to make double payment but would not have to make fourfold and fivefold payments I would here say I grant you that he should not be liable for the slaughter as when he slaughtered it it was a consecrated animal which he slaughtered and he did not slaughter that which belonged to the owner but why should he not be made liable for the very act of consecration for indeed what difference does it make to me whether he disposed of it to a private owner or whether he disposed of it to the ownership of heaven this represents the view of our Simeon who said that consecrated objects the loss of which the consecrator would have to make good should be considered as if still remaining in the possession of the consecrator but since the concluding clause gives the view of our Simeon the view stated in the previous clause is surely not that of our Simeon. Why then no liability for the act of consecration we must therefore be dealing here with a case of minor sacrifices and in accordance with our Jose the Galilean who declared that minor sacrifices are private property and thus still remain in the possession of the consecrated but what would be the law where the thief consecrated the stolen sheep or ox for most holy sacrifices would he then have to make fourfold or fivefold payment for the act of consecration if so why read in the opening clause if he steals and slaughters and consecrates it he has to make fourfold or fivefold payment why not make the distinction in stating the very case itself this ruling applies only in the case of minor sacrifices but where he sanctified it for the most holy sacrifices he would have to make fourfold or fivefold payment for the very act of consecration we must therefore still say that there is no difference whether the animal was consecrated for the most holy sacrifices or merely for Minor sacrifices and to the difficulty raised by you what difference does it make to me whether he disposed of it to a private owner or whether he disposed of it to the ownership of heaven it might be said in answer that where he disposed of it to a private owner it was previously the ox of Reuben and has now become the ox of Simeon whereas where he disposed of it to the ownership of heaven it was previously the ox of Reuben and still remains the ox of Reuben our Simeon however says in the case of consecrated cattle the loss of which the owner has to make good the thief has to make fourfold or fivefold payment but in the case of those the loss of which the owner has not to make good the thief is exempt I would here say granted that in the opinion of our Simeon it makes no difference whether he disposed of it to a private owner or whether he disposed of it to heaven has not the text to be transposed so as to read as follows for consecrating the stolen animals as sacrifices the loss of which he would have to make good the thief should be exempt as they have not yet been removed altogether from his possession whereas for consecrating them as sacrifices the loss of which he would
Should there be liability for slaughtering them as when Ardemi arrived he stated on behalf of Aryohan that the liability would arise if the thief slaughtered the sacrifices while unblemished within the precincts of the temple in the name of the owner but has not the principle thus been restored to the owner since the sacrifice produced atonement for him said R. Isaac B. Abin we presume that the blood was poured out and thus not sprinkled upon the altar so that no atonement was effected for the owner when Rabin arrived he said on behalf of Aryohan that the liability would only be where he slaughtered the sacrifices while unblemished within the precincts of the temple but not in the name of the owner Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B. Whereas Resh Lakish said that there will be liability also if the thief slaughtered blemished sacrifices outside the precincts of the temple R. Eliezer was astonished at the statement of Aryohan is it the slaughter that renders the sacrifice? Animal permissible for food is it not the sprinkling of the blood that renders it permissible to be partaken of so also he was astonished at the statement of Resh Lakish is it the slaughter that renders the sacrifice animal permissible for food is it not its redemption that renders it permissible for food it however escaped his memory that our Simeon has laid down that whatever is ready to be sprinkled is considered as if it has already been sprinkled and whatever is designated for being redeemed is considered as if it had already been redeemed whatever is ready to be sprinkled is considered as if it had already been sprinkled as taught our Simeon says there is not har which may be subject to defilement in accordance with the law applicable to the defilement of food but there is also not har which is not subject to defilement in accordance with the law applicable to the defilement of food how is this so if it remains overnight before the sprinkling of the blood it would not be Subject to become defiled in accordance with the law applicable to the defilement of food, but if after the sprinkling of blood it would be subject to become defiled in accordance with the law applicable to the defilement of food, now it is an accepted tradition that the meaning of before sprinkling is without it first having become fit to be sprinkled, and of after sprinkling after it became fit for sprinkling, hence where it remained overnight without having first become fit for sprinkling could only be where there was no time during the day to sprinkle it, such as where the sacrifice was slaughtered close upon sunset, in which case it would not be subject to become defiled in accordance with the law applicable to the defilement of food, and where it remained overnight after it had already become fit for sprinkling could only be where there was time during the previous day to sprinkle it, in which case it would be subject to become defiled in accordance with the law applicable to the Defilement of food this proves that whatever is ready to be sprinkled is considered as if it had already been sprinkled whatever is designated for being redeemed is considered as if it had already been redeemed as taught our Simeon says Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba the red heifer is subject to become defiled in accordance with the law applicable to the defilement of food since at one time it had ritual fitness to be used for food Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B and Resh Lakish observed that our Simeon used to say that the red heifer could be redeemed even after it was slaughtered and placed upon the wood for burning thus proving that whatever has the possibility of being redeemed is considered as if it had already been redeemed we can understand why our Yohanan did not give the same answer to the difficulty propounded as Resh Lakish as he was anxious to explain the ruling of our mission even in the case of unblemished sacrifices but why did Resh Lakish not give the same answer as our Yohanan? He could say scripture says and he slaughtered it or sold it implying that it was only an animal subject to this law in the case of a sale that could be subject to it in the case of slaughter whereas an animal which would not be subject to this law in the case of sale could similarly not be subject to it in the case of slaughter either now in the case of these unblemished sacrifices since if the thief had sold the sacrifices it would not have been a sale to all intents and purposes. They could not be subject to this law even when they were slaughtered our Yohanan and Resh Lakish indeed followed their own lines of reasoning elsewhere for it was stated if a thief sells a stolen ox which is trefa according to our Simeon our Yohanan said that he would be liable whereas Resh Lakish said that he would be exempt our Yohanan who said that he would be liable held that though this ox could not be subject to the law of slaughter it could yet be subject to the law of sale whereas Resh Lakish, who said that he would be exempt, maintained that since this ox could not be subject to the law of slaughter, it could similarly not be subject to the law of sale either. Our Yohanan objected to the view of Resh Lakish from the following if he stole a hybrid animal and slaughtered it or a trefa animal and sold it, he would have to make double payment. Now, does not this ruling follow the view of our Simeon, thus proving that though this ox would not be subject to the law of slaughter, it could nevertheless be subject to the law of sale? He replied, No, this is the view of the rabbis, but if this is the view of the rabbis, why should a trefa ox be subject only to the law of sale and not to the law of slaughter? You say then that it is the view of our Simeon, why then should a hybrid animal be subject only to the law of slaughter and not to that of sale? We must say, therefore, that though slaughter is mentioned, the same law was meant to apply also to sale, so also according to the rabbis, though. Sale is stated in the text the same law was meant to apply to slaughter our Yohanan however might say that this does not follow it is true that if you say that the ruling follows our Simeon there is no difficulty since it was necessary to state liability regarding trefa in the one case of sale only it states liability regarding a hybrid animal also in the one case of slaughter only but if you say that this ruling follows the rabbis why not join them together and state thus if the thief misappropriated a hybrid animal and a trefa sheep or ox and slaughtered them or sold them he would have to make fourfold or fivefold payment this indeed is a difficulty but why should there be liability for fourfold or fivefold payment in the case of a hybrid animal since scripture says sheep and rabbi elsewhere said that this is a locus elas psychus for the rule that wherever it says sheep the purpose is to exclude a hybrid animal this case here is different as scripture says or Implying the inclusion of a hybrid animal does this mean to say that the term or everywhere implies an amplification was it not taught when a bullock or a sheep this accepts a hybrid or a goat this accepts an animal looking like a hybrid said rather the term or in the one case is expounded in accordance with the subject matter of the verse and the term or in the other case is similarly expounded in accordance with the subject matter of that verse here in connection with theft where it is written an ox or a sheep since it is impossible to produce a hybrid from the union of these two the term or should be expounded to include a hybrid of a different kind whereas in connection with sacrifices where it is written a sheep or a goat where it is possible for you to produce a hybrid from their union the term or should rightly be taken to exclude the hybrid Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, but in connection with sacrifices it is also written a bullock or a sheep in which case it is Impossible for you to exclude a hybrid born from these two why then should we not employ the term or to include a hybrid of a different kind since the term or in the later phrase is to be employed to exclude the term or in the earlier phrase should similarly be employed to exclude but why not say on the contrary that as the term or in the earlier phrase has to be employed to amplify so also should the term or in the later phrase would this be logical I grant you that if you say that the term or meant to exclude then it would be necessary to have two terms or to exclude for even when a hybrid has been excluded it would still be necessary to exclude an animal looking like a hybrid but if you say it is meant to amplify why two amplifications in the two terms or for once a hybrid is included what question could there be of an animal looking like a hybrid to what halachah then with the statement made by Robert refer that this is a locus elas psychus for the rule that wherever it Says sheep the purpose is to exclude a hybrid if to sacrifices is it not explicitly said a bullock or a sheep which accepts a hybrid if to the tithes of animals is not the term under compared to underused in connection with sacrifices making it subject to the same law if to a firstling is the verb expressing passing not compared to passing used in connection with tithe or again we may say since where the animal only looks like a hybrid you say that it is not subject to the law of firstling since it is written but the firstling of an ox which implies that the rule holds good only where the parents were of the species of ox and the firstling was of the species of ox what question can there be regarding a hybrid itself the statement made by Rabba must therefore have referred to the firstling of an ass as we have learned it cannot be redeemed either by a calf or by a wild animal or by a slaughtered sheep or by a trefa sheep or by a hybrid or by a boy but if we accept it View of R. Eliezer who allows redemption with a hybrid sheep as we have learned R. Eliezer allows the redemption to be made with a hybrid for it is a sheep to what halachah can we refer the statement of Rabbah R. Eliezer might reply that the
We say that since he undertook to bring something called a burnt offering, the thief may be entitled to restore the minimum burnt offering, or perhaps the donor might be entitled to say to him, I am anxious to do my duty in the best manner possible. After he put the question on second thoughts, he decided that the thief might free himself by paying a sheep according to the view of the rabbis, or even a burnt offering of a bird according to the view of Rlaz or Bezri Araha, the son of Rik. Taught this as a definite ruling as follows Rabbi said, If one doubt, I take it upon myself to sacrifice a burnt offering, and he set aside an ox, and somebody came and stole it. The thief may free himself by paying for a sheep if we follow the rabbis, or even for a burnt offering of a bird if we follow Rlaz or Bezri Mishnah, if he sold the stolen sheep or ox with the exception of one hundred part of it, or if he had some partnership in it before he stole it, or if he slaughtered it and it became nibbled under his hand, or if he stabbed it, or tore loose the windpipe and gullet before cutting, he would have to make double payment, but would not have to make fourfold and fivefold payments. Himara, what is meant by with the exception of one hundred part of it? Rab said, with the exception of any part that would be rendered permissible for food, together with the bulk of the animal through the process of slaughter. Levi, however, said, with the exception even of its wool, it was indeed so taught in the very though, with the exception of its wool, an objection was raised from the following: if he sold it, with the exception of its forepaw, or with the exception of its foot, or with the exception of its horn, or with the exception of its wool, he would not have to make fourfold and fivefold payments. Rabbi, however, says, if he reserved for himself anything, the absence of which would prevent a ritual slaughter, he would not have to pay fourfold and fivefold payments. But if he Reserves anything which is not indispensable for the purposes of ritual slaughter, he would have to make fourfold or fivefold payment. But Arsimian B. Eliezer says if he reserved its horn, he would not have to make fourfold or fivefold payment. But if he reserved its wool, he would have to make fourfold or fivefold payment. This presents no difficulty to Levi as he would concur with the first tana. But with whom does Rab concur? It may he said that Rab concurs with the following tana as taught Arsimian B. Eliezer said if he sold it with the exception of its forepaw or with the exception of its foot, he would not have to make fourfold or fivefold payment. But if with the exception of its horn or with the exception of its wool, he would have to make fourfold and fivefold payments. What is the point at issue between all these tana? In the first tana held that to fulfill the words and he slaughter it, we require the whole of it as also to fulfill the words and he sell it, we Require the whole of it. Rabbi, however, held that any slaughter it refers only to those parts, the absence of which would render the slaughter ineffective, excluding us anything which has no bearing upon the slaughter. While any sell it is, of course, analogous to any slaughter it. Arsimian B. Eliezer, on the other hand, maintained that the horn not being a part which is usually cut off could be reckoned as a reservation so that he would not have to make fourfold and fivefold payments, whereas the wool of the animal being a part which is usually shorn off could not be reckoned as a reservation and he would thus have to make fourfold or fivefold payment. But the other tana of the school of Arsimian B. Eliezer maintained that its four paws or feet which require slaughter to render them permissible form a reservation and he would not have to pay fourfold and fivefold payments, whereas its horns or its wool as they do not require slaughter to render them permissible would not. Constitute a reservation, but does Arsimian B. Eliezer not contradict himself to Tanaim report differently? The view of Arsimian B. Eliezer, our rabbis taught he who steals a crippled or a lame or a blind sheep or ox, and so also he who steals an animal belonging to partners and slaughters it or sells it is liable for fourfold and fivefold payments. But if partners committed a theft, they would be exempt, but was it not taught if partners committed a theft, they would be liable? Said Arnaman. This offers no difficulty as the former statement deals with a partner stealing from the animals belonging to him and his fellow partner, whereas the latter states the law where a partner stole from outsiders. Rob objected to this explanation of Arnaman from the following lest you might think that if a partner steals from the animals belonging to himself and to his fellow partner, or if partners commit the theft, they should be liable. It is definitely stated and slaughter it showing. That we require the whole of it which is absent here does this not prove that partners stealing from outsiders are similarly exempt are not and therefore said the contradiction referred to above offers no difficulty as the statement of liability referred to a partner slaughtering with the authorization of his fellow partner whereas the other ruling referred to a partner slaughtering without the authorization of his fellow partner are Jeremiah inquired if the thief sold a stolen animal with the exception of the first 30 days or with the exception of its work or with the exception of its embryo what would be the law if we accept the view that an embryo is an integral part like the thigh of its mother there could be no question that this would be a sure reservation the question would arise only if we accept the view that an embryo is not like the thigh of its mother what indeed should be the law shall we say that since it is joined to it it should count as a reservation or Perhaps since it is destined to be separated from it, it should not be considered a reservation. Some state the question thus shall we say that since it is not like the thigh of its mother, it should not count as a reservation, or perhaps since at that time it requires the union with its mother to become permissible for food through the process of slaughter, it should be equal to a reservation made in the actual body of the mother. Let this stand undecided. Our papa inquired if the thief after stealing mutilated it and then sold it, what would be the law? Shall we say that since all that he stole he did not sell, he should be exempt, or perhaps since in what he sold he reserved nothing for himself, he should be liable. Let this also stand undecided. Our rabbis taught if he stole a sheep or an ox and gave it to another person who slaughtered it, or if he stole it and gave it to another person who sold it, Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, or if he stole it and consecrated it, or if he stole it and sold it on credit, or if he stole it and bartered it, or if he stole it and gave it as a gift, or if he stole it and paid a debt with it, or if he stole it and paid it for goods he had obtained on credit, or if he stole it and sent it as a betrothal gift to the house of his father in law, he would have to make fourfold and fivefold payments. What is this meant to tell us is not all this obvious. The new point lies in the opening clause if he stole a sheep or an ox and gave it to another person who slaughtered it, which implies that in this case the law of agency has application even for a matter involving transgression, though in the whole of the Torah there is no case of an agent entrusted with a matter involving transgression rendering the principal liable. In this case, an agent entrusted with a matter involving transgression would render his principal liable. The reason being that scripture says and he slaughtered it or sell it, implying that just as a sale cannot be. Effected without the intervention of some other person, so also where the slaughter was effected by some other person authorized by the thief to do so, the thief would be liable. There is also a new point in the concluding clause where he stole it and consecrated it, which tells us that it makes no difference whether he disposed of it to a private person or whether he disposed of it to the ownership of heaven. Mishnah, if he stole a sheep or an ox in the premises of the owners and slaughtered it, or sold it outside their premises, or if he stole it outside their premises and slaughtered it, or sold it on their premises, or if he stole it and slaughtered it, or sold it outside their premises, he would have to make fourfold or fivefold payment. But if he stole it and slaughtered it, or sold it in their premises, he would be exempt. If as he was pulling it out, it died while still in the premises of the owners, he would be exempt. But if it died after he has lifted it up or after he had already. Taken it out of the premises of the owners, he would be liable. So also, if he gave it to a priest for the redemption of his firstborn son, or to a creditor, to an unpaid billy, to a borrower, to a paid billy, or to a hire, and as he was pulling it out, it died while still in the premises of the owners, he would be exempt. But if it died after he had lifted it up or already taken it out of the premises of the owners, he would be liable. Gemara Omimar asked, was the formality of pulling instituted also in the case of billies or not? Our Yamar replied, come and here, if he gave it to a priest for the redemption of his firstborn son, to a creditor, to an unpaid billy, to a borrower, to a paid billy, or to a hire, and as he was pulling it out, it died while in the premises of the owners, he would be exempt. Now this means, does it not that the billy was pulling it out, thus proving that the requirement of pulling was instituted also in the case of billies? No, he rejoined, the thief was pulling it out, but was. Not this already stated in the previous clause there it was stated in regard to a thief stealing from the house of the owners whereas here it is stated in regard to a thief stealing from the house of a billy said Arashi to him Amimar do
Stick and thus drew it towards himself, but I would still ask since he was seen doing this publicly, should he on this account not be subject to the law applicable to a robber who has not to pay any fine since at the same time he was hiding himself from the public, he is subject to the law applicable to a thief. How then would you define a robber? Said Arabah one for instance, like Benai the son of Jehoiada, of whom we read, and he plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear, are Yohan, and said, like the men of Shechem, of whom we read, and the men of Shechem said liars in wait for him on the tops of the mountains, and they robbed all that came along that way by the men. It was told Abai Melech, why did Arabah not give his instance from this last source? He could say that since these were hiding themselves, they could not be called robbers, and are Yohan, and he could argue that the reason they were hiding themselves was so that people should not notice. The men run away from them. The disciples of Aryohan and Bezakai asked him why the Torah was more severe on a thief than on a robber. He replied, The latter puts the honor of the slave on the same level as the honor of his owner, whereas the former does not put the honor of the slave on the same level as the honor of the master, but higher for as it were. He acts as if the eye of the low would not be seeing and the ear of the low would not be hearing, as it says, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide. Their counsel from the Lord and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us and who knoweth us? Or as it is written, and they say, The Lord will not see, neither will the God of Jacob give heed. Or as again it is written, for they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. It was taught. Our said the following parable is reported in the name of Argamaliel. What do the thief and the robber resemble two people who dwelt in one town and made banquets? One invited the townspeople and did not invite the royal family the other invited neither the townspeople nor the royal family which deserves the heavier punishment surely the one who invited the townspeople but did not invite the royal family are further said observe how great is the importance attached to labor for in the case of an ox stolen and slaughtered where the thief interfered with its labor he has to pay fivefold while in the case of a sheep where he did not disturb it from its labor he has to pay only fourfold are you and bizak i said observe how great is the importance attached to the dignity of man for in the case of an ox which walks away on its own feet the payment is fivefold while in the case of a sheep which was usually carried on the thief's shoulder only fourfold has to be paid mission it is not right to breed small cattle in eretz israel they may however be bred in syria or in the deserts of eretz israel it is not right to breed hens in jerusalem on account of it Sacrifices nor may priests do so throughout the whole of Eretz Israel on account of their food which has to be ritually clean. It is not right to breed pigs in any place whatever no man should breed a dog unless it is on a chain. It is not right to place nets for doves unless at a distance of 30 rs from inhabited settlements. Gemara or rabbis taught it is not right to breed small cattle in Eretz Israel but they may be bred in the woods of Eretz Israel or in Syria even in inhabited settlements and needless to say also outside Eretz Israel another very taught it is not right to breed small cattle in Eretz Israel they may however be bred in the deserts of Judah and in the desert at the border of Akko still though the sages said it is not right to breed small cattle it is nevertheless quite proper to breed large cattle for we should not impose a restriction upon the community unless the majority of the community will be able to stand it small cattle could be imported. From outside Eretz Israel, whereas large cattle could not be imported from outside Eretz Israel again, though they said it is not right to breed small cattle, one may nevertheless keep them before a festival for thirty days, and similarly before the wedding festivity of his son for thirty days, he should, however, not retain the animal last bought for thirty days if these expire after the festival, so that if the festival had already gone, though since from the time he bought the animal until that time thirty days had not yet elapsed, we do not say that a period of thirty days is permitted for keeping the animal, but we are to say that as soon as the festival has gone, he should not retain it any longer. Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, a cattle dealer may, however, buy and slaughter or buy and even keep for the market, he may, however, not retain the animal he bought last for thirty days. Or Gamaliel was asked by his disciples whether it is permissible to breed small cattle, he said to them, it is. Permissible, but did we not learn it is not right to breed what they asked him was really this what about retaining it he said to them it is permissible provided it does not go out and pasture with the herd but is fastened to the legs of the bed or rabbis taught there was once a certain pious person who suffered with his heart and the doctors on being consulted said that there was no remedy for him unless he sucked warm milk every morning a goat was therefore brought to him and fastened to the legs of the bed and he sucked from it every morning after some days his colleagues came to visit him but as soon as they noticed the goat fastened to the legs of the bed they turned back and said an armed robber is in the house of this man how can we come in to see him they thereupon sat down and inquired into his conduct but they did not find any fault in him except the sin about the goat he also at the time of his death proclaimed I know that no sin can be imputed to me save that of the goat when I transgressed against the words of my colleagues or Ishmael said my father's family belonged to the property owners in Upper Galilee why then were they ruined because they used to pasture their flocks in forests and to try money cases without a colleague the forests were very near to their estates but there was also a little field nearby belonging to others and the cattle were led by way of this our rabbis taught if a shepherd desires to repent it would not be right to order him to sell immediately the small cattle with him but he may sell by degree so also in the case of a proselyte to whom dogs and pigs fall as an inheritance it would not be right to order him to sell immediately but he may sell by degree so also if one vows to buy a house or to marry a woman in Eretz Israel it would not be right to order him to enter into a contract immediately until he finds a house or a woman to suit him once a woman being annoyed by her son jumped up in anger and swore. Whoever will come forward and offer to marry me, I will not refuse him. And as unsuitable persons offered themselves to her, the matter was brought to the sages who thereupon said, Surely this woman did not intend her vow to apply save to a suitable person, just as the sages said that it is not right to breed small cattle. So also have they said that it is not right to breed small beasts. Or Ishmael said it is, however, allowed to breed village dogs, cats, apes, hul, that seen I'm porcupines, as these help to keep the house clean. What are hul, that seen I'm rab, Judah replied, A certain creeping animal of the Harza species, some say of the Harza species with thin legs which pastures among rose bushes, and the reason why it is called creeping is because its legs are short, and underneath it, Rab Judah said, In the name of Rab, we put ourselves in Babylon with reference to the law of breeding small cattle on the same footing as if we were in Eretz Israel or Adabi Ahabah said to Arunah, what about your? Small cattle he answered him as regarded by Hobah he however said to him is Hobah prepared to neglect her son so much as to bury him in point of fact during the lifetime of our Adabi Ahabah no children born of Hobah survived to Arunah some report Arunah said from the time Rab arrived in Babylon we put ourselves in Babylon with reference to breeding small cattle on the same footing as if we were in Eretz Israel Rab and Samuel and R.C. once met at a circumcision of a boy or as some say at the party for the redemption of a son Rab would not enter before Samuel Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi nor Samuel before R.C. nor R.C. before Rab they therefore argued who should go in last and it was decided that Samuel should go in last and that Rab and R.C. should go in together but why should not either Rab or R.C. have been last Rab at first was merely paying a compliment to Samuel to make up for the regrettable occasion when a curse against him escaped his lips for that reason. Rab offered him precedence. Meanwhile, a cat had come along and bitten off the hand of the child. Rab thereupon went out and declared in his discourse, "It is permissible to kill a cat, and it is in fact a sin to keep it. And the law of robbery does not apply to ignore that of returning a lost object to its owner. Since you have stated that it is permissible to kill it, why again state that it is a sin to keep it? You might perhaps think that though it is permissible to kill it, there is still no sin committed in keeping it. We are therefore told that this is not so. I could still ask, since you have said that the law of robbery does not apply to it, why again state that the law of returning a lost object to its owner does not apply to it? Said Rabbi, this refers to the skin of the cat where it was found dead. An objection was raised from the following: Our Simeon B. Eliezer says it is permissible to breed village dogs, cats, apes, and porcupines, as these help to keep the house clean. Does this? Not prove that it is permissible to breed cats. There is, however, no contradiction as the lat
Other misfortune that might burst forth upon the community as e.g. itching locusts, flies, hornets, mosquitoes, a plague of serpents and scorpions. No alarm was raised by public service on the Sabbath, but a cry was raised by privately reciting prayers. Does this not prove that no public prayers are to be held on this score on Sabbath? There is no contradiction as the latter case refers to the period when the plague is in the moist stage, whereas the former deals with dry itching as our Joshua B. Levi said the boils brought upon the Egyptians by the Holy One, blessed be he were moist within but dry without as it says, and it became a boil breaking forth with plains upon man and upon beast. What is the meaning of the words if the door to prosperity has been shut to an individual it will not speedily be opened? Marzitra said it refers to ordination. Arashi said one who is in disfavor hour is not readily taken into favor. Araha of Difti said he will never be taken into favor. This however is not. So for Araha of Difti stated this as a matter of personal experience in the case of him who buys a house in Eretz Yisrael the deed may be written even on the Sabbath day you mean to say on the Sabbath it must therefore mean as stated by Rabbah in the case mentioned there that a Gentile is asked to do it so also here a Gentile is asked to do it for those who ask a Gentile to do some work on the Sabbath is Shabbat the rabbis did not maintain this prohibition in this case on account of the welfare. Of Eretz Yisrael our Samuel B. Naman he said in the name of our Jonathan he who purchases a town in Eretz Yisrael can be compelled to purchase with it also the roads leading to it from all four sides on account of the welfare of Eretz Yisrael our rabbis taught Joshua on his entry into Eretz Yisrael laid down ten stipulations Talmud, Mas Babakama that cattle be permitted to pasture in woods that wood may be gathered by all in private fields that grasses may similarly be gathered by all in all places with the exception however of a field where fenugarek is growing that shoots be permitted to be cut off by all in all places with the exception however of stumps of olive trees that a spring emerging even for the first time may be used by the townspeople that it be permitted to fish with an angle in the sea of Tiberias provided no sail is spread as this would detain boats and thus interfere with navigation that it be permitted to ease oneself at the back of a fence even in a field full of saffron that it be permitted to the public to use the paths in private fields until the time when the second rain is expected that it be permitted to turn aside to private sidewalks in order to avoid the road picks that one who has lost himself in the vineyards be permitted to cut his way through when going up and cut his way through when coming down and that a dead body which anyone finds has to bury should acquire the right to be buried on the spot where found that cattle be permitted to pasture in woods. Our Papa said this applies only to small cattle pasturing in big woods. For in the case of small cattle pasturing in small woods or big cattle in big forests, it would not be permitted. Still less big cattle pasturing in small woods that wood may be gathered by all in private fields. This applies only to prickly shrubs such as spinaragia and hollow. For in the case of other kinds of wood, it would not be so. Moreover, even regarding spinaragia and hollow, permission was not given except where they were still attached to the ground. But after they had been already broken off by the owner, it would not be so. Again, even in the case of shrubs still attached to the soil, permission was not given except while they were still in a wet state. But once they had become dry, it would not be so. But in any case, it is not permitted to uproot them. That grasses may similarly be gathered by all in all places, with the exception, however, of a field where fenugarek is growing. Does this mean to say that fenugarek derives some benefit from grasses? If so, a contradiction could be pointed out from the following. If fenugarek is mixed up with other kinds of grasses, the owner need not be compelled to tear it out, for he will do it in any case on account of the fact that the grasses spoil the fenugarek. Now, does this not prove that grasses are disadvantageous to fenugarek? Said R. Jeremiah, there is no contradiction, for while the latter statement refers to the seeds, the former deals with the pods, it is only to the seeds that grasses are disadvantageous as they make them lean, whereas to the pods they are advantageous for when placed between grasses they get softer, or if you like, I can say that while one statement refers to fenugarek sown for the use of man, the other refers to fenugarek sown for animals, for since it was sown for animals, grasses are also required for it. How can we tell for what it was sown? Our Papa said if made in beds, it is sown for man, but if not in Beds it is for animals that shoots be permitted to be cut off by all in all places with the exception however of stumps of olive trees are tandem and arbaryas explained in the name of a certain old man that in the case of an olive tree the size of the length of an egg has to be left over at the bottom in the case of reeds and vines it is only from the knot and upwards that it is permitted to cut off shoots in the case of all other trees it is permitted only from the thick parts of it tree but not from the central part of the tree and only from a new bough that has not yet yielded fruit but not from an old bough which is yielding fruit again only from such spots on the tree as do not face the sun talmud mas baba but not from a spot which does face the sun for so it says and for the precious things of the fruits of the sun that a spring emerging even for the first time may be used by the townspeople rabbi son of Arhuna said that the owner is still entitled to be paid for its value. The law, however, is not in accordance with this view that it be permitted to fish with an angle in the sea of Tiberias, provided that no sail is spread as this would detain boats. It is, however, permitted to fish by means of nets and traps. Our rabbis taught the tribes stipulated with one another at the very outset that nobody should spread a sail and thus detain boats. It is, however, permitted to fish by means of nets and traps. Our rabbis taught the sea of Tiberias was included in the portion of Naphtali. In addition, he received the rope's length of dry land on the southern side to keep nets on in fulfillment of the verse possessed. Now the sea and the south, it was taught. Our Simeon B. Eliezer said anything found on the mountains detached from the soil was considered as belonging to all the tribes, but if still attached to the ground as belonging to the particular tribe in whose territory it was found, there was, however, no tribe in Israel which had not land both on the hills. And in the vale in the south and in the valley as stated turn you and take your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and unto all the places nigh there unto in the plain in the hills and in the vale and in the south and by the seaside etc. For you can similarly find the same regarding the Canaanites, Perizzites and Ammonites who were before them as stated and unto all nigh there unto proving that the same applied to those who were nigh there unto that it be permitted to ease ones. Self at the back of a fence even though in a field full of saffron or Ahabi Jacob said this permission was required only for the taking of a pebble from the fence or his da said this may be done even on the Sabbath Mars the pious used to take a pebble from a fence and put it back there and tell his servant to go and make it good again that it be permitted to use the paths in private fields until the time when the second rain is expected our Papa said that regarding our land here in Babylon. Even after the fall of Mirdu this would be harmful that it be permitted to turn aside to private sidewalks in order to avoid road picks as Samuel and Rav Judah were once walking on the road Samuel turned aside to the private sidewalk Rav Judah thereupon said to him do the stipulations laid down by Joshua hold good even in Babylon he answered him I say that it applies even outside Eretz Israel as Rabbi and Arhai were once walking on the road they turned aside to the private sidewalks. While Arjuda B. Kenosa went striding along the main road in front of them Rabbi thereupon said to Arhai who is that man who wants to show off in front of us Arhai answered him he might perhaps be Arjuda B. Kenosa, who is my disciple and who does all his deeds out of pure piety when they drew near to him they saw him and Arhai said to him had you not been Judah B. Kenosa, I would have sawed your joints with an iron saw that one who lost himself in the vineyards should be permitted to cut his way through when going up and cut his way through when coming down our rabbis taught he who sees his fellow wandering in the vineyards is permitted to cut his way through when going up and to cut his way through when coming down until he brings him into the town or onto the road so also one who is lost in the vineyards may cut his way through when going up and cut his way through when coming down until he reaches the town or the road what is the meaning of so also is the latter case not obvious you might think that it is only in the case of a fellow man wandering in which case he knows where he is going to that he may cut his way through whereas in the case of being lost himself when he does not know where he is going to he should not be permitted to cut his way through but should have to walk round about the boundaries we are therefore told that this is not so cannot this permission be derived from the pentateuch for it was taught once can it be derived that it is Obligatory to restore the body of a fellow man because it is said and thou shalt restore it to him
These stipulations only 10 in number are they not 11 the permission to use the paths in private fields is implied in a statement made by Solomon as taught if a man's produce has already been removed entirely from the field and nevertheless he does not allow persons to enter his field what would people say of him if not what real benefit has that owner from his field for in what way would people do him any harm it was regarding such a person that the verse says while you can be good do not call yourself bad but is it anywhere written while you can be good do not call yourself bad yes it is written to a similar effect withhold not good from him to whom it is due when it is in the power of thy hand to do it but were there no more stipulations was there not the one mentioned by our Judah for it was taught when it is the season of removing dung everybody is entitled to remove his dung into the public ground and he it up there for the whole period of 30 days so that it may be trodden upon by the feet of men and by the feet of animals for upon this condition did Joshua transfer the land to Israel as an inheritance again was there not also the one referred to by our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka for it was taught our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka said it is a stipulation of the court of law that the owner of the bees be entitled to go down into his fellow's field and cut off his fellow's bow upon which his bees have settled in order to rescue the swarm of his bees while paying only the value of his fellow's bow it is similarly a stipulation of the court of law that the owner of wine should pour out his wine from the flask so as to save in it the honey of his fellow and recover the value of his wine out of the honey of his fellow it is again a stipulation of the court of law that the owner of a bundle of wood should remove the wood from his ass and load on his ass the flax of his fellow from the back of the ass that Fell dead and recovered the value of his wood out of the flax of his fellow for it was upon this stipulation that Joshua transferred the land to Israel for an inheritance why then were these stipulations not included views of individual authorities were not stated among the stipulations that have unanimous recognition Talmud, Mas Baba Kama but did not Arabin upon arriving from Palestine state on behalf of our Yohanan that the owner of a tree which overhangs a neighbor's field as well as the owner of a tree close to the boundary has to bring the first fruits to Jerusalem and read the prescribed text as it was upon this stipulation that trees might be planted near the boundary of fields and even overhang a neighbor's field that Joshua transferred the land to Israel for an inheritance how then could our Yohanan describe this as a stipulation of Joshua when it was not included in the authoritative text of the Baratha side enumerating all the stipulations of Joshua it must Therefore be that the ten of the text enumerating the ten stipulations laid down by Joshua was our Joshua Bili by Arabi Hagi explicitly taught this in the text our ten and Arbariya stated in the name of a certain sage who was our Joshua Bili by the ten stipulations were laid down by Joshua the following ten enactments were ordained by Ezra that the law be read publicly in the Minha service on Sabbath that the law be read publicly on Mondays and Thursdays that courts be held on Mondays and Thursdays that clothes be washed on Thursdays that garlic be eaten on Fridays that the housewife rise early to bake bread that a woman must wear a sandar that a woman must comb her hair before performing a merchant that peddler selling spicery be allowed to travel about in the towns he also decreed a merchant to be required by those to whom pollution has happened that the law be read publicly in the Minha service on Sabbath on account of shopkeepers who during the weekdays have no time to hear the reading of the law that the law be read publicly on Mondays and Thursdays but was this ordained by Ezra was this not ordained even before him for it was taught and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water upon which those who expound verses metaphorically said water means nothing but Torah as it says ho everyone that thirsteth come yet for water it thus means that as they went three days without Torah they immediately became exhausted the prophets among them thereupon rose and enacted that they should publicly read the law on Sabbath make a break on Sunday read again on Monday make a break again on Tuesday and Wednesday read again on Thursday and then make a break on Friday so that they should not be kept for three days without Torah originally it was ordained that one man should read three verses or that three men should together read three verses corresponding to priests Levites and Israelites then Ezra came and ordained that three men should be called up to read and that ten verses should be read corresponding to ten Batlinim that courts be held on Mondays and Thursdays when people are about as they come to read the scroll of the law that clothes be washed on Thursdays that the Sabbath may be duly honored that garlic be eaten on Fridays because of the own as it is written that bringeth forth its fruit in its season and Rab Judah or as others say are Naman or as still others say are Kahana or again as others say are Yohanan. Stated that this refers to him who performs his marital duty every Friday night our rabbis taught five things were said of garlic it's a the eights, it keeps the body warm it brightens up the face it increases semen and it kills parasites in the bowels some say that it fosters love and removes jealousy that a housewife rise early to bake bread so that there should be bread for the poor that a woman must wear a sinar out of modesty that a woman comb her hair before performing the immersion but this is derived from the Pentateuch for it was taught and he shall bathe at Bizarro his flesh in water implying that there should be nothing intervening between the body and the water at Bizarro his flesh at including whatever is attached to his flesh i.e. the hair why then had this to be ordained by Ezra it may however be said that as far as the Pentateuch goes it would only have to be necessary to see that the hair should not be knotted or that nothing dirty should be there which might intervene Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi whereas Ezra came and ordained actual combing that peddler selling spicery be allowed to travel about in the towns for the purpose of providing toilet articles for the women so that they should not be repulsive in the eyes of their husbands he also decreed that a merchant was required for those to whom pollution had happened is not this in the Pentateuch as it is written and if the flow of seed go out from him then he shall bathe all his flesh in water. The Pentateuchal requirement referred to Teremah and sacrifices and he came and decreed that even for the study of the words of the Torah immersion is needed ten special regulations were applied to Jerusalem that a household there should not be liable to become irredeemable that it should never bring a heifer whose neck is broken that it could never be made a condemned city that its houses would not become defiled through leprosy that neither beams nor balconies should be allowed to project there that no dunghills should be made there that no kills should be kept there that neither gardens nor orchards should be cultivated there with the exception however of the garden of roses which existed from the days of the former prophets that no fowls should be reared there and that no dead person should be kept there overnight that a household there should not be liable to become irredeemable for it is written and the house that is in the walled city shall be made sure in Perpetuity to him that bought it throughout his generations, and as it is maintained that Jerusalem was not divided among the tribes, that it should never bring a heifer whose neck is broken, as it is written, if one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, and Jerusalem could not be included, as it was not divided among the tribes, that it could never be made a condemned city, for it is written, one of thy cities, and Jerusalem was not divided among the tribes. That its houses could not become defiled through leprosy, for it is written, and I put the plague of leprosy in the house of the land of your possession, and Jerusalem was not divided among the tribes, that neither beams nor balconies should be allowed to project in order not to form a tent spreading defilement, and not to cause harm to the pilgrims for the festivals, that no dunghills be made there on account of reptiles, that no kills be kept there on account of the smoke, that neither gardens. Nor orchards be cultivated there on account of the bad odor of withered grasses that no fowls be bred there on account of the sacrifices that no dead person be kept there overnight. This is known by tradition. It is not right to breed pigs in any place whatever our rabbis taught when the members of the Hasmonean house were contending with one another. Harkness was within an Aristobulus without the city while those who were within used to let down to the other party every day a basket of denarii and in return cattle were sent up for the regular sacrifices. There was however an old man among the besiegers who had some knowledge in Grecian wisdom and who said to them so long as the other party are allowed to continue to perform the service of the sacrifices they will not be delivered into your hands on the next day when the basket of denarii was let down a swine was sent up when the swine reached the center of the wall it stuck its claws into the wall and Eretz Yisrael. Quake over a distance of 400 parasangs by 400 parasangs it was proclaimed on that occasion curse be the man who would breed swine and curse be the man who would teach his son Grecian wisdom it was concerning this time that we have learned that the omer was once brought from the gardens of Zerifin and the two loaves from the valley of Ansukur but was Grecian wisdom
permitted to cut his hair in the Gentile fashion as he was in close contact with the government so also the members of the family of Rabban Gamaliel were permitted to discuss Grecian wisdom on account of their having had associations with the government no man should breed a dog unless it is on a chain etc. Our rabbis taught no man should breed a dog unless it is kept on a chain he may however breed it in a town adjoining the frontier where he should keep a chain during the daytime and loose. It only at night it was taught our Eliezer the Great says that he who breeds dogs is like him who breeds swine what is the practical bearing of this comparison that he be declared cursed our Joseph B. Menumi said in the name of Arnam and that Babylon was on a par with a town adjoining the frontier this however was interpreted to refer to Nihardia our dust eye of Bira expounded and when it rested he said return O Lord unto the tens of thousands and the thousands of Israel this he said teaches that the Shechinah does not rest upon Israel if they are less than two thousand plus two tens of thousands were therefore the Israelites to be twenty two thousand plus one and there was there among them a pregnant woman thus capable of completing the number but a dog barked at her and she miscarried the dog would in this case cause the Shechinah to depart from Israel a certain woman entered a neighbor's house to bake their bread and a dog suddenly barked at her but the owner of the house said to her do not be afraid of the dog as its teeth are gone she however said to him take thy kindness and throw it on the thorns for the embryo has already been moved from its place it is not right to place nets for doves unless at a distance of 30 ris from inhabited settlements but do they proceed so far did we not learn that a dove coat must be kept at a distance from the town of 50 cubits abay said they certainly fly much further than that but they eat their fill within 50 cubits but do they fly only 30 ris and no more was it not taught where there is an inhabited settlement no net must be spread even for a distance of 100 mil our joseph said the latter statement refers to a settlement of vineyards rabbi said that it refers to a settlement of dove coats but why not lay down the prohibition to spread nets on account of the dove cots themselves if you like i can say that they belong to kutians or if you like i can say that they are ownerless or if you again like I can say that they are his own Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B Chapter 8 Mishnah 1 who injures a fellow man becomes liable to him for five items for depreciation for pain for healing for loss of time and for degradation how is it with depreciation if he put out his eye cut off his arm or broke his leg the injured person is considered as if he were a slave being sold in the marketplace and evaluation is made as to how much he was worth previously and how much he is worth now pain if he burnt him either with a spit or with a nail even though on his fingernail which is a place where no bruise could be made it has to be calculated how much a man of equal standing would require to be paid to undergo such pain healing if he has struck him he is under obligation to pay medical expenses should ulcers meanwhile arise on his body if as a result of the wound the offender would be liable but if not as a result of the wound he would be exempt where the wound was healed but Reopened healed again but reopened he would still be under obligation to heal him if however it had completely healed but had subsequently reopened he would no more be under obligation to heal him loss of time the injured person is considered as if he were a watchman of cucumber bed so that the loss of such wages sustained by him during the period of illness may be reimbursed to him for there has already been paid to him the value of his hand or the value of his leg through which deprivation he would no more be able to carry on his previous employment degradation all to be estimated in accordance with the status of the offender and the offended tomorrow what pay compensation does the divine law not say I for I why not take this literally to mean putting out the eye of the offender let not this enter your mind since it has been taught you might think that where he put out his eye the offenders I should be put out or where he cut off his arm the offenders arm should be cut off or again where he broke his leg the offender's leg should be broken not so for it is laid down he that smite any man and he that smite the beast just as in the case of smiting a beast compensation is to be paid so also in the case of smiting a man compensation is to be paid and should this reason not satisfy you know that it is stated moreover ye shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer that is guilty of death implying that it is only for the life of a murderer that you may not take satisfaction whereas you may take satisfaction even for the principal limbs though these cannot be restored to what case of smiting does it refer if to the verse and he that killeth the beast shall make it good and he that killeth a man shall be put to death does not this verse refer to murder the quotation was therefore made from this text and he that smite the beast mortally shall make it good life for life which comes next to and if a man maim his neighbor as he hath done so shall it be done to him but is the term smiting mentioned in the latter text we speak of the effect of smiting implied in this text and of the effect of smiting implied in the other text just as smiting mentioned in the case of beast refers to the payment of compensation so also does smiting in the case of man refer to the payment of compensation but is it not written and he that smite any man mortally shall surely be put to death which on account of the fact that the law of murder is not being dealt with here surely refers to cases of mere injury and means retaliation even this refers to the payment of pecuniary compensation how do you know that it refers to pecuniary compensation why not say that it really means capital punishment let not this enter your mind first because it is compared to the case dealt with in the text he that smite the beast mortally shall make it good and furthermore because it is written soon after as he hath done so shall it be done to him thus proving that it means pecuniary compensation but what is meant by the statement if this reason does not satisfy you why should it not satisfy you the difficulty which further occurred to the tano was as follows what is your reason for deriving the law of man injuring man from the law of smiting a beast and not from the law governing the case of killing a man where retaliation is the rule i would answer it is proper to derive the law of injury from the law governing another case of injury and not to derive the law of injury from the law governing the case of murder it could however be argued to the contrary that it is proper to derive the law of injury inflicted upon man from another case of man but not to derive the law of injury inflicted upon man from the case of beast this was the point of the statement if however this reason does not satisfy you the answer is as follows it is stated moreover ye shall take no ransom for the life of a Murderer that is guilty of death but he shall surely be put to death implying that it was only for the life of a murderer that you may not take ransom whereas you may take ransom even for principal limbs though these cannot be restored but was the purpose of this verse moreover ye shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer to exclude the case of principal limbs was it not requisite that the divine law should state that you should not make him subject to two punishments i.e. that you should not take from him pecuniary compensation as well as kill him this however could be derived from the verse according to his crime which implies that you can make him liable for one crime but cannot make him liable for two crimes but still was it not requisite that the divine law should state that you should not take pecuniary compensation from him and release him from the capital punishment if so the divine law would have written moreover ye shall take no satisfaction for him who is Guilty and deserving of death, why then write for the life of a murderer unless to prove from it that it is only for the life of a murderer that you may not take ransom, whereas you may take ransom even for principal limbs, though these could not be restored, but since it was written moreover, ye shall take no ransom, implying the law of pecuniary compensation in the case of mere injury. Why do I require the analogy made between smiting in the case of injuring men and smiting in the case of injuring beast? It may be answered that if the law would have had to be derived only from the former text, I might have said that the offender has the option so that if he wishes he may pay with the loss of his eye, or if he desires otherwise he may pay the value of the eye. We are therefore told that the inference is from smiting a beast, just as in the case of smiting a beast, the offender is liable for pecuniary compensation, so also in the case of injuring a man he is liable for pecuniary. Compensation it was taught our dust I be Judah says I for I means pecuniary compensation you say pecuniary compensation but perhaps it is not so but actual retaliation by putting out an eye is meant what then will you say where the eye of one was big and the eye of the other little for how can I in this case apply the principle of I for I if however you say that in such a case pecuniary compensation will have to be taken did not the Torah state ye shall have one manner of law implying that the manner of law should be the same in all cases I might rejoin what is the difficulty even in that case why not perhaps say that for I taken away the divine law ordered I to be taken away from the offender for if you will not say this Talmud Mas Baba Kamba how could capital punishment be applied in the case of a dwarf killing a giant or a giant killing a dwarf seeing that the Torah says ye shall have one manner of law implying that the manner of law should be the same in all cases
carried out whereas where it is impossible it is impossible and the offender will have to be released altogether for if you will not say this what could be done in the case of a person afflicted with a fatal organic disease killing a healthy person you must therefore admit that it is only where it is possible to resort to the law of retaliation that it is resorted to whereas where it is impossible it is impossible and the offender will have to be released the school of our Ishmael taught. Scripture says so shall it be given to him again the word giving can apply only to pecuniary compensation but if so with the words as he hath given a blow that caused the blemish similarly refer to money it may be replied that at the school of our Ishmael this text was expounded as a superfluous verse since it has already been written and if a man maim his neighbor as he hath done so shall it be done to him why after this do we require the word so shall it be given to him again it must. Therefore refer to pecuniary compensation but still why the words as he hath given a blow that caused the blemish in a man since it was necessary to write so shall it be given to him again the text also writes as he hath given a blow that caused the blemish in a man the school of our high taught scripture says hand in hand meaning an article which is given from hand to hand which is of course money but could you also say the same regarding the next words foot in foot it may be replied that at the school of our high this text was expounded as a superfluous verse for it has already been written and shall you do unto him as he had purpose to do unto his brother if then you assume actual retaliation for injury why do I require the words hand in hand this shows that it means pecuniary compensation but still why the words foot in foot having written hand in hand the text also wrote foot in foot of said the principle of pecuniary compensation could be derived from the teaching of the school of Hezekiah for the school of Hezekiah taught I for I life for life but not life and I for I now if you assume that actual retaliation is meant it could sometimes happen that I and life would be taken for I as while the offender is being blinded his soul might depart from him but what difficulty is this perhaps what it means is that we have to form an estimate and only if the offender will be able to stand it will retaliation be adopted but if he will not be able to stand it retaliation will not be adopted and if after we estimate that he would be able to stand it and execute retaliation it so happens that his spirit departs from him there is nobody to blame as if he dies let him die for have we not learned regarding lashes where according to estimation he should be able to stand them but it happened that he died under the hand of the officer of the court there is exemption from any blame of manslaughter RZ but said in the name of Rabba scripture says Wound for what this means that compensation is to be made for pain even where depreciation is separately compensated now if you assume that actual retaliation is meant would it not be that just as the plaintiff suffered pain through the wound the offender too would suffer pain through the mere act of retaliation but what difficulty is this why perhaps not say that a person who is delicate suffers more pain whereas a person who is not delicate does not suffer so much pain so that the practical result of the scriptural inference would be to pay for the difference in the pain sustained our papa in the name of Rabba said scripture says to heal shall he heal this means that compensation is to be made for healing even where depreciation is compensated separately now if you assume that retaliation is meant would it not be that just as the plaintiff needed medical attention the defendant also would surely need medical attention through the act of retaliation but what Difficulty is this why perhaps not say that there are people whose flesh heals speedily while there are others whose flesh does not heal speedily so that the practical result of the scriptural inference would be to require payment for the difference in the medical expenses are as she said the principle of pecuniary compensation could be derived from the analogy of the term for occurring in connection with man with the term for occurring in connection with cattle it is written here I for I and it is also written there he shall surely pay ox for ox this indicates that just as in the latter case it is pecuniary compensation that is meant so also in the former case it means pecuniary compensation but what ground have you for comparing the term for with forementioned in connection with cattle rather than with the forementioned in connection with the killing of man as it is written thou shalt give life for life so that just as in the case of murder it is actual retaliation. So also here it means actual retaliation it may be answered that it is more logical to infer the law governing injury from the law governing another case of injury than to derive the law of injury from the law applicable in the case of murder but why not say on the contrary that it is more logical to derive the law applying to man from a law which similarly applies to man than to derive the law applying to man from that applying to cattle are as she therefore said it is from the words for he hath humbled her that the legal implication of I for I could be derived by analogy as the law in the case of man is thus derived from a law which is similarly applicable to man and the case of injury from a similar case of injury it was taught our Eliezer said I for I literally refers to the eye of the offender literally you say could our Eliezer be against all those ten name enumerated above Rabba thereupon said it only means to say that the injured person would not be valued as if he were a slave said Abbe to him how else could he be valued as a freeman could the bodily value of a freeman be ascertained by itself or as she therefore said it means to say that the valuation will be made not of the eye of the injured person but of that of the offender and as once bit off the hand of a child when the case was brought before our papa B. Samuel he said to the sheriffs of the court go forth and ascertain the value of the four items said Robert to him have we not learned five items he replied I did not include depreciation said Abbe to him was not the damage in this case done by an ass and in the case of an ass injuring even man there is no payment except for depreciation he therefore ordered the sheriffs go forth and make valuation of the depreciation but has not the injured person to be valued as if he were a slave he therefore said to them go forth and value the child as if it were a slave but the father of the child thereupon said I do not Want this method of valuation as this procedure is degrading they however said to him what right have you to deprive the child of the payment which would belong to it he replied when it comes of age I will reimburse it out of my own and ox once to the hand of a child when the case was brought before Rabba he said to the sheriffs of the court go forth and value the child as if it were a slave they however said to him did not the master himself say that payment for which the injured party would have to be valued as if he were a slave cannot be collected in Babylon he replied my order would surely have no application except in case of the plaintiff becoming possessed of property belonging to the defendant Rabba thus follows his own principle for Rabba said payment for damage done to chattel by cattle or for damage done to chattel by man can be collected even in Babylon whereas payment for injuries done to man by man or for injuries done to man by cattle cannot be collected in Babylon now what special reason is there why payment for injuries done to man by cattle cannot be collected in Babylon if not because it is requisite in these cases that the judges be termed Elohim a designation which is lacking in Babylon why then should the same not be also regarding payment for damage done to chattel by cattle or to chattel by man where there is similarly Talmud, Mas Baba Kama be required the designation of Elohim which is lacking in Babylon but if on the other hand the difference in the case of chattel damaged by cattle or chattel damaged by man is because we in Babylon are acting merely as the agents of the mum and judges in Eretz Yisrael as is the practice with matters of admittances and loans why then in the case of man injured by man or man injured by cattle should we similarly not act as their agents as is indeed the practice with matters of admittances and loans it may however be said that we act as their agents only in regard to a Matter of payment which we can fix definitely whereas in a matter of payment which we are not able to fix definitely but which requires valuation we do not act as their agents but I might object that payment for damage done to chattel by cattle or to chattel by man we are similarly not able to fix definitely but we have to say go out and see at what price an ox is sold on the marketplace why then in the case of man injured by man or man injured by cattle should you not similarly say go out and see at what price slaves are sold on the marketplace moreover why in the case of double payment and fourfold or fivefold payment which can be fixed precisely should we not act as their agents it may however be said that we may act as their agents only in matters of civil liability whereas in matters of a penal nature we cannot act as their agents but why then regarding payment for an injury done to man by man which is of a civil nature should we not act as their agents we can act as their agents only in a matter of frequent occurrence whereas in the case of man injured by man which is not a frequent occurrence we cannot act as their agents but why regarding degradation which is a frequent occurrence should we not act as their agents it may indeed be said that this is really the case for our papa ordered 400 zoos to be paid for degradation but this order of our papa is no precedence for when our hisda sent to consult our nomin in a certain case did not the letter sent backward hisda hisda are you really prepared to order payment of fines in babylon it must therefore be said that we can act as their
man why then only in the case of cattle injuring man is it not the fact that even in the case of man injuring man payment will not be collected in Babylon it must therefore surely refer to a case where damage was done to chattel and it was nevertheless laid down that no payment would be collected in Babylon it may however be said that that statement referred to Tam whereas the statement deals with Muad but did Rabbah not say that there could be no case of Muad in Babylon it may however be said that where an ox was declared Muad there in Eretz Yisrael and brought over here in Babylon there could be a case of Muad even in Babylon but surely this is a matter of no frequent occurrence and have you not stated that in a matter not of frequent occurrence we cannot act as their agents a case of Muad could arise even in Babylon where the rabbis of Eretz Yisrael came to Babylon and declared the ox Muad here but still this also is surely a matter of no frequent occurrence and have you not stated that in a matter not of frequent occurrence we cannot act as their agents Rabba must therefore have made a statement that payment will be collected even in Babylon where chattel was damaged by cattle with reference to tooth and foot which are Muad of initio pain if he burnt him either with a spit or with a nail even though on his fingernail which is a place where no bruise could be made etc would pain be compensated even in a case where no depreciation was thereby Cause who was the Tana that maintained such a view? Rabba replied, he was Ben Azay as taught Rabbi said that burning without bruising is mentioned at the outset, whereas Ben Azay said that it is with bruising that it is mentioned at the outset. What is the point at issue between them? Rabbi holds that as burning implies even without a bruise, the divine law had to insert bruise to indicate that it is only where the burning caused a bruise that there would be liability, but if otherwise this would not be so, whereas Ben Azay maintained that as burning by itself implied a bruise, the divine law had to insert bruise to indicate that burning meant even without a bruise or papa demurred. On the contrary, it is surely the reverse that stands to reason. Rabbi who said that burning without bruising is mentioned at the outset holds that as burning implies also a bruise, the divine law inserted bruise to indicate that burning meant even without a bruise, whereas Ben Azay who said that it was with bruising that it was mentioned at the outset maintains that as burning implies even without a bruise the divine law purposely inserted bruise to indicate that it was only where the burning has caused a bruise that there will be liability but if otherwise this would not be so for in this way they would have referred in their statements to the law as it stands now in its final form or alternatively it may be said that both held that burning implies both with a bruise and without a bruise. And here Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba, they were differing on the question of a generalization and a specification placed at a distance from each other rabbi maintaining that in such a case the principle of a generalization followed by a specification does not apply whereas Ben Azay maintained that the principle of a generalization followed by a specification does apply and should you ask why according to rabbi was it necessary to insert bruise the answer would be that it was necessary to impose. The payment of additional money it has to be calculated how much a man of equal standing would require to be paid to undergo such pain but how is pain calculated in a case where depreciation also has to be paid the father of Samuel replied we have to estimate how much a man would require to be paid to have his arm cut off to have his arm cut off would this involve only pain and not also all the five items moreover are we dealing with fools who would consent for any amount to have their arm cut off it must therefore refer to the cutting off of a mutilated arm but even if the calculation be made on the basis of a mutilated arm would it amount only to pain and not also to pain plus degradation as it is surely a humiliation that a part of the body should be taken away and thrown to dogs it must therefore mean that we estimate how much a man whose arm had by written decree of the government to be taken off by means of a drug would require that it should be cut off by means of a Sword, but I might say that even in such a case no man would take anything at all to hurt himself so much it must therefore mean that we have to estimate how much a man whose arm had by written decree of the government to be cut off by means of a sword would be prepared to pay that it might be taken off by means of a drug but if so instead of to be paid should it not be written to pay said Arhuna the son of our Joshua it means that payment to the plaintiff will have to be made by the offender to the extent of the amount which the person sentenced would have been prepared to pay healing if he has struck him he is under obligation to pay medical expenses etc our rabbis taught should ulcers grow on his body as a result of the wound and the wound break open again he has still to heal him and is liable to pay him for loss of time but if it was not caused through the wound he has not to heal him and need not pay him for loss of time our Judah however said that even if it was Caused through the wound though he has to heal him he has not to pay him for loss of time the sages said the loss of time and healing are mentioned together in scripture wherever there is liability for loss of time there is liability for healing but wherever there is no liability for loss of time there is no liability for healing in regard to what principle do they differ rabbis said I found the rabbis at the school of rabbis sitting and saying that the question whether or not a wound may be bandaged by the injured person was the point at issue the rabbis maintained that a wound may be bandaged whereas Arjuna maintained that a wound may not be bandaged so that it was only for healing of which there is a double mention in scripture that there is liability but for loss of time of which there is no double mention in scripture there is no liability I however said to them that if a wound may not be bandaged there would be no liability even for healing we must therefore say that all are agreed that a wound may be bandaged but not too much are Judah held that since it may not be bandaged too much it is only for healing of which there is a double mention in scripture that there will be liability but for loss of time of which there is no double mention in scripture there will be no liability whereas the rabbis maintained that since scripture made a double mention of healing there will be liability also for loss of time which is compared to healing are Judah however maintained that there will be no liability for loss of time as scripture accepted this by the term only to which the rabbis might rejoin that only was intended to exclude the case where the ulcers that grew were not caused by the wound but according to the rabbis mentioned last who stated that whenever there is liability for loss of time there is liability for healing whereas where there is no liability for loss of time there could be no liability for healing why do I require the double mention of Healing this was necessary for the lesson enunciated by the school of our Ishmael as taught the school of our Ishmael taught the words and to heal he shall heal are the source whence it can be derived that authorization was granted by God to the medical man to heal our rabbis taught whence can we learn that where ulcers have grown on account of the wound and the wound breaks open again the offender would still be liable to heal it and also pay him for the additional loss of time because it says only he shall pay for the loss of his time and to heal he shall heal that being so I might say that this is so even where the ulcers were not caused by the wound it therefore says further only our Jose B. Judah however said that even where they were caused by the wound he would be exempt since it says only some say that the view of our Jose that even where they were caused by the wound he would be exempt means altogether from any liability whatsoever which is also the view of it. Rabbis mentioned last but others say that even where they were caused by the wound he would be exempt means only from paying for additional loss of time though he would be liable for healing with whom would our Jose B. Judah then be concurring in his statement with his own father the master stated in that case I might say that this is so even where the ulcers were not caused by the wound it therefore says further only but is a text necessary to teach that there is exemption in the case where they were caused not by the wound it may be replied that what is meant by caused not by the wound is as taught if the injured person disobeyed his medical advice and ate honey or any other sort of sweet things though honey and any other sort of sweetness are harmful to a wound and the wound in consequence became gargut and scabby it might have been said that the offender should still be liable to continue to heal him to rule out this idea it says only what is the meaning of Gargut Niebe said a rough seam how can it be cured by aloes wax and resin if the offender says to the injured person I can personally act as your healer the other party can retort you are in my eyes like a lurking lion so also if the offender says to him I will bring you a physician who will heal you for nothing he might object saying a physician who heals for nothing is worth nothing again if he says to him I will bring you a physician from a distance he might say to him if the physician is a long way off the eye will be blind before he arrives if on the other hand the injured person says to the offender give the money to me personally as I will cure myself he might retort you might neglect yourself and thus get from me too much even if the injured person says to him make it a fixed and definite sum he might object and say there is all the more danger that you might neglect yourself and thus remain a cripple and I will consequently be called a harmful oxytanitot. All the four items will be paid even in the case where depreciation is paid independently whence can
Ishmael that the text Enjuhil Ishalhil is the source whence it is derived that authorization was granted by God to the medical man to heal if so that it was to be utilized solely for that implication scripture would have said let the physician cause him to be healed this shows that payment for healing should be made even in the case where depreciation is paid independently but still is not the text required as said above to provide a double mention in respect of healing if so scripture should have said either to cause to heal and to cause to heal or he shall cause to heal and he shall cause to heal why say and to heal he shall heal unless to prove that payment should be made for healing even in the case where deprecation is paid independently from this discussion it would appear that a case could arise where the four items would be paid even where no depreciation was caused but how could such a case be found where no depreciation was caused regarding pain it was stated pain if he burnt him either with a spit or with a nail even on his fingernail which is a place where no bruise could be made healing could apply in a case where one had been suffering from some wound which was being healed up but the offender put on the wound a very strong ointment which made the skin look white like that of a leper so that other ointments have to be put on to enable him to regain the natural color of the skin loss of time without depreciation could occur where the offender wrongfully locked him up in a room and thus kept him idle degradation could apply where he spat on his face loss of time the injured person is considered as if he were a watchman of cucumber beds are rabbis taught in the case of assessing loss of time the injured person is considered as if he would have been a watchman of cucumbers you might say that the requirements of justice suffer thereby since when he was well he would surely not necessarily have worked for the wages of a watchman of cucumber beds but might have carried buckets of water and been paid accordingly or have acted as a messenger and been paid accordingly but in truth the requirements of justice do not suffer for he has already been paid for the value of his hand or for the value of his leg Rabbi said if he cut off another's arm he must pay him for the value of the arm and as to loss of time the injured person is to be considered as if he were a watchman of cucumber bed so also if he Broke the other's leg, he must pay him for the value of the leg, and as to loss of time, the injured person is to be considered as if he were a doorkeeper. If he put out another's eye, he must pay him for the value of his eye, and as to loss of time, the injured person is to be considered as if he were grinding in the mill. But if he made the other deaf, he must pay for the value of the whole of him. Rob asked if he had cut off another man's arm, and before any appraisement had been made, he also broke his leg, and again before any appraisement had been made, he put out his eye, and again before any appraisement had been made, he made him at last deaf. What would be the law? Shall we say that since no valuation has yet been made, one valuation would be enough so that he would have to pay him altogether for the value of the whole of him, or shall perhaps each occurrence be appraised by itself and paid for accordingly? The practical difference would be whether he would have to pay for pain and degradation of each occurrence separately it is true that he would not have to pay for depreciation healing and loss of time regarding each occurrence separately the reason being that since he has to pay him for the whole of him the injured person is considered as if killed altogether and there could surely be made no more payment than for the value of the whole of him but in respect of pain and degradation the payment should be made for each occurrence separately as he surely suffered pain and degradation on each occasion separately if however you find it more correct to say that since no appraisement had been yet made he can pay him for the value of the whole of him altogether what would be the lower separate appraisements were made shall we say that since separate valuations were made the payment should be for each occurrence by itself or since the payment had not yet been made he has perhaps to pay him for the value of the whole of him this must remain undecided rabbi asked what would be the law regarding loss of time that renders the injured person of less value for the time being? How could we give an example for instance where he struck him on his arm and the arm was broken but will ultimately recover fully? What would be the legal position? Shall we say that since it will ultimately recover fully he need not pay him for the value of the arm or perhaps not so since for the time being he diminished his value? Come in here if one strikes his father and his mother without making on them a bruise or injures another man on the day of atonement Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba, he is liable for all of the five items. Now how are we to picture no bruise being made in such a case? Does this not mean e.g. where he struck him on his arm which will ultimately recover and it is nevertheless stated that he is liable for all of the five items? It may however be said that we are dealing here with a case where he made him deaf without making a bruise on him but did. Rabbi not say that he who makes his father deaf is subject to be executed for it is impossible to cause deafness without first making a bruise through which a drop of blood falls into the ear it must therefore be said that we are dealing here with a case where e.g. he shaved him against his will but will not the hair grow again in the case of shaving and that is the very question propounded it may however be said that we are dealing here with a case where e.g. he smeared nasha over it so that no hair will ever grow there again pain in such a case should similarly be paid where he had scratches on his head and thus suffered on account of the source healing should similarly be paid as it requires curing loss of time would be where he was a dancer in wine houses and has to make gestures by moving his head and cannot do so now on account of these scratches degradation should certainly be paid for there could hardly be a case of greater degradation but this matter which was Doubtful to Rabbi was quite certain to Abe taking one view and to Rabbi taking the opposite view for it was stated if he struck him on his arm and the arm was broken but so that it would ultimately recover completely Abe said that he must pay for general loss of time plus particular loss of time whereas Rabbi said that he will not have to pay him anything but for the amount of the loss of time for each day until he recovers it was stated if a man cuts off the arm of a Hebrew servant of another Abe said that he will have to pay the servant for general loss of time and the master for particular loss of time whereas Rabbi said that the whole payment should be given to the servant who would have to invest it and purchase real property whose produce would be enjoyed by the master there is no question that where the servant became through the injury depreciated in his personal value while no loss was caused so far as the master was concerned as for instance where the offender Split the top of the servant's ear or the top of his nostrils, the whole payment would go to the servant himself. It was only where the depreciation affected the master also that Abe and Rabbi differ degradation all to be estimated in accordance with the status of the offender and the offended. May we say that our mission is in agreement neither with our Meir nor with our Judah but with our Simeon, for it was taught all sorts of injured persons should be considered as if they were freemen who have become impoverished since they are all the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the view of our Meir. Our Judah says that degradation in the case of the eminent man will be estimated in accordance with his eminence, whereas in the case of the insignificant man it will be estimated in accordance with his insignificance. Our Simeon says that wealthy persons will be considered merely as if they were freemen who have become impoverished, whereas the poor will all be put on the level of it. Least among them now in accordance with whom is our mission it could not be in accordance with our mayor for the mission states that all are to be estimated in accordance with the status of the offender and the offended whereas according to our mayor all sorts of persons are treated alike it could similarly not be in accordance with our Judah for the mission subsequently states that he who insults even a blind person is liable whereas our Judah says that a blind person is not subject to the law of degradation must the mission therefore not be in accordance with our Simeon you may say that they are even in accordance with our Judah for the statement made by our Judah that a blind person is not subject to the law of degradation means that no payment will be exacted from him where he insulted others whereas when it comes to paying him for degradation where he was insulted by others we would surely order that he be paid but since it was stated in the concluding clause if he insulted a person who was sleeping he would be liable to pay for degradation whereas if a person who was asleep insulted others he would be exempt and no statement was made to the effect that a blind person insulting others should be exempt it surely implied that in the case of a blind person there was no difference whether he was insulted by others or whether he insulted others as in all cases the law of degradation would apply it must therefore be considered as proved that the Mishnaic statements were in accordance with our Simeon who was a tenant for what our rabbis taught if he intended to insult a katan but insulted by accident a gadol he would have to pay the gadol the amount due for the degradation of the katan and so also where he intended to insult a slave but by accident insulted a freeman he would have to pay the freeman the amount due for the degradation of the slave according to whom is this teaching it is in agreement neither with our mayor nor with our Juden, nor even with our Simeon it being assumed that Katon meant small in possessions and Gadol similarly meant great in possessions it could thus hardly be in accordance with our Meir for he said
of appraisement we can still base the assessment on them or if you like I may say that you may even regard the teaching as being in accordance with our mayor for why should you think that Gadol means great in possessions and Kadon means small in possessions and not rather that Gadol means an actual Gadol i.e. one who is of age and Kadon means an actual Kadon i.e. a minor but is a minor subject to suffer degradation yes as elsewhere stated by our Papa that if where he is reminded of some insult he feels abashed he is subject to degradation so also here Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B, he was a minor who if the insult were mentioned to him would feel abashed Mishnah one who insults a naked person or one who insults a blind person or one who insults a person asleep is liable for degradation though if a person asleep insulted others he would be exempt if one in falling from a roof did damage and also caused somebody to be degraded he would be liable for depreciation but exempt from paying for degradation unless he intended to inflict it Gemara our rabbis taught if he insulted a person who was naked he would be liable though there could be no comparison between one who insulted a person who was naked and one who insulted a person who was dressed if he insulted him in the public bath he would be liable though one who insulted a person in a public bath could not be compared to one who insulted a person in the marketplace the master stated if he insulted a person who was naked he would be liable but is a person who walks about naked capable of being insulted said our papa the meaning of naked is that a wind suddenly came and lifted up his clothes and then someone came along and raised them still higher thus putting him to shame if he insulted him in the public bath he would be liable but is a public bath a place where people are apt to feel offended said our papa it meant that he insulted him near the river our abu asked what would be the lower he humiliated a person who was asleep but who died before waking what is the principle involved in this query said rz but the principle involved is this is degradation paid because of the insult and as in this case he died before waking and was never insulted no payment should thus be made or is it perhaps on account of the public disgrace and as there was here disgrace payment should be made to the ears come and here our mayor says a deaf mute and a minor are subject to be paid for Degradation but an idiot is not subject to be paid for degradation now no difficulty arises if you say that degradation is paid on account of the disgrace it is then quite intelligible that a minor should be paid for degradation but if you say that degradation is paid on account of the insult we have to ask is a minor subject to feel insulted what well, then you say that degradation is paid because of the disgrace why then should the same not apply even in the case of an idiot it may however be said that the idiot by himself constitutes a disgrace which is second to none but in any case why not conclude from this statement that degradation is paid on account of the disgrace for if on account of the insult is a minor subject to feel insulted as elsewhere stated by our papa that if where the insult is recalled to him he feels abashed he is subject to degradation so also here he was a minor who when the insult was recalled to him would feel abashed our papa however said that the principle involved in the query of our Abba was this is degradation paid because of personal insult and as in this case where he died before waking he did not suffer any personal insult no payment should be made or is degradation paid perhaps on account of the insult suffered by the family come and here a deaf mute and a minor are subject to be paid for degradation but an idiot is not subject to be paid for degradation now no difficulty arises if you say that degradation is paid on account of the insult suffered by the family it is then quite intelligible that a minor should be paid for degradation but if you say that degradation is paid on account of personal insult we have to ask is a minor subject to personal insult what then do you say that degradation is paid because of the insult sustained by the members of the family why then should the same not apply in the case of an idiot it may however be said that the idiot by himself constitutes a degradation to them which is second to none but in any case why not conclude from this statement that degradation is paid on account of the insult suffered by the family for if on account of personal insult is a minor subject to personal insult said our papa yes if when the insult is mentioned to him he feels insulted as indeed taught rabbi says a deaf mute is subject to be paid for degradation but an idiot is not subject to be paid for degradation whereas a minor is sometimes subject to be paid and sometimes not subject to be paid for degradation the former must be in a case where if the insult is mentioned to him he would feel abashed and the latter in a case where if the insult is recalled to him he would not feel abashed one who insults a blind person is liable for degradation this mission is not in accordance with Arjuda for it was taught Arjuda says a blind person is not subject to the law of degradation so also did Arjuda exempt him from the liability of being exiled and from the liability of lashes and from the liability of being put to death by a court of law what is the reason of Arjuda he derives the law in the case of degradation by comparing the term thine eyes inserted in the case of degradation from the term thine eyes occurring in the case of witnesses who were proved so just as their blind persons are not included so also your blind persons should not be included the exemption from the liability to be exiled is derived as taught seeing him not except a blind person so Arjuda our mayor on the other hand says that it includes a blind person what is the reason of Arjuda he might say to you as scripture says as when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to you would which might include even a blind person the divine law therefore says seeing him not to exclude him but our mayor might contend that as the divine law inserted seeing him not which implies an exception and the divine law further inserted unawares which similarly implies an exception we have thus a limitation followed by another limitation and the established rule is that a limitation followed by another limitation is intended to amplify and Arjuda he could argue that the word unawares came to be inserted to accept the case of intention exemption from liability to be put to death by a court of law is derived from comparing the term murderer used in the section dealing with capital punishment with the term murderer used in the section setting out the liability to be exiled exemption from liability of lashes is learned by comparing the term wicked occurring in the section dealing with lashes with the term wicked occurring in the case of those who are liable to be put to death by a court of law another very the taught Arjuda says a blind person is not subject to the law of degradation Talmud Mas Baba Kamba so also did Arjuda exempt him from all the judgments of the Torah what is the reason of Arjuda scripture says and it Congregation shall judge between the smiter and the avenger of blood according to these ordinances whoever is subject to the law of the smiter and the avenger of blood is subject to judgments but he who is not subject to the law of the smiter and the avenger of blood is not subject to judgments another very the taught Arjuda says a blind person is not subject to the law of degradation so also did Arjuda exempt him from all commandments stated in the Torah Arshisha the son of Aridi said that reason of Arjuda was because scripture says now this is the commandment the statutes and the ordinances he who is subject to the ordinances is subject to commandments and statutes but he who is not subject to ordinances is not subject to commandments and statutes are Joseph stated formerly I used to say if someone would tell me that the Halajah is in accordance with Arjuda who declared that a blind person is exempt from the commandments I would make a festive occasion for our rabbis because Though I am not enjoined I still perform commandments but now that I have heard the statement of Arhana as Arhana indeed said that greater is the reward of those who being enjoined do good deeds than of those who without being enjoined but merely of their own free will do good deeds if someone would tell me that the Halacha is not in accordance with Arjuda I would make a festive occasion for our rabbis because if I am enjoined to perform commandments the reward will be greater for me mission on this point the law for man is more severe than the law for cattle is that man has to pay for depreciation pain healing loss of time and degradation and he pays also for the value of embryos whereas in the case of cattle there is no payment for anything but depreciation and there is exemption from paying the value of embryos one who strikes his father and his mother without however making a bruise on them or one who injured his fellow on the day of atonement is liable for all the five items one who injures a Hebrew slave is similarly liable for all of them with the exception however of loss of time if he is his own slave one who injures a Canaanite slave belonging to another person is similarly liable for all the five items are Judah however says that no degradation is paid in the case of Canaanite slaves a deaf mute an idiot and a minor are awkward to deal with as he who injures them is liable to pay whereas if they injure others they are exempt so also a slave and a married woman are awkward to deal with as he who injures them is liable to pay whereas if they injure others they are exempt though they may have to pay at a later date for if the woman was divorced or the slave manumitted they would be liable to pay he who smites his father or his mother making also a bruise on them or he who injures another on the Sabbath is exempt from all the five items for he is
Liable for all of them with the exception however of loss of time if he is his own slave Abbe replied rapturely agrees regarding the item of loss of time as the work of her hands during the period preceding the age of woman who belongs to her father a further objection was raised from the following if one injures his son who has already come of age he has to compensate him straight away but if his son was still a minor he must make for him a safe investment out of the compensation money. While he who injures his minor daughter is exempt and what is more if others injure her they are liable to pay the compensation to her father the rulings here similarly refer to loss of time is it really a fact that in the case of a son who has already come of age the father has to compensate him straight away if so a contradiction could be pointed out from the following if one injures the sons and daughters of others if they have already come of age he has to pay them straight away but if they are still minors he should make for them a safe investment out of the compensation money whereas where the sons and daughters were his own he would be exempt altogether it may however be said that there is no difficulty as the ruling here stating exemption refers to a case where the children still reclined at the father's table whereas the ruling there deals with a case where they did not recline at his table but how could you explain the former teaching to refer to a case where they did not recline at his table for if so read the concluding clause whereas he who injures his minor daughter is exempt and what is more even others who injure her are liable to pay the compensation to her father why not pay her since she has to maintain herself for even according to the view that a master may say to his slave work with me though I am not prepared to maintain you surely this applies only to a Canaanite slave to whom the master can say do your work during the day and in the evenings you can go out and look about for food whereas in the case of a Hebrew slave in connection with whom it is written because he fareth well with thee implying with thee in food and with thee in drink this could certainly not be maintained how much the more so than in the case of his own daughter as stated in another connection by Robert the son of Arola that the ruling applies only to the surplus of the amount of her earnings over the cost of maintenance so also here in this case. This ruling applies only to the surplus of the amount of compensation over the cost of maintenance you have then explained the latter statement that there is exemption in the case of his own children as dealing with the case where the children reclined at his table why then in the case of children of other persons is it stated that if they had already come of age he has to pay them straight away but if they were still minors he should make for them a safe investment out of the compensation. Money why should the compensation not be made to their father it may however be said that the father would be particular only in a matter which would cause him a loss whereas in regard to a profit coming from outside he would not mind it going to the children but what about a find which is similarly a profit coming from outside and the father still is particular about it it may be said that he is particular even about a profit which comes from outside provided no actual pain was caused to the children through it whereas in the matter of compensation for injury where the children suffered actual pain and where the profit comes from outside he does not mind but what of the other case where the daughter suffered actual pain and where there was a profit coming from outside and the father nevertheless was particular about it as stated what is more even others who injure her are liable to pay the compensation to her father it may still be said that it was only in that case where the father was an eccentric person who would not have his children at his table that he could be expected to care for the matter of profit coming even from outside whereas in the case here where he was not an eccentric person as his children joined him at his table it is only regarding a matter which would cause him a loss that he would be particular but he would not mind about a matter of profit coming from outside what is meant by a safe investment are his da said to buy a scroll of the law. Rabbi son of Arhuna said to buy a palm tree from which he gets a profit in the shape of dates Resh Lakish similarly said that the Torah did not bestow upon the father any right save to the income of youth alone are Yohan and however said even regarding wounding how can you think about wounding even our Eliezer did not raise a question except regarding an injury Talmud, Mas Babakama through which her pecuniary value is decreased whereas regarding mere wounding through which her pecuniary value would not usually decrease there was never any question that the compensation would not go to the father how then could our Yohan and speak of mere wounding our Jose B. Hanan replied we suppose the wound to have been made in her face thus causing her pecuniary value to be decreased one who injures a Canaanite slave belonging to another person is similarly liable for all five items our Judah however says that no degradation is paid in the case of Canaanite slaves what is the reason of our Judah? As scripture says when men strive together one with another the law applies to one who can claim brotherhood and thus excludes a slave who cannot claim brotherhood and the rabbis they would say that even a slave is a brother insofar as he is subject to commandments if this is so would you say that according to our Judah witnesses proved Zomemim in a capital accusation against a slave would not be subject to be put to death in virtue of the words then shall ye do unto him as he had purpose to do unto his brother Rabbi said that Arshis hate stated the verse concludes so shalt thou put away the evil from among you implying on all accounts would you say that according to the rabbis a slave would be eligible to be chosen as king I would reply according to your reasoning would the same difficulty not arise regarding a pros like whichever view we accept unless we suppose that when scripture says one from among thy brethren it implies one of the choicest of thy brethren but again would you now also say that according to the rabbis a slave would be eligible to give evidence since it says and behold if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother or replied regarding evidence you can surely not argue thus for that he is disqualified from giving evidence can be learned by means of an fortiori from the law in the case of woman for if woman who is eligible to enter by marriage into the congregation of Israel is yet ineligible to give evidence how much more must a slave who is not eligible to enter by marriage into the congregation of Israel be ineligible to give evidence but why is woman disqualified if not perhaps because she is not subject to the law of circumcision how then can you assert the same in the case of a slave who is subject to circumcision the case of a male minor will meet the subjection for in spite of his being subject to circumcision he is disqualified from giving evidence but why is a minor Disqualified if not perhaps because he is not subject to commandments how then can you assert the same in the case of a slave who is subject to commandments the case of woman will meet the subjection for though she is subject to commandments she is disqualified from giving evidence the argument is thus endlessly reversible there are features in the one instance which are not found in the other and vice versa the features common to both are that they are not subject to all the commandments and that they are disqualified from giving evidence I will therefore include with them a slave who also is not subject to all the commandments and should therefore also be disqualified from giving evidence but why I may ask is a feature common to them that they are disqualified from giving evidence if not perhaps because neither of them is a man how then can you assert the same in the case of a slave who is a man you must therefore deduce the disqualification of a slave from the law applicable in the case of a robber but why is there this disqualification in the case of a robber if not because his own deeds caused it how then can you assert the same in the case of a slave whose own deeds could surely not cause it you must therefore deduce the disqualification of a slave from both the law applicable to a robber and the law applicable to either of these referred to above Mar the son of Robin however said scripture says the fathers shall not be put to death through the children from this it could be inferred that no sentence of capital punishment should be passed on the evidence of the mouth of persons who if they were to be fathers would have no legal paternity over their children for if you assume that the verse is to be taken literally fathers shall not be put to death through children meaning through the evidence of children the divine law should have written fathers shall not be put to death through their children why then is it written children unless to indicate that no sentence of capital punishment should be passed on the evidence of the mouth of persons who if they were to be fathers would have no legal paternity over their children if that is so would you also say that the concluding clause neither shall the children be put to death through the father similarly implies that no sentence of capital punishment should be passed on the evidence of the mouth of witnesses who as children would have no legal filiation with respect to their fathers. And therefore argue that a proselyte should similarly be disqualified from giving evidence it may be said that there is no comparison it is true that a proselyte has no legal relationship to his ancestors still he has legal relationship with his descendants but we may therefore exclude a slave who has relationships neither with ancestors nor with descendants for if you should assume that a proselyte is disqualified from giving evidence the divine law should surely have written fathers shall not be put to death through their children which would mean what we stated that they would not be put to death through the evidence of children and after this the divine law should have written neither shall children be put to death through fathers as from such a text you would have derived the two rules one that children should not be put to death through the evidence of f
of the fact that he has legal paternity over his children if you object why did the divine law not write neither shall children be put to death through their fathers and why did the divine law write and neither shall children be put to death through fathers which appears to imply that no sentence of capital punishment should be passed on the evidence of the mouth of witnesses who as children would have no legal affiliation with respect to fathers my answer is that since it was written Fathers shall not be put to death through children. It was further written, neither shall children be put to death through fathers. A deaf mute and idiot and a minor are awkward to deal with. The mother of our Samuel B. Abba of Hadronia was married to our Abba and bequeathed her possessions to our Samuel B. Abba, her son after her death. Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B. Our Samuel B. Abba went to consult our Jeremiah B. Abba, who confirmed him in possession of her property. Our Abba thereupon went and related the case to our Hashai. Our Hashai then went and spoke on the matter with Rab Judah, who said to him that Samuel had ruled as follows: If a woman disposes of her Melic possessions during the lifetime of her husband and then dies, the husband is entitled to recover them from the hands of the purchasers. When the statement was repeated to our Jeremiah B. Abba, he said, I only know the Mishnah ruling which we have learned. If a man assigns his possessions to his son to take effect after his death, neither can the son. Alienate them during the lifetime of the father as they are then still in the possession of the father nor can the father dispose of them since they are assigned to the son still if the father sells them the sale is valid until his death if the son disposes of them the purchaser has no hold on them until the father dies this implies does it not that when the father dies the purchaser will have the possessions bought by him from the son during the lifetime of the father and this even though the son died during the lifetime of the father in which case they had never yet entered into the possession of the son for so it was laid down by our Simeon Belakish who said that there should be no difference whether the son died in the lifetime of the father in which case the estate never came into the possession of the son or whether the father died in the lifetime of the son in which case the estate had entered into the possession of the son the purchaser would in either case acquire title. To the estate for it was stated where the son sold the estate in the lifetime of the father and it so happened that the son died during the lifetime of the father our Yohanan said that the purchaser would not acquire title to the estate whereas Resh Lakish said that the purchaser would acquire title to the estate our Yohanan who held that the purchaser would not acquire title to the estate would say to you that the Mishnaic statement if the son disposed of them the purchaser would have no hold on them until the father dies implying that at any rate after the death of the father the purchaser would own them refers to the case where the son did not die during the lifetime of the father so that the estate had actually entered into the possession of the son whereas where the son died during the lifetime of the father in which case the estate had never entered into the possession of the son the purchaser would have no title to the estate even after the death of the father this shows that in the opinion of our Yohanan, a right to use a fruct amounts in law to a right to the very substance of the estate from which it follows that when the son sold the estate during the lifetime of his father, he was disposing of a thing not belonging to him. Resh Lakish, on the other hand, said that the purchaser would in all cases acquire title to the estate after the death of the vendor's father. For the Mishnaic statement, if the son disposed of them, the purchaser would have no hold on them until the father died, implying that at least after the death of the father, the purchaser would own them applies equally whether the son did not die in the lifetime of the father, in which case the estate had entered into the possession of the son, or whether the son did die during the lifetime of the father, in which case the estate never did come into the possession of the son, as in all cases the purchaser would acquire title to the estate as soon as the vendor's father died. This shows that in the Opinion of Resh Lakish, a right to mere usufruct does not yet amount to a right in the very substance of the estate from which it follows that when the son sold the estate during his father's lifetime, he was disposing of a thing that legally belonged to him. Now both our Jeremiah B. Abba and Rab Judah concur with Resh Lakish and our Jeremiah B. Abba accordingly argues thus if you assume that a right to usufruct amounts in law to a right in the very substance, why then on the death of the father? If the son has previously died during the lifetime of his father, should the purchaser have any title to the estate since when the son sold it, he was disposing of a thing not belonging to him, does not this show that a right to mere usufruct does not amount to a right to the very substance when, however, the argument was later repeated in the presence of Rab Judah, he said that Samuel had definitely stated this case cannot be compared to that stated in the mission on what ground our Joseph replied. We should have no difficulty if the case in the mission were stated in a reverse order, i.e., if a son assigns his possessions to his father to take effect after the son's death and the father sold them during the lifetime of the son and died before the son, and if the law would also in this case have been that the purchaser acquired title to the possessions, it would indeed have been possible to prove from it that a right to use of rock does not amount to a right to the very substance, but seeing that what it actually says is if a father assigns his possessions to his son, the reason why the sale by the son is valid is that since he was eligible to inherit him, the father by drawing up the deed must necessarily have intended that the transfer to the son should have legal effect forthwith sent away to him. Does only a son inherit a father, and does a father never inherit a son? It is therefore to be assumed that such a deed was drawn up only for the purpose of keeping the possessions. Out of the hands of the children, and similarly also here the deed might have been drawn up for the sole purpose of keeping the possessions out of the hands of his brothers. The reason of Samuel's remark that this case cannot be compared to that stated in the Mishnah is because of the rabbinic enactment at Ashah for our Jose B. Hanna said it was enacted at Ashah that if a woman disposes of her Melic possessions during the lifetime of her husband and subsequently dies, the husband will be entitled to recover them from the hands of the purchasers. Our E.D.B. Avin said that we have been taught to the same effect where witnesses state we can testify against the particular person that he has divorced his wife and paid her for her Kathu the Talmud, Mas Babakama, while the woman in question was still with him and in fact looking after him and the witnesses were subsequently proved so it would not be right to say that they should pay the woman the whole amount of her Kathu as she did. Not lose anything but the satisfaction of the benefit of being provided with her kathuba. How could the value of the satisfaction of the benefit of her kathuba be arrived at? An estimate will have to be made of how much a man would be prepared to pay as purchase money for the kathuba of this particular woman, which can mature only after she is left a widow or divorced. Since were she previously to die, her husband would inherit her. Now, if you assume that this enactment of a is of no avail, why is it certain that her husband would inherit her? Why should she be unable to sell her kathuba outright? Abay said, if all this could be said regarding Melic possessions, can it also be said regarding the possessions placed in the husband's hands and secured as if they were iron flocks? Abay further said, since the subject of the mere satisfaction of the benefit has been raised, let us say something on it. The purchase money of the satisfaction of the benefit would belong solely to. The woman, for if you assume that it should be subject to the rights of the husband, why could the witnesses not argue against her? What loss did we cause you? For should you even have sold the satisfaction of the benefit, the husband would have taken away the purchase money from you or shall man, however, said because even then there would have been ample domestic provision. Rabba stated the law is that the purchase money for the satisfaction of the benefit belongs solely to the woman, and the husband will have no right to enjoy any profit that may result from it. The reason being that it was only profits that the rabbis assigned to him, whereas profits out of profits were not assigned to him by the rabbis. When our papa and our Huna, the son of our Joshua, came from the college, they said we have learned to the same effect as the enactment of a shot in the following mission. A slave and a woman are awkward to deal with as he who injures them is liable to pay, whereas if they have injured. Others they are exempt now if you assume that the enactment of a shot is not effective why should she not sell her melic property and with the purchase money pay the compensation but even according to your reasoning granted that the enactment of a shot is effective in which case she would be powerless to alienate altogether her melic possessions yet let her sell the melic estate for what the satisfaction of the benefit would fetch and with his purchase money pay the compensation it must therefore surely be said that the ruling applies where she had no melic property so also according to the other view the ruling would apply only where she possessed no melic property but why should she not sell her kathuba for as much as the satisfaction of the benefit will fetch and thus pay compensation the ruling is based on the view of our mayor who said that it is prohibited for any man to keep his wife without a kathuba even for one hour but what is the reason of this so that it should not be an Easy matter in his e
she should subsequently release her husband from the obligation the purchaser would lose nothing as now too she pays him nothing on account of the compensation my answer is that as it is in any case quite certain that where there is an obligation on the husband the wife will release him it would not be proper to trouble the court of law so much for nothing but seeing that it was taught so also if she injures her husband she does not forfeit her kathu but why should she in this case not assign her kathu to the husband and thus let him have the satisfaction of the benefit as compensation for the injury for even if she releases her husband from the obligation no loss will result therefrom this teaching is surely based on the view of our mayor who said that it is prohibited for any man to keep his wife without a kathu but even for one hour the reason being that it should not be an easy matter in the eyes of the husband to divorce a wife so also here if the kathu be assigned to him he might easily divorce her and have her kathu for himself as compensation for the injury but if so even now that the kathu remains with her would he just the same not find it easy to divorce her as he would retain the amount of her kathu as compensation for the injury this however would not be so where e.g. the amount of her kathu was much more than that of the compensation as on account of the small amount of the compensation he would surely not risk losing more but again if it amount of her kathu exceeded that of an ordinary kathu as fixed by the law why should we not reduce the amount to that of the ordinary kathu fixed by the law and she should assign the difference to the husband as compensation for the injury this could not be done where e.g. the amount of her kathu did not exceed that of the ordinary kathu fixed by the law and the compensation for the injury was assessed to be four zoos as it is pretty certain that for four zoos he will not risk Losing 25 cell but what of that which was taught just as she cannot be compelled to assign her kathu so long as she is with her husband so also she cannot be compelled to remit anything of her kathu so long as she is with her husband are there not times when she would be forced to remit as for example where the amount of her kathu exceeded the amount of an ordinary kathu fixed by the law said Robert this concluding paragraph refers to the clause inserted in it. Kathu regarding the male children and what was meant was this just as in the case of a wife assigning her kathu to others she does thereby not impair the clause in the kathu regarding the male children the reason being that she might have been compelled to do it on account of a pressing need for money so should also be the case where a wife assigns her kathu to her own husband that she would thereby not impair the clause in the kathu dealing with male children on the ground that she might have been compelled to do this for lack of funds. May we say that the enactment of the Shah was a point at issue between the following Tanaim for one Barry that teaches that Melik slaves are to go out free for the sake of a tooth or an eye if assaulted by the wife but not if assaulted by the husband whereas another Barry that teaches that they are not to go out free when assaulted either by the husband or by the wife. Now it was thought that all authorities agree that a right to use a fruct does not constitute in law right to the very substance. Are we not to suppose then that the point at issue between them was that the one who held that they are to go out free if assaulted by the wife did not accept the enactment of the Shah while the one who held that they are not to go out free when assaulted either by the husband or by the wife accepted the enactment of the Shah? No, it is quite certain that the enactment of the Shah was unanimously accepted but the former Barry that was formulated before. The passing of the enactment while the other one was formulated after or if you like I may say that both the one Barry and the other dealt with conditions prevailing after the enactment and also that both accepted the enactment of the Shah but the authority who held that the slaves are to go out free if assaulted by the wife and not by the husband did so on account of a reason underlying a statement of Rabba for Rabba said Talmud, Mas Baba Kama the consecration of cattle to the altar the prohibition of leaven from any use and the monumission of a slave release any of these articles if mortgaged from the burden of the mortgage are we then to say that the statement of Rabba constituted a point at issue between these ten aim no it is possible that all concurred in the ruling of Rabba in general cases but in this particular case here the rabbis might perhaps have specially protected the mortgage of the husband or again if you like I may say that these ten aim were Unanimous in not accepting the enactment of the Shah, but in the case here they might have differed as to whether the right to use a fruct amounts in law to a right to the very substance exactly as this was the dividing point between the following ten aim for it was taught if an owner sells his slave to a man with whom he stipulates that the slave shall still remain to serve him for the next thirty days our mayor says that the vendor would be subject to the law of a day or two because the slave was still under him his view being that the right to use a fruct in the slave amounts in law to a right to the very substance of him or Judah on the other hand says that it is the purchaser who would be subject to the law of a day or two because the slave was his money his view being that a right to use a fruct in the slave does not amount in law to a right to the very substance of him but our Jose says that both of them would be subject to the right of a day or two the vendor because the slave was still under him and the purchaser because the slave was already his money for he was in doubt whether a right to a use of fruct should amount to a right to the very substance or should not amount to a right to the very substance and as is well known a doubt in capital charges should always be for the benefit of the accused our Eliezer on the other hand says that neither of them would be subject to the law of a day or two the purchaser because the slave is not under him and the vendor because he is not his money Rabbah said the reason of our Eliezer was because scripture says for he is his money implying that he has to be his money owned by him exclusively whose view is followed in the statement made by Mimar that if a husband and wife sold the Melik property even simultaneously their act is of no effect of course the view of our Eliezer so too who was the Tana who stated that which our rabbis taught one who is half a slave and half a freeman as well as a slave belonging to Two partners does not go out free for the mutilation of the principal limbs even those which cannot be restored to him said our Mordecai to our Ashi thus was it stated in the name of Rabba that this ruling gives the view of our Eliezer for did our Eliezer not say that his money implied that which was owned by him exclusively so also here his slave implies one who is owned by him exclusively mission if a man boxes another man's ear he has to pay him a seller Arjuta in the name of our Jose the Galilean says that he has to pay him a mina if he smacked him on the face he has to pay him 200 ZUZ if he did it with the back of his hand he has to pay him 400 ZUZ if he pulled his ear plucked his hair spat so that the spittle reached him removed his garment from upon him uncovered the head of a woman in the marketplace he must pay 400 ZUZ Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B this is the general practice though all depends upon the dignity of the insulted person our Akiva said that even the poor in Israel have to be considered as if they are free and reduced in circumstances for in fact they all are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It once happened that a certain person uncovered the head of a woman in the marketplace and when she came before our Akiba he ordered the offender to pay her 400 ZUZ. The latter said to him, Rabbi, allow me time in which to carry out the judgment. Our Akiba sent it and fixed a time for him. He watched her until he saw her standing. Outside the door of her courtyard he then broke in her presence a pitcher where there was oil of the value of an ISAR and she uncovered her head and collected the oil with her palms and put her hands upon her head to anoint it. He then set up witnesses against her and came to our Akiba and said to him, Have I to give such a woman 400 ZUZ? But our Akiba said to him, Your argument is of no legal effect for where one injures oneself though forbidden he is exempt yet were others to injure him. They would be liable so also he who cuts down his own plants though not acting lawfully is exempt yet were others to do it they would be liable tomorrow it was asked is it a Tyrian mena of which the Mishnah text speaks or is it only a local mena which is referred to come and here a certain person boxed another's ear and the case was brought before our Jude he said to him here I am and here is also our Jose the Galilean so that you have to pay the plaintiff a Tyrian mena does this not show that it is a Tyrian mena which is spoken of in the text it does what is the meaning of here I am and here is also our Jose the Galilean if you say he meant here I am who witnessed you doing this and here is also our Jose the Galilean who holds that the payment should be a Tyrian mena go therefore and thus pay him a Tyrian mena would this not imply that a witness is eligible to act also as judge but how can this be since it was taught if the members of the Sanhedrin saw a man killing Another some of them should act as witnesses and the others should act as judges this is the opinion of our Tarfan our Akiba on the other hand said that all of them are considered witnesses and they thus cannot act as judges for a witness may not act as a judge now even our Tarfan surely did not mean more than that a part of them should act as witnes
Excludes the case where the instrument of killing disappeared from under the hands of the witnesses said Arakiba to him even if the instrument was placed before the judges yet did the actual killing take place before the judges of the court of law that they should be expected to know how many times the murderer struck the victim or again the part of the body upon which he struck him whether it was upon his thigh or upon the tip of the heart again supposing the murderer threw a man down from the top of a roof or from the top of a mansion house so that the victim died would the court of law have to go to the mansion or would the mansion have to go to the court of law again if the mansion meanwhile collapsed would it be necessary to erect it new as it was before for the inspection of the court of law we must therefore say that just as a fist is a definite object that was placed before the side of witnesses when the murder was committed so also it is necessary that all other Instruments should have been placed before the side of the witnesses which excludes the case where the instrument of killing disappeared from under the hand of the murderer who is thus free we see then that Arakiba said to him did the actual killing take place before the judges of the court of law that they should be expected to know how many times the murderer struck the victim which would imply that if he had killed him in their presence they who were the witnesses would have been able to act as judges he was arguing from the point of view of Arsimi and the Temanite but this was not his own opinion our rabbis taught if an ox while still tam killed a person and subsequently also did damage the judges will adjudicate on the loss of life but will not adjudicate on the pecuniary damage in the case however of Muad killing a person and subsequently doing damage the judges will first deal with the pecuniary matter and then adjudicate on the loss of life but if for some reason or other they have already adjudicated on the capital matter it would no more be possible to start dealing with the pecuniary matter but even if they first adjudicated on the capital matter what has happened that it should no more be possible for them to start dealing with the pecuniary matter Rabbi said I found the rabbis at the school of rab sitting and stating that this teaching follows the view of Arsimi and the Temanite who said that just as a fist is a definite object which can be submitted to the consideration of the assembly of the judges and the witnesses Talmud, Mas Baba Kama Talmud, Mas Baba Kama so also all other instruments should be able to be submitted to the consideration of the assembly of the judges and the witnesses which shows that the inspection of the instrument by the court of law is essential before any liability can be imposed and in this case where the sentence has already been passed on the ox to be stoned it would not be possible to keep the ox for Inspection by the court of law as we could not delay the execution of the judgment I said to them you may even say that the teaching follows the view of our Akiba for we may have been dealing here with a case where the defendant ran away but if the defendant ran away even in the case where the capital matter has not yet been adjudicated how would it be possible to deal with the pecuniary matter in the absence of the defendant it was only after the evidence of the witnesses had already been accepted that he ran away be that as it may once could the payment come since the defendant ran away out of the hire obtained from plowing done by the ox but if so why also in the case of Tam should the pecuniary matter not be adjudicated first and the payment made out of the hire obtained from plowing and then adjudicate the capital matter said Armari the son of Arkahana this indeed proves that the hire obtained from plowing forms a part of the general estate of the owner the Question was raised is an inspection of the instrument essential also in the case of mere damage or is no inspection necessary in the case of mere damage shall we say that it is only regarding murder that we have to inspect the instrument as by means of one instrument life could be taken while by means of another life could not be taken whereas regarding mere damage any instrument would be sufficient or is there perhaps no difference come in here just as pit can cause death because it is usually ten handbreadths deep so also other similar nuisances should be such as can cause death i.e. ten handbreadths deep if however they were less than ten handbreadths deep and an ox or an ass fell into them and died there would be exemption but if only injured by them there would be liability is not the ten you reckoning upwards so that what he says is that a pit of a depth of from one handbreadth to ten handbreadths could not cause death though it could cause damage implying that a pit of any depth would involve liability in the case of mere damage and thus indicating that no inspection is necessary regarding mere damage no he reckoned downwards and thus meant to say that only a pit of ten handbreadths could cause death whereas a pit a little less than ten handbreadths could cause only damage and not death so that it may therefore still be argued that inspection might be essential even regarding mere damage and that in each case it may be necessary that the instrument be such as would be fit to cause the particular damage done come and here if the master struck his slave on the eye and blinded him or on his ear and deafened him the slave would on account of that go out free but if he struck on an object which was opposite the slave's eye through which he lost his sight or on an object which was opposite his ear through which he lost his hearing the slave would on account of this not go out free is not the reason of this that consideration of the instrument is required before any liability can be imposed which proves that the inspection of the instrument is essential also in the case of mere damage no the reason is because we say that it was the slave who frightened himself as taught if a man frightens another he is exempt according to the judgments of man but liable according to the judgments of heaven thus if he blew into his ear and deafened him he would be exempt but if he actually took hold of his ear and blew into it and thus deafened him he would be liable come and here regarding the five items an estimation will be made and the payment made straight away though healing and loss of time will have to be estimated for the whole period until he completely recovers if after the estimation was made his health continued to deteriorate the payment will not be more than in accordance with the previous estimation so also if after the estimation was made he recovered rapidly payment will be made of the whole sum Estimated does this not show that estimation is essential also in the case of mere damage that an estimate has to be made of the length of the illness likely to result from the wound has never been questioned by us for it is certain that we would have to make such an estimation the point which was doubtful to us was whether we estimate if the instrument was one likely to do that damage or not what is indeed the law come and here Simeon the Temanite said that just as a fist is a definite object that can be submitted to the consideration of the assembly of the judges and the witnesses so also all other instruments should be able to be submitted to the consideration of the assembly of the judges and the witnesses does this not show that the inspection of the instrument is essential even in the case of mere damage it does indeed the master stated so also if after the estimation was made he recovered rapidly payment will be made of the whole sum estimated this appears to support the view of Rabba for Rabba said an injured person whose illness was estimated to last the whole day but who as it happened recovered in the middle of the day and performed his usual work would still be paid for the whole day as the unexpected recovery was an act of mercy especially bestowed upon him from heaven if he spat so that the spittle reached him he has to pay 400 Z.U.Z. Our Papa said this Mishnah ruling applies only where it reached him his person but if it reached only his garment this would not be so but why should this not be equivalent to an insult in words it was stated in the West in the name of our Jose B. Aben that this could indeed prove that where the insult was merely in words there would be exemption from any liability whatsoever all depends upon the dignity the question was raised did the first tana mean by this to mitigate or to aggravate the penalty did he mean to mitigate the penalty so that a poor man would not have to be paid so much or did he Perhaps mean to aggravate the penalty so that a rich man would have to be paid more come and here since our Akiba stated that even the poor in Israel have to be considered as if they are freemen who have been reduced in circumstances for in fact they all are the descendants of Abraham Isaac and Jacob does this not show that the first tana meant to mitigate the penalty it does indeed it once happened that a certain person uncovered the head of a woman in the marketplace fixed a time for him but his time allowed in such a case did our Hannah not say that no time is granted in cases of injury no time is granted in the case of injury where there is an actual loss of money but in the case of degradation where there is no actual loss of money time to pay may be granted he watched until he saw her standing outside the door of her courtyard for if one injures oneself though it is forbidden to do so but was it not taught our Akiba said to him you have dived into the depths and have brought up a pot's hurt in your hand for a man may injure himself. Rabbi said there is no difficulty as the Mishnahic statement deals with actual injury whereas the other text referred to degradation but surely the Mishnah deals with degradation Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B and it nevertheless says if one injures oneself though it is forbidden to do so he is exempt it was this which he said to him there could be no question regarding degradation as a man may put himself to shame but even in the case of injury where a man may not injure himself if others injured him they would be liable but may a man not
not injure himself and there is another maintaining that a man may injure himself but who is the tana maintaining that a man may not injure himself it could hardly be said that he was the tana of the teaching and surely your blood of your lives will I require upon which our Eliezer remarked that it meant I will require your blood if shed by the hands of yourselves for murder is perhaps different he might therefore be the tana of the following teaching garments may be rent for a dead person as this is not necessarily done to imitate the ways of the Amorites, but our Eliezer said, I heard that he who rents his garments too much for a dead person transgresses the command thou shalt not destroy, and it seems that this should be the more so in the case of injuring his own body, but garments might perhaps be different as the loss is irretrievable, for our Yohanan used to call garments my honorous and our Histah whenever he had to walk between thorns and thistles used to lift up his garments. Saying that whereas for the body of injured nature will produce a healing for garments, if for nature could bring up no cure, he must therefore be the tana of the following teaching our Eliezer Hakibar Birabai said, What is the point of the words and make an atonement for him for that he sinned regarding the soul regarding what soul did this Nazarite sin unless by having deprived himself of wine? Now can we not base on this an argument the Forshiori of a Nazarite who deprived himself only of one is already called a sinner, how much the more so one who deprives oneself of all matters, he who cuts down his own plants. Rabbi Barhana resided in the presence of Rab, where a plaintiff pleads, You killed my ox, you cut my plants, pay compensation, and the defendant responds, You told me to kill it, you told me to cut it down, he would be exempt. He Rab said to him, If so, you almost make it impossible for anyone to live, for how can you trust him? He therefore said to him, Has this teaching to be deleted? He replied, No, your teaching could hold good in the case where the ox was marked for slaughter, and so also the tree had to be cut down. If so, what plea has he against him? He says to him, I wanted to perform the precept myself in the way taught he shall pour out and cover it, implying that he who poured out has to cover it, but it once happened that a certain person performed the slaughter, and another anticipated him and covered the blood, and Argamaliel condemned it. Letter to pay ten gold points. Rab said, a palm tree producing even one cab of fruit may not be cut down. An objection was raised from the following: What quantity should be on an olive tree so that it should not be permitted to cut it down? A quarter of a cab of olives are different as they are more important. Our Hannah said, Shiv, if my son did not pass away except for having cut down a fig tree before its time, Rabbanah, however, said, if its value for other purposes exceeds that for fruit, it is permitted to cut it down. It was also taught to the same effect. Only the trees of which thou knowest implies even fruit-bearing trees that they be not trees for meat means a wild tree. But since we ultimately include all things, why then was it stated that they are not trees for food to give priority to a wild tree over one bearing edible fruits? Talmud, Mas Babakama, as you might say that this is so even where the value for other purposes exceeds that for fruits. It says only Samuel's field. Laborer brought him some dates as he partook of them. He tasted wine, and then when he asked the laborer how that came about, he told him that the date trees were placed between vines. He said to him, Since they are weakening the vines so much, bring me their roots tomorrow. When Arhista saw certain palms among the vines, he said to his field laborers, Remove them with their roots. Vines can easily buy palms, but palms cannot buy vines. Mission, even though the offender pays him compensation, the offense is not forgiven until he asks him for pardon. As it says now, therefore, restore the man's wife, etc. Whence can we learn that should the injured person not forgive him, he would be stigmatized as cruel from the word? So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech, etc. If the plaintiff said, Put out my eye, cut off my arm, and break my leg, the offender would nevertheless be liable. And so also, even if he told him to do it on the understanding that he would be exempt, he would still be liable if. The plaintiff said to hear my garment and break my picture the defendant would still be liable but if he said to him do this on the understanding that you will be exempt he would be exempt but if one said to the defendant do this to a third person on the understanding that you will be exempt the defendant would be liable whether where the injury was done to the person or to his chattels tomorrow our rabbis taught all these fixed some stated above specify only the payment civilly due for degradation for regarding the hurt done to the feelings of the plaintiff even if the offender should bring all the rams of Nebaiath in the world the offense would not be forgiven until he asks him for pardon as it is written now therefore restore the man's wife for he is a prophet and he will pray for thee but is it only the wife of a prophet who has to be restored whereas the wife of another man need not be restored our Samuel Binaman, he said in the name of our Yohanan restore the man's wife Surely implies in all cases for as to your allegation wilt thou slay even a righteous nation said he not unto me she is my sister and she even she herself said he is my brother you should know that he is a prophet who has already by act and deed taught the world that where a stranger comes to a city whether he is to be questioned regarding food and drink or regarding his wife whether she is his wife or sister from this we can learn that a descendant of Noah may become liable to death if he had the opportunity to acquire instruction and did not do so and so committed a crime through the ignorance of the law for to close the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abba Melech our Eliezer said why is closing up mentioned twice there was one closing up in the case of males Vesemen Viral and two in the case of females Vesemen and the giving of birth in a very day it was taught that there were two in the case of males Vesemen Viral and urinating and three in the Case of females, i.e., semen urinating and the giving of birth, Rubin said three in the case of males, be semen viral urinating and anus, and four in the case of females, be semen and the giving of birth, urinating and anus. All the wombs of the house of Abimelech it was stated at the college of Arjane that even a hand of the house of Abimelech did not lay an egg at that time. Rabbi said to Rabbi Bimari, whence can be derived the lesson taught by our rabbis that one who solicits mercy for his fellow while he himself is in need of the same thing will be answered first. He replied, as it is written, and the Lord changed the fortune of Job when he prayed for his friends. He said to him, You say it is from that text, but I say it is from this text. And Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and immediately after it says, And the Lord remembered Sarah as he had said, etc., i.e., as Abraham had prayed and said regarding Abimelech, Rabbi again said to Rabbi Bimari once can be derived the proverbial saying that together with the thorn the cabbage is smitten he replied as it is written wherefore will ye contend with me all have transgressed against me says the Lord he said to him you derive it from that text but I derive it from this how long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws Rabbi again said to Rabbi Bimari it is written and from among his brethren he took five men who were these five he replied thus said are Yohanan that they were those whose names were repeated in the farewell of Moses but was not the name Judah repeated to he replied the repetition in the case of Judah was for a different purpose as stated by our Samuel Binamani that our Yohanan said what is the meaning of the words let Reuben live and not die and that his men become few and this is for Judah all the forty years that the Israelites were in the wilderness the bones of Judah were scattered in the coffin until Moses came and solicited for mercy. By saying thus to God, Master of the universe, who brought Reuben to confess, if not Judah, here therefore, Lord, the voice of Judah thereupon each limb fitted itself into its original place. He was, however, not permitted to ascend to the heavenly gathering until Moses said, and bring him in unto his people, as however he did not know what the rabbis were saying, and was thus unable to argue with the rabbis on matters of the law. Moses said, His hands shall contend for him, as again he was unable to bring his statement into accord with the halacha. Moses said, Thou shalt be a help against his adversaries. Rabbi again said to Rabbi Bimari, Whence can be derived the popular saying that poverty follows the poor? He replied, We have learned the rich used to bring the first fruits in baskets of gold and silver, but the poor brought it in wicker baskets made out of the bark of willow, and thus gave the baskets as well as the first fruits to the priest. He said to him, You derive it from there, but I derive it. From this Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B and shall cry unclean unclean Rabbi again said to Rabbi Bimari once can be derived the advice given by our rabbis have early breakfast in the summer because of the heat and in the winter because of the cold and people even say that sixty men may pursue him who has early meals in the mornings and will not overtake him he replied as it is written they shall not hunger nor thirst neither shall the heat nor sun smite them he said to him you derive it from that text but I derive it from this one and ye shall serve the Lord your God this as has been explained refers
Pains reach the teeth of him who hears the noise made by another man eating while he himself does not eat. He replied, As it is written, but me, even me, thy servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benai the son of Jehoiada, and thy servant Solomon, hath he not called? He said to him, You derive it from that verse, but I derive it from this verse. And Isaac brought her unto his mother Sarah's tent, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted for his mother, and soon after. It is written, and again Abraham took another wife, and her name was Keturah. Rabba further said to Rabba Bimari, Whence can be derived the popular saying, Though the wine belongs to the owner, the thanks are given to the butler. He replied, As it is written, and thou shalt put up thy honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may hearken. And it is also written, and Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, etc. Rabba again said to Rabba Bimari, Whence can be derived the popular saying, A dog when hungry is ready to swallow even his own excrements. He replied, As it is written, the full soul loaded in honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Rabba again said to Rabba Bimari, Whence can be derived the popular saying, A bad palm will usually make its way to a grove of barren trees. He replied, This matter was written in the Pentateuch, repeated in the Prophets mentioned a third time in the Hagiographa and also learned in a mission and taught in a Berith. It is stated in the Pentateuch as written. So Esau went unto Ishmael, repeated in the Prophets as written, and there gathered themselves to Jephthah idle men, and they went out with him. Mentioned a third time in the Hagiographa as written, every foul dwells near its kind and man near his equal. It was learned in the mission all that which is attached to an article that is subject to the law of defilement will similarly become defiled, but all that which is attached to anything which would always remain levitically clean would similarly remain clean. And it was also taught in a Berith. Our Eliezer said, Not for nothing did the starling follow the raven, but because it is of its kind. Rabba again said to Rabbi Bimari, whence can be derived the popular saying, If you draw the attention of your fellow to warn him and he does not respond, you may push a big wall and throw it at him. He Replied as it is written, because I have purged thee and thou wast not purged, thou shalt not be purged from thy filthiness any more. Rabba again said to Rabbi Bimari, whence can be derived the popular saying, Into the well from which you have once drank water, do not throw clods. He replied as it is written, Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother, thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. Rabba again said to Rabbi Bimari, whence can be derived the popular saying, If thou wilt join me in lifting the burden, I will carry it, and if not, I will not carry it. He replied as it is written, and Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go, but if thou wilt not go with me, I will not go. Rabba again said to Rabbi Bimari, whence can be derived the popular saying, When we were young, we were treated as men, whereas now that we have grown old, we are looked upon as babies. He replied, It is first written, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Talmud, Mas Baba Kama. But subsequently it is written, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee by the way. Rabba again said to Rabbi Bimari, Whence can be derived the popular saying, Behind an owner of wealth ships are dragged along. He replied, As it is written, and Lot also who went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents are hand, and said, He who invokes the judgment of heaven against his fellow is himself. Punished first, as it says, And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee, etc. And it is subsequently written, And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. This, however, is the case only where justice could be obtained in a temporal court of law. Our Isaac said, Woe to him who cries for divine intervention, even more than to him against whom it is invoked. It was taught likewise, Both the one who cries for divine intervention and the one against whom it is invoked come under the scriptural. Threat but punishment is meted out first to the one who cries and is more severe than for the one against whom justice is invoked. Our Isaac again said the curse of an ordinary man should never be considered a trifling matter in your eyes for when Abimelech called the curse upon Sarah it was fulfilled in her seat as it says behold it is for the covering of the eyes which implies that he said to her since thou hast covered the truth from me and not disclosed that he was thy husband and hast thus caused me all this trouble let it be the will of heaven that there shall be to the covering of the eyes and this was actually fulfilled in her seat as it is written and it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see our above said a man should always strive to be rather of the persecuted than of the persecutors as there is none among the birds more persecuted than doves and pigeons and yet scripture made them alone eligible for the altar if it Plaintiff said, Put out my eye on the understanding that he would be exempt, he would still be liable. If the plaintiff said, Tear my garment on the understanding that you will be exempt, he would be exempt. R.C.B. Hamas said to Rabbi, Why is the rule differing in the former case and in the latter case? He replied, There is liability in the former case because no man truly pardons the wounding of his principal limbs. The others rejoined, Does a man then pardon the inflicting of pain? Seeing that it was taught, if the plaintiff had said, Smite me and wound me on the understanding that you will be exempt, the defendant would be exempt. He had no answer and said, Have you heard anything on this matter? He thereupon said to him, This is what R.C.B. Hamas said. The liability is because the plaintiff had no right to pardon the discredit to the family. It was similarly stated, R.C.B. said, Because of the discredit to the family, whereas Rabbi said, Because no man could truly pardon the injury done to. His principal limbs are Yohanan, however, said sometimes the term yes means no and the term no means yes, as when spoken ironically, it was also taught likewise if the plaintiff said smite me and wound me, and when the defendant interposed on the understanding of being exempt, the plaintiff replied yes, there may be a yes which implies no, i.e. when spoken ironically, if the plaintiff said to your my garment, and when the defendant interposed on the understanding of being exempt, he said to him no, there may be a no which means yes, such as when spoken ironically, if the defendant said break my pitcher and tear my garment, the defendant would still be liable, a contradiction was pouched out to keep but not to destroy, to keep but not to tear, to keep but not to distribute to the poor, in which case the liability of Billy's would not apply, why then liability in the mission said, are who not there is no difficulty, as here the article came into his hands, whereas there the article did not come into his. And said Rabbi to him, does the expression to keep not imply that the article has come into his hands? Rabbi therefore said this case as well as the other is one in which the article has come into his hands, and still there is no difficulty as in the case here the article originally came into his hands for the purpose of being guarded, whereas there it came to his hands for the purpose of being torn a purse of money for charity having been brought to Pumadai the Arjoseph deposited it with a certain person who however was so negligent that thieves came and stole it. Arjoseph declared liability to pay, but Abbe said to him, Was it not taught to keep but not to distribute to the poor? Arjoseph rejoined the poor of Pumadai to have a fixed allowance, and the charity money could thus be considered as having been deposited to keep and not to distribute it to the poor Talmud. Mas Baba Kama B Chapter 9 Mission If one misappropriates pieces of wood and makes utensils out of them or Pieces of wool and makes garments out of them, he has to pay for them in accordance with their value at the time of the robbery. If one misappropriated a pregnant cow which meanwhile gave birth to a calf or a sheep bearing wool which he sheared, he would pay the value of a cow which was about to give birth to a calf and the value of a sheep which was ready to be shorn respectively. But if he misappropriated a cow which became pregnant while with him and then gave birth or a sheep which while with him grew wool which he sheared, he would pay in accordance with the value at the time of the robbery. This is the general principle all robbers have to pay in accordance with the value of the misappropriated articles at the time of the robbery. Gamara shall we say that it is only where he actually made utensils out of the pieces of wood that the Mishnah ruling will apply, whereas if he merely planed them, this would not be so again. It is only where he made garments out of the wool. That this will be so, whereas where he merely bleached it, this would not be so, but could not a contradiction be raised from the following one who misappropriated pieces of wood and planed them stones and chiseled them wool and bleached it or flax and cleansed it would have to pay in accordance with the value at the time of the robbery said Abbe the Tana of our mission stated the ruling where the change in the article misappropriated is only such as is recognized by the rabbis that is, where it can still revert to its former condition and of
Latter in accordance with the rabbis for it was taught if after the owner had shorn his sheep he spanned the wool or wove it this portion would not be taken into account with the other wool which was still left in the raw state but if he only purified it our Simeon says it would still not be taken into account whereas the sages say that it would be taken into account but Rabbah said that both statements might be in accordance with our Simeon and there would still be no difficulty as in one case the process of bleaching was by beating the wool where no actual change took place whereas in the other case the wool was scored with a comar high and said that in one case the wool was merely washed so that no actual change took place whereas in the other it was whitened with sulfur but since even dying is according to our Simeon not considered a change how could bleaching be considered a change for was it not taught where the owner had shorn one sheep after another and in the interval Died the respective fleeces were shorn one after another and in the interval spun the wool were shorn one after another and in the interval wove the wool this portion would not be taken into account but our Simeon Bejuda said in the name of our Simeon that if he only died the wool it would be taken into account said Abay there is no difficulty as the former statement was made by the rabbis according to our Simeon whereas the latter was made by our Simeon Bejuda according to our Simeon but Rabbah said you may still say that the rabbis did not differ from our Simeon Bejuda on this point for dying might be different the reason being that since the color could be removed by soap it is not considered a change and as to the statement made there if the owner did not manage to give the first of his fleece to the priest until it had already been dyed he would be exempt which has been stated to be accepted unanimously this deals with a case where it was dyed with indigo which could not be Removed by Sokabe said Arsimian Bijuda Bet Shamai R. Lazar B. Jacob Arsimian B. Eliezer and R. Ishmael all maintain that a change leaves the article in its previous status Arsimian Bijuda here in the text quoted by us but what about Bet Shamai as it was taught where he gave her as her higher wheat of which she made flour or olives of which she made oil or grapes of which she made wine one berry that taught that the produce is forbidden to be sacrificed upon the altar whereas another berry that taught it is permitted and R. Joseph said Gory and Talmud, Mas Baba Kama of Asparak taught Bet Shamai prohibit the produce to be used as sacrifices whereas Beth Hillel permitted now what was the reason of Bet Shamai because it is written Gam to include their transformation but Beth Hillel maintains that Hem implies only them and not their transformations Bet Shamai however maintains that though Hem is written what it implies is them and not their offsprings Beth Hillel still. Argue that you can understand both points from it them and not their transformations them and not their offsprings but how could Bethilel explain the insertion of Gam Gam offers a difficulty according to the view of Bethilel what about our Eliezer B. Jacob as it was taught our Eliezer B. Jacob says if one misappropriated S.E.I. of wheat and kneaded it and baked it and set aside a portion of it as Halah how would he be able to pronounce the benediction he would surely not be pronouncing a blessing but pronouncing a blasphemy as to such a one could be applied the words the robber pronounces a benediction but in fact contemneth the Lord what about our Simeon B. Eliezer as it was taught this principle was stated by our Simeon B. Eliezer in respect of any improvement carried out by the robber he would have the upper hand if he wishes he can take the improvement or if he wishes he may say to the plaintiff here take your own what is meant by this last statement said Arshis hate is meant where the article has been improved the robber may take the increased value but where it has deteriorated he may say to him here take your own as a change leaves the article in its previous status but if so why should it not be the same even in the case where the article was improved we may reply in order to make matters easier for repentant robbers what about our Ishmael it was taught strictly speaking the precept of PER requires that it should be set aside from standing crops if however the owner did not set it aside from standing crops he should set it aside from the sheep so also if he did not set it aside from the sheep he should set it aside from the heap in his store so long as he has not even the pile but if he had already even the pile he would have first to tithe it and then set aside the PE offer the poor moreover in the name of our Ishmael it was stated that the owner would even have to set it aside from the dough and give it to the poor said our papa to Abbe, why was it necessary to repeat and bring together all these tannatic statements for the sole purpose of making us know that they concurred with Beth Shammai? He replied, It was for the purpose of telling us that Beth Hillel and the Beth Shammai did probably not differ at all on this matter. But Rabbi said, What ground have we for saying that all these tannaim follow one view? Why not perhaps say that Arsimian Bijuda meant his statement there to apply only to the case of dying on account of the fact that the color could be removed by soap? And so also did Beth Shammai mean their view there to apply only to a religious offering because it looks repulsive? Or again, that our Eliezer B. Jacob meant his statement there to apply only to a benediction on the ground that it was a precept performed by the means of a transgression? And so also did Arsimian B. Eliezer mean his view there to apply only to a deterioration which can be replaced? Or again, our Ishmael meant his view there to apply only. To the law of P.E. on account of the repeated expression thou shalt leave if however you argue that we should derive the law from the latter case it might surely be said that gifts to the poor are altogether different as is shown by the question of our Jonathan for our Jonathan asked concerning the reason of our Ishmael was it because he held that a change does not transfer ownership or does he as a rule hold that a change would transfer ownership but here it is different on account of the repeated expression thou shalt leave but if you find ground for assuming that the reason of our Ishmael was because a change does not transfer ownership why then did the divine law repeat the expression thou shalt leave again according to the rabbis why did the divine law repeat the expression thou shalt leave this additional insertion was necessary for that which was taught if a man after renouncing the ownership of his vineyard gets up early on the following morning and cuts off the grapes. He will be subject to the laws of Paragolel for getting NPEO but will be exempt from tithes. Rab Judah said that Samuel stated that the Halachah is in accordance with Arsimian B. Eliezer, but did Samuel really say so? Did not Samuel state that assessment of the carcass is made neither in cases of death nor of robbery but only of damage? I grant you that according to Rabbi who said that the statement made there by Arsimian B. Eliezer related only to a deterioration where a recovery would still be possible. There would be no difficulty since Samuel in his statement that the Halachah is in accordance with Arsimian B. Eliezer who holds that a change leaves the article in its previous status referred to the case of deterioration where a recovery would still be possible, whereas the statement made there by Samuel that assessment of the carcass is made neither in the case of death nor of robbery but only of damage would apply to deterioration where no recovery seems possible, but according to Abbe who said that the statement made by Arsimian B. Eliezer also referred to deterioration where a recovery is no more possible how can we get over the contradiction but Abbe might read thus Rab Judah said that Samuel stated Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi they said that the Halachah is in accordance with Arsimian B. Eliezer though Samuel himself did not agree with this Arhai B. Abba said that Ar Yohanan stated that according to the law of the Torah a misappropriated article should even after being changed be returned to the owner in its present condition as it is said he shall restore that which he took by robbery in all cases and should you side against me the Mishnah ruling my answer is that this was merely an enactment for the purpose of making matters easier for repentant robbers but did Ar Yohanan really say this did Ar Yohanan not say that the Halachah should be in accordance with an anonymous mission and we have learned if the owner did not manage to give the first of it Please to the priest until it had already been died he is exempt but a certain scholar of our rabbis whose name was our Jacob said to them this matter was explained to me by our Yohanan personally that his statement referred only to a case where e.g. there were misappropriated plain pieces of wood out of which utensils were made as after such a change the material could still revert to its previous condition our rabbis taught if robbers or usurers repent and of their own free will are prepared to restore the misappropriated articles it is not right to accept them from them and he who does accept them from them does not obtain the approval of the sages our Yohanan said it was in the days of rabbi that this teaching was enunciated as taught it once happened with a certain man who was desirous of making restitution that his wife said to him Rack, if you are going to make restitution even the girdle you are wearing would not remain yours and he thus refrained altogether from making Repentance it was at that time that it was declared that if robbers or usurers are prepared to make restitution it is not right to accept the misappropriated articles from them and he who accepts from them does not obtain the
With him should he not have restored it but it might be that he had no time to restore it before he suddenly died come and your robbers and usurers even after they have collected the money must return it but what collection could there have been in the case of robbers for surely if they misappropriated anything they committed robbery and if they had not misappropriated anything they were not robbers at all it must therefore read as follows robbers that is to say usurers even after they have already collected the money must return it it may however be said that though they have to make restitution of the money it would not be accepted from them if so why have they to make restitution to make it quite evident that out of their own free will they are prepared to fulfill their duty before having come and here for shepherds tax collectors and revenue farmers it is difficult to make repentance yet they must make restitution of the articles in question to all those whom they know they have robbed it may however also here be said that though they have to make restitution it would not be accepted from them if so why have they to make restitution to make it quite evident that out of their free will they are prepared to fulfill their duty before heaven but if so why should it be difficult for them to make repentance again why was it said in the concluding clause that out of articles of which they do not know the owners they should make public utilities and are his said that these should be well stitches and caves there is however no difficulty as this teaching was enunciated before the days of the enactment whereas the other statements were made after the enactment moreover as Arnaman has now stated that the enactment referred only to a case where the misappropriated article was no more intact it may even be said that both teachings were enunciated after the days of the enactment and yet there is no difficulty Talmud, Mas Baba, Kama, Talmud, Mas Baba. Comma as the latter deals with a case where the misappropriated article is still intact whereas the other teaching refers to a case where the misappropriated article is no more intact but what about the girdle referred to above in which case the misappropriated article was still intact what was meant by girdle was the value of the girdle but is it really the fact that so long as the misappropriated article was intact our rabbis did not make this enactment what then about the beam in which case the misappropriated article was still intact and we have nevertheless learned our Yohan and Vigajada testified that if a misappropriated beam has been built into a house the owner will recover only its value that matter is different altogether for since the house would otherwise be damaged the rabbis regarded the beam as being no longer intact if one misappropriated a pregnant cow which meanwhile gave birth to a calf etc our rabbis taught he who misappropriates a sheep and shears it away. Cow which has meanwhile given birth to a calf has to pay for the animal and the wool and the calf. This is the view of our Meir Arjuna says that the misappropriated animal will be restored intact. Our Simeon says that the animal will be considered as if it had been insured with the robber for its value at the time of the robbery. The question was raised what was the reason of our Meir? Was it because he held that a change leaves the article in its existing status or did he hold in general that a change would transfer ownership? But here he imposes a fine upon the robber. The practical difference being where the animal became leaner. Come and here if one misappropriated an animal and it became old or slaves and they became old, he would still have to pay according to their value at the time of the robbery. But our Meir said that in the case of slaves, the robber would be entitled to say to the plaintiff here, take your own. It thus appears that in the case of an animal, even our Meir held. That the payment would have to be in accordance with the value at the time of the robbery. Now, if you assume that Armadier was of the opinion that a change leaves the article in its previous status, why even in the case of an animal can the robber not say here take your own? Does this therefore not prove that even Armadier held that a change would transfer ownership and that in the case of the wool and the calf it was only a fine which Armadier imposed on the robber? It may, however, be said that R. Madir was arguing from the premises of the rabbis, thus, according to my view, a change does not transfer ownership, so that also in the case of an animal the robber would be entitled to say here take your own, but even according to your view that a change does transfer ownership, you must at least agree with me in the case of slaves who are compared to real property, and as we know, real property is not subject to the law of robbery. The rabbis, however, answered him, no, for slaves are on a PA or with. Movables in this respect come and here if wool was handed over to a dyer to dye it red but he dyed it black or to dye it black but he dyed it red our mayor says that he would have to pay the owner of the wool for the value of the wool it thus appears that he had to pay only for the original value of the wool but not for the combined value of the wool and the improvement on account of the color now if you suppose that our mayor held that a change would not transfer ownership why should he not have to pay for the combined value of the wool and the improvement does this therefore not prove that our mayor held that a change would transfer ownership and that here in the case of the calf it was only a fine that our mayor imposed upon the robber this could indeed be proved from it some even say that this question was never so much as raised for since rab transposed the names in the mission and read thus if one misappropriated a cow which became old or slaves who became old he would have to pay in accordance with the value at the time of the robbery. This is the view of Armadier, whereas the sages say that in the case of slaves, the robber would be entitled to say, Here, take your own. It is quite certain that according to Armadier, a change would transfer ownership, and that here in the case of a calf, it was only a fine that Armadier imposed upon the robber. But if a question was raised, it was this was a fine imposed only in the case of willful misappropriation, whereas in the case of inadvertent misappropriation, the fine was not imposed, or perhaps even for inadvertent misappropriation, the fine was also imposed. Come and here, five kinds of creditors are allowed to DIST reign only on the free assets of the debtor. They are as follows creditors for produce for amelioration, showing profits for an undertaking to maintain the wife's son or the wife's daughter for a bond of liability without a warranty of indemnity, and for the ketuba of a wife where no property is. Made security now what authority have you heard lay down that the omission to make the property security is not a mere scribal error if not armadier and it is yet stated creditors for produce and amelioration showing profits may dist reign on free assets in the hands of the debtor now who are creditors for amelioration showing profits they come and do they not where the vendor has misappropriated a field from his fellow and sold it to another who ameliorated it and from whose hands it was subsequently taken away the law then is that when the purchaser comes to dist reign talmud mas baba kamabi he will do so for the principal even on real property that has been sold but for the amelioration only on assets which are free in the hands of the vendor but this is certain that the owner of the field is entitled to come and take away the field together with the increment now do we not deal here with a purchaser who was ignorant of the law and did not know whether real property is subject to the law of robbery or is not subject to the law of robbery and even in such a case the owner of the field will be entitled to come and take away the land together with the increment does not this show that even in the case of inadvertent misappropriation our mayor would impose the fine it may however be said that this is not so as we are dealing here with a purchaser who is a scholar and knows very well that real property is not subject to the law of robbery come and here if wool was handed over to a dyer to dye it red but he dyed it black or to dye it black and he dyed it red our mayor says that he would have to pay the owner of the wool for the value of the wool it thus appears that he has to pay only for the original value of the wool but not for the combined value of the wool and the improvement on account of the color now if you assume that our mayor would impose the fine even in the case of inadvertent misappropriation why should he not have to pay for the Combined value of the wool and the improvement does this not prove that it is only in the case of willful misappropriation that the fine is imposed but in the case of inadvertent misappropriation the fine would not be imposed this could indeed be proved from it. Arjuna says that the misappropriated animal will be restored intact our Simeon says that the animal be considered as if it had been insured with the robber for its value at the time of the robbery what is the practical difference between them said RZ but they differ regarding the increased value still attaching to the misappropriated article Arjuna maintained that this would belong to the plaintiff whereas our Simeon was of the opinion that this would belong to the robber our papa however said that both might agree that an increased value still attaching to the misappropriated article should not solely belong to the plaintiff but where they differed was as to whether the robber should be entitled to retain a half or a third or a fourth for his attending to the welfare of the article Arjuna maintaining that an increased value still attaching to the misappropriated article would belong solely to the robber whereas our Simeon maintained that the robber would be paid only to the extent of a half a third or a fourth we have learned but if he misappropriated a cow which became pregnant while with him and then gave birth or a sheep which while with him grew wool which he sheared he would pay in accordance with the value at the time of the robbery that is so only if the cow has already given birth but if the cow has not given birth yet it would be returned as it is this accords well with the view
Portion out of the body of the misappropriated animal. The answer was found in the statement made by Arnaman in the name of Samuel. There are three cases where increased value will be appraised and paid in money. They are as follows in the settlement of accounts between the firstborn and a plain son, between the creditor and the purchaser, and between the creditor and heirs. Said Rabbanu Arashi, did Samuel really say that a creditor will have to pay the purchaser for increased value? Did Samuel not state that a creditor dist reigns even on the increment? He replied, There is no difficulty as the former ruling applies to an increment which could reach the shoulders to be carried away, whereas the latter ruling deals with an increment which could not reach the shoulders to be carried away. He rejoined, Do not cases happen every day where Samuel dist reigns even on an increment which could reach the shoulders to be carried away? He replied, There is still no difficulty. Talmud, Mas Baba Kama as this is. So only where the amount of the debt owing to the creditor covers both the land and the increment, whereas the former ruling applies where the debt due to him is only to the extent of the land he rejoined. I grant you that on the view that even if the purchaser possesses money, he has no right to bar the creditor from land by paying in specie. Your argument would be sound, but according to the view that the purchaser possessing money can bar the creditor from the field by paying him in specie, why? Should he not say to the creditor, if I had had money, I would surely have been able to bar you from the whole field by paying you in specie. Now also, therefore, I am entitled to be left with a grip of land corresponding to the value of my amelioration. He replied, We are dealing here with a case where the debtor expressly made that field a security, as where he said to him, You shall not be paid from anything but from the field. Robber stated, There is no question that where the robber improved it. Misappropriated article and then sold it, or where the robber improved the misappropriated article and then left it to his heirs, he has genuinely sold or left to his heirs the increment he has created. Robber, however, asked what would be the lower after having bought the misappropriated article from the robber, the purchaser improved it. After asking the question, he himself gave the answer that what the former sold the latter was surely all rights which might subsequently accrue to him. Robber again asked what would be the lower, even misappropriated an article and improved it. Said Araha of Dipti to Robin, shall we trouble ourselves to make an enactment for the benefit of a heathen? He said to him, No, the query might refer to the case where e.g. he sold it to an Israelite, but he retorted, Be that as it may, he who comes to claim through a heathen predecessor could surely not expect better treatment than the heathen himself. No, the query could still refer to the case. Where e.g. an Israelite had misappropriated an article and sold it to a heathen who improved it and who subsequently sold it to another Israelite, what then should be the law? Shall we say that since an Israelite was in possession at the beginning and an Israelite was in possession at the end, our rabbis would also here make use of the enactment, or perhaps since a heathen intervened, our rabbis would not make use of the enactment, let it remain undecided. Our papa stated if one misappropriated a palm tree from his fellow and cut it down, he would not acquire title to it even though he threw it from the other's field into his own land, the reason being that it was previously called palm tree and is now also called palm tree, so also where out of the palm tree he made logs, he would not acquire title to them as even now they would still be called logs of the palm tree, it is only where out of the logs he made beams that he would acquire title to them, but if out of big beams he made small. Beams he would not acquire title to them though were he to have made them into boards he would acquire title to them. Rabbi said if one misappropriated a lulab and converted it into leaves he would acquire title to them as originally it was called lulab whereas now they are mere leaves so also where out of the leaves he made a broom he would acquire title to it as originally they were leaves whereas now they form a broom but where out of the broom he made a rope he would not acquire title to it. Since if he were to undo it it would again become a broom our papa asked what would be the lower the central leaf of the lulab became split come and here our mother said that our Joshua B. Levi stated that if the central leaf of the lulab was removed the lulab would be disqualified for ritual purposes Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B. Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B. Now would not the same lot apply where it was merely split no the case where it was removed is different as the leaf is then missing altogether. Some on the other hand read thus come and hear what our said that our Joshua B. Levi stated that if the central leaf was split it would be considered as if it was altogether removed and the lulab would be disqualified which would solve our papa's question our papa further said if one misappropriated sand from another and made a brick out of it he would not acquire title to it the reason being that it could again be made into sand but if he converted a brick into sand he would acquire title to it for should you object that he could perhaps make the sand again into a brick it may be said that that brick would be not the original but another brick as it would be a new entity which would be produced our papa further said if one misappropriated bullion of silver from another and converted it into coins he would not acquire title to them the reason being that he could again convert them into bullion but if out of coins he made bullion he would acquire title to it for should you Object that he can again convert it into coins. My answer is that it would be a new entity which would be produced if the coins were blackened and he made them look new. He would thereby not acquire title to them. But if they were new and he made them black, he would acquire title to them. For should you object that he could make them look again new, it may be said that their blackness will surely always be noticeable. This is the general principle. All robbers have to pay in accordance with the value of the misappropriated articles at the time of the robbery. One additional fact is the expression. This is the general principle intended to introduce. It is meant to introduce that which Arlie said. If a thief misappropriated a lamb which became a ram or a calf which became an ox, as the animal underwent a change while in his hands, he would acquire title to it. So that if he subsequently slaughtered or sold it, it was his which he slaughtered and it was his which he sold a certain man who misappropriated a yoke of oxen from his fellow went and did some plowing with them and also sowed with them some seeds and at last returned them to their owner when the case came before our nomin, he said to the sheriffs of the court go forth and appraise the increment added to the field but robber said to him were only the oxen instrumental in the increment and did the land contribute nothing to the increment he replied did i ever order payment of the full appraisement of the increment i surely meant only half of it he however rejoined be that as it may since the oxen were misappropriated they merely have to be returned intact as we have indeed learned all robbers have to pay in accordance with the value at the time of the robbery why then pay for any work done with them he replied did i not say to you that when i am sitting in judgment you should not make any suggestions to me for whom our colleague said with reference to me that i and king Shipper are like brothers in Respect of civil law that person who misappropriated the pair of oxen is a notorious robber and I want to penalize him mission if one misappropriated an animal and it became old or slaves and they became old he would have to pay according to the value at the time of the robbery our mayor however says that in the case of slaves he might say to the owner here take your own if he misappropriated a coin and it became cracked fruits and they became stale or wine and it became sour he would have to pay according to the value at the time of the robbery but if the coin went out of use the terima became defiled the leaven forbidden for any use because Passover had intervened or if the animal he misappropriated became the instrument for the commission of a sin or it became otherwise disqualified from being sacrificed upon the altar or if it was taken out to be stoned he can say to him here take your own Gemara our papa said the expression it became old does not necessarily mean that it actually became old for the same law would apply even where it had otherwise deteriorated but do we not expressly learn it became old this indicates that the deterioration has to be equivalent to its becoming old i.e. where it will no more recover health markashi saw the son of arhista said to arashi it has been expressly stated in the name of aryohanan that even where a thief misappropriated a lamb which became a ram or a calf which became an ox since the animal underwent a change while in his hands he would acquire title to it so that if he subsequently slaughtered or sold it it was his which he slaughtered and it was his which he sold he said to him did i not say to you that you should not transpose the names of scholars that statement was made in the name of arlay armayur however says that in the case of slaves he might say to the owner here take your own arhan abib dimi said that rab stated that the halacha is in accordance with armayur but how could rab abandon the view of the rabbis and act in accordance with our mayor. It may, however, be said that he did so because in the text of the relevant bari the names were transposed. But again, how could Rab abandon the text of the Mishnah and act in accordance with the bari? The rab even in the text of our Mishnah had transposed the names. But still, what was the reason of Rab for transposing the names in the text of the Mishnah because of that of the bari? The why not on the contrary transpose the names in the text of
and the other says that it took place when he was owner the vendor would have to swear that the birth took place when he was owner and thus retain it for all those who have to take an oath according to the law of the Torah by taking the oath release themselves from payment this is a view of our measure but the sages say that an oath can be imposed neither in the case of slaves nor of real property now since the text of our mission should have been reversed why did Rab state that the halacha is in accordance with our measure should he not have said that the halacha is in accordance with the rabbis what he said was this according to the text you taught with the names transposed the halacha is in accordance with our measure Talmud Mas Baba Kama but did Rab really say that slaves are on the same footing as real property did our Daniel B. Katna not say that Rab stated that if a man forcibly seizes another slave and makes him perform some work he would be exempt from any payment now if you really suppose that slaves are on the same footing as real property why should he be exempt should the slave not be considered as still being in the possession of the owner we are dealing there with a case where he took hold of the slave at a time when the owner usually required no work from him exactly as our Abba sent to Mari Bimar saying ask Arhuna whether a person who stays in the premises of another without his knowledge must pay him rent or not and he sent him back reply that he is not liable to pay him rent but what comparison is there there is no difficulty in that case as if we follow the view that premises which are inhabited by tenants keep in a better condition we must say that the owner is well pleased that his house be inhabited or again if we follow the view that the gate is smitten onto roll we can again say that the owner benefited by it but here in this case what owner could be said to be pleased that his slave became reduced by overwork it may However, be said that here also it may be beneficial to the owner that his slave should not become prone to idleness. Some at the house of our Joseph B. Hamel used to see slaves of people who owed them money and make them perform some work. Rabbi his son said to him, Why do you sir allow this to be done? He thereupon said to him, Because our Naman stated that the work of the slave is not worth the bread he eats. He rejoined, Do we not say that our Naman meant his statement only to apply to one like Daru? His own servant who was a notorious dancer in the wine houses, whereas with all other servants who do some work, the case is not so. He however said to him, I hold with our Daniel B. Katna for our Daniel B. Katna said that Rab stated that one who forcibly seizes another slave and makes him perform some work would be exempt from any payment, thus proving that this is beneficial to the owner by preventing his slave from becoming idle. He replied, These rulings could apply only where he has no money. Claim against the owner, but in your case, sir, since you have a money claim against the owner, it looks like usury exactly as our Joseph B. Menumi said, namely that our Naman stated that though the rabbis decided that one who occupies another's premises without his consent is not liable to pay him rent if he lent money to another and then occupied his premises, he would have to pay him rent. He thereupon said to him, If so, I withdraw. It was stated if one forcibly seizes another's ship and performs some work with it, Rab said that if the owner wishes, he may demand payment for its hire, or if he wishes, he may demand payment for its wear and tear. But Samuel said he may demand only for its wear and tear, said our Papa. They do not differ as Rab referred to the case where the ship was made for hire and Samuel to the case where it was not made for hire, or if you like, I can say that both statements deal with the case where it was made for hire, but whereas Rab deals with the case where possession was. Taken of it with the intention of paying the hire Samuel refers to one where possession was taken of it with the intention of robbery if he misappropriated a coin and it became cracked etc. Arhuna said it became cracked means that it actually cracked and it went out of use means that the government declared it obsolete but Rab Judah said that where the government declared the coin obsolete it would be tantamount to its being disfigured and what was meant by it went out of use is that the inhabitants of a particular province rejected it while it was still in circulation in another province Arhista said to Arhuna according to your statement that it went out of use meant that the government declared it obsolete why in our mission in the case of fruits that became stale or wine that became sour which appears to be equivalent to a coin that was declared obsolete by the government is it stated that he would have to pay in accordance with the value at the time of the robbery he Replied there in the case of the fruits and the wine the taste and the smell changed whereas here in the case of the coin there was no change in the substance Rabbi on the other hand said to Rab Judah according to your statement that where the government declared the coin obsolete it would be tantamount to its having been cracked why in our mission in the case of Teramah that became defiled which appears to resemble a coin that was declared obsolete by the government is it stated that he can say to him here take your own he replied there in the case of the Teramah the defect is not noticeable whereas here in the case of the coin the defect is noticeable it was stated if a man lends his fellow something on condition that it should be repaid in a certain coin and that coin became obsolete Rab said Talmud Mas Baba Kama be that the debtor would have to pay the creditor with the coin that had currency at that time whereas Samuel said that the debtor could say to the Creditor go forth and spend it in Meshon Arnam and said that the ruling of Samuel might reasonably be applied where the creditor had occasion to go to Meshon but if he had no occasion to go there it would surely not be so but Robert raised an objection to this view of Arnam and from the following redemption of the second tithe cannot be made by means of money which has no currency as for instance if one possessed the coins of Jerusalem or of the earlier kings no redemption could be made. By these now does this not imply that if the coins were of the later kings even though analogous in one respect to coins of the earlier kings it would be possible to effect the redemption by means of them he however said to him that we were dealing here with a case where the governments of the different provinces were not antagonistic to one another but since this implies that the statement of Samuel as explained by Arnam and referred to the case where the governments of the different Provinces were antagonistic to one another. How would it be possible to bring the coins to the province where they still have currency? They could be brought there with some difficulty, as where no thorough search was made at the frontier. Though if the coins were to be discovered, there would be trouble. Come and your redemption of the second tithe cannot be effected by means of coins which have currency here, but which are actually with the owner in Babylon. So also if they have currency in Babylon, but are kept here, but where the coins have their currency in Babylon and are in Babylon, redemption can be effected by means of them. Now it is at all events stated here, is it not that no redemption could be effected by means of coins which, though having currency here, are actually with the owner in Babylon, irrespective of the fact that the owner will have to go up here? We are dealing here with a case where the governments of the respective countries were antagonistic to each. Other, but if so, how would coins which have currency in Babylon and are kept in Babylon be utilized as redemption money? They may be utilized for the purchase of an animal in Babylon, which can then be brought up to Jerusalem. But was it not taught that there was an enactment that all kinds of money should be current in Jerusalem? Said Arzera, this is no difficulty, as the latter statement refers to the time when Israel had sway in Eretz Israel over the heathen, whereas the former referred to a time when the heathen governed themselves. Our rabbis taught what was the coin of Jerusalem. The names David and Solomon were inscribed on one side, and the name of Jerusalem on the other. What was the coin of Abraham, or patriarch, an old man and an old woman on the one side, and a young man and a young woman on the other? Rabbi asked Arhista, what would be the law where a man lent his fellow something on condition of being repaid with a certain coin, and that coin meanwhile was made heavier? He replied the payment will have to be with the coins that have currency at that time said the other even if the new coin be of the size of a sieve he replied yes said the other even if it be of the size of a church he again replied yes but in such circumstances would not the products have become cheaper our ashi therefore said we have to look into the matter if it was through the increased weight of the coin that prices of products dropped we would have to deduct from the payment. Accordingly Talmud, Mas Baba Kama but if it was through the market supplies that prices dropped we would not have to deduct anything still with the creditor not derive a benefit from the additional metal we must therefore act like our Papa and Arhuna the son of our Joshua who gave judgment in an action about coins according to the information of an Arabian agron that the debtor should pay for ten old coins only eight new ones Rabbi stated he who throws a coin of another even into. The ocean is exempt the reason being that he can say to him here it lies before you if you are anxious to have it take it this applies however only where the water was clear so that it could be seen but if it was so muddy that the coin could not be seen this would not be so again this holds good only where the throwing was merely indirectly caused by him but if he took it in his hand he would surely have already become subject to the law of robbery and as such would have been liable to make proper restitution
A bruise through which a drop of blood falls into the ear and rabble further stated he who splits the ear of another's cow is exempt the reason being that so far as the value of the cow is concerned it remains as it was before for he did not do anything to reduce it since not all oxen are meant to be sacrificed upon the altar robber raised an objection from the following if he did work with the water of purification or with the heifer of purification he would be exempt according to the judgments of man but liable according to the judgments of heaven now surely this is so only where mere work was done with it in which case the damage done to it is not noticeable whereas in the case of splitting where the damage is noticeable there would also be liability according to the judgments of man it may however be said that the same law would apply in the case of splitting where he would similarly be exempt according to the judgments of man and that what we are told here is that even in the case of mere work where the damage is not noticeable there would still be liability according to the judgments of heaven rabble further stated if one destroyed by fire the bond of a creditor he would be exempt because he can say to him it was only a mere piece of paper of yours that i have burnt rami bihani demurred what are the circumstances talmud mas baba kama b if there are witnesses who know what were the contents of the bond why not draw up another bond which would be valid if on the other hand such witnesses are not available how could we know what were the contents Rabbi said the case could arise where the defendant takes the plaintiff's word as to the contents of the bond Ardimi Bihanada said that regarding this ruling of Rabbi there was a difference of opinion between our Simeon and our other rabbis according to our Simeon who held that an object whose absence would cause an outlay of money is reckoned in law as money there would be liability but according to the rabbis who said that an object whose absence would cause an outlay of money is not reckoned in law as money there would be no liability Arhuna the son of Arjashu Demurd I would suggest that you have to understand our Simeon's statement that an object whose absence would cause an outlay of money is reckoned in law as money to apply only to an object whose substance is its intrinsic value exactly as in another case made out by Rabbi for Rabbi said that where Levin was misappropriated before the arrival of Passover and a third person came along and burned it if this took place during the festival he would be exempt as at that time all are enjoined to destroy it but if after Passover there would be a difference of opinion between our Simeon and our rabbis as according to our Simeon who held that an object whose absence would cause an outlay of money is reckoned in law as money he would be liable while according to our rabbis who said that an object whose absence would cause an outlay of money is not reckoned in law as money he would be exempt but once could it be proved that even regarding an object whose substance is not its intrinsic value our Simeon similarly maintained the same view Amimar said that the authority who is prepared to adjudicate liability in an action for damage done indirectly would similarly hear a judge damages to the amount recoverable on a valid bill but the one who does not adjudicate liability in an action for damage done Indirectly would hear a judge damages only to the extent of the value of a mere paper it once happened that in such an action Raphram compelled Arashi and damages were collected from him like a beam fit for decorative moldings but if the leaven he misappropriated became forbidden for any use because Passover had intervened he can say to him here take your own who is the Tana who in regard to things forbidden for any use allows the offender to say here take your own are his dasa. He is our Jacob as indeed taught if an ox killed a person and before its judgment was concluded its owner disposed of it the sale would hold good if he pronounced it sacred it would be sacred if it was slaughtered its flesh would be permitted for food if a billy returned it to the house of its owner it would be a legal restoration but if after its sentence had already been pronounced the owner disposed of it the sale would not be valid if he consecrated it, it would not be sacred if it was. Slaughtered its flesh would be forbidden for any use if a billy returned it to the house of its owner it would not be a legal restoration our Jacob however says even if after the sentence had already been pronounced the billy returned it to its owner it would be a legal restoration now is not the point at issue between them that our Jacob in the case of things forbidden for any use allows the offender to say here take your own whereas the rabbis disallow this in the case of things forbidden. For any use rabbis said to him no all may agree that even regarding things forbidden for any use the offender is allowed in certain circumstances to say here take your own for if otherwise why did they not differ in the case of leaven during Passover rather therefore said here in the case before us the point at issue must be whether or not sentence may be pronounced over an ox in its absence the rabbis hold that sentence cannot be pronounced over an ox in its absence so that the owner may Plead against the belief thus if you had returned it to me before the passing of the sentence I would have driven it away to the pastures whereas now you have surrendered my ox into the hands of those against whom I am unable to bring any action our Jacob however holds that sentence can be pronounced over the ox even in its absence so that the belly may return to the owner thus in any case the sentence would have been passed on the ox even in its absence our histoch came across Rabbi B. Samuel and said to him have you been taught anything regarding things forbidden for any use he replied yes I was taught the following he shall restore the misappropriated object what is the point of the additional words which he violently took away it is that so long as it was intact he may restore it hence did the rabbis declare that if one misappropriated a coin and it went out of use fruits and they became stale wine and it became sour terima and it became defiled leaven and it became forbidden for any use because Passover intervened an animal and it became the instrument for the commission of a sin or an ox and it subsequently became subject to be stoned but its judgment was not yet concluded he can say to the owner here take your own now which authority can you suppose to apply this ruling only where the judgment was not yet concluded but not where the judgment was already concluded if not the rabbis and it is at the same time stated that if he misappropriated love and it became forbidden for any use because Passover intervened he can say to him here take your own he replied if you happen to meet them please do not tell them anything of this teaching if one misappropriated fruits and they became stale he can say to him here take your own but did we not learn if he misappropriated fruits and they became stale he would certainly have to pay according to the value at the time of the robbery said our papa the latter ruling refers to where the all of them became stale the former to where only parts of them became stale Mishnah if an owner gave craftsmen some articles to set in order and they spoiled them they would be liable to pay where he gave a joiner a chest a box or a cupboard set in order and he spoiled it he would be liable to pay if a builder undertook to pull down a wall and broke the stones or damaged them he would be liable to pay but if while he was pulling down the wall on one side another part fell on another side he would be exempt though if it was caused through the knocking he would be liable Gamar RC said the Mishnah ruling could not be regarded as applying except where he gave a joiner a box a chest or a cupboard to knock a nail in and while he was knocking in the nail he broke them but if he gave the joiner timber to make a chest a box or a cupboard and after he had made the box the chest or the cupboard they were broken by him he would be exempt the reason being that a craftsman acquires title to the increase in value caused by the construction of the article but we have learned if an owner gave craftsmen some articles to set in order and they spoiled them they would be liable to pay does this not mean that he gave them timber to make utensils no he gave them a chest a box or a cupboard but since the concluding clause in the text mentions chest box or cupboard is it not implied that the opening clause refers to timber it may however be said that the later clause only means to expand the earlier as follows in the case where an owner gave craftsmen some articles to set in order and they spoiled them how would they be liable to pay as eg where he gave a joiner a chest a box or a cupboard there is also good reason for supposing that the text of the latter clause was merely giving an example for should you assume that the opening clause refers to timber after we have been first told that even in the case of timber they would be liable to pay and that we should not say that the craftsman acquires title to the increase in value caused by the construction of the article what necessity would there be to mention afterwards chest box and portable turret if only on account of this your point could hardly be regarded as proof for the later clause might have been inserted to reveal the true meaning of the earlier clause so that you should not think that the earlier clause refers to the case where he gave the joiner a chest box and covered whereas where he gave him timber the law would not be so hence the concluding clause specifically mentions chest box and covered to indicate that the opening clause refers to timber and that even in that case the craftsman would be liable to pay may we say that he can be supported from the following if wool was given to a dire talmud moss baba comma and it was burnt by the dye he would have to pay the owner the value of his wool now it is only the value of the wool that he has to pay but not the Combined value of the wool and the increase in price does this not apply even where it was
that a refutation would be possible come and hear if he gave his garment to a craftsman and the latter finished it and informed him of the fact even if from that time ten days elapsed without his paying him he would through that not be transgressing the injunction thou shalt not keep all night but if the craftsman delivered the garment to him in the middle of the day as soon as the sun set without payment having been made the owner would through that transgress the injunction thou shalt not keep all night now if you assume that a craftsman acquires title to the improvement carried out by him on any article why should the owner be transgressing the injunction thou shalt not keep all night said armari the son of Arkahana the work required in this case was to remove the woolly surface of a thick cloth where there was no accretion but be it as it may since he gave it to him for the purpose of making it softer as soon as he made it softer was there not already an improvement no the ruling is necessary for meeting the case where he hired him to stamp upon it and undertook to pay him for every act of stamping one ma which is but the higher for labor but according to what we assumed previously that he was not hired for stamping this ruling would have been a support to the view of Arshi's hate for when it was asked of Arshi's hate whether in the case of contracting the owner would transgress the injunction thou shalt not keep all night or would not transgress he answered that he would transgress but are we at the same time to say that Arshi's hate differed from R.C. Samuel Biaha said Arshi's hate was speaking of a messenger sent to deliver a letter shall we say that the same difference is found between the following ten aim for it was taught if a woman says make for me bracelets earrings and rings and I will become betrothed unto thee as soon as he makes them she becomes betrothed unto him this is the view of our mayor but the sages say that she would not become betrothed until something of actual value has come into her possession. Now, what is meant by actual value? We can hardly say that it refers to this particular value. For this would imply that, according to our mayor, it was not necessary for her to come into possession even of that value. If so, what would be the instrument to effect the betrothal? It therefore appears evident that what was meant by actual value was some other value. Now, again, it was presumed by the students that, according to all authorities, there is continuous growth of liability for hire from the very commencement of the work until the end of it. And also that, according to all authorities, if one betrothes a woman through foregoing a debt owing to him from her, she would not be betrothed. Would it therefore not appear that they differed on the question whether a craftsman acquires title to the improvement carried out by him upon an article? Our mayor maintaining that a craftsman acquires title to the Improvement carried out by him upon an article while the rabbis maintain that the craftsman does not acquire title to the improvement carried out by him upon an article. No, all may agree that the craftsman does not acquire title to the improvement carried out by him upon an article. And here they differ as to whether there is progressive liability for hire from the very commencement of the work until the very end. Our mayor maintaining that there is no liability for hire except at the very end. Whereas the rabbis maintain that there is progressive liability for hire from the commencement until the very end. Or if you wish, I may say that in the opinion of all, there is progressive liability for hire from the very commencement to the end. But here they differ in regard to the law regarding one who betrothes a woman by foregoing a debt due from her. Our mayor maintaining that one who betrothes a woman by foregoing a debt due from her would thereby effect a legal betrothal. Whereas the other rabbis maintain that he who betrothes a woman by foregoing a debt due from her would thereby not effect a valid betrothal Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi Rabba however said that all might have been agreed that there is progressive liability for hire from the very commencement until the end and also that one who betrothes a woman by foregoing a debt due from her would not thereby effect a valid betrothal and it was again unanimously held that a craftsman does not acquire title to the improvement carried out by him upon an article and here we are dealing with a case where e.g. he added a particle out of his own funds to the raw material supplied by her or mayor holding that where the instrument of betrothal is both the foregoing of a debt and the giving of a parata the woman thinks more of the parata whereas the rabbis held that where the instrument of betrothal is both the foregoing of a debt and the giving of a parata she thinks more of the debt. Which she is excused. This was also the difference between the following ten aim as taught. If a man says in consideration of the hire for the work I have already done for you, be betrothed to me, she would not become betrothed. But if he says in consideration of the hire for work which I will do for you, be betrothed to me, she would become betrothed. Our Nathan said that if he said in consideration of the hire for work I will do for you, she would thereby not become betrothed, and all the more. So in this case where he said in consideration of the hire for work I have already done for you, or Judah the prince, however, says it was truly stated that whether he said in consideration of the hire for the work I have already done for you, or in consideration of the hire for work I will do for you, she would not thereby become betrothed. But if he added a particle out of his own funds to the raw material supplied by her, she would thereby become betrothed. Now the difference between the first. Tana and Arnathan is on the question of the liability for hire whether or not it is progressive from the very commencement while the difference between Arnathan and Arjuna the prince is on the question what is her attitude when the betrothal is made both by the foregoing of a debt and the giving of a parata Samuel said an expert slaughterer who did not carry out the slaughter properly would be liable to pay as he was a damaged doer and he was careless and this would be considered as if the owner asked him to slaughter for him from one side and he slaughtered for him from the other but why was it necessary for him to say both he was a damaged doer and he was careless if he had said only he was a damaged doer he might have said that this ruling should apply only where he was working for a hire whereas where he was working gratuitously this would not be so we are therefore told that there is no distinction as he was careless our Hamabi Guri raised an objection to this view of Samuel from the following if an animal was given to a slaughterer and he caused it to become nibble if he was an expert he would be exempt but if an amateur he would be liable if however he was engaged for hire whether he was an amateur or expert he would be liable is this not in contradiction to the view of Samuel he replied is your brain disordered then another one of our rabbis came along and raised the same objection to his view he said to him you surely deserve to be given the same as your fellow I was stating to you the view of our mayor and you tell me the view of the rabbis why did you not examine my words carefully wherein I said for he was a damaged doer and he was careless and this should be considered as if the owner asked him to slaughter for him from one side and he slaughtered for him from the other for surely who reasons in this way if not our mayor who said that a human being has to take greater heed to himself but what statement of our mayor is referred to we can hardly say the one of our mayor which we learned Nemonic KL and if the owner fastened his ox to the wall inside the stable with the cord or shut the door in front of it properly but the ox nevertheless got out and did damage whether it had been tam or already knew it he would be liable this is the opinion of our mayor for surely in that case there they differed as to the interpretation of scriptural verses it therefore seems to be the one of our mayor which we learned if wool was handed over to a dire to dye it red but he dyed it black or to dye it black and he dyed it red our mayor says that he would have to pay the owner for the value of the wool but did he not there spoil it with his own hands the reference therefore must be to the one of our mayor which was taught if a pitcher is broken and the pot's herds are not removed or a camel falls down and is not raised our mayor orders payment for any damage resulting therefrom whereas the other sages say that no action can be instituted in Civil courts though there is liability according to divine justice and we came to the conclusion that they differed as to whether or not stumbling implies negligence Rabbi Barhanna said that Ar Yohanan stated that an expert slaughterer who did not carry out the slaughter properly would be liable to pay even if he was as skilled as the slaughterer of Sephoris but did Ar Yohanan really say so did Rabbi Barhanna not say that such a case came before Ar Yohanan in the synagogue of Mon and he said to the slaughterer go and bring evidence that you are skilled to slaughter hands and I will declare you exempt there is however no difficulty as the latter ruling was in a case where the slaughterer was working gratuitously whereas the former ruling applies where the slaughterer works for hire exactly as Arzara said if one wants the slaughterer to become liable to him he shall give him a dinner whose beforehand an objection was raised if wheat was brought to be ground and the miller omitted to moisten it and he made it into bread flour or coarse bread or if flour was given to a baker and he made out of it bread which crumbled or an animal to a slaughterer and he rendered it nibble he would be liable as he is on the same footing as a worker who receives hire does this not imply that he was working gratuitously no read because he is a worker receiving hire a case of magrumita was brought before rab who declared it trefa and nevertheless released the slaughterer from any
Further instruction whatever but who made a mistake regarding a new stamp at the time when the coin had just for the first time come from the mint there was a certain woman who showed a dinar to our high and he told her that it was good later she again came to him and said to him I afterwards showed it to others and they said to me that it was bad and in fact I could not pass it he therefore said to Rab go forth and change it for a good one and write down in my register that this was a bad business but why should he be different from Dancho and Isser who would be exempt because they needed no instruction surely our high also needed no instruction our high acted within the margin of the judgment on the principle learned by our Joseph and Shalcho the means Talmud, Mas Babakama the source of their livelihood the way means deeds of loving kindness they must walk means of visitation of the sick wherein means burial and the work means the law which they must do means within it. Margin of the judgment Rush Lakish showed a dinar to our Eliezer who told him that it was good he said to him you see that I rely upon you he replied suppose you do rely on me what of it do you think that if it is found bad I would have to exchange it for a good one did not you yourself state that it was only Armadir who adjudicates liability in an action for damage done indirectly which apparently means that it was only Armadir who maintained so whereas we did not hold in accordance with his view but he said to him no Armadir maintained so and we hold with him but to what statement of Armadir was the reference it could hardly be the one of Armadir which we learned if a judge in giving judgment in a certain case has declared innocent the person who was really liable or made liable a person who was really innocent declared defiled the thing which was levitically clean or declared clean the thing which was really defiled his decision would stand but he would have to make reparation. Out of his own estate for was it not taught in connection with this that Arley said that Rab stated that this would be so only where he personally executed the judgment by his own hand the reference therefore appears to be the one of Armadir which we learned if wool was handed over to a dyer to dye it red but he dyed it black or to dye it black and he dyed it red Armadir says that he would have to pay the owner for the value of his wool but did he not in that case also spoil it with his own hands the reference must therefore be to the one of Armadir which we learned he who with the branches of his vine covers the crops of his fellow renders them proscribed and will be liable for damages but there also did he not do the mischief with his own hands the reference must therefore be to the one of Armadir which was taught if the fence of a vineyard near a field of crops is broken through Talmud, Mas Babakama be the owner of the crops may request the owner of the vineyard to Repair it so also if it is broken through again he may similarly request him to repair it but if the owner of the vineyard abandons it altogether and does not repair it he would render the produce proscribed and would incur full responsibility Mishnah if wool was given to a dyer and the dye burnt it he would have to pay the owner the value of his wool but if he died it and if the increase in value is greater than his outlay the owner would give him only the outlay whereas if the outlay was greater than the increase in value he would have to pay him the amount of the increase where wool was handed to a dyer to dye red and he dyed it black or to dye black and he dyed it red Armadir says that he would have to pay the owner for the value of his wool Arjuda however says if the increase in value is greater than the outlay the owner would pay the dyer his outlay whereas if the outlay exceeded the increase in value he would have to pay him no more than the increase tomorrow what does copper mean Arnaman said that Rabbi Barhan has stated it means that the copper died it what is meant by saying that the copper died it said Rabbi B. Samuel Talmud, Mas Babakama he died it with the sediments of the kettles our rabbis taught if pieces of wood were given to a joiner to make a chair and he made a bench out of them or to make a bench and he made a chair out of them our mayor says that he will have to refund to the owner the value of his wood whereas Arjuna says that if the increase in value exceeds his outlay the owner would pay the joiner his outlay whereas if the outlay exceeds the increase in value he would have to pay him no more than the increase our mayor however agrees that where pieces of wood were given to a joiner to make a handsome chair out of and he made an ugly chair out of them or to make a handsome bench and he made an ugly one if the increased value would exceed the outlay the owner would pay the joiner the amount of his outlay whereas if it Outlay exceeded the increase in value he would have to pay him no more than the amount of the increase it was asked is the improvement affected by colors a separate item independent of the wool or is the improvement affected by colors not a separate item independent of the wool how can such a question arise in practice the case can hardly be one where a man misappropriated pigments and after having crushed and dissolved them he dyed wool with them for would he not have acquired title to them through the change which they underwent no the query could have application only where he misappropriated pigments already dissolved and used them for dyeing so that if the improvement affected by colors is a separate item independent of the wool the plaintiff might plead give me back the dyes which you have taken from me but if on the other hand the improvement affected by colors is not a separate item independent of the wool the defendant might say to him I have nothing of yours with me but I would here say even if the improvement affected by colors is not a separate item independent of the wool why should the defendant be able to say to him I have nothing of yours with me seeing that the plaintiff can say to him give me back the pigments of which you have deprived me we must therefore take the other alternative are we to say that the improvement affected by colors is not a separate item independent of the wool and the defendant would have to pay him or is it improvement affected by colors a separate item independent of the wool and the defendant can say to him here are your dyes before you and you can take them away but how can he take them away by means of soap but soap would surely remove them without making any restitution we must therefore be dealing here in the query with a case where e.g. a robber misappropriated dyes and wool of one and the same owner and dyed that wool with those dyes and was returning to him that wool now if it Improvement affected by colors is a separate item independent of the wool the robber would thus be returning both the dyes and the wool but if the improvement affected by colors is not a separate item independent of the wool it was only the wool which he was returning whereas the dyes he was not returning but I would still say why should it not be sufficient for the robber to do the seeing that he caused the wool to increase in value no the query might have application where colored wool had meanwhile depreciated in price or if you wish I may say that it refers to where e.g. he painted with them an ape in which case there was thereby no increase in value Robin has said we were dealing here in the query with a case where e.g. the wool belonged to one person and the dyes to another and as an ape came along and dyed that wool of the one with those dyes of the other now is the improvement affected by the colors a separate item independent of the wool so that the owner of it Dies is entitled to say to the owner of the wool give me my dies which are with you or is the improvement affected by colors not a separate item apart from the wool so that he might retort to him I have nothing belonging to you come and here a garment which was dyed with the shells of the fruits of Orla has to be destroyed by fire this proves that appearance is a distinct item in valuation said Rabbah it is different in this case where any benefit visible to the eye was forbidden by the Torah is taught uncircumcised it shall not be eaten of this gives me only its prohibition as food once do I learn that no other benefit should be derived from it that it should not be used for dying with that a candle should not be lit with it it was therefore stated further ye shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised uncircumcised it shall not be eaten of for the purpose of including all of these come and here a garment which was dyed with the shells of the fruits of it Sabbatical year has to be destroyed by fire it is different there as scripture stated it shall be implying that it must always be as it was Talmud, Mas Babakama B. Rabba pointed out a contradiction we have learned a garment which was dyed with the shells of the fruits of Orla has to be destroyed by fire thus proving that color is a distinct item but a contradiction could be pointed out if a quarter of a log of the blood of a dead person has been absorbed in the floor of a house all in the house would become defiled or as others say all in the house would not be defiled these two statements however do not differ as the former refers to utensils which were there at the beginning whereas the latter refers to the utensils which were brought there subsequently after the blood was already absorbed in the ground if the blood was absorbed in a garment we have to see if on the garment being washed a quarter of a log of blood would come out of it it would cause defilement but if not it would not cause defilement said Arkahana the ruling stated in this mission is one of concessions made in respect of quarters of a log applicable in the case of blood of one weltering in his blood who defiles by mere rabbinic enactment Rabbah again pointed out a contradiction we have learned among the species of dyes the aftergrowths of woad and matter are subject to the law of the sabbatical year and so also is any value received for them subject to the law of the sabbatical year they are subject to the law of removal and any value received for them is similarly subject to the
implying not for the purpose of steeping for food and not for the purpose of washing but our Jose said that scripture stated for you implying for all your needs but also according to the rabbis was it not stated for you for you should be analogous to for food referring us to any uses by which a benefit is derived from the products at the very time of their consumption excluding us the purposes of steeping and washing where the benefit is derived from the products after their consumption but what does our Jose make of for food he might say to you that that was solely necessary for the ruling of the very as taught for food but not for a plaster you say for food but not for a plaster why perhaps not otherwise for food but not for the purpose of washing when it says for you the purpose of washing is indicated what then do I make of for food if not for food but not for a plaster but what reason had you for including the purpose of washing and excluding the purpose of a plaster I include the purpose of washing as this is a requirement shared alike by all people but exclude the purpose of plaster which is a requirement not shared alike by all people now whose view would be followed in that statement which was taught for food but not for a plaster for food but not for perfume for food but not to make it into an emetic it must be in accordance with our Jose for if in accordance with the rabbis the purpose of washing and steeping should also be excluded our Judah. However says if the increase in value etc. And Imanic Saban our Joseph was once sitting behind our Abba in the presence of our Huna who was sitting and stating that the Halacha was in accordance with our Joshua B. Karha and again that the Halacha was in accordance with our Judah our Joseph thereupon turned his face towards him and said I understand his mentioning our Joshua B. Karha as it was necessary to state that the Halacha is in accordance with him since he might have been inclined to think that the principle that where an individual differs from the majority the Halacha is in accordance with the majority applies also here it was therefore made known to us that in this case the Halacha is in accordance with the individual what statement of our Joshua B. Karha is referred to that which was taught our Joshua B. Karha says that a debt recorded in an instrument should not be collected from them whereas debts contracted by mere word of mouth may be collected from them because this is no more than rescuing one's money from the hands of the debtors but why was it necessary to state that the Halacha was in accordance with our Judah for his view was in the first instance stated as a point at issue between the authorities and subsequently as an anonymous ruling and it is an established rule that if a view is first dealt with as a point at issue and then stated anonymously the Halacha is in accordance with the anonymous statement the point at issue in this case was in Baba Kama. If wool was handed over to a dyer to dye it red but he dyed it black or to dye it black but he dyed it red our mayor says that he would have to pay the owner for the value of his wool but our Judah says if the increase in value exceeds the outlay the owner would repay to the dyer his outlay while if the outlay exceeded the increase in value he would have to pay him no more than the amount of the increase whereas the anonymous statement was made in Baba Mizia where we have learned whichever party Departs from the terms of the agreement is at a disadvantage so also whichever party retracts from the agreement has the inferior claim Arhuna considered that it was necessary for him to state so since otherwise you might have thought that there was no precise order for the teaching of the Mishnah so that this ruling of Arjuna might perhaps have been in the first instance anonymous but subsequently a point at issue what does Arjuna say to this he says that if so wherever a ruling is first a point at issue and then stated anonymously it might be questioned that as no precise order may have been kept in the teaching of the Mishnah it might have been anonymous in the first instance and a point at issue later on to this Arhuna would answer that we never say that there was no precise order in the teaching of the Mishnah in one and the same tractate whereas in the case of two tractates we might indeed say so Arjuna however considered the whole of Nezikin to form only one tractate, if you like, again, I may say that it is because this ruling was stated among fixed laws, whichever party departs from the terms of the agreement is at a disadvantage, and so also whichever party retracts from the argument has an inferior claim. Our rabbis taught where money was given to an agent Talmud, Mas Baba Kama Bija by wheat, and he bought with it barley or barley, and he bought with it wheat. It was taught in one barita that if there was a loss, the loss would be sustained by him, and so also if there was a profit, the profit would be enjoyed by him. But in another barita, it was taught that if there was a loss, he would sustain the loss, but if there was a profit, the profit would be divided between them. Why this difference of opinion said our Yohan, and there is no difficulty as one was in accordance with our mayor and the other with our Judah. The former was in accordance with our mayor who said that a change transfers ownership, whereas the latter was in accordance with our Judah. Who said that a change does not transfer ownership? Our Eliezer demurred. Once can you know this? May it not be perhaps that our mayor meant his view to apply only to a matter which was intended to be used by the owner personally, but in regard to matters of merchandise, he would not say so. Our Eliezer therefore said that one as well as the other barita might be in accordance with our mayor, and there would still be no difficulty as the former dealt with a case where the grain was bought for domestic food, whereas in the latter it was bought for merchandise. Moreover, in the West they were even amused at the statement of our Yohan and regarding the view of our Judah, for they said, Who was it that informed the vendor of the wheat so that he might transfer the ownership of the wheat to the owner of the money? Our Samuel B. Sassardi demurred. If so, why not also say the same even in the case where wheat was wanted by the principal and wheat was bought by the agent? Our Abab, however, said the case where Wheat was wanted and wheat was bought is different as in this case the agent was acting for the principal upon the terms of his mandate and it is the same in law as if the principal himself had done it this could even be proved from what we have learned neither in the case of one who has declared his possessions consecrated nor in the case of one who has dedicated the valuation of himself can the temple treasurer claim either the garments of the wife or the garments of the children or the articles which were dyed for them or the new footwear bought for them now why not ask here also who informed the dyer that he was transferring the ownership of his dye to the wife but must we not then answer that since the husband was acting on behalf of his wife it is considered as if this was done by the actual hand of the wife if so also there as the agent was acting upon a mandate it is considered as if the purchase of the wheat had been done by the actual hand of the principal or However said no it was because when a man declares his possession sacred he has no intention to include the garments of his wife and children are Zeradimur could it be said that in such circumstances a man would include in his mind even his tefillin and we have nevertheless learned that in the case of one who declares his possession sacred even his tefillin would have to be included in the estimate of a however said to him yes it is quite possible that a man may in his mind include even his tefillin as he who declares his possessions consecrated surely thinks that he is performing a commandment but no man would in his mind include the garments of his wife and children as this would create ill feeling our Ashai Demur was this not stated here as applying also to liabilities for vows of value regarding which case we have learned that those who have incurred liabilities for vows of value can be forced to give a pledge though it could hardly be said that it was in the mind of a Man that the giving of a pledge should be enforced upon himself or Abba therefore said one who declares his possessions consecrated is regarded as having from the very beginning transferred the ownership of the garments of his wife and children to them or rabbis taught if one man buys a field in the name of another he cannot compel the latter to sell it to him but if he explicitly made the stipulation with the vendor he could force him to sell what does this mean said Arshis hate what is meant. Is this if one man buys a field from another in the name of the exilarch he cannot subsequently force the exilarch to sell it to him but if when buying it he explicitly made the stipulation he could compel the exilarch to sell it the master stated if one buys a field in the name of the exilarch he cannot subsequently force the exilarch to sell it thus implying that he would surely acquire title to it shall we say that this differs from the view of the scholars of the West who stated who Indeed inform the vendor of the wheat so that he may transfer the ownership of the wheat to the owner of the money as far as that goes there would be no difficulty as this could hold good where Ikvendi made this known to the owner of the field and also informed the witnesses who signed the deed about it read however the concluding clause but if when buying it he explicitly made the stipulation he could compel the exilarch to sell it but why should it be so why should the exilarch not be entitled to say I want neither your compliments nor your insults Abbe therefore said what was meant was this if one buys a field in the name of another Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba, such as the exilarch he cannot compel the vendor to sell it to him again but if when buying it he explicitly made the stipulation he could compel the vendor to sell it to him again the master stated if one man buys a field in the name of another such as the exilarch he cannot compel
Purchase money, he replied to him. If when they sold it, they stated that it was Kahana's flax, you may go and receive the money, but if not, you may not accept it. But was this ruling made in accordance with the view of the Western scholars who asked who was it that informed the vendor of the wheat so that he might transfer the ownership of his wheat to the owner of the money? But what comparison is there had Arkahana given for to receive eight so that it were usury? Was it not his flax which had by itself gone up in price and which was definitely misappropriated by the vendors? And regarding this, we have learned that all kinds of robbers have to pay in accordance with the value at the time of the robbery. It may, however, be said that there it was a case of advance payment, and Arkahana had never pulled the flax to acquire title to it, and Rab was following his own reasoning for Rab elsewhere stated advance payment at present prices may be made for the future delivery of products. But no advance payment at present prices may be made if the value of the products will subsequently be paid in actual money in lieu of the mission. If one man robbed another to the extent of a parata and took nevertheless an oath that he did not do so, he would have to convey it personally to him, even as far as to media he may give it neither to his son nor to his agent, though he may give it to the sheriff of the court of law. If the plaintiff died, the robber would have to restore it to the heirs if he refunded to him the principal but did not pay him the additional fifth, or if the other excused him the principal, though not the fifth, or excused him both one and the other, with the exception, however, of less than the value of a parata on account of the principal, he would not have to go after him if, however, he paid him the fifth, but did not refund the principal, or where the other excused him the fifth, but not the principal, or even where he remitted him both one and the other. With the exception, however, of the value of a parita on account of the principal, he would have to convey it personally to him if he refunded to him the principal and took an oath regarding the fifth Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi, he would have to pay him a fifth on top of the fifth and so on until the principal becomes reduced to less than the value of a parita. So also is the case regarding a deposit as it is stated in that which was delivered him to keep or in fellowship or in a thing taken away by violence or hath deceived his neighbor or hath found that which was lost and yet concerning it and sweareth falsely he has to pay the principal and the fifth and bring a trespass offering tomorrow. This is so apparently only where the robber had taken an oath against him, but if he had not yet taken an oath, this would not be so, but would this be not in agreement either with our Tarfan or with our Akiba, for we have learned if a man robbed one out of five persons without knowing which one he robbed. And each one claims that he was robbed, he may set down the misappropriated article between them and depart. This is the view of our Tarfan. Our Akiva, however, said that this is not the way to liberate him from sin. For this purpose, he must restore the misappropriated article to each of them. Now, in accordance with whose view is the ruling of our mission, if in accordance with our Tarfan, did he not say that even after he had sworn, he may set down the misappropriated article among them and depart, if again in accordance with our Akiva, did he not say that even where no oath was taken, he would have to restore the value of the misappropriated article to each of them? It might still be in accordance with our Akiva for the statement of our Akiva that he would have to pay for the misappropriated article to each of them was made only where an oath was taken. The reason being that Scripture stated and given unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his being guilty, our Tarfan, however, held that though Oath was taken. Our rabbis have still made an enactment to facilitate repentance, as indeed taught our Elias or Bizotic says a general enactment was laid down to the effect that where the expense of personally conveying the misappropriated article would be more than actual principal, he should be able to pay the principal and the fifth to the court of law and thereupon bring his guilt offering and so obtain atonement. And our Akiva he argues that the rabbis made the enactment only where he knew whom he robbed, in which case the amount misappropriated would ultimately be restored to the owner, whereas where he robbed one of five persons and does not know whom he robbed, in which case the amount misappropriated could not be restored to its true owner. Our rabbis did surely not make the enactment. Our Hunabi Judah raised an objection from the following. Our Simeon B. Eliezer said that our Tarfan and our Akiva did not differ in regard to one who bought an article from one out of five without knowing from whom he bought it both holding that he may put down the purchase money among them and depart where they differed was regarding one who robbed one out of five persons without knowing whom he robbed our tarfan maintaining that he may leave the value of the misappropriated article among them and depart whereas our Akiva says that there could be no remedy for him unless he pays for the misappropriated article to each of them now if you assume that an oath was taken here what difference is there between purchasing and misappropriating robber further objected from the following it once happened that a certain pious man bought an article from two persons without knowing from whom he had bought it and when he consulted our tarfan the latter said to him leave the purchase money among them and depart but when he came to our Akiva he said to him there is no remedy for you unless you pay each of them now if you assume that a false oath was taken here would a pious man swear falsely nor can you say that he first took an oath and subsequently became a pious man since wherever we say that it once happened with a certain pious man he was either Arjuna B. Baba or Arjuna B. Ilai and as is well known Arjuna B. Baba and Arjuna B. Ilai were pious men from the very beginning the ruling of the mission must therefore be in accordance with our Tarfan for our Tarfan would agree where a false oath was taken the reason being that scripture stated and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering but our Akiba maintained that even where no oath was taken the fine has to be imposed now according to our Tarfan let us see where he took an oath he would surely not be subject to the law unless he admitted his guilt why then only in the case where he took an oath would not the same hold good even where no oath was taken as indeed taught our Tarfan agrees that if a man says to two persons I have robbed one of you and do not know whom he would have to pay each of them amina. Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, since he made a voluntary admission, Rabba therefore said the case of our mission is different altogether, for since he knows whom he robbed and in fact has admitted it so that it is possible to restore the misappropriated value to the owner, it is considered as if the plaintiff had said to him, Let it for time being be in your possession, it is therefore only in the case where an oath was taken that though it is considered as if he said to him, Let it for time being be in your possession, yet since the robber is in need of atonement, this is not sufficient until it actually comes into the plaintiff's hands, whereas where no oath was taken, the misappropriated article is considered as a deposit with him until the owner comes and takes it, he may give it neither to his son nor to his agent. It was taught where an agent was appointed in the presence of witnesses to receive some payment of money, Arhista said that he would be a properly accredited agent, but rather said that he is still not an agent to release the payer of responsibility Arhista said that he would be a properly accredited agent for it was for this purpose that he took the trouble to appoint him in the presence of witnesses so that he should stand in his place but Rabbi said that he is still not an agent to release the payer of responsibility for he meant merely to state that this man is honest and if you are prepared to rely upon him you may rely and if you are prepared to send it payment through him you may send it through him we have learned if one agreed to borrow a cow and the lender sent it by the hand of his son or by the hand of his slave or by the hand of his agent or even by the hand of the son or by the hand of the slave or by the hand of the agent of the borrower and it so happened that it died on the way he would be exempt now how are we to picture this agent if he was not appointed in the presence of witnesses whence could we know that he was an agent at all must it therefore not be that he appointed him in the presence of witnesses, and it is nevertheless stated that the would-be borrower is exempt in contradiction to the view of Arhista. It is as Arhista elsewhere said that he was a hireling or a lodger of his. So also here he was a hireling or a lodger of his. We have learned he may give it neither to his son nor to his agent. How are we to picture this agent if he did not appoint him in the presence of witnesses? Whence could we know that he was appointed an agent at all? Does it therefore not mean that he appointed him in the presence of witnesses? Arhista, however, interpreted it as referring to a hireling or a lodger. But what would be the law where the agent was appointed in the presence of witnesses? Would he indeed have to be considered a properly accredited agent? Why then state in the concluding clause he may give it to the sheriff of the court of law and not make the distinction in the same case by saying that these statements refer only to an agent who was not appointed in the presence of witnesses whereas if the agent was appointed in the presence of witnesses he would indeed be considered a properly accredited agent it may however be said that on this point the tana could not state it absolutely regarding the sheriff of the court no matter whether the plaintiff authorized him or whether the robber authorized him he could
From a certain person who does not forward it to me it may therefore be advisable for you to be seen by him since perhaps he has found no one with whom to forward it or as explained by Arista that he was a hireling or a lodger of his Rav Judah said that Samuel stated that Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba B, it is not right to forward trust money through a person whose power of attorney is authenticated by a mere figure even if witnesses are signed on it to identify the authentication are you had had. However said if witnesses are signed on it to identify the authentication it may be forwarded but I would fain say in accordance with the view of Samuel what remedy is available the same as in the case of our Abba to whom money was owing from our Joseph Pihama and who therefore said to our Safra when you go there bring it to me and it so happened that when the latter came there Robert the son of the debtor said to him did the creditor give you a written statement that by your accepting the money he will be deemed to have received it and as he said to him no he rejoined if so go back first and let him give you a written statement that by your acceptance he will be deemed to have received the money but ultimately he said to him even if he were to write that by your acceptance he will be deemed to have received the money it would be of no avail for before you come back our Abba might perhaps in the meantime have died and as the money would then already have been transferred to the ears. The receipt executed by our Abba would be of no avail what then he asked can be the remedy go back and let him transfer to you the ownership of the money by dint of land and when you come back you will give us a written acknowledgement that you have received the money as in the case of our Papa to whom 12,000 sous were owing from men of BQZ and who transferred the ownership of them to Samuel B. Abba by dint of the threshold of his house and when the latter came back the former was so pleased that he went out to meet him as far as Tauk if he refunded him the principal but did not pay him the fifth he would not have to go after him for that this surely proves that the fifth is a civil liability so that were the robber to die the ears would have to pay it we have also learned if he refunded to him for the principal and took an oath regarding the fifth he would have to pay him a fifth on top of the fifth similarly proving that the fifth is a civil liability it was. Moreover taught to the same effect if one man robbed another but took an oath that he did not do so and after admitting his guilt he died the ears would have to pay the principal and the fifth though they would be exempt from the trespass offering now since heirs are subject to pay the fifth which their father would have had to pay it surely proves that the fifth is a civil liability which has to be met by heirs but a contradiction could be raised from the following I would still say. That the case where an heir has not to pay the fifth for a robbery committed by his father is only where neither he nor his father took an oath whence could it be proved that the same holds good where he though not his father took an oath or his father but not he took an oath or even where both he and his father took oaths from the significant words that which he took by robbery or the thing which he had gotten by oppression whereas in this case he has neither taken violently away nor Deceived anybody said Arnam and there is no contradiction as in one case the father admitted his guilt before he died whereas in the other he never admitted it but if no admission was made why should the heirs have to pay even the principal if however you argue that this will indeed be so that they will not have to pay it since the whole discussion revolves here around the fifth does it not show that the principal will have to be paid it was moreover taught explicitly I would still say that. The case where an heir has to pay the principal for a robbery committed by his father was only where both he and his father took oaths or where his father though not he or he though not his father took an oath but once could it be proved that the same holds good where neither he nor his father took an oath from the significant words a misappropriated article and the deceitfully gotten article the lost article and the deposit as Yishtalmud equals equals this is certainly a definite teaching and when Arhuna was sitting and repeating this teaching his son Rabbi said to him did the master mean to say Yish Talmud i.e. there is a definite teaching on this subject or did the master mean to say Yish Talmud i.e. it stands to reason that the heirs should have to pay he replied to him I said Yish Talmud i.e. there is a definite teaching on the subject as I maintain that this could be amplified from the added scriptural expressions it must therefore be said that what was meant by the statement he made no admission was that the father made no admission though the son did but why should the son not become liable to pay even a fifth for his own oath it may however be said that the misappropriated article was no longer extant in this case but if the misappropriated article was no longer extant why should he pay even the principal no it might have application where real possessions were left but were even real possessions to be left of what avail would it be since the Liability is but an oral liability and as known a liability by mere word of mouth can be enforced neither on heirs nor on purchasers it may however be said Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba that before the father died he had already appeared in court and liability was established against him but if he had already appeared in court and liability had been established on the denial of which the son took a false oath why then should the son not pay even the fifth said Arunah the son of our Joshua. Because a fifth is not paid for the denial of a liability which is secured upon real estate but Rabbah said that the misappropriated article was still extant in this case as the reason that the son need not pay a fifth for his own false oath is because we were dealing here with a case where the misappropriated article was kept in his father's bag that was deposited with others the principal therefore must be paid since it was subsequently discovered to be in existence whereas the fifth has not to be paid since when the son took the oath he meant to swear truly as at that time he did not know that there was a misappropriated article in the estate with the exception however of less than the value of a paratadu on account of the principal he would not have to go after him our papa said this mishnah ruling can apply only where the misappropriated article was no more in existence for where the misappropriated article was still in existence the robber would still have to go after him as there is a possibility that it may have risen in value others however said that our papa stated that there was no difference whether the misappropriated article was in existence or not in existence as in all cases he would not have to go after him since we disregard the possibility that it may rise in price robber said if one misappropriated three bundles of goods altogether worth three brutas but which subsequently fell in price and become worth only two and it so happened that he Restored two bundles he would still have to restore the third this could also be proved from the following teaching of the tenor if one misappropriated leaven and Passover meanwhile came and went he may say to the plaintiff here there is thine before thee the reason evidently is that the misappropriated article is intact whereas if it were not intact even though it has at present no pecuniary value he would have to pay on account of the fact that it originally had some pecuniary value so also. In this case though the bundle is now not of the value of a parita since originally it was of the value of a parita he must pay for it robber raised the question what would be the law where he misappropriated two bundles amounting in value to a parita and returned the plaintiff one do we lay stress on the fact that there is not now with him a misappropriated object of the value of a parita or do we say that since he did not restore the robbery which was with him he did not discharge his duty. Robber himself on second thought solved it thus there is neither a robbery here nor is there the performance of restoration here but if there is no robbery here is it not surely because there was restoration here what he meant was this though there remained no robbery here the performance of the injunction of restoration was similarly not performed here Robber said it has been definitely stated that a Nazi right who performed the duty of shaving but left two hairs unshaved performed nothing at all. Of the injunction Robber asked what would be the law where he subsequently shaved one of the two and the other fell out of its own accord said Araha of Dipti to Rabbana how could it have been doubtful to Robber whether a Nazi right would have performed his duty by shaving one hair after another he replied no the query has application where e.g. one of the two hairs fell out of itself and the other was shaved by him shall we say that since now there is no minimum of hair left unshaved the duty of Shaving has been performed or was there perhaps no performance of shaving since originally he had left two hairs unshaved and when he made up his mind to shave them now there were not two hairs to be shaved on second thoughts Rabbah himself solved it thus there is neither any hair here nor is there the performance of shaving here but if there is no hair left here was not the duty of shaving surely performed here what he meant was this though there remained no hair yet the performance of the injunction of shaving was not performed here Rabbah also said it has been stated that if an earthenware barrel had a hole which was filled up with leaves they would render it safe and secure while in a tent where a corpse of a human being was kept as a barrel would be considered to have a covering tightly fastened upon it Rabbah thereupon asked what would be the lower only half of the hole was blocked up said Aryamar to Arashi is this not covered by our mission for we have learned if an Earthenware barrel had a hole which was filled up with leaves they would render it safe and secure while in a tent where a corpse of a human being was kept if it was corked up with vine shoots it would not do unless it was smeared with m
Rabbis stated, if one man says to another, you have stolen my ox, and the other says, I did not steal it at all, and when the first asks, what then is the reason of its being with you? The other replies, I am a gratuitous bailee regarding it, and after affirming this defense by an oath, he admitted his guilt, he would be liable for by this false defense, he would have been able to release himself from liability in the case of theft or loss, so also where the false defense was, I am a paid bailee. Regarding it, he would similarly be liable as he would thereby have released himself from liability in the case where the animal became maimed or died again, even where the false defense was that I am a borrower. Regarding it, he would be liable for he would thereby have released himself from any liability were the animal to have died merely because of the usual work performed with it. Now, this surely proves that though the animal now stands intact, since if it were to be stolen, the statement would amount to a denial of money. It is even now considered to be a denial of money. So, also here in this case, though the leaven at present is considered in the eyes of the law to be equivalent to mere ashes, yet since if it were to be stolen, he would have to pay him with proper value. Even now, there is a denial there of actual money. Rabba was once sitting and repeating this teaching when Aram Rome pointed out to Rabba difficulty from the following and left concerning it has the effect of Accepting a case where there is admission of the substance of the claim is where in answer to the plea you have stolen my ox the accused says I did not steal it but when the plaintiff retorts what then is the reason of its being with you the defendant states you sold it to me you gave it to me as a gift your father sold it to me your father gave it to me as a gift or the ox was running after my cow or it came of its own accord to me or I found it straying on the road or I am a gratuitous Billy regarding it or I am a paid Billy regarding it or I am a borrower regarding it and after confirming such a false defense by an oath he admitted his guilt but as you might say that he would be liable here it is therefore stated further and yet concerning it to accept a case like this where there is an admission of the substance of the claim you reply this argument is confused for the teaching there dealt with a case where the defendant tendered him immediate delivery whereas it Statement I made refers to a case where the animal was at that time kept on the meadow, but what admission in the substance of the claim could there be in the defense you have sold it to me? It might have application where the defendant said to him, As I have not yet paid you its value, take your ox back and go, but still what admission in the substance of the claim is there in the defense you gave it to me as a gift, or your father gave it to me as a gift? It might be admission where the defendant said to him as a gift was made on the condition that I should do you some favor, and since I did not do anything for you, you are entitled to take your ox back and go, but again where the defense was I found it straying on the road, why should the plaintiff not plead you surely have had to return it to me? But the father of Samuel said the defendant was alleging and confirming it by an oath I found it as a lost article and was not aware that it was yours to return it to you, it was. Top Benazay said the following three false oaths taken by a single witness are subject to one law where he had cognizance of the lost animal but not of the person who found it of the person who found it but not of the lost animal neither of the lost animal nor its finder but if he had cognizance neither of the lost animal nor of its finder was he not swearing truly say therefore he had cognizance both of the lost animal and of its finder to what decision does the statement point. RMI said on behalf of Arhana to exemption but Samuel said to liability they are divided on the point at issue between the following ten names taught where a single witness was adjured and the oath was subsequently admitted by him to have been false he would be exempt but RLA's or son of Arsimian makes him liable in what fundamental principle do they differ the latter master maintained that a matter which might merely cause some pecuniary liability is regarded in law as directly. Touching upon money, whereas the other master maintained that it is not regarded as directly touching upon money, Arshis hate said he who falsely denies a deposit is instantly considered as if he had misappropriated it and will therefore become liable for all accidents. This is also supported by the following tentative teaching from the verse and Heliath concerning it we could derive the penalty, but whence could the warning be derived from the significant words neither shall ye deal? Falsely now does this not refer to the penalty for merely having denied the money? No, it refers to the penalty for the false oath, but since the concluding clause refers to a case where an oath was taken, it surely follows that the commencing clause deals with a case where no oath was taken, for it was stated in the concluding clause from the text and sweareth falsely we can derive the penalty, but whence can the warning be derived from the injunction nor line now since the concluding clause? Deals with a case where an oath was taken must not the commencing clause deal with a case where no oath was taken it may however be said that the one clause as well as the other deals with a case where an oath was taken but while in the case of the concluding clause the defendant admitted his perjury and that of the commencing clause witnesses appeared and proved and where witnesses appeared and proved the perjury the defendant would become liable for all accidents from the very moment he took the false oath whereas where he himself admitted his perjury he would be liable for the principal and the fifth and the trespass offering Rami Bihama raised an objection from the following where the other party was suspected regarding the oath how so where he took falsely either an oath regarding evidence or an oath regarding a deposit or an oath in vain but if there is legal force in your statement would not that party have become disqualified from the very moment of the denial of might however be said that we are dealing here with a case where the deposited animal was at that time placed on the meadow so that the denial could not be considered a genuine one since he might have thought to himself I will get rid of the plaintiff for the time being so that he should no more press me for it and later I will go and deliver up to him the deposited animal this view could even be proved from the following statement R.E.D.B. Avin said that he who falsely denies a loan is not yet disqualified from giving evidence Talmud, Mas Baba Kama whereas if this was done in the case of a deposit he would thereby become disqualified from giving evidence but did Ilfa not say that an oath transfers possession which appears to prove that it is only the oath which would transfer responsibility whereas mere denial would not transfer responsibility but here also we are dealing with a case where the deposited article was at that time situated on the meadow or if you wish I may. Say that what was meant to be conveyed by the statement that an oath transfers possession was as in the case of Arhuna for Arhuna said that Rab stated where one said to another you have a mana of mine and the other retorted I have nothing of yours and confirmed it by an oath and then witnesses came forward and proved the defendant to have perjured himself he would be exempt as it is stated and the owner thereof shall accept it and he shall not make restitution implying that wherever the plaintiff accepted an oath the defendant could no more be made liable to pay money to return to a previous theme Arhuna said that Rab stated that where one said to another you have a mana of mine and the other rejoined I have nothing of yours and confirmed it by an oath and subsequently witnesses came forward and proved the defendant to have perjured himself he would be exempt as it is stated and the owner thereof shall accept it and he shall not make restitution implying that wherever the plaintiff accepted an oath the defendant could no more be made liable to pay money Rabba thereupon said we should naturally suppose that the statement of Rab is meant to apply to the case of a loan where the money was given to be spent but not to a deposit which always remains in the possession of the owner but I affirm by God that Rab made a statement even with reference to a deposit as it was regarding a deposit that the text of the verse quoted was written Arnaman was sitting and repeating this teaching when Arahabi Menumi pointed out to Arnaman a contradiction from the following if a man says to another where is my deposit and the other replies it is lost and the depositor then says will you take an oath and the bailey replies amen and if witnesses testify against him that he himself had consumed it he has to pay only the principal whereas if he admits this on his own accord he has to pay the principal together with a fifth and bring a trespass offering R. Naman said to him, We are dealing here with a case where the oath was taken outside the court of law. He rejoined, If so, read the concluding clause. But if on being asked, Where is my deposit? The bailey replied, It was stolen. And when the depositor retorted, Will you take an oath? The bailey said, Amen. If witnesses testify against him that he himself had stolen it, he has to repay double. Whereas if he admits this on his own accord, he has to pay the principal together with a fifth and a trespass. Offering now, if you assume that the oath was taken outside the court of law, how could there be liability for double payment? He replied, I might indeed answer you that though in the case of the commencing clause the oath was taken outside the court of law and that of the concluding clause it was taken in the court of law, but as I am not going to give you a forced answer, I will therefore say that though in the one case as well as in the other the oath was taken in the court of law, there is. Still no difficulty as in the first case we suppose that the claimant anticipated the court in administering the o
Similarly not say that it was done outside the court of law for it is stated in the presence of the court of law as he raised this difficulty so he also solved it by pointing out that the text should be interpreted disjunctively where an oath was imposed upon him by the court but taken outside the court of law or where it was administered in the presence of the court of law but in anticipation of its action robber raised an objection from the following if a bailey advanced a plea of theft regarding a deposit and confirmed it by an oath but subsequently admitted his perjury and witnesses came forward and testified to the same effect if he confessed before the appearance of the witnesses he has to pay the principal together with a fifth and a trespass offering but if he confessed after the appearance of the witnesses he has to repay double and bring a trespass offering now here it could not be said that it was outside the court of law or that it was done in anticipation of the action of the court since the liability of double payment is mentioned here Robert therefore said to all cases of confession no matter whether he pleaded in defense loss or theft Rob did not mean his statement to apply for it is definitely written then they shall confess implying that in all cases the perjurer would have to pay the principal and the fifth and so also in the case where he pleaded theft and witnesses came forward and proved otherwise Rab similarly did not mean his Statement to apply for it is in this case that the liability for double payment is laid down in scripture. The statement made by Rab applies only to the case where e.g. he pleaded in defense loss and after confirming it by an oath he did not admit his perjury but witnesses appeared and proved it or gamda went and repeated this explanation in the presence of Arashi who said to him seeing that Arhamana was a disciple of Rab and surely knew very well that Rab meant his statement to apply also to the case of confession since otherwise he would not have raised an objection from a case of confession how then can you say that Rab did not mean his statement to apply to a case of confession said Arahat the elder to Arashi Arhamana's difficulty may have been this Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B I could quite understand that if he were to say that if witnesses appeared after he took the oath thus proving him to be a perjurer he would have to pay as it would be on account of this that we should Make him liable to bring sacrificial atonement for the oath on the last occasion since it was always open to him to retract and admit the claim but if you maintain that should witnesses appear after he took the oath he would be exempt is it possible that whereas if witnesses were to have come and testified against him he would have been exempt we should rise and declare him liable to sacrificial atonement for an oath on the mere ground that he could have been able to retract and confess his perjury for the time being at any rate he has not made such a confession our high B Abba said that our Yohanan stated he who falsely advances a plea of theft with reference to a deposit in his possession may have to repay double so also if he slaughtered or sold it he may have to repay fourfold or fivefold for since a thief repays double and a bailey pleading the defense of theft has to repay double just as a thief who has to repay double is liable to repay fourfold or fivefold in the case of Slaughter or sale so also a bailey who when pleading the defense of theft regarding a deposit has similarly to repay double should likewise have to repay fourfold or fivefold in the case of slaughter or sale but how can you argue from a thief who has to repay double even in the absence of perjury to a bailey pleading the defense of theft where no double payment has to be made unless where a false oath was taken it might however be said that a thief and a bailey alleging theft are made. Analogous in scripture and no refutation could be made against an analogy in scripture this may be granted if we accept the view that one verse deals with a thief and the other with a bailey falsely advancing a plea of theft but if we adopt the view that both the verses if the thief be found and if the thief be not found deal with a bailey falsely advancing a plea of theft what could be said it may still be argued that they were made analogous by means of the definite article as Instead of thief it was written the thief our high B Abba pointed out to our Yohan an objection from the following if a depositor says where is my ox and the bailey pleads and was stolen and upon the plaintiff saying I want you to take an oath the defendant says amen and then witnesses testify against him that he consumed it he would have to repay double now in this case where it was impossible for him to consume meat even of the size of an olive unless the animal was first slaughtered effectively it was stated that he would repay double thus implying that it is only double payment which will be made but not fourfold and fivefold payments we might have been dealing here with a case where it was consumed Nibla why did he not answer that it was consumed here he adopted the view of our mayor who stated that a slaughter which does not render the animal ritually fit for consumption is still designated in law slaughter but again why not answer that the ox was an animal taken alive out of a slaughtered mother's womb and as such it may be eaten without any ritual slaughter but on this point too he followed the view of our mayor who said that an animal taken alive out of a slaughtered mother's womb is subject to the law of slaughter but still why not answer that the ruling applied where e.g. the billy had already appeared in the court and was told to go forth and pay the plaintiff for Rabba stated where a thief was ordered to go and pay the owner. And after that he slaughtered or sold the animal he would be exempt the reason being that since the judges had already adjudicated on the matter when he sold or slaughtered the animal he became in the eye of the law robber and a robber has not to make fourfold and fivefold payments but where they merely said to him you are liable to pay him and after that he slaughtered or sold the animal he would be liable to repay fourfold or fivefold the reason being that since they have not Delivered the final sentence upon the matter he is still a thief to this I might say granting all this why not answer that the bailey was a partner in the theft and slaughtered the ox without the knowledge of his fellow partner in which case he could not be made liable for fourfold or fivefold payment it must therefore be that one out of two or three possible answers has been adopted our high B Abba said that our Yohanan stated he who advanced in his own defense a plea of theft regarding a lost article which had been found by him would have to repay double the reason being that it is written for any manner of lost thing whereof one Seth our Abba B Memel pointed out to our high B Abba an objection from the following if a man shall deliver implies that the delivery by a minor is of no effect in law so far I only know this to be the case where he was a minor at the time of the delivery and was still a minor at the time of the demand but whence could it be proved that this is so also in the case where at the time of the delivery he had been a minor though at the time of the demand he had already come of age because it says further the cause of both parties shall come before the judges thus showing that the law of bailment does not apply unless the delivery and the demand were made under the same circumstances now if your view is sound why should this case with the minor not be like that of the lost article he replied we are dealing here with a case where the deposit was consumed by the bailey while the depositor was still a minor but what would be the law where he consumed it after the depositor had already come of age would he have to pay if so why state unless the delivery and the demand were made under the same circumstances and not unless the consumption and the demand took place under the same circumstances he said to him you should indeed read unless the consumption and the demand took place under the same circumstances are actually moreover said the two cases could not be compared as the lost article came into the hands of the finder from the possession of a person of responsibility whereas in the case of a minor the deposit did not come to the bailey from the possession of a person of responsibility our high B Abba further said that our Yohanan stated he who puts forward a defense of theft in the case of a deposit could not be made liable unless he denies a part and admits a part of the claim the reason being that scripture states. This is it implying this only this view is contrary to that of our high B Joseph for our high B Joseph said Talmud, Mas Baba Kama there is here an interweaving of sections as the words this is it written here have reference to loans but why alone in particular in accordance with Rabba for Rabba stated on what ground did the Torah lay down that he who admits a part of a claim has to take an oath because of the assumption that no man is so brazen faced as to deny outright in it presence of his creditor the claim put forward against him it could therefore be assumed that he was desirous of repudiating the claim altogether and the reason that he did not deny it outright is because no man is brazen faced enough to do so it may consequently be argued that he was on this account inclined to admit the whole claim the reason that he denied the part was because he considered were I to admit now the whole liability he will soon demand the whole claim from me I should therefore better at least for time being get rid of him and as soon as I have the money will pay him it was on account of this that the divine law imposed an oath upon him so that he should have to admit the whole of the claim now it is only in the case of a loan that such reasoning could apply whereas regarding a deposit the billy would surely brazen it out against the depositor Rami B. Mama learned the four billies Talmud, Mas Baba Kama B have to deny a part and admit a part of the claim before the oath can be imposed upon them they are as follows the unpaid billy and the borrower the paid
To our high B Abba did he mean to say that this is so only where it was still standing at the crib whereas if Abili had already committed conversion the deposit would thereby already have been transferred to his possession so that the subsequent oath would have been of no legal avail or did he perhaps mean to say that this is so even where it was still standing at the crib he replied this I have not heard but something similar to this I have heard for R.C. said that Aryohan had stated. One who had in his defense pleaded loss and had sworn thus but came afterwards and pleaded theft also confirming it by an oath though witnesses appeared proving otherwise would be exempt now is the reason of this ruling not because the deposit had already been transferred to his possession through the first oath he replied to him no the reason is because he had already discharged his duty to the owner by having taken the first oath it was indeed similarly stated Arabin said that Arle stated in the name of Aryohan and if one advanced in his defense a plea of loss regarding a deposit and had sworn thus but came afterwards and advanced a plea of theft also confirming it by an oath and witnesses appeared proving otherwise he would be exempt because he had already discharged his duty to the owner by having taken the first oath Arshis hate said one who falsely pleads theft in the case of a deposit if he had already committed conversion would be exempt the reason being that Scripture says the master of the house shall come near unto the judges to see whether he have not put his hand etc. implying that were he to have already committed conversion he would be exempt but Arnavan said to him since three oaths are imposed upon him an oath that he was not careless an oath that he did not commit conversion and an oath that the deposit was no more in his possession does this not mean that the oath that he did not commit conversion should be compared to the oath that the deposit was no more in his possession so that just as where he swears that the deposit was no more in his possession as soon as it becomes known that the deposit was really at that time in his possession he would be liable for double payment so also where he swore that he did not commit conversion when the matter becomes known that he did commit conversion he would be liable he replied no the oath that he did not commit conversion was meant to be compared to the oath that he was not careless. Just as where he swears that he was not careless even if it should become known that he was careless he would be exempt from double payment so also where he swears that he did not commit conversion even if it becomes known that he did commit conversion he would still be exempt from double payment Rami Bihama asks since where there is liability for double payment there is no liability for a fifth is it to be understood that a pecuniary value for which there is liability to make double payment exempts from the fifth or is it perhaps the oath which involves the liability of double payment that exempts from the fifth in what circumstances could this problem have practical application e.g. where the Billy had pleaded in his defense theft confirming it by an oath and then came again and pleaded loss and similarly confirmed it by an oath Talmud, Mas Baba Kama and it so happened that witnesses appeared and proved the first oath to have been perjury while he himself confessed that. The last oath was perjury now what is the law is it the pecuniary value for which there is liability to make double payment that exempts from the fifth so that as in this case too there is liability to make double payment for the deposit there would be no fifth for it or perhaps it is the oath which involves a liability for double payment that exempts from a fifth so that since the last oath does not entail liability for double payment it should entail the liability for the fifth said Rabbah. Come and hear if a man said to another in the market where is my ox which you have stolen and the other rejoined I did not steal it at all whereupon the first said swear to me and the defendant replied amen and witnesses and gave evidence against him that he did steal it he would have to repay double but if he confessed on his own accord he would have to pay the principal and a fifth and bring a trespass offering now here it is the witnesses who make him liable for double payment and yet it was only where he confessed of his own accord that he would be subject to the law of a fifth whereas where he made a confession after the evidence was given by the witnesses it would not be so but if you assume that it is the oath involving liability of double payment that exempts from the fifth why then in this case even where he made confession after the evidence had already been given by the witnesses should the liability for the fifth not be involved since the oath here was not instrumental in imposing the liability for double payment why should it not involve the liability for the fifth this would seem conclusively to prove that a pecuniary value for which there is liability to make double payment exempts from the fifth would it not this could indeed be proved from it Robin asked what would be the laws to a fifth and double payment to be borne by two persons respectively what were the circumstances e.g. where an ox was handed over to two persons and both pleaded in defense theft but while one of them confirmed it by an oath and subsequently confessed it to have been perjury the other one confirmed it by an oath and witnesses appeared and proved it perjury now what is the law shall we say that it was only in the case of one man that the divine law was particular that he should not pay both the fifth and double payment so that in this case where two persons are involved one should make double payment and the other should pay a fifth or shall it perhaps be said that it was regarding one and the same pecuniary value that the divine law was particular that there should not be made any payment of both a fifth and double payment and in this case also it was one and the same pecuniary value this must stand undecided our papa asked what would be the law regarding two fifths and two double payments in the case of one man what are the circumstances e.g. where the billy first pleaded in his defense loss and after confirming it by an oath confessed it to have been perjury but afterwards came back and pleaded again a subsequent loss confirming it by an oath and then again confessed it to have been perjury or e.g. where he pleaded in defense theft confirming it by an oath and witnesses appeared and proved it to have been perjury but he afterwards came back and advanced again the defense of a subsequent theft confirming it by an oath and witnesses appeared against him now what would be the law shall we say that it was only two different kinds of pecuniary liability that the divine law forbade to be paid regarding one and the same pecuniary value whereas here the liabilities are of one kind and should therefore be paid or perhaps it was two pecuniary liabilities that the divine law forbade to be paid regarding one and the same pecuniary value and here also the pecuniary liabilities are to come and here what Rabbah stated and shall add the fifth the Torah has thus attached many fifths to one principle it could surely be derived from this if the owner had claimed his deposit from the billy who though he denied the claim on oath nevertheless paid it and it so happened that the actual thief was identified to whom should the double payment go Abbe said to the owner of the deposit but Rabbah said to the billy with whom the deposit was in charge Abbe said that it should go to the depositor for since he was troubled to the extent of having to impose an oath he could not be expected to have transferred the double payment but Rabbah said that it would go to the billy with whom the deposit was in charge for since after all he paid him the double payment was surely transferred to him they are divided on the implication of a mission for we learned where one person deposited with another an animal or utensils which were subsequently stolen or lost if the billy paid rather than deny on oath although it has been stated that an unpaid billy can by means of an oath discharge his liability and it so happened that the actual thief was found and had thus to make double payment or if he had already slaughtered the animal or sold it fourfold or fivefold payment to whom should he pay to him with whom the deposit was in charge but if the billy took an oath to defend himself rather than pay and it so happened that the actual thief was found and has to make double payment or where he already slaughtered the animal or sold it fourfold or fivefold payment to whom shall he Pay to the owner of the deposit now Abbe infers his view from the commencing clause whereas Rabbi deduces his ruling from the concluding clause Abbe infers his view from the commencing clause where it was stated if the billy paid rather than deny on oath this is so only where he was not willing to swear Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi but where he did take an oath even though he subsequently paid the thief would surely have to pay the owner of the deposit but Rabbi deduces his ruling from it. Concluding clause where it was stated but if the billy took an oath to defend himself rather than pay this is so only where he was not willing to pay but where he did pay even though he first denied the claim on oath the thief would of course have to pay him with whom the deposit was in charge does not the implication of the concluding clause contradict the view of Abbe Abbe would say to you what it means to say is this if the billy swore rather than pay before having taken the oath. Though he did so after he took the oath to whom will the thief pay to the owner of the deposit but does not the implication of the commencing clause contradict the view of Rabba Rabba could say to you that the meaning is this if the billy paid as he was not willing to take his stand upon his oath and consequently pay to whom should the thief pay to him with whom the deposit was in charge suppose the owner had claimed his deposit from the billy and the latter denied upon oath and the actual thief was then identified and the billy demanded payment from him and he confessed the theft but when the owner of the deposit demanded pay
Just as you did us a favor we also are willing to do you the same and are therefore hunting after the thief let us take back what belonged to us and you receive back what belonged to you this must stand undecided it was taught where the deposit was stolen through violence and the thief was identified Abe said that if the billy was unpaid he has the option of going to law with him or of clearing himself by an oath so that the owner will himself have to deal with the thief whereas if it was a paid billy he would have to go to law with the thief and he cannot take an oath to discharge his liability but Robin said whichever he is he would have to go to law with the thief and not take an oath may we say that Robin differs from the view of Arunabi Abin for Arunabi Abin sent word that where the deposit was stolen by violence and the thief was identified if the billy was unpaid he had the option of going to law with him or of clearing himself by an oath whereas if he was a paid Billy he would have to go to law with the thief and could not clear himself by an oath Robert could say to you that in this last ruling we are dealing with a case where the paid Billy took the oath before the thief was identified but did Arhuna not say he had the option of going to law or of clearing himself by an oath what he meant was this the unpaid Billy had the choice of taking his stand on his oath or of going to law with him Rabbi Zudi asked us where the deposited animal was stolen by violence and the thief restored it to the house of the Billy where it then died through carelessness on the part of the Billy what should be the law shall we say that since it was stolen by violence the duty of bailment came to an end or perhaps since it was restored to him it once more came into his charge which thus revived this must stand undecided mission if a man says to another where is my deposit and he replies it is lost and the depositor then says I put it to you on oath and the other replies amen if witnesses testify against him that he himself had consumed it he has to pay only the principal whereas if he confesses on his own accord he has to repay the principal together with a fifth and bring a trespass offering but if the depositor says where is my deposit and the billy replies it was stolen and the depositor then says I put it to you on oath and the billy replies amen if witnesses testify against him that he himself had stolen it he has to repay double whereas if he confesses on his own accord he has to repay the principal together with a fifth and bring a trespass offering if a man robbed his father and when charged by him denied it on oath and the father afterwards died he would have to repay the principal and a fifth and a trespass offering to his father's children or to his father's brothers but if he is unwilling to do so or he has nothing with him he should borrow the amount from others and perform the duty of Restoration to any of the specified relatives and the creditors can subsequently come and demand to be paid the portion which would by law have belonged to the robber as heir if a man said to his son Konam be whatever benefit you have of mine and subsequently died the son will inherit him Talmud, Mas Baba Kamae but if he said Konam both during his life and after his death and the father died the son will not inherit him but the portion will be transferred to his father's other children or to his father's brothers if the son has nothing for a livelihood he may borrow from others an amount equal to his portion in the inheritance and the creditors can come and demand payment out of the estate Gamara Joseph said he must pay the amount due for the robber even to the charity box our papa added he must however say this is due for having robbed my father but why should he not remit the liability to himself have we not learned where the plaintiff released him from? Payment of the principal though he did not release him from payment of the fifth etc. Thus proving that this liability is subject to be remitted said our Yohanan this is no difficulty as that was the view of our Jose the Galilean whereas the ruling here presents the view of our Akiva is indeed taught but if the man have no kinsman to restore the trespass unto how could there be a man in Israel who had no kinsman scripture must therefore be speaking of restitution to a proselyte suppose a man robbed the proselyte and when charged denied it on oath and as he then heard that the proselyte had died he accordingly took the amount of money due and the trespass offering to Jerusalem but there as it happened came across that proselyte who then converted the sum due to him into a loan if the proselyte were subsequently to die the robber would acquire title to the amount in his possession these are the words of our Jose the Galilean our Akiva however said there is no remedy for him to Obtain atonement unless he should divest himself of the amount stolen thus according to our Jose the Galilean whether to himself or to others the plaintiff may remit the liability whereas according to our Akiva no matter whether to others or to himself he cannot remit it again according to our Jose the Galilean the same law would apply even where the proselyte did not convert the amount due into a loan and the reason why it says who then converted the sum due to him into a loan is to let you know how far our Akiva is prepared to go since he maintains that even if the proselyte converted the sum due into a loan there is no remedy for the robber to obtain atonement unless he divest himself of the proceeds of the robbery Arshis hate to this if so he said why did not our Jose the Galilean tell us his view in a case where the claimant remits it to himself the rule and applying a fortiori to where he remits it to others and again why did not our Akiva tell his view that it is Impossible to remit to others than arguing a fortiori that he cannot remit it to himself. Arshis hate therefore said that the one ruling as well as the other is in accordance with our Jose the Galilean for the statement made by our Jose the Galilean that it is possible to remit such a liability applies only where others get the benefit whereas where he himself would benefit it would not be possible to remit it. Rabbah however said the one ruling as well as the other here is in accordance with our Akiva. For when our Akiva says that it is impossible to remit the liability he means to himself whereas to others it is possible for him to remit it. Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi this would imply that our Jose the Galilean maintained that even to himself he could remit it now if that is so how could a case ever arise that restitution for robbery committed upon a proselyte should be made to the priest as ordained in the divine law said Rabbah we are dealing here with a case where one robbed the proselyte and Falsely denied to him on oath that he had done so and the proselyte having died the robber confessed subsequently on the proselyte's death so that at the time he made confession God acquired title to it and granted it to the priest's robin asked what would be the law where a proselyte test was robbed shall we say that when the divine law says man it does not include woman or perhaps this is only the scriptural manner of speaking said our errand to robin come and here it was taught the man this tells me only that the law applies to a man once do I know that it applies also to a woman when it is further stated that the trespass be restored we have two cases mentioned but if so why was man specifically mentioned to show that only in the case of a person who has reached manhood is it necessary to investigate whether he had kinsmen or not but in the case of a minor it is not necessary since it is pretty certain that he could have no redeemers or rabbis taught unto the Lord even to the priest means that the Lord acquired title to it and granted it to the priest of that particular division you say to the priest of that particular division but perhaps it is not so but to any priest whom the robber prefers since it is further stated beside the ram of atonement whereby he shall make an atonement for him it proves that scripture referred to the priest of that particular division or rabbis taught in the case where the robber was a priest how do we know that he is not entitled to say since the payment would in any case have to go to the priest now that it is in my possession it should surely remain mine cannot he argue that if he has a title to payment which is in the possession of others all the more should he have a title to payment which he has in his own possession our Nathan put the argument in a different form seeing that a thing in which he had no share until it actually entered his possession cannot be taken from him once it has entered his Possession does it not stand to reason that a thing in which he had a share even before it came into his possession cannot be taken from him once it has come into his possession this however is not so for while this may be true of a thing in which he had no share since in that case just as he had no share in it so has nobody else any share in it it is not necessarily true of the proceeds of robbery where just as he has a share in it so also have others a share in it the payment for robbery must therefore be taken away from his possession and shared out to all his brethren the priests but is it not written and every man's hallowed things shall be as we are dealing here with a priest who was levitically defiled but if the priest was defiled could there be anything in which he should have a share the fact is that the ruling is derived by the analogy of the term to the priest to a similar term to the priest occurring in the case of a field of permanent possession is taught what is the point of the words of permanent possession thereof? The point is this how can we know that if a field which would in due course have to fall to the priest in the Jubilee but was redeemed by one of the priests he should not have the right to say since the field is destined to fall to the priest in the Jubilee and as it is already in my possession it should remain mine as is indeed only reasonable to argue for since I have a title to a field in the possession of others should this not be the more so when the field is in my own possession the text therefore significantly says as a field
Though carried out only with effort is still a valid service he may appoint an agent whereas in regard to the eating which if carried through only with effort would constitute an abnormal eating which is not counted as anything in the eyes of the law the fee for the sacrifice and the skin must belong to the members of the division Arshis hates and if a priest in the division is unclean he has the right to hand over a public sacrifice to whomever he prefers but the fee and the skin will belong to the members of the division what are the circumstances if there were in the division priests who were not defiled how then could defiled priests perform the service if on the other hand there were no priests there who were not defiled how then could the fee for the sacrifice and the skin belong to the members of the division who were defiled and unable to partake of holy food said robbery thus the fee for it and the skin of it will belong to blemished undefiled priests in that particular division Arashi said where the high priest was known and he may hand over his sacrifice to any priest he prefers whereas the fee for it and the skin of it will belong to the members of the division what does this tell us which we do not already know was it not taught the high priest may sacrifice even while known and but he may neither partake of the sacrifice nor even acquire any share in it for the purpose of partaking of it in the evening you might have supposed that the Concession made by the divine law to the high priest was only that he himself should perform the sacrifice but not that he should be entitled to appoint an agent we are therefore told that this is not the case mission if one robbed the proselyte and after he had sworn to him that he did not do so the proselyte died he would have to pay the principal and a fifth to the priest and bring a trespass offering to the altar as it is said but if the man have no kinsman to restore the trespass unto let the trespass be restored unto the Lord even to the priest beside the realm of atonement whereby an atonement shall be made for him if while he was bringing the money and the trespass offering up to Jerusalem he died on the way the money will be given to his heirs and the trespass offering will be kept on the pasture until it becomes blemished when it will be sold and the value received will go to the fund or free will offerings but if he had already given the money to the members of it Division and then died the heirs have no power to make them give it up as it is written whatsoever any man give to the priest it shall be as if he gave the money to Jehoiarab and the trespass offering to Jedea he has fulfilled his duty if however the trespass offering was first given to Jehoiarab and then the money to Jedea if the trespass offering is still in existence the members of the Jedea division will have to sacrifice it but if it is no more in existence he would have to bring another trespass offering for he who brings the restitution for robbery before having brought the trespass offering fulfills his obligation whereas he who brings the trespass offering before having brought the restitution for the robbery has not fulfilled his obligation if he has repaid the principal but not the fifth the non-payment of the fifth is no bar to his bringing the offering tomorrow our rabbis taught the trespass this indicates the principal be restored this indicates the fifth or perhaps this is not so, but the trespass indicates the rem and the practical difference as to which view we take would involve the rejection of the view of Rabba for Rabba said restitution for robbery committed upon a proselyte if made at night time does not fulfill the obligation nor does restitution by have the reason being that the divine law termed it trespass since it says later beside the rem of atonement you must surely say that the trespass is the principle another bury the fifth. Trespass is the principle be restored is the fifth or perhaps this is not so, but the trespass means the fifth and the practical difference as to which view we take would involve the rejection of the ruling of our mission of is if he has repaid the principle but not the fifth the non-payment of the fifth is no bar for in this case on the contrary the non-payment of the fifth would be a bar since it has already been stated and he shall recompense his trespass with the principle thereof and add. Unto it a fifth thereof you must need say that the trespass is the principle another buried the taught the trespass is the principle be restored is a fifth as the verse here deals with robbery committed upon a proselyte or perhaps this is not so but be restored indicates the doubling of the payment the reference being to theft committed upon a proselyte since it has already been stated and he shall restore his trespass with the principle thereof and add unto it a fifth part thereof it is obvious that scripture deals here with money which is paid as principle to revert to the above text robber said restitution for robbery committed upon a proselyte if made at night time would not be a fulfillment of the obligation nor would it have made in half the reason being that the divine law termed it trespass robber further said if in the restitution for robbery committed upon a proselyte there was not the value of a pair for each priest of the division the obligation would not be Fulfilled because it is written the trespass be recompensed which indicates that unless there be recompense to each priest there is no atonement rather thereupon asked what would be the law if it were insufficient with respect to the division of Jehoiarab but sufficient Talmud, Mas Baba Kama be for the division of Jedea what are the circumstances if we suppose that he paid it to Jedea during the time of service of the division of Jedea surely in such a case the amount is sufficient no. We must suppose that he paid it to Jedea during the time of the division of Jehoiarab now what would be the law shall we say that since it was not in the time of his division the restoration is of no avail or perhaps since it would not do for Jehoiarab it was destined from the very outset to go to Jedea let this stand undecided Rabba again ask may the priest set one payment for a robbery committed upon a proselyte against another payment for a robbery committed upon a proselyte shall. We say that since the divine law designated a trespass therefore just as in the case of a trespass offering one trespass offering cannot be set against another trespass offering so also in the case of payment for a robbery committed upon a proselyte one payment for robbery committed upon a proselyte cannot be set against another payment for robbery committed upon a proselyte or perhaps since payment for robbery committed upon a proselyte is a matter of money it should not be subject. To this restriction he however subsequently decided that as the divine law termed a trespass it should follow the same rule Araha the son of Rabba stated this explicitly Rabba said the priests have no right to set one payment for a robbery committed upon a proselyte against another payment for robbery committed upon a proselyte the reason being that the divine law termed a trespass Rabba asked are the priests in relation to the payment for robbery committed upon a proselyte in the Capacity of heirs or in the capacity of recipients of endowments a practical difference arises where e.g. the robber misappropriated leaven and Passover meanwhile passed by if now you maintain that they are in the capacity of heirs it will follow that what they inherited they will have whereas if you maintain that they are recipients of endowments the divine law surely ordered the giving of an endowment and in this case nothing would be given them since the leaven is considered in the eye of the law as being mere ashes rzeira put the question thus even if you maintain that they are recipients of endowments then still no question arises since it is this endowment originally due to the proselyte which the divine law has enjoined to be bestowed upon them what however is doubtful to us is where e.g. ten animals fell to the portion of a priest as payment for robbery committed upon a proselyte is he then under an obligation to set aside a tithe or not are they the priest heirs in which case the dictum of the master applies that where heirs have bought animals out of the funds of the general estate they would be liable to tithe or are they perhaps endowment recipients in which case we have learned he who buys animals or receives them as a gift is exempt from the law of tithing animals now what should be the law come and here 24 priestly endowments were bestowed upon Aaron and his sons all these were granted to him by means of a generalization followed by a specification which was in its turn followed again by a generalization and a covenant of salt so that to fulfill them is like fulfilling the whole law which is expounded by generalization specification and generalization and like offering all the sacrifices forming the covenant of salt whereas to transgress them is like transgressing the whole Torah which is expounded by generalization specification and generalization and all the sacrifices forming the covenant of salt they are these ten to be partaken in the precincts of the temple for in Jerusalem and ten within the borders of the land of Israel the ten in the precincts of the temple are a sin offering of an animal a sin offering of a foul a trespass offering for a known sin a trespass offering for a doubtful sin the peace offering of the congregation the log of oil in the case of a leper the remnant of the omer the two loaves the shoe bread and the remnant of meal offerings the four in Jerusalem are the first linga first of the first fruits the portion separated in the case of the thank offering and in the case of the ram of the Nazirite and the skins of the most holy sacrifices the ten to be partaken in the borders of the land of Israel are terima the terima of the tithe hal the first of the fleece the portions of unconsecrated animals the redemption of the son the redemption of the firstling of an ass a field of possession a field devoted and payment for a robbery committed upon a Proselyte now since it is here designated an endowment this surely proves that the priests are endowment recipients in this respect this proves it but if he had already given the money to the members of
not have consented to betroth herself upon this understanding in that case we all can bear witness Talmud, Mas Baba Kama that she was quite prepared to accept any conditions as we learned from Rush Lakish for Rush Lakish said it is better for a woman to dwell as two than to dwell in widowhood where he gave the money to Jehoiarab and the trespass offering to Jedeah etc. Our rabbis taught where he gave the trespass offering to Jehoiarab and the money to Jedeah the money will have to be brought to whom the trespass offering is due this is the view of our Judah but the sages say that the trespass offering will have to be brought to whom the money is due what are the circumstances do we suppose that the trespass offering was given to Jehoiarab during the time of the division of Jehoiarab and so also the money was given to Jedeah during the time of the division of Jedeah if so why should the one not acquire title to his and the other to his said Rabba we are dealing here with a case where the trespass offering was given to Jehoiarab during the time of the division of Jehoiarab and so also the money was given to Jedeah during the time of the division of Jehoiarab in such a case our Judah maintained that since it was not the time of the division of Jedeah it is Jedeah whom we ought to penalize and the money has therefore to be brought to the place of the trespass offering whereas the rabbis maintained that as it was the members of the Jehoiarab Division that acted unlawfully and having accepted the trespass offering before the money it is they who have to be penalized and the trespass offering accordingly should be brought to the place where the money is due it was taught rabbi said according to the view of our Judah if the members of the Jehoiarab division had already sacrificed the trespass offering the robber would have to come again and bring another trespass offering which will now be sacrificed by the members of the Jedeah division though the others would acquire title to that which remained in their possession but I would fain ask for what could the disqualified trespass offering have any value said rabbi for its skin it was taught rabbi said according to our Judah if the trespass offering was still in existence the trespass offering will have to be brought to whom the money is due but is our Judah not of the opinion that the money should be brought to whom the trespass offering is due we are dealing here with the case where e.g. the division of Jehoiarab has already left without however having made any demand and what we are told therefore is that this should be considered as a waiving of their right in favor of the members of the division of Jedeah another buried the taught again rabbi said according to our Judah if the trespass offering was still in existence the money would have to be brought to whom the trespass offering is due but is this not obvious since this was actually his view we are dealing here with the case where e.g. the divisions of both Jehoiarab and Jedeah have already left without having made any demand on each other in this case you might have thought that they mutually waived their claim on each other we are therefore told that since there was no demand from either of them we say that the original position must be restored for he who brings the payment for robbery before having brought the trespass offering fulfills his duty whereas he who brings the Trespass offering before having brought the payment for robbery did not fulfill his duty. Whence can these rulings be derived? Said Rabbi Scripture states, Let the trespass be restored unto the Lord, even to the priest beside the ram of the atonement, whereby an atonement shall be made for him, thus implying that the money must be paid first. One of the rabbis, however, said to Rabbi, But according to this reasoning, will it not follow that in the verse ye shall offer these beside the burnt offering in the morning? It is similarly implied that the additional offering will have to be sacrificed first, but was it not taught? Whence do we know that no offering should be sacrificed prior to the continual offering of the morning, because it is stated, And lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And Rabbi stated, The burnt offering means the first burnt offering. He, however, said to him, I derive it from the clause whereby an atonement shall be made for him, which indicates that the atonement has not yet. Been made where he paid the principal but did not pay the fifth, the non payment of the fifth is no bar. Our rabbis taught once could it be derived that if he brought the principal due for sacrilege but had not yet brought the trespass offering, or if he brought the trespass offering but had not yet brought the principal due for sacrilege, he did not thereby fulfill his duty because it says with the ram of the trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him again. Whence could it be derived that if he brought his trespass offering before he brought the principal due for the sacrilege, he did not thereby fulfill his duty because it says with the ram of the trespass implying that the trespass itself has already been made good, it might be thought that just as the ram and the trespass are indispensable, so should the fifth be indispensable. It is therefore stated with the ram of the trespass offering and it shall he forgiven him implying that it was only the ram and the trespass which are indispensable in the atonement for the sacrilege of consecrated things whereas the fifth is not indispensable now the law regarding consecrated things could be derived from that regarding private belongings and that of private belongings could be derived from the law regarding consecrated things the law regarding consecrated things could be derived from that regarding private belongings just as trespass there denotes the principle so does trespass here denote the principle the law regarding private belongings could be derived from that regarding consecrated things just as in the case of consecrated things the fifth is not indispensable so in the case of private things the fifth is similarly not indispensable chapter x talmud mas baba kama bimish if one misappropriated foodstuff and fed his children or left it to them as an inheritance they would not be liable to make restitution but if there was anything left which could serve as security they would be liable to pay Gemara Arista said if one misappropriated an article and before the owner gave up hope of recovering it another person came and consumed it the owner has the option of collecting payment from either the one or the other the reason being that so long as the owner did not give up hope of recovery the misappropriated article is still in the ownership of the original possessor but we have learned if one misappropriated foodstuff and fed his children with it or left it to them as an inheritance they would not be liable to make restitution now is this not a contradiction to the view of Arista Arista might say to you that this holds good only after the owner has given up hope if he left it to them as an inheritance they would not be liable to make restitution Rami Bihama said this ruling proves that the possession of an area is on the same footing in law as the possession of a purchaser Rabba however said the possession of an area is not on a PAR with the possession of a purchaser for here we are dealing with a case where the food was consumed after the father's death but since it is stated in the concluding clause but if there was anything left which could serve as security they would be liable to pay does it not imply that even in the earlier clause we are dealing with a case where the misappropriated article was still in existence Robert could however say to you that what is meant is this if their father left them property constituting legal security they would be liable to pay but did rabbi not teach his son our simian that anything which could serve as security should not be taken literally to mean actual security for even if he left a couch to plow with or an ass to be driven they would be liable to restore it to save their father's good name Robert therefore said when i pass away arashai will come out to meet me since i am explaining the mishnah text in accordance with his teaching for arashai taught where he misappropriated food stuff and fed his children they would not have to make restitution if he left it to them as an inheritance so long as the misappropriated article is in existence they will be liable but as soon as the misappropriated article is no more intact they will be exempt but if their father left them property constituting legal security they would be liable to pay the master stated as soon as the misappropriated article is no more intact they would be exempt should we not say that this is a contradiction to the view of Arista Arista could say to you that the ruling here applies subsequent to renunciation the master said so long as the misappropriated article is in existence they will be liable to pay should we not say that this is a contradiction to the view of Rami Bihama but Rami Bihama could say to you that this teaching Talmud Mas Baba Kama applies prior to renunciation Ar Abiyah read the statement of Rami Bihama with reference to the following Teaching if their father left them money acquired from usury they would not have to restore it even though they definitely know that it came from usury and it was in connection with this that Rami Bihama said that this proves that the possession of an heir is on the same footing as the possession of a purchaser whereas Rabbi said I can still maintain that the possession of an heir is not on the same footing as the possession of a purchaser for here there is a special reason as scripture states take thou no usury of him or increase but fear thy God that thy brother may live with thee as much as to say restore it to him so that he may live with thee now it is the man himself who is thus commanded by the divine law whereas his son is not commanded by the divine law those who attach the argument to the Beritha would certainly connect it also with the ruling of our mission but those who attach to our mission might maintain that as regards the Beritha Rami Bihama expounds it in the same way as Rabbi our rabbis taught if one misappropriated food stuff and fed his children they would not be liable to repay if however he left it intact to them and if they are adults they would be liable to pay but if minors they would be exempt but
father and so slaughtered it and consumed it they would have to pay for the value of meat at the cheapest price if their father left them property that forms a legal security they would be liable to pay some connect this last ruling with the commencing clause but others connected with the concluding clause those who connected with the commencing clause would certainly apply it to the concluding clause and thus differ from our papa whereas those who connected with the concluding clause would not apply it in the case of the commencing clause and so would fall in with the view of our papa for our papa stated if one had a cow that he had stolen and slaughtered it on the sabbath he would be liable for he had already become liable for the theft prior to his having committed the sin of violating the sabbath but if he had a cow that was borrowed and slaughtered it on the sabbath he would be exempt for in this case the crime of violating the sabbath and the crime of theft were Committed simultaneously, our rabbis taught he shall restore the misappropriated article which he took violently away. What is the point of the words which he took violently away? Restoration should be made so long as it is intact as it was at the time when he took it violently away. Hence, it was laid down. If one misappropriated food stuff and fed his children, they would not be liable to repay. If, however, he left it to them intact, whether they were adults or minors, they would be liable. Simicus, however, was quoted as having ruled that only adults would be liable, but minors would be exempt. The son of our Jeremiah's father-in-law once bolted the door in the face of our Jeremiah. The latter thereupon came to complain about this to our Abin, who, however, said to him, was he not merely asserting his right to his own? But our Jeremiah said to him, I can bring witnesses to testify that I took possession of the premises during the lifetime of the father. To which the other replied, Can the evidence of Witnesses be accepted Talmud, Mas Baba Kama be where the other party is not present and why not was it not stated whether adults or minors they would be liable the other rejoined is not the divergent view of Simicus under your nose he retorted has the whole world made up its mind to adopt the view of Simicus just in order to deprive me of my property meanwhile the matter was referred from one to another till it came to the notice of Arabah who said to them have you not heard of what are Joseph Beham reported in the name of Ashai for our Joseph B. Mama said that our Ashai stated if a minor collected his slaves and took possession of another person's field claiming that it was his we do not say let us wait till he come of age but we rested from him forthwith and when he comes of age he can bring forward witnesses to support his allegation and then we will consider the matter but what comparison is there in that case we are entitled to take it away from him because he had no Presumptive title to it from his father, but in a case where he has such a presumptive title from his father, this should surely not be so. Our Ashi said that our Shabbatai stated evidence of witnesses may be accepted, even though the other party to the case is not present. Thereupon, our Yohanan remarked in surprise, Is it possible to accept evidence of witnesses if the other party is not present? Our Jose Bihanan accepted from him the ruling to apply in the case where, e.g., either he was dangerously ill or the witnesses were dangerously ill or where the witnesses were intending to go abroad and the party in question was sent for but did not appear. Rab Judah said that Samuel stated that evidence of witnesses may be accepted even if the other party is not present. Marakba, however, said it was explained to me in so many words from Samuel that this is so only where, e.g., the case has already been opened in the court and the party in question was sent for but did not appear, whereas if it Case has not yet been opened in the court, he might plead. I prefer to go to the high court of law, but if so, even after the case had already been opened, why should he similarly not plead? I prefer to go to the high court of law, said Rabbana. This plea could not be put forward, where e.g., the local court is holding a writ of mandamus issued by the high court of law. Rab said a document can be authenticated even not in the presence of the other party to the suit, whereas our Yohanan said that a document cannot be authenticated in the absence of the other party to the suit. Our Shis hate said to our Joseph Biabad, I will explain to you the reason of our Yohanan. Scripture says, and it hath been testified to its owner, and he hath not kept him in the Torah, thus lays down that the owner of the ox has to appear and stand by his ox when testimony has to be borne against it. But Rabbana said the law is that a document may be authenticated even not in the presence of the other party, and even if he Protests aloud before us that the document is a forgery if however he says give me time till I can bring witnesses and I will invalidate the document we have to give him time if he appears with witnesses well and good but if he does not appear we wait again over the following Monday and Thursday and Monday if he still does not appear we write a pethi out against him to take effect after 90 days for the first 30 days we do not take possession of his property as we say that he is busy trying to borrow money during the next 30 we similarly do not take possession of his property as we say perhaps he was unable to raise a loan and is trying to sell his property during the last 30 days we similarly cannot take possession of his property as we still say that the purchaser himself is busy trying to raise the money it is only if after all this he still does not appear that we write an attract on his property all this however is only if he has pleaded I will come and Defend whereas if he said I will not appear at all we have to write the attractive forthwith again these rulings apply only in the case of a loan whereas in the case of a deposit we have to write the attractive forthwith an attractive can be attached only to immovables but not to movables lest the creditor should meanwhile carry off the movables and consume them so that should the debtor subsequently appear and bring evidence which invalidates the document he would find nothing from which to recover payment but if the creditor is in possession of immovables we may write an attractive even upon movables this however is not correct we do not write an attractive upon movables even though the creditor possesses immovables since there is a possibility that his property may meanwhile become depreciated in value whenever we write an attractive we notify this to the debtor provided he resides nearby but if he resides at a distance this is not done again even where he resides far away if he has relatives Nearby or if there are caravans which take that route we should have to wait another 12 months until the caravan is able to go there and come back as Rabbana waited in the case of Maraha 12 months until the caravan was able to go to Bikuzi and come back this however is no proof or in that case the creditor was a violent man so that should the attractor have come into his hand it would never have been possible to get anything back from him whereas in ordinary cases we need only wait for the usher of the court to go on the third day of the week and come back on the fourth day of the week so that on the fifth day of the week he himself can appear in the court of law Rabbana said the usher of the court of law is as credible as two witnesses this however applies only to the imposition of Shamta but in the case of Pethiha seeing that he may be involved in expense through having to pay for the scribe this would not be so Rabbana again said we may convey a legal summons through the Mouth of a woman or through the mouth of neighbors, this rule, however, holds good only where the party was at that time not in town Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, but if he was then in town, this would not be so, as there is a possibility that they might not transmit the summons to him, thinking that the usher of the court of law will himself surely find him and deliver it to him again. We do not apply this rule except where the party would not have to pass by the door of the court of law, but if he would have to pass by the door of the court of law, this would not be so, as they might say that at the court of law they will surely find him first and deliver him the summons again. We do not rule thus except where the party was to come home on the same day, but if he had not to come home on the same day, this would not be so, for we might say they would surely forget it altogether. Rabbis stated where a pethiha was written upon a defaulter for not having appeared before the court, he will not be destroyed, so long as he does not actually appear before the court so also if it was for not having obeyed the law it will not be destroyed until he actually obeys the law this however is not correct as soon as he declares his intention to obey we have to destroy the pethihar his said in a legal summons we cite the man to appear on monday then on thursday and then on the next monday i.e we fix one date and then another date after one more date and on the morrow of the last day we write the pethihar he happened to be at arkahadas where he noticed that a certain woman had been summoned to appear before the court on the previous evening and as she failed to appear a pethihar was already written against her on the following morning he thereupon said to arkahana does the master not accept the view expressed by our that in a legal summons we cite the defendant to appear on monday then on thursday and then on the next monday he replied this applies only to a man who might be unavoidably prevented through being out of town but a woman being always in town and still failing to appear is considered contumacious after the first act of disobedience Rab Judah said we never cite a defendant to appear either during Nissan or during Tishri or on the eve of a holy day or on the eve of a Sabbath we can however during Nissan cite him to appear after Nissan and so also during Tishri we may cite him to appear after Tishri but on
They eat be replied with the verse give instructions to a wise man and he will yet be wiser mission and no money may be taken in change either from the box of the customs collectors or from the purse of the tax collectors nor may charity be taken from them though it may be taken from their own coins which they have at home or in the marketplace Gamara 8 and taught when he gives him a dinar he may receive back the balance due to him in the case of customs collectors why should the dictum of Samuel not apply that the law of the state is law or Hannah of Bikahana said that Samuel stated that a customs collector who is bound by no limit is surely not acting lawfully at the school of Arjana it was stated that we are dealing here with a customs collector who acts on his own authority some read these statements with reference to the following no man may wear a garment in which wool and linen are mixed even over ten other garments and even for the purpose of escaping the customs and it was thereupon asked, does not this mission aid ruling conflict with the view of our Akiva as taught it is an unqualified transgression to elude the customs are Simeon however said in the name of our Akiva that customs may sometimes be eluded by putting on garments of linen and will now regarding garments of linen and will I can very well explain their difference to consist in this that while one master maintained that an act done unintentionally could not be prohibited the other master maintained that an act done unintentionally should also be prohibited but is it not a definite transgression to elude the customs did Samuel not state that the law of the state is law or Hannah Bikahana said that Samuel stated that a customs collector who is bound by no limit is surely not acting lawfully at the school of our Janae it was stated that we were dealing here with a customs collector who acted on his own authority still others read these statements with reference to the following to escape murderers or robbers or customs collectors one may confirm by a vow statement that e.g. the grain is terima or belongs to the royal court though it was not terima and though it did not belong to the royal court but why should two customs collectors not apply the statement made by Samuel that the law of the state has the force of law or Hannah Bikahana said that a customs collector who is bound by no limit is surely not acting lawfully at the school of Arjana it was stated that we were dealing here with a customs collector who acted on his own authority but Arashi said we suppose the customs collector here to be a heathen publican as it was taught where a suit arises between an Israelite and a heathen if you can justify the former according to the laws of Israel justify him and say this is our law so also if you can justify him by the laws of the heathens justify him and say to the other party this is your law but if this cannot be done we use subterfuges to circumvent him this is a view of our Ishmael but our Akiva said that we should not attempt to circumvent him on account of the sanctification of the name now according to our Akiva the whole reason appears to be because of the sanctification of the name but were there no infringement of the sanctification of the name we could circumvent him is then the robbery of a heathen permissible has it not been taught that our Simeon stated that the following matter was expounded by our Akiva when he arrived from Zephyrin whence can we learn that the robbery of a heathen is forbidden from the significant words after that he is sold he may be redeemed again Talmud, Mas Baba Kambabi which implies that he could not withdraw and leave him without paying the redemption money you might then say that he may demand an exorbitant sum for him no since it says and he shall reckon with him that bought him to emphasize that he must be very precise in making the valuation with him who had bought him said R. Joseph there is no difficulty here where the exception is made it refers only to a heathen whereas there is indeed no exception in the case of a G.E.R. Tashab but Abbe said to him are the two of them not mentioned next to one another so that neither forms an exception in the law as it says thy brother sell himself implying not to you but to a stranger as it says unto the stranger again not to a G.E.R. Zedek but to a mere G.E.R. Tashab as it says unto a stranger settler the family of a stranger this denotes one who worships idols and when it says or to an eager it means that the person in question sold himself for idolatrous practices robber therefore said there is no difficulty as regarding robbery there is indeed no exception whereas regarding the cancellation of debt a heathen might not have been included Abbe rejoined to him is not the purchase of a Hebrew slave merely the cancellation of a debt and yet no distinction whatsoever is made as to the person of the master. Rabba adheres to his own view as elsewhere stated by Rabba that a Hebrew slave is actually owned in his body by the master R.B.B. Gittel said that Arsimian the pious stated the robbery of a heathen is prohibited though an article lost by him is permissible his robbery is prohibited for Arhuna said once do we learn that the robbery of a heathen is prohibited because it says and thou shalt consume all the peoples that the Lord thy God shall deliver unto thee only in the time of war when they were delivered in thy hand as enemies this is permitted whereas this is not so in the time of peace when they are not delivered in thy hand as enemies his lost article is permissible for Arhamab Egeria said that Rab stated once can we learn that the lost article of a heathen is permissible because it says and with all lost thing of thy brothers it is to your brother that you make restoration but you need not make restoration to a heathen but why not say that this applies only where the lost article has not yet come into the possession of the finder in which case he is under no obligation to look round for it whereas if it had already entered his possession why not say that he should return it said Rubin and thou hast found it surely implies that the lost article has already come into his possession it was taught Arfine has been here said that where there was a danger of causing a profanation of the name even the retaining of a lost article of a heathen is a crime. Samuel said it is permissible however to benefit by his mistake as in the case when Samuel once bought of a heathen a golden bowl under the assumption of it being of copper for four zoos and also left him minus one zoos Arkahana once bought of a heathen a hundred and twenty barrels which were supposed to be a hundred while he similarly left him minus one zoos and said to him see that I am relying upon you Rubin together with a heathen bought a palm tree to chop up and divide he thereupon said. To his attendant quick bring to me the parts near to the roots for the heathen is interested only in the number but not in the quality Arashi was once walking on the road when he noticed branches of vines outside a vineyard upon which ripe clusters of grapes were hanging he said to his attendant go and see if they belong to a heathen bring them to me but if to an Israelite do not bring them to me the heathen happened to be then sitting in the vineyard and thus overheard this conversation so. He said to him if a heathen would they be permitted he replied a heathen is usually prepared to dispose of his grapes and accept payment whereas an Israelite is generally not prepared to do so and accept payment the above text stated Samuel said the law of the state is law said Rabbi you can prove this from the fact that the authorities fell palm trees without the consent of the owners and construct bridges with them and we nevertheless make use of them by passing over them but. Abbe said to him this is so perhaps because the proprietors have meanwhile abandoned their right in them he however said to him if the rulings of the state had not the force of law why should the proprietors abandon their right still as the officers do not fully carry out the instructions of the ruler since the ruler orders them to go and fell the trees from each valley in equal proportion and they come and fell them from one particular valley why then do we make use of the bridges which are thus constructed from misappropriated timber the agent of the ruler is like the ruler himself and cannot be troubled to arrange the felling in equal proportion and it is the proprietors who bring this loss on themselves since it was for them to have obtained contributions from the owners of all the valleys and handed over the money to defray the public expenditure Rabbe said he who is found in the barn must pay the king's share for all the grain in the field this statement applies only to a partner whereas an heiress has to pay no more than for the portion of his tenancy Rabba further said one citizen may be pledged for another citizen of the same town provided however the arrears are due for follower and carga of the current year whereas if they are due for the year that has already passed it would not be so for since the king has already been pacified the matter will be allowed to slide Rabba further said in the case of those heathens who mature fields for pay and reside within the sabbath limits around the town it is prohibited to purchase any animal from them the reason being that an animal from the town might have been mixed up with theirs but if they reside outside the sabbath limits it is permitted to buy animals from them Rabba however said if proprietors were pursuing them for the restoration of misappropriated animals it would be prohibited to purchase an animal from them even were they to reside outside the sabbath limits Rabba proclaimed or as others say are who not let it be known to those who go up to the land of Israel and who come down from Babylonia that if a son of Israel knows some evidence for the benefit of a heathen and without being called upon by him goes into a heathen court of law and bears testimony against a fellow Israelite he deserves to have a sham to pronounce against him the reason being that heathens adjudicate the payment of money Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, even on the evidence of one witness this
Right of preemption enjoyed by the nearest neighbor to the boundary does not apply. It must therefore be because the neighbor might say to the vendor, You have placed a line at my border. He therefore deserves to have a shamta pronounced against him unless he accepts upon himself the responsibility for any consequent mishap that might result from the sale mission. If customs collectors took away a man's ass and gave him instead another ass, or if brigands took away his garment and gave him instead another garment, it would belong to him. For the owners have surely given up hope of recovering it. If one rescued articles from a river or from a marauding band or from highwaymen, if the owners have given up hope of them, they will belong to him. So also regarding swarms of bees, if the owners have given up hope of recovering them, they would belong to him. Or Yohanan B. Baraka said, Even a woman or a minor is trusted when stating that the swarm started from here. The owner of bees is allowed. To walk into the field of his neighbor for the purpose of rescuing his swarm, though if he causes damage, he would have to pay for the amount of damage he does. He may, however, not cut off his neighbor's bow upon which his bees have settled, even though with the intention of paying him its value. Or Ishmael, the son of Ar Yohanan B. Baraka, however, said that he may even cut off his neighbor's bow if he means to repay him the value. Gamar Aitan had taught if he was given anything by customs collectors, he would have to restore it to the original proprietors. This view thus maintains that renunciation by itself does not transfer ownership, and consequently the misappropriated article has at the very outset come into his possession unlawfully. Some, however, read if he cares to give up the article given him by the customs collector, he should restore it to the original proprietors. The reason being that renunciation by itself transfers ownership, so that it is only when he made up his. Mind saying I do not like to benefit from money which is not really mine, he must restore it to the original proprietors. IT would belong to him for the owners have surely abandoned IT said Arashi. This Mishnah ruling applies only where the robber was a heathen, but in the case of a robber who was an Israelite, this would not be so as the proprietor surely thinks if not today, tomorrow I will take him to Law or Joseph Demer to the saying on the contrary, the reverse is more likely in the case of heathens who usually administer law forcibly, the owner need not give up hope, whereas in the case of an Israelite where the judges merely issue an order to make restoration without, however, employing corporal punishment, the owner has surely abandoned any hope of recovery. If therefore a contrary statement was ever made, it was made only regarding the concluding clause as follows if one rescued articles from a river or from heathens or from robbers, if the owners have abandoned them. They will belong to him, implying that as a rule this would not be so. This implication could, however, not be maintained in the case of heathens who usually administer the law forcibly, whereas in the case of a robber who was an Israelite, since the judges will merely issue an order to make restoration without, however, employing corporal punishment, the owner has surely abandoned any hope of recovery. We learned elsewhere in the case of skins belonging to a lay owner, mere mental determination on the part of the owner will render them capable of becoming defiled, whereas in the case of those belonging to a tanner, no mental determination would render them capable of becoming defiled. Regarding those in possession of a thief, mental determination will render them capable of becoming defiled, whereas those in the possession of a robber, no mental determination will render them capable of becoming defiled. Our Simeon, however, says that the rulings are to be reversed regarding those in the possession of. A robber mental determination will render them capable of becoming defiled, whereas those in the possession of a thief no mental determinations will render them capable of becoming defiled, as in the last case the owners do not usually abandon hope of finding the thief said well this difference of opinion exists only in average cases but where renunciation is definitely known to have taken place opinion is unanimous that renunciation transfers ownership Rabbi however said even where the renunciation is definitely known to have taken place there is also a difference of opinion Abbe said to Rabbi you should not contest the statement of Olaf or in our mission we learned in accordance with him as the owners do not usually abandon hope of finding the thief the reason is that usually the owners do not abandon hope of tracing the thief but where they definitely abandon hope of doing so the skins would have become as he rejoined we interpret the text in our mission to mean for there is no renunciation of them on the part of the owners we have learned if customs collectors took away a man's ass and gave him instead another ass or if brigands took away his garment and gave him instead another garment it would belong to him for the owners have surely abandoned hope of recovering it now whose view is represented here if we say that of the rabbis the ruling in the case of robbers raises a difficulty again if that of our simian the ruling in the case of thieves raises a difficulty the problem it is true is easily solved if we accept the view of Ola who stated that where renunciation was definitely known to have taken place ownership is transferred the mishnah ruling here would then similarly apply to the case where renunciation was definitely known to have taken place and would thus be unanimous but on the view of rabbi who stated that even where the renunciation is definitely known to have taken place there is still a difference of opinion with whose view with the Mishnah ruling accord, it could neither be with that of the rabbis nor with that of our Simeon. We speak here of an armed highwayman, and the ruling will be in accordance with our Simeon. But if so, is this case not identical with that of a customs collector acting openly like a robber? Yes, but two kinds of robbers are spoken of. Come and here, if a thief, a robber, or an honest consecrates a misappropriated article, it is duly consecrated. If he sets aside the portion for the priest's gift, it is genuine terima. Or again, if he sets aside the portion for the Levite's gift, the tithe is valid. Now, whose view does this teaching follow? If we say that of the rabbis, the case of robbers creates a difficulty. If that of our Simeon, the case of the thief creates a difficulty. The problem, it is true, is easily solved. If we accept the view of Allah who stated that where renunciation was definitely known to have taken place, ownership is transferred. The Mishnah ruling here would then similarly apply to. The case where renunciation was definitely known to have taken place and would thus be unanimous, but if we adopt the view of Rabbi who stated that even where the renunciation is definitely known to have taken place, there is still a difference of opinion with whose view would the Mishnah ruling accord. It could be neither in accordance with the Rabbis nor in accordance with our Simeon. Here too, an armed highwayman is meant, and the ruling will be in accordance with our Simeon, but if so, is this case not identical with that of robber? Yes, two kinds of robbers are spoken of, or if you wish, I may alternatively say that this teaching is in accordance with Rabbi as taught. Rabbi says a thief is in this respect subject to the same law as a robber Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi, and it is a known fact that it was to the law applicable to a robber according to our Simeon to which a thief was made subject in the statement of Rabbi. The above text states Rabbi says, I maintain that a thief is in this. Respect subject to the same law as a robber. The question was asked: Did he mean to make him subject to the law applicable to a robber as laid down by the rabbis? In which case ownership is not transferred, or did he perhaps mean to make him subject to the law applicable to a robber as defined by our Simeon? In which case the ownership is transferred. Come and here, if customs collectors took away a man's ass and gave him instead another ass, or if brigands took away his garment, it would belong to him. For the owners have surely abandoned it now. With whose view does this ruling accord? If with that of the rabbis, the case of the robber raises a difficulty. If with that of our Simeon, the case of the thief raises a difficulty. The difficulty is easily solved if you say that rabbi meant to make the thief subject to the law applicable to a robber as defined by our Simeon. In which case ownership is transferred. The ruling in the mission would then be in accordance with rabbis on this account. Ownership would be transferred, but if you say that he meant to make him subject to the law of robber as defined by the rabbis, in which case ownership will not be transferred, whom will the Mishnah ruling follow? It will be in accordance neither with rabbi nor with our Simeon nor with the rabbis. The robber spoken of here is an armed brigand, and the ruling will be in accordance with our Simeon, but if so, is this case not identical with that of a customs collector acting openly like a robber? Yes. Two kinds of robbers are spoken of. Come and here, if a thief, a robber, or an anus consecrates a misappropriated article, it is duly consecrated if he sets aside the portion for the priest's gift, it is genuine terima, or again, if he sets aside the portion for the Levite's gift, the tithe is valid. Now, with whose view does this teaching accord? If we say it is in accordance with the rabbis, the case of the robber creates a difficulty. If again we say it is in accordance with our Simeon, the case of it. Thief creates a difficulty. The difficulty it is true is easily solved if you say that Rabbi meant to make the thief subject to the same law as robber as defined by our Simeon, in which case ownership is transferred. The ruling in this
to them has only rabbinic authority behind it. We presume the owner generally to have resigned his right unless we know definitely to the contrary. We are told that it was only where the proprietors have explicitly renounced them that this will be so. But if not, this will not be so. Our Yohanan B. Baraka said that even a woman or a minor is trusted when stating that the swarm started from here. Are a woman and a minor competent to give evidence? Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, we are. Dealing here with a case where e.g. the proprietors were chasing the bees and a woman or a minor speaking in all innocence said that the swarm started from here or as she said remarks made by a person in the course of speaking in all innocence cannot be taken as evidence with the exception only of evidence of the death of a husband for the release of his wife said Rabbanu to our ashi is there no other case in which it would be taken as evidence surely in the case of a swarm of bees we deal with a remark made in all innocence the case of a swarm of bees is different as the ownership of it has only rabbinic sanction but does not the same apply to ordinances based on the written law did not Rab Judah say that Samuel stated that a certain man speaking in all innocence declared I remember that when I was a child I was once hoisted on the shoulders of my father and taken out of school and stripped of my shirt and immersed in water in order that I might partake of in the evening and are Hannah completed the statement thus and my comrades were kept separate from me and called me Yohanan who partakes of hell and Rabbi raised him to the status of priesthood upon the strength of the statement of his own mouth this was only for the purpose of eating Teramah mere rabbinic authority still would this not apply also to prohibitions based on the written law surely when our arrived he stated that our Hannah of Cardina or as others said our Aha of Cardina related a certain case brought before our Joshua B. Levi or as others say before Rabbi regarding a certain child speaking in all innocence who said I and my mother were taken captive among heathens whenever I went out to draw water I was thinking only of my mother and when I went out to gather wood I was thinking only of my mother and Rabbi permitted her to be married to a priest on the strength of the statement made by the child in the case of a woman taken captive the Rabbis were always lenient he may however not Cut off his neighbor's bow, etc. It was taught our Ishmael, the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka, said it is a stipulation of the court of law that the owner of the bees be entitled to come down into his neighbor's field and cut off his bow upon which his bees have settled in order to rescue his swarm of bees while the owner of the bow will be paid the value of his bow out of the other swarm. It is similarly a stipulation of the court of law that the owner of the one pour out the wine from the flask in order to save in it the other man's honey and that he can recover the value of his wine out of the other's honey. It is again a stipulation of the court of law that the owner of the wood should remove his wood from his ass and load on it the other man's flax from the ass that fell dead and that he can recover the value of his wood out of the other's flax for it was upon this condition that Joshua divided the land among the Israelites. Mishnah, if a man identifies his Articles or books in the possession of another person and a rumor of burglary in his place had already been current in town. The purchaser, while pleading purchase in market over it, would have to swear how much he paid for them and would be paid accordingly as he restores the articles or books to the plaintiff. But if this was not so, he could not be believed, for I may say that he sold them to another person from whom the defendant purchased them in a lawful manner. Imara, but even if a rumor of burglary in his place had already been current in town, why should the law be so? Why not still suspect that it was he who sold them in the market and it was he himself who circulated the rumor? Rab Judah said in the name of Rab, we suppose that e.g. people had entered his house and he rose in the middle of the night and called for help, crying out that he was being robbed. But is this not all the more reason for suspecting that he was merely looking for a pretext? Arkahana, therefore. Completed the statement made in the name of Rab as follows We suppose e.g. that a breach was found to have been made in his house and persons who lodged in his house were going out with bundles of articles upon their shoulders so that everyone was saying that so and so had had a burglary but still there might have been their only articles but not any books are high. B. Abba said in the name of our Yohanan We suppose that they were all saying that books also were there but why not apprehend that? They might have been little books while he is claiming big ones said our Jose B. Hanna, We suppose they say such and such a book but still they might perhaps have been old books while he is claiming new ones Rab said we suppose they were all saying that these were the articles of so and so and these were the books of so and so but did Rab really say so did Rab not say that if a thief entered a house by breaking in and misappropriated articles and departed with them he would be free to Reason being that he acquired title to them through the risk of life to which he exposed himself. This last ruling that ownership is transferred applies only where the thief entered by breaking in, in which case he from the very outset exposed himself to the risk of being killed. But to those who lodged in his house, since they did not expose themselves to the risk of being killed, this ruling cannot apply. Rabbi said all these qualifications apply only to a proprietor who keeps his goods for sale. But in the case of a proprietor who does not keep his goods for sale, Talmud, Mas Baba Kama, it would not be necessary to be so particular, but he might perhaps have been in need of money and thus compelled to sell some of his articles. Said Arashi, there is the fact that a rumor of burglary in his place had been current in town. It was stated where articles were stolen and sold by the thief who was subsequently identified. Rabbi, in the name of Arhai, said that the owner would have to sue the First, whereas our Yohanan in the name of Arjana said that he would have to sue the second, our Joseph thereupon said there is no conflict of opinion in the one case where the purchase took place before renunciation he could sue the second, whereas in the other where it took place after renunciation he would have to sue the first and both of them adopt the view expressed by Arhis Diabe said to him do they indeed not differ is the case of endowments to priests not on a PAR with the purchase taking place before renunciation and there is nevertheless here a difference of opinion for we learned if one asked another to sell him the inside of a cow in which there were included priestly portions he would have to give it to the priest without deducting anything from the purchase money but if he bought it from him by weight he would have to give the portions to the priests and deduct their value from the purchase money and Rab thereupon said that the last ruling could not be explained. Except where it was the purchaser who waited for himself, for if the butcher waited for him, the priest would have to sue the butcher, right? He can sue also the butcher, for you might have thought that priestly portions are not subject to the law of robbery. We are therefore told here that this is not so, but according to Abbe, who stated that there was a difference of opinion between them, what is that difference whether or not to accept the statement of Arhis Darzi, but said they differed? In regard to a case where e.g. the proprietor abandoned hope of recovering the articles when they were in the hands of the purchaser, but did not give up hope so long as they were in the hands of the thief, and the point at issue between them was that while one master maintained that it was only renunciation followed by a change of possession that transfers ownership, whereas if the change of ownership has preceded renunciation, no ownership is thereby transferred, the other master maintained that. There is no distinction our papa said regarding the garment itself there could be no difference of opinion at all as all agree that it will have to be restored to the proprietor where they differ here is as to whether the benefit of market over it is to be applied to him Rab in the name of Arhai said that he has to sue the first i.e. the claim of the purchaser for recovery of his money is against the thief as the benefit of market over it does not apply here whereas our Yohanan stated in the name of R. Janay that he may sue the second i.e. the claim of the purchaser for repayment should be against the proprietor since the benefit of market over it does apply also here but does Rab really maintain that the benefit of market over it should not apply here was Arhuna not a disciple of Rab and yet when Hanan the wicked misappropriated a garment and sold it and was brought before Arhuna he said to the plaintiff go forth and redeem your pledge in the purchaser's hand the case of Hanan the wicked was Different for since it was impossible to get any payment from him, it was the same as where the thief was not identified at all. Rabbi said where the thief is notorious, the benefit of the purchase in market over it would not apply, but was Hanan the wicked not notorious, and yet the benefit of the purchase in market over it still applied. He was only notorious for wickedness, but for theft he was not notorious at all. It was stated if a man misappropriated articles and paid a debt with them, or if he misappropriated them and paid for goods he received on credit, the benefit of the purchase in market over it will not apply, for we are entitled to say whatever credit you gave him was not in return for these stolen articles. If he pledged them for a hundred, their value being two hundred, the benefit of the purchase in market over it would apply, but if their value equaled the amount of money lent on them, Amimar said that the benefit of market over it would not
misappropriating articles and paying with them a debt or misappropriating articles and paying with them for goods received on credit whereas the further advance of the last four Zeus was a matter of mere trust just as he trusted him at the very outset after being referred from one authority to another the matter reached the notice of Arabah who said that the law was in accordance with Arkonain Arashin misappropriated a book and sold it to a Papunian for 80 Zeus and this Papunian went and sold it to a Mahosin for 120 Zeus as the thief was subsequently identified Abay said that the proprietor of the book could come and pay the Mahosin 80 Zeus and get his book back and the Mahosin would be entitled to go and recover the other 40 Zeus from the Papunian Rabba demurred saying if in the case of a purchase from the thief himself the benefit of market over should this not be the more so in the case of a purchase from a purchaser Rabba therefore Said the proprietor of the book can go and pay the Mahosin 120 Zeus and get back his book and the proprietor of the book is then entitled to go and recover 40 Zeus from the Papunian and 80 Zeus from the Narashin Mishnah if one man was coming along with a barrel of wine and another with a jug of honey and the barrel of honey happened to crack and the other one poured out his wine and rescued the honey into his empty barrel Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi he would be able to claim no more than the value of his services but if he said at the outset I am going to rescue your honey and I expect to be paid the value of my wine the other has to pay him accordingly so also if a river swept away his ass and another man's ass his ass being only worth a and his fellow's ass 200 Zeus and he left his own ass to its fate and rescued the other man's ass he would be able to claim no more than the value of his services but if he said to him at the outset I am Going to rescue your ass and I expect to be paid at least the value of my ass the other would have to pay him accordingly tomorrow but why should the rescuer not be entitled to say I have acquired title to the rescued object as it became ownerless was it not taught in the very day if a man carrying pitchers of wine and pitchers of oil noticed that they were about to be broken he may not say I declare this terrible or tithe with respect to other produce which I have at home and if he says so. His statement is of no legal validity as our Jeremiah said in another connection where the bale of the press house was twined around it it would not become ownerless so also here in the case of the barrel we suppose the bale of the press house was twined around it still how does the very state and if he says so his statement is of no legal validity surely it was taught if a man was walking on the road with money in his possession and a robber confronted him he may not say the produce. Which I have in my house shall become redeemed by virtue of these coins. Yet if he says so, his statement has legal validity here. In the latter case, we suppose that he was still able to rescue the money. But if he was still able to rescue the money, why then should he not be allowed to say so even directly? We suppose he would be able to rescue it with some exertion. But still, even where there is likely to be a loss, why should he not be allowed to say so even directly? Surely it was taught if a man has ten barrels of unclean people and notices one of them on the point of becoming broken or uncovered, he may say, Let this be the terima portion of the tithe with respect to the other nine barrels. Though in the case of oil, he should not do so, as he would thereby cause a great loss to the priest. Said our Jeremiah. In this case, we suppose that the bale of the press chest was still twined around it. This is a sufficient reason. In the case where the barrel broke, as the wine remaining is still. Fit to be used, but in the case where the barrel became uncovered for what use is the wine fit any more for should you argue that it is still fit for sprinkling purposes was it not taught water which became uncovered should not even be poured out on public ground and should neither be used for stamping clay nor for sprinkling the house nor for feeding either one's own animal or the animal of a neighbor he may make it good by using a strainer in accordance with the view of our Nehemiah is taught. A strainer is subject to the law of uncovering our Nehemiah however says that this is so only where the receptacle underneath was uncovered but if the receptacle underneath was covered though the strainer on top was uncovered the liquid strained into the receptacle beneath would not be subject to the law of uncovering as the venom of a serpent resembles a fungus and thus remains floating in its previous position but was it not taught in reference to this that our Simeon said in the name of our Joshua believe by that this ruling applies only if it has not been stirred but if it had been stirred it would be forbidden even there it is possible to rectify matters by putting some cloth on the mouth of the barrel and straining the liquid gently through but if we follow our Nehemiah is it permitted to make unclean produce terima even with respect to other unclean produce surely it has been taught it is permitted to make unclean produce terima with respect to other unclean produce or clean produce with respect to other clean produce but not unclean produce with respect to clean produce whereas our Nehemiah said that unclean produce is not allowed to be made terima even with respect to unclean produce except in the case of Dimeh here also we are dealing with the case of Dimeh the master stated though in the case of oil he should not do so as he would thereby cause a great loss to the priest but why is oil different surely because it can be used for lighting cannot wine similarly be Used for sprinkling purposes and should you argue that sprinkling is not a thing of any consequence did Samuel not say in the name of our high that for drinking purposes one should pay a cell of prolog of wine whereas for sprinkling purposes two cellars prolog we are dealing here with fresh wine but could it not be kept until it becomes old he may happen to use it for a wrong purpose but why not also in the case of oil apprehend that he may happen to use it for a wrong purpose we suppose he keeps it in a filthy receptacle but why not keep the wine also in a filthy receptacle since it is needed for sprinkling purposes how could it be placed in a filthy receptacle the apprehension of illicit use is in itself a point at issue between ten as taught if a barrel of terima wine became unclean Beth Shammai maintained Talmud, Mas Baba Kama that the whole of it must immediately be poured out whereas Beth Hillel maintained that it could be used for sprinkling purposes or Ishmael Jose. Said I will suggest a compromise if it was already in the house it might be used for sprinkling purposes but if it was still in the field it would have to be poured out entirely or as some say if it was old it might be used for sprinkling purposes but if it was fresh it should be poured out entirely they were joined to him a compromise based on an independent reasoning cannot be accepted but if he said at the outset I am going to rescue your honey and I expect to be paid the value of my wine. The other has to pay him accordingly but why should the other party not say to him subsequently I am merely jesting with you surely it was taught if a man running away from prison came to a ferry and said to the boatman take a dinar to ferry me across he would still have to pay him not more than the value of his services that shows that he is entitled to say I was merely jesting with you why then also here should he not be entitled to say to him I was merely jesting with you the comparison. Is rather with the case dealt with in the concluding clause, but if he said to him, Take this dinar as your fee for ferrying me across, he would have to pay him the sum stipulated in full. But why this difference between the case in the first clause and that in the second clause? Said Rami Bihama in the second clause, the other party was a fisher catching fishes from the sea, in which case he can surely say to him, You caused me to lose fish amounting in value to a zoo. So also, if a river swept away, his ass and another man's ass, his ass being worth a main hand, the other's ass 200 zuz, etc. Both cases had to be stated for. Had we only the former case, we might think that it was only there where a stipulation was made that the payment should be for the whole value of the wine, since its owner sustained the loss by direct act of his own hands, whereas here where the loss came of itself, it might have been said that in all circumstances he would have no more than the value of his. Services so also if we had had only the second case we might have thought that it was only here where no stipulation was made that he would have no more than the value of his services since the loss came of itself whereas in the other case where the loss was sustained through his own act I might have said that even where no stipulation was made the payment would have to be for the whole value of the honey it was therefore necessary to state both cases are Kahana asked Rab what would be the law if the owner of the inferior ass went down to rescue the other's ass with the stipulation of being paid the value of his own ass and it so happened that his own ass got out by itself he replied this was surely an act of mercy towards him on the part of heaven a similar case happened with our Safra when he was going along with the caravan a lion followed them and they had every evening to abandon to it in turn an ass of each of them which it ate when the turn of our Safra came and he gave it is as the lion did not eat it our Safra immediately hastened to take possession of it said our Ahav Difti to Rubina why was it necessary for him to take possession of it again for though he had implicitly abandoned it he surely had abandoned it only with respect to the lion whereas with respect to anybody else in the world he
The general custom of the ass-drivers The ass-drivers are entitled to stipulate that one who loses his ass should be provided with another ass if however this was caused by negligence they would not have to provide him with another ass where this was done without any negligence on his part he is provided with another ass if he said give me the money for the ass and I will buy it myself and in any case guard the asses we do not listen to him is this not obvious no this is a case where he possesses another ass and where therefore I might have said that since he has in any case to guard it his request should be complied with we are therefore told that there is a difference between guarding one and guarding two our rabbis taught if a boat was sailing on the sea and a gale arose threatening to sink it so that it became necessary to lighten the cargo the apportionment of the loss of each passenger will have to be made according to the weight of the cargo and not according to the value of the cargo though they should not deviate from the general custom of mariners the mariners are entitled to stipulate that one who loses his boat should be provided with another boat if this was caused by his fault they would not have to provide him with another boat but if without negligence he is provided with another boat so also if he sailed to a place where boats should not go and thus lost his boat they would not have to provide him with another one but is this not obvious no there may be a place where during this and they generally sail one rope's length away from the shore whereas during Tishri they sail two ropes length away from the shore and it so happened here that during this and he sailed in the place fit for sailing during Tishri in this case it might be argued that as he took his wanted course in sailing he should still be provided with another boat we are therefore told that this is not the case our rabbis taught if a caravan was traveling in the desert and a band of robbers threatened to plunder it and one member of the caravan rose and rescued some of their belongings whatever he rescued will go to the respective owners whereas if he said at the beginning I am going to rescue for myself whatever he rescued would belong to himself what are the circumstances if the other owners were able to rescue their belongings why even in the second case should the rescued belongings not go to the respective owners if on the other hand no other owner was able to rescue anything why even in the first case should they not belong to the man himself said Rami Bihama we are dealing here with partners and in an emergency like this a partner may dissolve partnership even without the knowledge of his fellow so that where he made a stipulation as in the concluding clause the partnership has been dissolved whereas if no stipulation was made as in the first clause the partnership has not yet been dissolved Rabbah however said that we are Dealing here with laborers and the ruling follows the view of Rab for Rab said that a laborer is entitled to withdraw even in the middle of the day hence so long as he did not withdraw whatever he rescues is regarded as being in the possession of the employer whereas after he had already withdrawn it is a different matter altogether as it is written for unto me the children of Israel are servants they are my servants but not servants to servants are as she said we are dealing here with a case where any other owner would be able to rescue the property only with great difficulty so that where he the one who did the work of rescue declared his intention the belongings rescued will go to him whereas where he did not declare his intention they will go to their respective owners Mishnah if a man robbed another of a field and then did he massacre and confiscated it if this blow befell the whole province he may say to him here is thine before thee but if it was caused through the robber Himself, he would have to provide him with another field. Gemara Arnam and B. Isaac said, One who reads here Masakin is not an error, while one who reads Masakin is similarly not an error. One who reads Masakin is not an error, as it was written in the siege and Masak straightness. So also, he who reads Masakin is not an error, as it is written the locust shall consume, which is translated the Saka Sak carrier shall inherit it. But if it was caused through the robber himself, he would have to provide him with another field. How are we to understand this? If only this field was confiscated while all the other fields were not confiscated, could this not be derived from the earlier clause, which says, If this blow befell the whole province, he may say to him, Here is thine before thee, which implies that if this was not so, the ruling would be otherwise. No, it is necessary to state the law where he did not actually misappropriate the field, but merely pointed it out to the bandit Eju. Confiscated according to another explanation we are dealing here with a case where E.G. Evans demanded of him with threats to show them his fields and he showed them also this field among his own a certain person showed to robbers a heap of wheat that belonged to the house of the Exilarch he was brought before Arnaman and ordered by Arnaman to pay Arjoseph happened to be sitting at the back of Arhuna Bihai who was sitting in front of Arnaman Arhuna Bihai said to Arnaman is this a judgment or a fine he replied this is the ruling in our mission as we have learned if it was caused through the robber himself he would have to provide him with another field which we interpreted to refer to a case where he showed the field to bandits after Arnaman had gone Arjoseph said to Arhuna Bihai what difference does it make Talmud Mas Babakama whether it is a judgment or a fine he replied if it is a judgment we may derive other cases from it whereas if it is a fine we would be unable to derive other cases from it but what is your ground for saying that from a matter of mere fine we cannot derive any other case as it was taught originally it was said that liability will attach for defiling terimah or for vitiating wine but it was subsequently laid down that it will also attach for mixing common grain with terimah grain now this is so only because it was so laid down subsequently whereas had it not been so laid down subsequently this would not have been so is the reason for this not because liability here is a matter of mere fine thus proving that we cannot derive anything from a fine no originally it was thought that it is only where a great loss is involved that we have to be on our guard whereas where only a small loss is involved we need not be particular whereas subsequently it was decided that even in the case of a small loss we should be particular but this is not so for the father of our Abin learned originally it was said that Liability will attach for defiling terimah or for mixing it with unconsecrated grain but it was subsequently laid down that it will also attach for vitiating wine now this is so only because it was so laid down subsequently whereas had it not been so stated subsequently this would not have been so is the reason for this not because we are unable to derive anything from a matter of mere fine no originally the view of our Abin was taken but subsequently the view of our Jeremiah was adopted. Originally the view of our Abin was taken for our Abin said if one shot an arrow from the beginning to the end of a space of four cubits and it cut through some silk in its passage he would be exempt for the outset of the motion was subservient to its termination for which he is liable to capital punishment but subsequently it was decided in accordance with our Jeremiah for our Jeremiah said from the moment the defendant lifted up the wine it entered into his possession and he thus became liable to Make pecuniary compensation whereas he does not become liable to capital punishment until the very moment of the idolatry's libation happening to be at Bia Bion Arhunabi Judah visited Rabbah who said to him has any case about which you are in doubt recently been decided by you he replied I had to decide the case of an Israelite whom heathens forced to show them another man's possessions and I ordered him to pay he however said to him reverse the judgment in favor of the defendant as taught. An Israelite who was forced by heathens to show them another man's possessions is exempt though if he personally took it and gave it to the heathens with his own hand he would be liable Rabbah said if he showed it on his own accord it is the same in law as if he personally took it and gave it to the robber with his own hand a certain man was forced by heathens to show them the wine of Mari the son of Arfin has the son of Arhista the heathens then said to him carry the wine and bring. It along with us so he carried it and brought it along with them when he was brought before Arashi he exempted him the rabbi said to Arashi was it not taught if he personally took it and gave it to the heathens with his own hand he would be liable he said to them this ruling applies only where the heathens were not standing near it whereas where they stood near it is the same in the eye of the law as if it had already been burnt Arabah raised an objection to the explanation of Arashi. From the following if a ruffian said to him hand me this bunch of sheep or this cluster of grapes and he handed it to him he would be liable no we are dealing here with a case where they were standing on two banks of a river that this was the case could also be proved from the use of the word hand instead of give this indeed proves that two persons were quarreling about a certain net one said it is mine and the other said it is mine one of them eventually went and surrendered it to the Hungary of the king for confiscation Abbe thereupon said that he should be entitled to plead when I surrendered the article it was my own property that I surrendered said Rabbah to him why should he be believed if he says so Rabbah therefore said we would have to impose a shamta upon him until he brings back the net and appears before the court a certain man who was desirous of showing another man's straw to be confiscated appeared before Rab who said to him don't show it don't show it he retorted I will show it I will show it our Kahana was then sitting before Rab and he tore that man's windpipe out of him R
Any difficulty another statement and the former raised no difficulty Arkahana was put back through the seven rows until he remained seated upon the very last row Aryohan and thereupon said to our Simeon Belakish the lion you mentioned turns out to be a mere fox Arkahana thereupon whispered in prayer may it be the will of heaven that these seven rows be in the place of the seven years mentioned by Rabbi thereupon immediately stood on his feet and said to Aryohan and will the master please start. The lecture again from the beginning as soon as the latter made a statement on a matter of law Arkahana pointed out a difficulty and so also when Aryohan and subsequently made further statements for which he was placed again on the first row Aryohan and was sitting upon seven cushions whenever he made a statement against which a difficulty was pointed out one cushion was pulled out from under him and so it went on until all the cushions were pulled out from under him and he remained seated upon. The ground as Aryohan was then a very old man and his eyelashes were overhanging he said to them lift up my eyes for me as I want to see him so they lifted up his eyelids with silver pincers he saw that Arkahana's lips were parted and thought that he was laughing at him he felt aggrieved and in consequence the soul of Arkahana went to rest on the next day Aryohan said to our rabbis have you noticed how the Babylonian was making a laughing stock of us but they said to him this was his natural appearance he thereupon went to the cave of Arkahana's grave and saw Talmud, Mas Baba Kama Ba snake coiled round it he said snake snake open thy mouth and let the master go into the disciple but the snake did not open its mouth he then said let the colleague go into his associate but it still did not open its mouth until he said let the disciple enter to his master when the snake did open its mouth he then prayed for mercy and raised him he said to him had I known that the Natural appearance of the master was like that I should never have taken offense now therefore let the master go with us he replied if you are able to pray for mercy that I should never die again through causing you any annoyance I will go with you but if not I am not prepared to go with you for later on you might change again Aryohan and thereupon completely awakened and restored him and he used to consult him on doubtful points Arkahana solving them for him this is implied in the statement. Made by Aryohan and what I had believed to be yours was in fact theirs there was a certain man who showed a silk ornament of our abba to heathen ruffians our abba and our hand of and our Isaac the smith were sitting in judgment with our early sitting near them they were inclined to declare the defendant liable as we have learned where a judge in deciding on a certain case declared innocent the person who was really liable or made liable the person who was really innocent declared defiled the thing. Which was levitically clean or declared clean, a thing which was really defiled, his decision would stand, but he would have to make restitution out of his own estate. Thereupon, Ali said to them, Thus stated, Rab provided the defendant actually took and gave it away with his own hand. They therefore said to the plaintiff, Go and take your case to our Simeon Beliakim and our Eliezer Bepedath, who adjudicate liability for damage done by Garmai when he went to them. They declared the defendant liable on the strength of our Mishnah. If this was caused through the robber, he would have to provide him with another field, which we interpreted to refer to a case where he showed the field to oppressors. A certain man had a silver cup which had been deposited with him, and being attacked by thieves, he took it and handed it over to them. He was summoned before Rabba, who declared him exempt, said, Abba, Rabba was this man not rescuing himself by means of another man's money. Our Ashi said, We have to consider. The circumstances if he was a wealthy man the thieves came upon him probably with the intention of stealing his own possessions but if not they came for the silver cup a certain man had a purse of money for the redemption of captives deposited with him being attacked by thieves he took it and handed it over to them he was thereupon summoned before Rabba who nevertheless declared him exempt said Abbe to him was not that man rescuing himself by means of another man's money he replied there could hardly be a case of redeeming captives more pressing than this a certain man managed to get his ass onto a ferry boat before the people in the boat had got out onto shore the boat was in danger of sinking so a certain person came along and pushed that man's ass over into the river where it drowned when the case was brought before Rabba he declared him exempt said Abbe to him was that person not rescuing himself by means of another man's money he however said to him the owner of it as was from the very beginning in the position of the pursuer Rabba follows his own line of reasoning for Rabba elsewhere said if a man was pursuing another with the intention of killing him and in his course broke utensils whether they belonged to the pursuit or to any other person he would be exempt for he was at that time incurring capital liability if however he who was pursued broke utensils he would be exempt only if they belonged to the pursuer whose possessions could surely not be entitled to greater protection than his body whereas if they belonged to any other person he would be liable as it is forbidden to rescue oneself by means of another man's possessions but if a man ran after a pursuer with the intention of rescuing someone from him and in his course accidentally broke utensils whether they belonged to the pursuit or to any other person he would be exempt this however is not a matter of strict law but is based upon the consideration that if he were not to Rule thus no man would ever put himself out to rescue a fellow man from the hands of a pursuer mission if a river flooded a misappropriated field the robber is entitled to say to the other party here is years before you tomorrow our rabbis taught if a man robbed another of a field and a river flooded it, he would have to present him with another field this is the opinion of our Eliezer but the sages maintain that he would be entitled to say to him here is years before you what is the ground of their difference our Eliezer expounds scripture on the principle of amplifications and limitations the expression and lie unto his neighbor is an amplification and that which was delivered him to keep constitutes a limitation or all that about which he has sworn falsely forms again an amplification and where an amplification is followed by a limitation which precedes another amplification everything is included what is thus included all articles and what is excluded bills but the rabbis Expound scripture on the principle of generalization and specification thus the expression and lie is a generalization and that which was delivered him to keep is a specification or all that about which he has sworn falsely is again a generalization and where a generalization is followed by a specification that precedes another generalization you surely cannot include anything save what is similar to the specification so here just as the specification is an article which is movable and of which the intrinsic value lies in its substance you include any other matter which is movable and of which the intrinsic value lies in its very substance land is thus excluded as it is not movable so also are slaves excluded as they are compared in lodge lands and bills are similarly excluded for though they are movables their substance does not constitute their intrinsic value but was it not taught if one misappropriated a cow and a river swept it away he would have to present him with Another cow according to the opinion of our Eliezer whereas the sages maintain that he would be entitled to say to him here is years before you now in what principle did they differ there in the case of the cow said our papa we are dealing there with a case where e.g. he robbed a man of a field on which Talmud, Mas Baba Kama a cow was lying and a river subsequently flooded our Eliezer following his line of reasoning while the rabbis followed their own view mission if a man has robbed another or borrowed money from him or received a deposit from him in an inhabited place he may not restore it to him in the wilderness but if the transaction was originally made upon the stipulation that he was going into the wilderness he may make restoration even while in the wilderness Kamara a contradiction could be raised from the following alone can be paid in all places whereas a lost article which was found or a deposit cannot be restored save in a place suitable for the said epic. What is meant is this alone can be demanded in any place whereas a lost article which was found or a deposit cannot be demanded save in the proper place but if the transaction was originally made upon the stipulation of his going into the wilderness etc. Is this ruling not obvious? No for we have to consider the case where he said to him take this article and deposit with you as I intend departing to the wilderness and the other said to him I similarly intend departing to the wilderness so that if you want me to return it to you there I will be able to do so mission if one man says to another I have robbed you I have borrowed money from you I received a deposit from you but I do not know whether I have already restored it to you or not he has to make restitution but if he says I do not know whether I have robbed you whether I have borrowed money from you whether I received a deposit from you he is not liable to make restitution tomorrow it was stated if one man alleges you have Amina of mine and the other says I am not certain about it Arhuna and Rabjuda hold that he is liable but Arnaman and Aryohan and say that he is exempt Arhuna and Rabjuda maintain that he is liable because where a positive plea is met by an uncertain one the positive plea prevails but Arnaman and Aryohan and say that he is exempt since money
counted the sheep and found the herd complete the thief would be exempt in regard to any subsequent mishap. Amara Rab said if the proprietor knew of the theft he has similarly to know of the restoration where he had no knowledge of the theft his counting exempts the thief and the words he counted the sheep and found the herd complete refer only to the concluding clause. Samuel however said whether the proprietor knew or had no knowledge of it his counting would exempt it. Thief and the words if he counted the sheep and found the herd complete the thief would be exempt refer to all cases or Yohan and moreover said if the proprietor had knowledge of the theft his counting will exempt the thief whereas if he had no knowledge of it it would not even be necessary to count and the words he counted the sheep and found the herd complete refer exclusively to the first clause or his da however said where the proprietor had knowledge of the theft counting will exempt the thief whereas where he had no knowledge of the theft he would have to be notified of the restoration and the words he counted the sheep and found the herd complete refer only to the first clause Rabbah said Talmud, Mas Baba Kamabi the reason of our his is because living things have the habit of running out into the fields but did Rabbah really maintain this has not Rabbah said if a man saw another lifting up a lamb of his herd and picked up a clod to throw at him and did not notice whether he put back the lamb or did not put it back and it so happened that it died or was stolen by somebody else the thief would be responsible for it now does this ruling not hold good even where the herd had subsequently been counted no only where the proprietor had not yet counted it but did Rab really make the statement did not Rab say if the thief restored the stolen sheep to a herd which the proprietor had in the wilderness he would thereby have fulfilled his duty said Arhain and B. Abarab would accept the latter ruling in the case of an easily recognizable lamb may we say that they differed in the same way as the following ten name if a man steals a lamb from a herd or a seller from a purse he must restore it to the same place from which he stole it so are Ishmael but Arakiba said that he would have to notify the proprietor now it was presumed that both parties concurred with the statement of Arizak who said that a man usually examines his purse at short Intervals could it therefore not be concluded that they referred to the case of a seller the theft of which is known to the proprietor so that they differed in the same way as Rab and Samuel know they referred to the case of the lamb the theft of which is probably unknown to the owner and they thus differed in the same way as Arhista and Aryohan and Arzibit said in the name of Rabba where the article was stolen from the actual possession of the proprietor there is no difference of opinion between them as in such a case they would adopt the view of Arhista but here they differ on a case where a bailee misappropriated a deposit in his own possession and subsequently restored it to the place from which he misappropriated it or Akiba holding that when he misappropriated the deposit the bailment came to an end whereas Arishmael held that the bailment did not thereby come to an end may we still say that whether or not counting exempts is a question at issue between Tanaim for it was Taught if a man robbed another but made up for the amount by inserting it in his settlement of accounts it was taught on one occasion that he thereby fulfilled his duty whereas it was taught elsewhere that he did not fulfill his duty now as it is generally presumed that all parties concur with the dictum of our Isaac who said that a man usually examines his purse from time to time does it not follow then that the two views differ on this point is that the view that he fulfilled his duty implies that counting secures exemption whereas the view that he did not fulfill his duty implies that counting does not secure exemption it may however be said that if they were to accept the saying of our Isaac they would none of them have questioned that counting should secure exemption but they did in fact differ regarding the statement of our Isaac the one master agreeing with the statement of our Isaac and the other master disagreeing or if you wish I may alternatively say that all are in Agreement with the statement of our Isaac and still there is no difficulty as in the former statement we suppose the thief to have counted the money and thrown it into the purse of the other party whereas in the latter statement we suppose him to have counted it and thrown it into the hand of the other party or if you wish I may alternatively still say that in the one case as well as in the other the robber counted the money and threw it into the purse of the other party but while on the latter case we suppose some money to have been in the purse the former deals with a case where no other money was in the purse mission it is not right to buy either wool or milk or kids from the shepherds nor wood nor fruits from those who are in charge of fruits it is however permitted to buy from housewives wool and goods in Judea flax and goods in Galilee or calves in Sharon but in all these cases if it was stipulated by them that the goods are to be hidden it is forbidden to buy them eggs and hands may however be bought in all places Gemara our rabbis taught it is not right to buy from shepherds either goats or kids or fleeces or torn pieces of wool though it is allowed to buy from them made up garments as these are certainly theirs it is similarly allowed to buy from them milk and cheese in the wilderness though not in inhabited places it is also allowed to buy from them four or five sheep four or five fleeces but neither two sheep nor two fleeces are Judah says domesticated animals may be bought from them but pasture animals may not be bought from them the general principle is that anything the absence of which if it is sold by the shepherd would be noticed by the proprietor may be bought from the former but if the proprietor would not notice it it may not be bought from him the master stated it is also allowed to buy from them four or five sheep four or five fleeces seeing that it has been said that four may be bought is it necessary to mention five set are his for me be bought out of five some however say that are his da stated that four may be bought out of a small herd and five out of a big herd but the text itself seems to contain a contradiction you say four or five sheep four or five fleeces implying that only four or five could be bought but not three whereas when you read in the concluding clause but not two sheep is it not implied that three sheep may be bought there is no contradiction as the latter statement refers to fat animals and the former do. Lean ones are Judah says domesticated animals may be bought from them but pasture animals may not be bought from them it was asked did are Judah refer to the opening clause in which case his ruling would be the stricter or perhaps to the concluding clause in which case it would be the more lenient did he refer to the opening clause and mean to be more stringent so that when it says it is allowed to buy from them four or five sheep the ruling is to be confined to domesticated animals whereas in the Case of pasture animals even four or five should not be bought or did he perhaps refer to the concluding clause and mean to be more lenient so that when it says but neither two sheep nor two fleeces this ruling would apply only to pasture animals whereas in the case of domesticated animals even two may be bought come and here Arjuna says domesticated animals may be bought from them whereas pasture animals may not be bought from them but in all places four or five sheep may be bought from them. Talmud, Mas Baba Kama now since he says in all places we may conclude that he referred to the concluding clause and took the lenient view this proves it nor would nor fruits from those in charge of fruits rab bought bundles of twigs from an Arab they thereupon said to him did we not learn nor would nor fruits from those in charge of fruits he replied this ruling applies only to a keeper in charge who has no ownership whatsoever in the substance of the land whereas in the case of an heiress who has a part in it I can say that he is selling his own goods our rabbis taught it is allowed to buy from those in charge of fruits while they are seated and offering their wares having the baskets before them and the scales in front of them though in all cases if they tell the purchaser to hide the goods purchased it is forbidden so also it is allowed to buy from them at the entrance of the garden though not at the back of the garden it was stated in the case of a robber when would it be allowed to buy goods from him rab said only when the majority of his possessions is his but Samuel said even when only the minority of them is his rab Judah instructed out of the attendant of the rabbis to act in accordance with the view that even where only a smaller part of his possessions is his it is already permitted to deal with him regarding the property of an informer Arhuna and rab Judah are divided one said that it is permitted to destroy it directly whereas the other one said that it is forbidden to destroy it directly the one who stated that it is permitted to destroy it directly maintains that an offense against the property of an informer could surely not be worse than one against his body whereas the one who held that it is forbidden to destroy it maintains that the informer might perhaps have good children as written he the wicked may prepare it but the just shall put it on our his had among his employees a certain heiress who weighed and gave weight and took the produce of the field he thereupon dismissed him and quoted regarding himself and the wealth of the sinner is laid tip for the just for what is the hope of the hypocrite though he hath gained when God taketh away his soul Arhuna and Arhista differed as to the interpretation of this verse one said that it referred to the soul of the robbed person the other one said that it referred to the soul of the robber the one said that it referred to the soul of the robbed person for it is Written so are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain which ta
sons and his daughters. So also if you say that these statements apply only where no money was given, whereas where money was given, this would not be so. Come and hear for Hamas the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. Again, should you say that these statements refer only to a case where a robbery was directly committed by hand, whereas where it was merely caused indirectly, this would not be so. Come and hear it is for Saul and for his bloody. House because he slew the Gibeonites, for indeed where do we find that Saul slew the Gibeonites? It must therefore be because he slew not the city of the priests who used to supply them with water and food. Scripture considers it as though he had slain them. It is however permitted to buy from housewives. Our rabbis taught it is permitted to buy from housewives woolen goods in Judea and flax and goods in Galilee, but neither wine nor oil nor flour nor from slaves nor from children. Abba Saul says that a housewife may sell the worth of four or five denarii for the purpose of making a hat for her head, but in all these cases, if it was stipulated that the goods should be hidden, it is forbidden to buy them. Charity collectors may accept from them small donations, but not big amounts. In the case of oil pressers, it is permitted to buy from them their housewives olives by measure and oil by measure, but neither olives in a small quantity nor oil in a small quantity are Simeon B. Gamaliel, however, says. In Upper Galilee it is permitted to buy from housewives olives even in small quantities for sometimes a man is ashamed to sell them at the door of his house and so gives them to his wife to sell Rabbi came once to the city of Mahusa and the housewives of Mahusa came and threw before him chains and bracelets which he accepted from them said Rabbi Tosfaya to was it not taught charity collectors may accept from them small donations but not big amounts he however said to him these things are considered with the people of Mahusa as small amounts mission shreds of wool which are taken out by the washer belong to him but those which the carter removes belong to the proprietor the washer may remove the three threads at the edge and they will belong to him but all over and above that will belong to the proprietor though if they were black upon a white surface he may remove them all and they will belong to him if a tailor left a thread sufficient to sew with or a patch of the width of three fingers by three fingers it will belong to the proprietor whatever a carpenter removes with the ATZE belongs to him but that which he removes by the axe belongs to the proprietor if however he was working on the proprietor's premises even the sawdust belongs to the proprietor Gemara our rabbis taught it is allowed to buy shreds of wool from the washer as they are his the washer may remove the two upper threads and they will belong to him Talmud, Mas Baba Kamba Bidi. Carter must not use of the cloth for stretching and hackling more than three widths of a seam he should similarly not comb the garment towards the warp but towards its woof he may straighten it out lengthways but not breadthways if he wants however to straighten it out up to a handbreadth he may do so the master stated two threads but did we not learn three there is no difficulty as the former statement applies to thick threads and the latter to thin ones he should similarly not comb it. Garment towards the warp but towards its woof but was it not taught to the contrary there is no difficulty as the latter statement refers to an everyday garment whereas the former deals with the best cloak used very seldom he must not use of the cloth for stretching or hackling more than three widths of a seam our Jeremiah asked does the preliminary drawing of the needle to and fro count as one stitch or does it perhaps count as two stitches let it stand undecided he may straighten it out lengthways but not breadthways but was it not taught to the contrary there is no difficulty as the former statement refers to a garment and the latter refers to a girdle our rabbis taught it is not allowed to buy hackled wool from the carter as it is not his but in places where it is customary for it to belong to him it is allowed to buy it in all places however it is allowed to buy from them a mattress full of stuffing and a cushion full of stuffing the reason being that these articles had in any case, been transferred to them through the change which the stuffing underwent. Our rabbis taught it is not right to buy from a weaver either remnants of woof or of warp or threads of the bobbin or remnants of coils. It is, however, allowed to buy from him even a checkered web and woof and warp if they are spun and woven. I would here ask, since it is now stated that if spun it may be accepted from them, what necessity was there to say woven? What is meant by woven is merely twisted. Without first having been spun, our rabbis taught it is not right to buy from a dyer either test pieces or samples or torn pieces of wool, but it is allowed to buy from him a colored garment yarn and ready made garments. But since it has now been stated that yarn may be accepted from him, what doubt could there be regarding ready made garments? What is meant by ready made garments is felt spreadings. Our rabbis taught if skins have been given to a tanner, the part trimmed off and the pieces. Of hair torn off will belong to the proprietor, whereas what comes up by the rinsing in water would belong to him. If they were black upon a white surface, he may remove them all, and they will belong to him. Rab Judah said a washer is named Kazra, and he takes the Kazra. Rab Judah again said all the three threads can be reckoned for the purpose of teeth left. Though Isaac, my son, is particular about them. If a tailor left a thread sufficient to sew with, how much is sufficient to sew with? Said Arasi. The length of a needle and beyond a needle. The question was raised: Does this mean the length of a needle and as much again as the length of a needle, or perhaps the length of a needle and anything beyond a needle? Come and here, if a tailor left a thread which is less than sufficient to sew with, or a patch less than the width of three fingers by three fingers, if the proprietor is particular about them, they would belong to the proprietor. But if the proprietor is not particular about then they would belong to the tailor now there is no difficulty if you say that the length of a needle and beyond a needle means as much again as a needle for a thread less than that can still make a clip but if you say that the length of a needle and anything beyond a needle for what purpose could a thread which is less than this be fit we may therefore conclude from this that it means the length of a needle and beyond a needle as much again as the length of a needle this proves it whatever a carpenter removes with the ATZE belongs to him but that which he removes by the axe belongs to the proprietor a contradiction could be raised from the following whatever a carpenter removes with the adze or cuts with his saw belongs to the proprietor for it is only that which comes out from under the burr or from under the chisel or is sawed with the saw that belongs to the carpenter himself said Rabba in the place where our tana of the mission lived two kinds of implements were used the larger called axe and the smaller called adze, whereas in the place of the tenna of the Beretha there was only one implement, i.e., the larger, and they still called it adze. If, however, he was working on the proprietor's premises, even the sawdust belongs to the proprietor. Our rabbis taught workmen chiseling stones do not become liable for robbery by retaining the chips in their possession. Workmen who thin trees or thin vines or trim shrubs or weed plants or thin vegetables, if the proprietor is particular about the waste materials, become liable for robbery. But if the proprietor is not particular about them, they will belong to the employees. Rab Judah said also, Cuscuta and Lycan are under such circumstances not subject to the law of robbery, though in places where proprietors are particular, they would be subject to the law of robbery. Rabbin thereupon said, Motha Mahaja is a place where the proprietors are particular about them.